Yo yo, what's up bros? My name is Adi, today we got one more video special of the GOAT Mahua. If you're new here, subscribe now to be able to today and because of both videos every single day and because we are growing super fast 60 bros in 5 months, let's get the 100k mark by the end of the year bros and enjoy in the video. The weather is really bad and it's raining heavily. Our protagonist works in a bookstore and is thinking to himself that he might not get any customers today because of the weather, but what if somebody forgot an umbrella? They might have to find a place to stay while the rain goes away, our protagonist thinks. And by offering them a warm place and being nice to them, they will probably buy some books as well. Now we can see a mysterious woman out on the streets in the heavy rain, single-handedly fighting and finishing off multiple thugs. Even though she managed to beat all of them, she still got injured and is thinking she needs a place to hide while her self-healing takes care of her wounds. She then stumbles upon the bookstore of our protagonist. Because this was the only bookstore working at this bad weather, she wasn't sure if it is a trap for her or maybe destiny that she can go in and hide while waiting to heal. After entering the bookstore, our protagonist welcomes her kindly complimenting her looks and bravery because she was walking out in this awful weather. He's plotting in his mind what kind of books she might need and what approach does he need to have to sell her a lot of books. He also offered her a towel and turned on the heating which was all suspicious to her because usually bookstores aren't as equipped as this one is. She starts to think if he belongs to some enemy faction because he definitely didn't have regular book clerk vibes. He starts talking about books, which confuses her a little bit, since she couldn't figure out whether he is actually friendly or an enemy in disguise. She can read his body language and she realizes he is using psychological tricks on her, but she still doesn't understand why exactly. He offers her a seat and a hot beverage, and she tells him she was a victim of a betrayal. Now two of them are having different thoughts, she is still trying to figure out if he is the enemy, and he is trying to understand her situation so he can sell her books. After she mentioned she was betrayed, he wanted to encourage her by saying that maybe she should take some positive from it, and learn how to understand people better. She said he's right, but that she already lost so much and can only see the ugly side of the humanity now. So he gives her another advice again, saying that in the future, she shouldn't feel remorse for people who harmed her already, even if they were a really close person to her before. This makes her even more suspicious of him, but she goes along with him, asking what else should she do, and he tells her to exact vengeance. She shouldn't be soft on people who hurt her. In his mind, he's still thinking about the strategies of what to say to her to prepare for buying books from him. But she got surprised by this answer, saying that she isn't mentally prepared to do evil things like that yet. And all of a sudden he tells her, maybe you need to buy this book to learn more. She gets even more surprised again and even confused now, because she doesn't understand why is he recommending her a book all of a sudden, whilst he is just trying to sell her book because that's good for his business. She agrees to buy the book and he gives her a library card to fill out and after seeing her name he realizes she is the only daughter of a rich tycoon and sees another great business opportunity to sell her even more books in the future. As she was leaving he gave her an umbrella and she told him that maybe they could get to know each other a little bit more. Then he realized that his business strategy might have been perceived as flirting by her but it's better to go with the flow, so he tells her his name, Lin Ji. As they are saying goodbyes, she is still suspicious of him, while he is just happy that he managed to sell a book today and do good business. As she is walking in the rainy street, she is thinking that maybe he gave her an order to finish off the traitor, and afterwards come back to him to return the umbrella, but to actually come back after doing this deed. But all of a sudden, a mysterious figure of a man pops up behind her, but before we get to learn more about him, we learn more about our protagonist Lin Ji's past. While he was sorting books, he found an old book written by himself, which woke up some memories in him of his past, and he remembered his old life when he was an ordinary man who liked reading books so much that girls that used to work with him didn't understand him at all. After getting back to his home, we can see a magical ring in his room, and this ring was conjured by Lin himself. He strikes it down with his fist saying his wish, please let me own all the books in the world. Nothing happened, or so it seemed. 
he didn't realize but behind him a demon appeared who created a portal door to another dimension and Lin immediately knew if he goes through the door he will own every book in the world but will not be able to go back to earth ever again without any hesitation he went through the door and was living as a book clerk for the last three years ever since then on a different world but he didn't mind at all he actually liked it very much because he could read an endless supply of books and even help his customers with their life situations by giving them proper books. He remembered the lady that just bought a book from him and realized besides her he didn't have customers in a long time. Now we go back to her and the mystery man on the street. She was walking right past him but realized that something was off since she couldn't move her hand at all. At that moment the mysterious man turned around and said, oh, I see. It's that book. The blood in her veins froze as she realized something about that man. The rain was still falling heavily. And now we go back to Lin Ji sitting in his library with a new visitor, who was the mysterious man from a moment ago. But our protagonist already knew this man. His name was Old Wild and he was there to return a book he previously borrowed. Two of them started talking about book that Old Wild borrowed and Lin Ji said the book was written by a great author who passed away. The girl was spying this from the outside and she realized that Old Wild is actually a high level black mage, rank destructive. There were four ranks, abnormal, panicky, destructive and indestructible. Old Wild's real name was Frank Wild and he was famous for the mask he wears in being half serpent blooded mage. He fought against one of the 10 holy knights of the order and destroyed an area of 10 kilometers wide, hence the title destructive. In this city there aren't even 10 destructive mages and on the entire world less than a hundred. As the girl walked away she was thinking about how Lin can just casually talk with someone of that power as well. Now we go back into the bookshop where Lin is thinking to himself that Old Wild is his regular customer and he needs to be treated accordingly. Old Wild was a loner. Even though he had two kids they didn't treat him well. His wife left him and his colleagues were scared of him because of the way that he looks. Lin remembered when he met Old Wild for the first time two years ago. When Old Wild first entered the shop, he intrigued our protagonist both with his looks and his demeanor, and he was also carrying a mysterious book of high value with him. Lin offered him tea, which Wild refused because he looked scary and didn't want to take his robes, but Lin said he doesn't focus on the looks but on the heart and Old Wild actually took off his robes showing his scary looks. However, Lin found him more weird and scary because of the mask that he wore. Lin turned on his business and brain and tried to figure out the best approach to make Wild his regular customer. So firstly he asked him about the book that the old man brought, because it was a book about magical and dying languages. Wild was surprised because Lin could feel the magic from the book, which even other destructive mutants couldn't feel. So as our girl from the beginning of the story, Old Wild got suspicious of Lin and decided to proceed with caution. They started talking about the book and Wild pretended as if, as if he doesn't know much about it but said he is studying those languages. And then he asked Lin to teach him more about it. This was a huge business opportunity for our protagonist and he offered Wild a new book to read. This book was about the most complex dialect in China. The book's name was Devil's Language and Old Wild immediately realized that and got extremely excited about it. Lin was happy that he could interest him in the book and Wild asked how did he manage to obtain such a rare book. Lin couldn't tell the truth about book being from his original world so he had to lie and said it's from a splendid civilization. Lin got a bit sad that he can't go back to earth again. However, Wilde noticed nostalgia in Lin's voice when he was describing this ancient and splendid civilization and Wilde thought that if Lin is from this civilization, he's probably a terrifying individual. After they introduced themselves back to present, Wilde said thanks to the Devil's Language book, he started doing a new research and he needs a new book on the topic. 
Lin was completely oblivious to Violet's intentions, but his business instinct kicked in again and he wanted to offer him a new book to read. Now we go 40 years in the past and we can see snowy mountain tops and old wild when he was younger. He has reached the highest of the mountain peaks to speak with the imprisoned king of ancient mage knowledge. The mage king said a word, looked at the crow that was flying by and it just hit the ground, losing its life like that. Old Wild was absolutely surprised at how powerful mage spells are. The mage king then explained to Old Wild that mages control the power of word and languages. White mages write spells and black mages recite incantations. He then gave Old Wild the most valuable lesson and said that if Old Wild can realize and find the sound of his soul and create his own language, that he would reach indescribable power. Now we go back to the present and a dialogue between Old Wild and our protagonist, Mr. Lin. Old Wild is saying he wants to borrow a book that will help him understand another book he has that's really difficult to understand and is a part of a single language. Our protagonist, Mr. Lin, asks Old Wild to wait for a moment while he thinks about what kind of a book would help him the best. While Old Wild is waiting, he thinks about Mr. Lin always being nice to him and always there to help him out when needed. Even after Old Wild lost terribly after fighting with a guy called Joseph, who was a divine knight, Mr. Lin was there for Old Wild to help guide him to the right path. Old Wild also told that Mr. Lin is a learned hermit beyond indescribable power, because he could hide his power easily from Old Wild. And he thinks that after two years of studying that mysterious book that's so hard to understand, Old Wild can finally understand some parts of it, and it's all thanks to Mr. Lin whom Old Wild thought of as an omniscient and wise scholar. Old Wild wanted to show his gratitude to Mr. Lin this time. Just then Mr. Lin comes back with another book, saying that it's a bold statement thinking this book will help Old Wild, but Mr. Lin says he considers himself quite confident in this field, which is why he gave out the vibes to Old Wild that he is a powerful scholar. After seeing what kind of a book it is, Old Wild got completely and utterly shocked, asking Mr. Lin if he really wrote this book his own, which Lin confirmed with confidence. Old Wild, still shocked, remembered the three mainstream religions that were known to him, but he never heard about the religion of cult of ghouls before. Old Wild felt evil aura coming from the book, so he thought to himself that Mr. Lin has to be wicked if he wrote this book, and then he thought whether Mr. Lin is trying to start his own religion. Old Wild asked Mr. Lin if this book was his field of study about the rituals, which Mr. Lin confirmed and said that he used to study it a very long time ago and that it was a destiny changing book for him. Mr. Lin was implying that thanks to the study of this field he could leave earth and come work in an underground world as a librarian with possession of all the books. But of course Old Wild didn't know this, which is why his suspicions about Mr. Lin seem to be confirmed. Mr. Lin then tells Old Wild that he didn't publish the book and that this is the only copy of the book and then he thinks to himself that if he stayed on earth and published it, he could have earned the title of an associate professor on earth. Then Mr. Lin looked at Old Wild again and said since they are acquaintances, he will lend him this book even though this is the only copy of it in the world. But if Old Wild wishes, he could take another book instead. Old Wild was thinking that he has to take this book since it's the only copy ever and it's written by this master. But Old Wild wonders what this powerful master Lin want from him. So Old Wild says that it would be his honor to take the book. He then says that he feels a bit uneasy to receive such a valuable book from Mr. Lin, thinking to himself that maybe Mr. Lin wants to use Old Wild as his test subject. Mr. Lin thought that he needs to utilize more of his business book selling techniques, then taps Old Wild on the shoulder and says, don't worry Old Wild, I'm sure you will add more value to my book. Only when someone sees my work, then my research is worth it. As for this book, it's not important for me now. I have entire forests already. Again, Mr. Lin was implying that he doesn't need that one book because he just used it to get to his current position where he has a forest of books, meaning all the books in the world. Then he says he still possesses all the knowledge from the book and he could reprint it anytime. 
That's why it's not a problem if Old Wild borrows it. Then he thinks to himself again that Old Wild should borrow the book since he's a lone scholar, and if he published the book, he would receive wealth and fame, which would heal his soul. And borrowing books to his customers and healing their souls was always Mr. Lin's top priority. Old Wild was again left in complete awe and shock, and he thought to himself that Lin is maybe teaching him that fame and wealth are useless, but Mr. Lin then says, feel free to recommend it to others. Old Wild agrees and thinks to himself that maybe this is the price he needs to pay to spread the knowledge about the book, to distribute the book with keeping Lin as an author of the book a secret. And that was precisely Mr. Lin's plan to heal Old Wild's soul, to make him publish it and become famous and wealthy for it. Old Wild thanks Mr. Lin for his guidance over the years, then starts conjuring something, saying that this is the token of his gratitude. It was a gargoyle that Old Wild received from his teacher after graduating. Gargoyle's power is that it can identify murderous intent by itself and it has great magic resistance. Mr. Lin thinks Old Wild thinking that this token of gratitude is really valuable and that it took a lot of craftsmanship to make it because it looks as if it is alive. They both thank each other and Old Wild thinks to himself that one book from Mr. Lin could buy thousands of these gargoyles, that it's not that special. As Old Wild is leaving and saying goodbyes to Mr. Lin, he also says that he will give him a better gift next time, one that is worthy of an indescribable power. Mr. Lin says he can't wait while saying goodbye to Old Wild. After Old Wild left, Mr. Lin is thinking to himself, what kind of a gift could he give me? Maybe another one of these gargoyles. As Mr. Lin stretches, saying that that's all the work for today, he notices a black goo rising on his table. The goo spells out letters, long time no see, and Mr. Lin screams in shock, that's you? Mr. Lin realizes that this is the demon that sent Mr. Lin to this underground realm, and tells him that it has been three years since they last talked and asks if it's the time for Mr. Lin to pay the price for the favor that the demon has provided him. Mr. Lin thinks that this demon is actually quite friendly since it had already helped him and fulfilled his biggest wish. Thus, Mr. Lin is not expecting the demon to ask for a big price. Then the demon sends a message saying that the price has already been paid and is actually the reason why the demon has awoken. Mr. Lin was surprised starts thinking, what did he do that made him pay the price already? Mm, maybe because he let Old Wild recommend the book to someone? The demon responds by writing letters, yes, out of the black goo on the table. Mr. Lin asked the demon if the price he just paid somehow benefits the demon, and demon responded with yes again. Mr. Lin, relieved, says that there will be no issues then, since the price has already been paid, but Mr. Lin is suspicious, because it was too easy. Now we see the man named Jack on a building balcony, while the rain is still falling heavily. Jack is a mysterious man for now, but is a part of some special force unit. He receives a message over his radio, that they have found the whereabouts of Old Wild, and that Old Wild just spent an hour in that bookstore. Jack gets suspicious and thinks to himself that this bookstore is maybe a hidden gathering spot for the black mages. The woman on the other side of the radio gets surprised and says she has to report to Joseph and calls Jack back to provide more info. And yes, Joseph is the guy Old Wild mentioned earlier in the story that he suffered a terrible loss to. Jack confirms the order and says he will return back, but at that moment we can see Old Wild himself behind Jack, saying, there's a rat, and attacking him. Jack pulls out a knife to stab Old Wild, but before he does it, Old Wild grabs his face, utters a magic word, and Jack loses his life in the blink of an eye. Woman on the radio calls for Jack, but Old Wild stomps on the radio, destroying it, and saying that they should never spy on his place of residence, thinking about Mr. Lin, of course, and saying that the punishment Jack has just received was too merciful for this transgression. Now we go back to headquarters Jack was supposed to report to, and we see that woman knocking on the door of a special knight, saying she has something to report to. We see the knight chilling in his chair, telling the woman whose name is Claudie to come in. The knight asks if something happened to the spawn of the magic mirror, and says that those hunters are so annoying, gets so pissed and while punching the table says he'll use the tombstones of their mothers as punching bags. Claudie, a little bit scared, says she has a new case for this knight. Knight asks what's more important than what Old Wild is doing, and she reports on Jack's just losing his life a couple of moments ago. 
and said that he just discovered where Wilde was before getting assassinated. The knight gets utterly furious asking who did this and then Claudie says it was old Wilde's doing. They thought he lost his life after the battle of White Hills two years ago but apparently he survived. The knight says he knew old Wilde survived and that nobody knows old Wilde better than him and says that the finally old pest has come out of the sewer. The knight was surprised Old Wild is in Nokin region, however, and asks what he was doing at the 23rd street, the street where the bookstore of Mr. Lin is. Claudie says that the report is limited since Jack didn't make it back to give a full report, but they know that Old Wild spent an hour in the bookstore. The knight gets angry saying that it makes no sense for a black mage who uses words for his magic to go to a bookstore and asks if there is any background check on the bookstore. Claudie says that bookstore is flagship of Ash Tree Merchant Group and is open for three years now. It has a good reputation but not many customers and that the only thing about the bookstore that is a little bit odd is the owner who is not local. The knight says that the Ash Tree Merchant Group belongs to the Druids who follow nature and forests and that he doubts they have anything to do with the black mages and because of that the knight doubts that the bookstore is the gathering place of mages. The knight gets completely pissed then, runs towards Claudia and asks her what is the mission of their order of knights. Claudia in a trembling voice responds, to eradicate evil and bring peace. The knight says that they cannot tolerate anyone who stands for evil or works with those who stand for evil, saying that Wilde didn't stay in the bookstore only to chat, read a book and drink some tea. While these are precisely the reasons why Old Wilde stayed there. The knight continues yelling in anger saying that if Claudia really thinks this, that an immensely powerful black mage stayed at a bookstore for an hour only to do that, then he will need to put on the sharp mithril boots and kick Claudia a few times so she learns her lessons. Claudia, quivering in fear, says that the Ash Tree group of merchants who own the bookstore as well fund 40% of their operation as well. The knight realizes his mistake, exhales and says that he will go to the bookstore himself to check out what's the big deal about this bookstore. As he's leaving his base you can see many many knights in a line greeting him honorably. He looks at the record of Lin Yi saying he will personally get to see what kind of a being Lin is. Then we find out the name of the knight, Joseph Abraham. He was one of the ten radiant knights and the knight that beat old wild terribly once already. As the chapter draws to an end, Sir Joseph starts hallucinating again, seeing bright red light everywhere and as a magic sword appears in front of him, Sir Joseph utters the curse of the magic sword Candela. We see Joseph drowning and falling deeper and deeper in water, demon tendrils wrapping around him and even an illusion of a mysterious man trying to choke him out. Joseph snaps back out of the hallucination and he's on a rainy street close to Mr. Link's bookstore. Joseph is talking to himself, saying that the curse of the sword Candela activated again and that's why he can't go visit the bookstore now. And the reason for the curse is a madness possessed by its original owner. This curse can drive people mad with hallucinations and only extremely powerful knights can withstand this curse with their tremendous willpower. But the curse is activating again before Joseph could find a suitable successor for the blade. Joseph thinks to himself that he is no undefeatable sacred knight, since he can't withstand this curse anymore. He's just an old cripple. Then he leaves down the street without going to the bookstore. Now we see drained corpses of enemies who attack the girl from the beginning of the novel, and the man in robes, whose name is Helix, and who is a leader of the White Wolf clan. And Helix is saying that he underestimated the girl, after all, she was second in command, so it's understandable that she is not weak. And we see the girl again, standing in front of a burning building and we get to learn more about her. She was a former second in command of the White Wolf clan, the clan Helix is the current leader of, and her name is Ji Zinsu. We see more enemies charging at her from behind, but she dismantles them without betting an eye, then asks Max to report on the situation. Now we can see Max on the rooftop saying that it's confirmed that Helix has become a total madman after receiving the spawn of the magic mirror and that he has started a massacre among the hunters after taking it. Max warns G that they are outmatched since Helix has allied with Casper, who's third in command. Now we see another woman named Kay approach them saying that Helix and Casper have probably planned this assault a long time ago and that they are too powerful right now. Then she tells G that she got betrayed only because of that scheming bastard. 
Li then thanks Kay, saying that the only reason why she survived the pursuers was thanks to Kay. Then Li thinks about Kay being really impressive, since she can suppress the side effects of the tainted blood, meaning even when she is transformed, she can retain complete control, which is impossible for regular hunters. Now we see a man known as Rat Ryan screaming that Helix and Casper are close to panicky level and that after Lee and Kate transform, they can defeat them easily. Kay absolutely despises Rat Ryan, but G said that they can trust him since he has a loyalty rune marked onto his soul. G then explains that Kay and Max are able to withstand the mind corruption of the magic mirror because that rune has been casted by the white mage. That proceeds to explain that all of them have tainted blood and that hunting that cruel dream beast is a path they all chose to have. She lets out a battle cry telling her hunters that there is no turning back now. They agree and follow her instructions. They leave saying that this is going to be their last battle. They reach the church gate which they break open and enter. Inside they find third in command Casper and they get surprised asking where is Helix and why is Casper alone? Casper laughs while G rushes towards him suspecting that something is wrong. After flipping him over, she realizes he has started transforming and takes a syringe to inject into him to slow down his transformation. Then she asks where is Helix and Casper, while still transforming, screams, His holiness will come. Then Casper explodes, ending his own life. G completely shocked and angry breaks the glass mirror while Max is asking her that they should ask Mr. Keywood for help. But she quickly declines Max's offer and gives an order to Kay to continue investigating. She then orders Ryan to follow her. And shocked, he asks, where, while she utters, to 23rd Street. Now we see our protagonist, Mr. Lin, sitting in his bookstore, drinking coffee and reading a book. While thinking to himself that today is another day without customers. Since Old Wild and G, it's been three days without any customers. He then thinks to himself that he's only scraping by because of that black lady who is financing the bookstore and Lin hopes that the book he recommended to this black lady can be of any help to her. He then thinks that he should devise strategies how to share books better since he's probably not getting any customers with weather being as bad as it is today and in that moment somebody enters the bookstore. It's Miss G, dressed in a beautiful dress which leaves Mr. Lin a bit surprised, but he happily welcomes her in. He then remembers that she's a daughter of a rich tycoon and that this is his chance to make his business prosper by making her his regular customer. He tells her that he didn't expect her to come back so soon and that she's the first person ever to visit his bookstore after only three days. G is thinking to himself that Mr. Lin is disappointed in her and after giving her such a great guidance the last time, she still came back to him asking for more help. She then notices the gargoyle that Mr. Lin received from Old Wild and thinks to herself if that's the mage's gargoyle. And even though it didn't move, she feels a powerful aura coming from him. She continues thinking about Mr. Lin trying to pretend to be a normal person but he's displaying this gargoyle. Is he trying to comfort her and treat her with forgiveness and encouragement like before? She then apologizes to Mr. Lin for disappointing him and in that moment Rat Ryan enters the bookstore asking G if this is the place where she is taking him. He gets surprised after seeing Mr. Lin and thinking why did the boss take me to see a normal person? Mr. Lin asks about who this guy is and she explains telling this is her subordinate, saying that he is completely loyal. Mr. Lin then starts pouring coffee and thinks that G got traumatized by that bastard who G mentioned in the chapter 1 and for whom Mr. Lin told her to need to get the revenge against. Mr. Lin thinks she was traumatized by this guy so much because when she introduces other people she needs to say they are loyal. But then Mr. Lin realizes that if she took his advice and listened to him and got revenge she should feel more confident now. And why did she just say she disappointed Mr. Lin? He asks her if she failed doing this and offers her coffee. G thinks to herself that even though she didn't say it, Mr. Lin already knows this, so she tells him that yes, she had failed. They are talking about different people however. G is talking about Helix and wanting to end his life, while Mr. Lin is thinking that the guy is her ex who betrayed her. G then proceeds to explain that he got away and she couldn't get her revenge. She asked others to search for him but they couldn't find him yet. 
and then she fought him for two days. And after receiving Mr. Lin's teachings, she started pushing him back, even explaining, even destroying his base, and even though she paid a heavy price, he still managed to escape because she has underestimated him. She then apologizes to Mr. Lin because she got careless. Mr. Lin, with a happy face, says that it's not her fault. And while he sips his coffee, he gets completely and utterly confused, not realizing what's going on because he is thinking that the guy G is talking about is her ex. Why is she talking about romance like fighting someone, he wonders. And thinks there's a saying, love is like shopping and shopping is like fighting. So logically, love is like fighting. Lin thinks that G is used to business terminology since her father is a tycoon and that's why she's describing it like that and he thinks he understands it now. He thinks she meant she argued with that guy for days, but only understood how clever he is at the end, and he managed to run away with her money at the end. He pours more coffee for Miss G and says that he understands. Miss G gets a bit happy and asks Mr. Lim what does he think, while we can see Rat Ryan in the back, completely confused because he doesn't understand what the heck is going on. And we go bit in the past to learn more about Rat Ryan. He's talking on the phone with somebody whom he told that Old Wild is in Nokin region now and that person starts complimenting Ryan for getting this classified information easily. Ryan said cut the flattery, I can serve someone else in an instant. The person on the phone thanks Ryan again and tells him who the next target is and Ryan says that he's just a naive brat who believes that the rule of truth is safe but that it's really really easy to crack them up. And at that moment K calls for Rat Ryan telling him that G is looking for him and that he's not gonna be a mindless rat anymore but her subordinate. Ryan apologizes and says he's leaving right away. And while going, he thinks to himself that K has the ability to control lycanthropy easily and that if he finds a way to do this, he can be the ultimate intel to destroy hunters forever. Now lycanthropy is the ability to transform into a wolf or a werewolf for those of you who don't know. Now back to the present where Ryan is completely confused, not understanding why is she talking to this man in such a way, as if he possesses some kind of indescribable power, but he's just a normal human. She then asks Mr. Lin to guide her, and he tells her that she doesn't need to worry so much, that it's actually easier than she thinks, that her enemy isn't that guy right now, but other things, and that she fears the fear itself, and that she needs to wait for a bit, that good news will come. Ryan realizes that these are all lies and empty words because Ryan knows them too well because those are all tricks of a liar and Red Ryan is a liar himself. Mr. Lin then quickly apologizes and asks him to wait for a moment because his stomach started acting up since he drank too much tea, thinking he'll get no customers today. When he leaves, Red Ryan in a loud tone asks G what the hell is she doing? She tells him to watch his tone, that she brought him here because he might have some useful intel, not because she trusts him or values him, and she calls him impudent. Ryan loses it and starts screaming that Mr. Lin is a liar, how Ryan is impudent but he knows that, but that Mr. Lin's deception definitely needs to be worked on, and how Ryan can find at least three people with that low level of deception. He warns G that Mr. Lin is spinning her around, and then he feels G's blade at his throat, as she yells at him saying, I knew I shouldn't have brought you, a wicked man like you only sees wicked things. She tells him that if he wasn't useful she'd just end his life right there and then. Ryan thinks to himself that he needs to calm down and manipulate G, since he thinks she is so easy to manipulate, and says that he's loyal to her and her only, and that when Mr. Lin comes back he will prove it to her, preparing his poisoned arrow to strike Mr. Lin down. At that moment the magic gargoyle that Mr. Lin got from the old wild awakens, because it felt Ryan's murderous intent. It grabs Ryan, leaving G in shock, quickly pulls him close to his mouth and devours Ryan in a blink of an eye. Then just before Mr. Lin returned, gargoyle goes back into its normal sleeping form, looking like a statue again. Mr. Lin comes back, apologizing for leaving and asks, where is your subordinate G? She's completely terrified and petrified and answers in a shaky voice. He... something... urgent. While still being frozen with fear, G starts thinking to herself how everything just now happened so quickly she didn't even realize and she didn't even have time to react. 
The gargoyle attacked and swallowed Red Ryan so fast that if it was targeting G instead, she couldn't defend herself and would get completely obliterated by it without even standing a chance. Is this what it feels to stare death in the eyes? She thinks to herself as the chills caused by the biggest fear in her life are running through her body. She then thinks that Mr. Lin realized that Red Ryan is a liar and wanted to finish him off but didn't want to get his hands dirty by doing this job, that's why he left to a different room for a couple of moments, letting his gargoyle quickly dispose of that ignorant guy. She thinks that this is such a brutal but elegant tactic, and thinks that she shouldn't have brought Trent Ryan in the first place. She then thinks that she angered Mr. Lin, and if he thinks she's behind this, what could he even do to her? But at that moment, Mr. Lin interrupts her thoughts, asking, What's wrong? You look pale, Mr. G. He tells her to relax, that his bookstore should be a place for people who visit and relax. Don't be scared. I'm not gonna eat you, he says. Miss G gets even more terrified now, if that is even possible, and starts shaking and apologizing, saying her subordinate was rude and that she shouldn't have brought him with her to the bookstore. Mr. Lin gets completely confused again, not understanding why she's so nervous and scared. Does she really think I eat people? He thinks. But there is no way she'd think something like that about such a friendly book clerk like Mr. Lim. He thinks that maybe she's just too naive and believes everything people say. That's why she got betrayed by her ex as well, Mr. Lim thinks. He then realizes that he probably earned her trust with soul healing her the last time she came and that's why she came again and is planning to do his best again to help her soul out. He apologizes for making jokes and asks Miss G if he can help her in any way. Miss G notices that Mr. Lin is calm, so she relaxed a bit as well, apologizing for her transgression and asking for a book to help with her willpower. Mr. Lin says no problem, and while finding a good book for her, he wonders why does she look so scared. He's only been gone a couple of minutes, what could have happened? Maybe it's because her subordinate left so suddenly. So Mr. Lin decides to comment about him, saying that Red Ryan didn't look right and it's better to not talk about stuff like absolute loyalty. She gets shocked thinking that Mr. Lin didn't say this randomly, that something must be wrong with the loyalty rune. She thinks that only white mages who make this rune can crack them, and that the mage that made the rune for Ryan works for her father Haywood, and if Ryan's rune is not working, her father is probably breaking the runes to manipulate other people. She comments out loud saying, How can this be? Who can I trust? And Mr. Lin without a moment to spare answers by saying, Yourself. You can only rely on yourself. He tells her that she can never completely understand an individual and that the best way is to get strong and steel so nobody can defeat you and you don't have to rely on other people and offers her a book titled How the Steel Was Tempered. G is shocked, but Lin tells her that after she reads this book, it will be really helpful to her. He then uses some quotes to encourage her and tells her, Strike when the iron is hot. Man's dearest possession is life, and it's given to him to live but once. As she is leaving, he continues quoting more sentences from the book. Now she's walking down the street again and looks at the cover of the book for a moment, and then opens it up. The book releases light particles all around G, startling her a bit, and then a huge demon eye appears above her. The unending will of steel has a different effect on the power of the soul, is the quote she hears. G is left confused and not understanding what has just happened, while she sees visions of the bookstore and the gargoyle in the bookstore. Then the vision zooms on the neck of the gargoyle, where we can see people is swallowed, one of them being Red Ryan whose rune of truth was gone from his neck. She then realizes the rune was indeed cracked and broken. The demon eye above her zaps her with dark energies. She feels pain and her nose starts bleeding, but in her vision she finds herself in front of Red Riot who's suffering. Now she's out of the vision, thinking how incredible Mr. Lin is. He changed her soul so easily and poured huge amounts of mana in her, and she finally has a chance to break through panicky level into a higher power level. She feels satisfaction overflowing through her body. She feels as if Mr. Lin gave her a second life and thinks that Mr. Lin wants to help all the hunters gradually, step by step, and she thinks she finally understands his goals. She swears that absolute loyalty to him 
giving her body and everything to him and saying she will never let Mr. Lin down again. While sorting books in his bookstore, Mr. Lin turns around and sees Ji standing out in the rain in front of the bookstore and he realizes she was there all this time. But why does she have a nosebleed? He wonders as she runs away. Mr. Lin then thinks that maybe she has a crush on him after being betrayed by her ex and being vulnerable. And Mr. Lin was there for her. No, 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 that can't be the case, he thinks. I need to focus on the customers. And the chapter ends with Holy Knight Joseph standing in front of the bookstore. Now we get to see Radiant Knight Joseph in front of the bookstore having a magical aura around him to protect him from the rain at all times. That's how powerful he is. He then thinks to himself that he doesn't understand why would a powerful black mage like Old Wild decide to spend an hour in this ordinary bookstore. But Joseph says that he can't let this opportunity go to waste and decides to go in to investigate. As he's entering the bookstore, he's thinking to himself that as a knight, it is his duty to protect law and peace. Now we see our main protagonist, Mr. Lin, just sitting in a chair in a bookstore browsing through books. And there is one book that he's holding in his hand, The Little Prince. And he thinks about how this book is a children's book, but it has so many philosophical points and it's both heartwarming and cute. He decides to read this book tonight before going to sleep. And at that moment, the doorbell rings and somebody enters the bookstore. Mr. Lin gets excited that he gets a new customer and then he thinks that Miss G is probably his lucky charm because every time she came to visit him, as soon as she left, some other customer came in. Now we see the imposing presence of Radiant Knight Joseph and Mr. Lin also realizes quickly that this man has a threatening presence, but being a good book clerk as he is, he welcomes him and offers him his services. Radiant Knight Joseph is scanning the area with his magical eye, but he realizes that this is just an ordinary bookstore and that Mr. Lin is just an ordinary man and doesn't understand why Old Wild would spend any time here. But then Joseph sees the gargoyle and thinks to himself that this gargoyle is the only out of the ordinary thing in this entire bookstore. He thinks that Old Wild wouldn't just give this gargoyle to anybody and he decides to investigate a little bit further. Then he asks Mr. Lin if he's the actual owner of the bookstore and before replying Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this guy seems a little bit unsociable so he decides to use an endearing and respectful language and decides to call Radiant Knight Joseph Grandpa. When Mr. Lin says you're right I'm the owner of the bookstore Grandpa, Radiant Knight Joseph gets surprised, shocked and completely angry. Even though Mr. Lin was trying to be polite, Joseph took this in a wrong way and took it as an insult, thinking to himself that he should bash Mr. Lin's skull in, but he won't do it since Mr. Lin is just an ordinary man and he can't go around bashing skulls of civilians. He then asks Mr. Lin if this gargoyle is his actually, which Mr. Lin says yes, a customer gifted it to me and that's the reason why it's not on sale. Joseph thinks to himself that he would never want to buy something like this. What the hell would the Radiant Knight do with a gargoyle made by a black mage. Then Joseph asks Mr. Lin if Old Wild gifted this gargoyle to him. Mr. Lin answers yes but thinks to himself that this man might have a grudge against Old Wild because of his threatening demeanor. Joseph is still a little bit confused and doesn't understand why would a powerful black mage give the gargoyle this powerful to an ordinary man. Joseph says to himself that first he thought this is a gathering place for black mages but after scouting it he knows that this is just an ordinary bookstore with an ordinary book clerk. But maybe they're using this place to exchange secret messages is what Joseph thinks. So this place would be an exchanging point for the black mages then. Now we see Mr. Lin thinking and trying to analyze and understand what kind of a man Joseph is. He thinks to himself that even though Joseph has this threatening aura around him, he must be a good man and a gentle soul because he didn't break anything after he entered in the bookstore. And if he is a gentle soul, he shouldn't have a grudge against a literary student like Old Wild. Then Mr. Lin remembers a quote from Sherlock Holmes, which goes, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And he realizes, yes, and asks Joseph, are you a friend of Old Wild? Joseph gets completely surprised, but he decides to use this for his advantage, saying that yes, he's known him for many, many years and that they've shed blood together in war, but that they've had a small conflict two years ago and he didn't hear about him since then. And while Joseph is thinking to himself that as soon as he sees Old Wild, he's going to rip his head off and break his bones. And that's basically what he already did last time they fought. But Old Wild used some unfamiliar magic to escape death and run away. So while he's thinking this, 
Mr. Lin is thinking that they really have a deep connection and a bromance and an enviable friendship. And he tells Joseph that he realized they are close friends because Joseph immediately knew that Gargoyle was from Old Wild. Joseph said that he's been looking for Old Wild all these years and asks Mr. Lin if he has the address of where Old Wild is right now, that he would like to pay him a visit right now personally. Mr. Lin says that he would gladly give him the address but unfortunately that he doesn't have it. But he lets Joseph know that Old Wild borrowed a book and he will be back in a couple of days to return the book. And when he comes back Mr. Lin will tell him about Joseph trying to find him. Then he asks Joseph if he would like to sit and rest for a while and his business instincts are kicking in and he asks him if he would like to borrow a book. Joseph sighs and says, <laughs> do I look tired? And he thinks to himself that even though Mr. Lin is an ordinary man talking to a super powerful man right now, he's still being really casual and friendly towards Joseph. And Joseph thinks to himself that nobody talked to him like this for many many years, ever since he became a Radiant Knight. Then Joseph says that he isn't tired, but he has no reason to pass on a little bit of tea. But he will not read any books, since he doesn't like reading and he didn't bring any money with him. Mr. Lin thinks to himself that Joseph is incredibly arrogant judging by the tone of his voice, but that he's opening up right now. So he offers him with tea and tells him that he can read any book behind him for free. Joseph again refuses to read the book and thinks that his headache is getting worse and worse. And at that moment Mr. Lin just slides a book to Joseph. Book's title is A Seed of the Abyss. And then also tells him that he's reading a fairy tale right now that's really relaxing and soothing for soul before going to sleep. And if Joseph wants he can let him this book to read to help him relax his soul. Joseph scoffs and says, fairy tale? Young man, you're an adult as well. Why would you read such a book? That's so immature. Mr. Lin is a little bit disappointed because of how condescending Joseph is and tells him, suit yourself, but this book is really really good. It's the only copy in Nokin region. Joseph gets surprised and asks Mr. Lin, what? Are you certain this book is a fairy tale? Mr. Lin left a little bit confused says, yes, this is the classical story. Is there any problems? Joseph thinks to himself that nobody in his right mind would call a book which name is A Seed of the Abyss a fairy tale story for kids that you read before going to sleep. Now we get to learn something new and mind blowing twist. Books that Mr. Lin has and sees, when he gives them to his customers, they see it differently. And the book changes in according to what the customer souls needs. That's why Joseph was surprised because Mr. Lin was talking about a fairy tale but the book's name was A Seed of the Abyss. But Mr. Lin saw this book as the story of Little Prince, which in reality is a children's book. Now Joseph gets intrigued and because of this, he asks Mr. Lin to have a look at the book, but not because he's interested in it, but because he is a polite person who doesn't want to decline such a polite offer from Mr. Lin who keeps recommending him to read this book. Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this grandpa is really like a macho man on the outside, but he's really soft and has a woman's heart on the inside. And as he offers Joseph the book, and as soon Joseph touches the book, he feels a familiar feeling of dizziness and pain. He realizes it's the sword Candela resonating with something right now. Is it the book he wonders? He's completely confused. And while falling down to the floor, he remembers Mr. Lin saying bedtime. Is this what he meant? We can see Joseph fighting to stay conscious, but he faints and falls on the floor. Mr. Lin completely shocked screams, Grandpa, are you okay? What is happening? And as he's running towards Joseph to give him first aid, he's thinking maybe he had a stroke. And after checking his pulse, he realizes that Joseph's breathing and heartbeat are completely perfect and he's just sleeping. He's a little bit confused, but he says that Joseph has a better pulse than Mr. Lin in his prime, even though Mr. Lin is young and Joseph is so old. But then Mr. Lin gets scared a little bit again, thinking, but why did he pass out? Why did he fall asleep so suddenly? Is it something to do with the book? No, it makes no sense. Why would anybody pass out after seeing the Little Prince title? However, Mr. Lin collects himself and says, he is my customer right now, he passed out at the bookstore, I need to take care of him, make him more comfortable right now and I'll ask him about it when he wakes up. Now we see Mr. Lin trying to lift Joseph up and carry him to a more comfortable place, but literally after using all of his power he can't move Joseph not even an inch. After getting completely tired, he thinks how Joseph is very very heavy and he's got muscles everywhere like a big brown bear. He thinks it would be much easier to carry Joseph if he was as thin as old Wild. 
Then Mr. Lin thinks maybe another customer will come and help me carry him. But there's no way anybody will come at this time of night and at this bad of a weather. Then he apologizes to Joseph saying I'm sorry for doing something like this but I can't do anything else, it's out of my power. And because he can't carry Joseph, he starts dragging him by his coat on the floor to find a more comfortable place for him. After placing him on a comfortable chair, he notices that Joseph has a mechanical arm and he thinks maybe Joseph is a cripple like Old Wild. But then he sees how complex and intricate this mechanical arm is and Mr. Lane thinks to himself that there is no way an ordinary old man would carry something like this on him. Then Mr. Lane thinks that Joseph is maybe a high-ranked retired military officer because of his attitude, the way he looks, the way he acts, the way he talks, because he is so muscular for an old man. Yes, that's it, Mr. Lin thinks, because he already met retired military officers in the past and all of them have the same exact aura around them. Mr. Lin also thinks that he has to have PTSD because of his guarded attitude and that he also must see his lost arm as a glorious reminder of the battle he once fought. These kind of elderly people are always so stubborn, no wonder he seemed so arrogant before. Then Mr. Lin thinks that maybe Joseph's mechanical arm malfunctioned, he got some kind of an electrical shock from it and that's why he fainted and fell asleep. Then Mr. Lin thinks to himself that if somebody saw what just happened between him and Joseph, they would probably think of Mr. Lin as a serial killer who just murdered somebody and took him in the back of the shop to hide the body. No, 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 there's no way somebody would think something like that, Mr. Lin thinks. I'm an upstanding citizen and even though this scene is easy to misunderstand, there's nobody here to see. But then we see a cat peeking through the door and then runs away. Mr. Lin hears that somebody entered the store but this was cat leaving but he didn't know that so he goes to check and he sees open door. After going outside to see what's going on he sees this cat running away. He tells the cat watch out it's dangerous because of the weather outside. He thinks this is a regular cat but we can see cat actually being frightened and having actual thoughts thinking how could this happen. Then after getting tired and running a little bit further away, we can see Cat actually speaking saying dispel shape shifting and it starts transforming into a man. We learn that this man is a spy working for secret instrument tower and when we see his face he's crying thinking how could this happen. Then we get to learn more about this man and we realize he's Joseph's biggest fan and he studied and worked very hard to join his order as a spy and because he studied so much of course he knows everything about Radiant Knights, their battles with enemies and the battle between Joseph and Old Wild as well. After learning that Joseph is going to the bookstore to find out why Old Wild was there, this man decided to shapeshift into a cat and follow him to protect him if he needs assistance. But after realizing this is just an ordinary bookstore, he waited outside to get autograph from Joseph after he's done. But because Joseph took so long, he peeked in to see what's going on and what is taking Joseph so long, and when he peeked, it was at the exact moment that Joseph started fainting. Then the cat started thinking how powerful Mr. Lin is because he could overpower and beat Joseph so easily. After going back to see why did he drag him back, he saw when Mr. Lin told Joseph, even a veteran like you deserves to have some sleep dreams. The cat misunderstood the situation and felt ominous aura coming from Mr. Lin, thinking he was casting some black evil spell on Joseph while Joseph was sleeping. Then the cat gets scared, realizes that if Mr. Lin is so powerful that he could defeat Joseph, he's probably going to finish the cat as well. He gets so scared and starts running away saying, I have to get out of here as quickly as I can. I'm so scared. Sounding if he is about to poop his pants. Now we see the man shaking and quivering in fear outside on the rain, thinking wow this is how it feels to look death in the eyes. And he thinks that if Mr. Lin wanted he could have finished him off but for some reason he let him go. Why he wonders. Does he want me to go back and report? We get to learn the name of this man whose name is Morrison Gregg and he decides that he has no other choice that he has to go back and report this current situation. Then we see Mr. Joseph waking up and finding himself in the deep water again. What? Where am I? He thinks. Oh, another curse of Candela, another illusion, he thinks. But why don't I feel pain now? He then hears a voice. When you gaze into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you and recognizes one of its own. The voice was coming from the book and the words from the book were overflowing Joseph's mind. Stop! Stop! It's too much! He yells. Then he hears another voice that says, I'm happy to finally meet you. Joseph starts to feel pain fading away 
and he realizes that the curse of Candela is finally lifted. When he looks towards the illusion of Candela, he sees a beautiful blonde haired knight, the first owner of the sword, and the curse was now gone. This is that kind of a fairy tale? Joseph tells in his sleep, and as he wakes up and snaps back to reality, he yells, Fairy tales are definitely for kids. While Joseph is still a little bit confused, and while waking up, we see Mr. Lin turning around and saying, Oh, Grandpa, you're finally awake. And instead of getting completely angry like he usually would, Joseph puts on a slight smile, looks at Mr. Lin and says, Thank you. Mr. Lin says, No problem. How do you feel? Do you feel alright? Joseph thinks for a moment and says, I feel great, better than before. Then Mr. Lin thinks that with Joseph's physique, there's no way he's anything else besides a retired military officer. He then realizes that his skills at judging people are becoming more and more accurate, and he thinks how Joseph is so strong, he could probably take someone's life with a single punch. He thinks if Joseph was to punch Old Wild, he would send his upper half of the body flying away. But thankfully they are friends. Joseph then apologizes to Mr. Lin for accepting his hospitality and then causing inconvenience for him. But Mr. Lin says no problem, my job is to help the customers. This is what I also told Old Wild. Joseph says I see, I understand. And thinks to himself that Mr. Lin with his carefree attitude will help all of his customers no matter what affiliation they belong to. The moment you enter the bookstore you become his customer and he will take the best care of you. And Joseph thinks to himself that he only saw this kindness and pure heart in one group before, among the elves. Ancient and long lived race. It would make sense if Mr. Lin was also an elf himself. It's because he has lived a very long life that he has left the differences between good and evil. Everybody is the same and he's trying to help everybody. He treats people with warm and polite attitude and this elegance can only be achieved after years and years of refinement. And he probably opened this bookstore because of the knowledge he possesses. Joseph then remembers that Candela was the prince of the ancient elven kingdom who later became the moon king of the elves as well. But he was also the first to lose his mind. He finished his own life with his own sword and the swords heal his soul away. And that's how Curse of Candela was born, making the future wielders of the blade go crazy with hallucinations and eventually lose their mind and end their life as well. And before today, Joseph also thought that there's no way for him to avoid this curse, but this book, this book helped seal this curse of Sword of Candela. He then realizes that only an elf could possess such a book and no ordinary elf at that. This elf must have lived for thousands and thousands of years. And this elf probably used immense magical power to preserve this book in a perfect state. And that's why Mr. Lin probably doesn't have any magic aura around him. Yes, it all makes sense now, Joseph thinks. He then asks Mr. Lin, can he borrow the book since this was the only copy? Mr. Lin, happy to see that Joseph got interested, says, of course, I wouldn't recommend it if you couldn't borrow it. Then again, he turns his business mode on and he wants to give validation to Joseph because that's what everybody likes to get. And then he tells Joseph, from the moment I saw you, I knew this book was perfect for you. There's a lot of people like you who suffer great pain because of the turmoil and regret boiling within them makes them feel as if their strength was inadequate, which makes them doubt themselves, which eventually leads them to madness, Mr. Lin tells Joseph. Mr. Lin then thinks that people who saw Battlefield firsthand can never easily forget it and they always carry those awful memories with them for the rest of their lives. He then tells Joseph that in the end it's not the pain that defeats these kind of people, but their weakening kindness. Joseph then thinks to himself that he already saw two previous wielders actually succumb to this feeling of inadequacy and asks Mr. Lin, is it wrong to be kind? Mr. Lin says kindness is not a problem, weakening kindness is a problem. Because they have high expectations of themselves, they think of themselves as having big responsibility to other people, which in reality is their weakness. With that sort of weakening kindness, they can save others but never themselves. And as soon as their spirit grows weak, they will become susceptible to everything. He tells Joseph it's okay to not always be the invincible hero. 
it sometimes takes more bravery and courage to be a normal man. And Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this is a great business strategy that almost made him tear up, that his sir is going to reach Joseph as well. Joseph finally understands and thinks to himself that it's not the curse that drives people insane and make them end their own lives, it's the pursuit of the perfection they chase. And he thinks, why did nobody ever notice this before and tell me? He then asks Mr. Lin, how long will I remain calm like this? And Mr. Lin thinks to himself that it's not going to last long because it's just a children's book. If they had a permanent effect, that there would be no need for psychiatrists. He then tells Joseph that it's not going to last long, but if Joseph allows Mr. Lin to help him, Mr. Lin guarantees a long-term result. Now, what Mr. Lin is thinking, that this way he will gain a recurring customer, but Joseph gets completely surprised, thinking that Mr. Lin is actually asking to take the curse of Candela upon himself. Then Joseph thinks that people might say that he's already been wielding the sword for the longest, that he's already wallowing in his own failures before the sword even got the chance to corrupt him. That the invincible sacred flame used to sound intimidating before, but now, now it doesn't anymore. Joseph thinks that it was a good thing that he decided to retire. Maybe all of this happened just so the sword could find its next rightful owner. Are you certain? Won't it cause you inconvenience? It's not a simple matter after all, Joseph tells Mr. Lin. While thinking that Mr. Lin wants to take Sword of Candela under his own and wield the curse of Candela, while Mr. Lin was thinking about consulting Joseph in the future and giving him more books. Yet another funny misunderstanding. Mr. Lin thinks of himself as a professional life coach and since there was a misunderstanding between the two, he tells Joseph that there is nothing to worry about. You're barely holding on right now, correct? If you want, I can give you this book. Joseph gets surprised, doesn't know what to say, and Mr. Lin continues speaking, saying, you've been carrying those burdens for far too long. You and your heroic comrades deserve to rest. Joseph is left in complete awe and admiration of Mr. Lin's selflessness, elegance and grace. He thinks that only people who lived very long lives could achieve such level of these attributes. Joseph is happy and he answers saying that there is no need to rest right now. He will rest when there is peace in the world. And as he's leaving he asks if he can borrow this book. Mr. Lin says no problem at all. Just register your details here to borrow the book and thinks to himself yes. I've gained a new customer. Joseph fills in his details, bows down in gratitude and leaves the bookstore, saying that he has no more regrets and the only thing left for him is to serve justice. It doesn't matter if Wilde survived or not, because sooner or later, when Joseph gets his hands on Wilde, he will end him once and for all. Now, as the chapter draws to an end, we can see old Wilde in his chamber studying the book that Mr. Lin gave him, saying that the knowledge in his book is as vast as sky and as deep as the ocean. He is feeling an overwhelming euphoria as he is learning about secret sacrificial rituals from this book. It's a wild ceremony and a grotesque task. Then Old Wild turns around, looks at his black mask and thinks to himself that maybe it's time for the black scaled faces to reappear in Nokin once again. He feels a hypnotizing greatness of emotions and says to himself, this is only possible thanks to Mr. Lin, I've prepared a special gift for him. I'm sure he will like it. Now we go back to the Joseph space and we see his disciple being absolutely shocked after hearing the news from the black cat who was the transformed spy. The news being that Joseph fainted just by looking at Mr. Lin. Claudia thinks how is this even possible? She then thinks that she needs to send reinforcements to help save Joseph, but then she realizes maybe sending reinforcements harshly like this would be a mistake, because Mr. Lin is probably so powerful that he caused Joseph to faint just by looking at him. Because if she sends others and it causes more losses, it would just be a bigger mistake. Then her cell phone starts ringing and she gets a call from the team that is investigating the bookstore right now. As soon as she answers, she starts screaming, what's going on, report the situation, and then she gets absolutely surprised after finding out that Joseph is just leaving the bookstore normally. Then she gets a call from Joseph himself and she asks him, teacher, what are your orders? And Joseph says, recall the investigating forces of bookstore immediately, starting right now. As from now on, the bookstore area is classified as class I top secret. Claudia gets absolutely surprised and shocked. Class I? She utters. Then she remembers the classes lists. A for abnormal, P for panicky, D for destructive, and class I, the most powerful one, for indescribable. 
This means that Joseph classified bookstore as indescribable power level, thinking Mr. Lin's power level is the highest there is. She asks Joseph what's going on and he tells that the bookstore owner is, and his sentence gets interrupted by him seeing three black stray kittens in a box out on the rain. Then she asks Claudia over the phone, Claudia, is there someone with you? She says yes there is and realizes that Joseph probably thinks she's been careless and she hits the cat spy for trusting him. Now we see Joseph playing with these stray kittens while threatening Claudia, telling her if you know what's your job, why don't you do it? Do you really want to be sent to Northern Highlands to grow potatoes? She says no, 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 of course not, and that she'll send a word immediately for people to classify this bookstore as class I top secret. She then thinks about how Joseph sounds normal and that he didn't change at all, and that despite looking as if he's going to crush her skull and he's mad, if you follow his exact orders he doesn't hold a grudge against you. She then admires Joseph thinking that he is sharp tongued, soft hearted, radiant knight Joseph, her teacher. She then explains the whole situation that Joseph just told her to people who are in charge for classifying cases, tells her that this is the new order for Radiant Knight Joseph and that elders will understand properly. She then says to herself quietly that the new case I file is ready and that after Radiant Knight Joseph is back, He's going to need to fill out all the contents. At that exact moment, the door of the office opens. Joseph enters and says, Okay, which makes Claudia scream in shock. Joseph then asks her who was with her a couple of moments ago when they were talking on the phone when Joseph realized that somebody is with Claudie and tells her that she needs to use a forget rune on this person so he doesn't remember what they were talking about. She then explains that this is their special investigator Morrison Gregg who is a mage who is also really really talented in shapeshifting. She then says um, he's also a bit special, he's your fan, he's joined the 13 fan clubs of the undefeatable Sacred Flame, spending around 3 million in various fundraisers every year, including that inscribing the name Abraham Joseph into gold incident last year. And while Joseph is filling in the report, he asks Claudia if this really happened, which she confirms. Then he tells that he knows mage families are rich, which she confirms again. Then he thinks and says, instead of spending money on these meaningless things, why didn't he just donate money straight to his idol? Then Joseph says that he'll take Morris and Greg in as his disciple, charging him a fee for close contact. Cody gets completely surprised and shocked, thinking, how can a radiant knight be so greedy that he even wants to take kids money? But since she's only just a disciple of Joseph as well, she says of course right away. Joseph says good, that'll save him the cost of a memory wipe. And we can see his report on screen filled in saying Glass Eye Area, Bookstore 412, 23rd Street, Knockin Upper City District. Danger level, friendly. Contact ill advised. Security level, top secret. Tailing in progress. Description. The bookstore owner appears to be a long-term hermit in the bookstore. His services include lending and selling books. The books contain mysterious and immense powers. Joseph submits the report thinking that this should be enough to make other people stay away from the bookstore, but if some idiot still wants to go in, then he wishes him luck. We then see Joseph at his home in his pajamas talking on the phone with somebody saying I'm fine, I'm not dead, can't you see that, can't you realize that, who told you I'm dead? And that the only thing that would make him dead is that person annoying him even more. He says that he's not at work right now and tells the person to go bother Claudia tomorrow. He looks at the book that Mr. Lin gave him and thinks that Sword's mood remains calm and pleasant which is really good. And that the book has no effect on his mood right now that's also really really good. And at that moment the phone rings, Joseph gets a little bit angry saying who is calling me at this time and that they will need to raise his salary to compensate for the emotional damages he gets from these second raters. Now we see Joseph talking to her daughter and tells her to drink milk before sleep and she says I know father, I'm not a kid anymore, I'm already an abnormal level combat knight captain and that he doesn't have to remind her all the time. To which Joseph responds that he is not telling her to drink milk to grow taller and that she's never going to get married like this. Which leaves his daughter in a shock. He gets a little bit angry at her dad thinking that he only has muscles for brains. And as she turns around she notices some book on the table. 
This was the book that Mr. Lin gave to Joseph. She thinks it's strange. Why would her dad read the book? He has a muscle for Bray. She comes close to the book and as she opens it, she gets completely surprised. Then we see Joseph again screaming on the phone, telling his subordinates to stop bothering him about his class I case and that Mr. Lin managed to incapacitate him without even breaking a sweat. And if any one of them manages to do this as well, then Joseph will open a class I report for them as well. He warns them to not go to bookstore and do something disrespectful and if they get in trouble that he's not going to save them when they don't obey his command. Now he goes back to his daughter while she's reading a book. When she hears him coming, she closes the book quickly and gets scared that he might get angry because she was reading this book. He looks at her in his cute pajamas and tells her with a threatening voice. Melissa. The blood in her vein freezes from the fear she feels right now. She turns around and says, No, I... And he offers her a glass of milk and says, Remember? He then thinks to himself that Melissa is probably in her rebellious phase, but it's not a problem because the most important thing is for her to grow healthy. Now we see Melissa in her room still a little bit shocked, thinking who wrote that book and if the protagonist of the book could be the elf King Candela. And why are the stories in the book so splendid and real? The most important thing though is she still didn't finish reading the book. She's about to get to the best part and wants to see what happens when she couldn't because her dad interrupted her. Stupid, stupid dad. She says apart from being stupid, strong and handsome, he's just a good for nothing idiot. She then thinks to herself that she didn't expect somebody like her dad to read that kind of a book and thinks that she was being a little bit unfair to him, but then remembers she heard him say something about that book being from a highly classified bookstore. <laughs> highly classified bookstore, who cares, it's still just a normal bookstore. Those strong old fogies wouldn't stay in a place like a bookstore. She then uses a key she got from her mom who was also a radiant knight to access the classified bookstore files. She thinks, thanks mom, after reading that novel I promise I'll work hard to become an excellent knight, I won't let you down. She then opens a file about the bookstore and while she's reading through it, she sees that the target is classified as friendly. That's nothing, I knew it wasn't that impressive, she thinks. So in that case if the target is friendly, she can just go there and have a look, she thinks. Now before going to sleep, she sees a glass of the milk on the table, makes a coffee face and drinks the milk, thinking to herself, they'll grow, right? Now we see news on the radio saying that the rain warning level is red. The roads to Nokia's lower city district have been closed temporarily. And so far all sewage systems have been working at the highest efficiency. And according to experts, if this heavy rain continues for another week, a third of Nokia will be flooded completely. Expert analysis shows that the rain originates from the cold air mass of the northern highlands. Now we see Mr. Lin in his bookshop mopping the floors and thinking to himself that this heavy rain has been falling for over a week now and it's only growing stronger. And if it continues falling this heavily, he's going to need to get himself a boat. Even trying to lead a normal life is going to be difficult, Mr. Lin thinks, because when he saw the entire floor flooded this morning, he thought he's going to have to move out. But luckily the books are okay. He's finally finished clearing the floor, which looks as good as new now. And Mr. Lane thinks to himself that he is so awesome because he's able to clean it this good. Now he goes to open the store and as he's opening the store he thinks about the cat, wondering if it got home safely because it's dangerous for a small cat like that to be wandering out in such a weather. And then we see Mr. Greg Morrison in Joseph's office totally fanboying about him, saying he can feel his scent everywhere and wonders if he is in heaven. To which Claudie responds, no, but if you continue acting that way, you're soon gonna be there. Now we see Mr. Lin's neighbor completely angry and furious because his TV is not working. He thinks the TV itself is fine and the wiring is also good, but it probably is a tripped fuse that's not working. But the circuit breaker is outside and he doesn't want to go outside in this heavy rain. But then he remembers that Mr. Lin is his neighbor and maybe he can ask him for help. After all, he's been a good guy and likes helping people. He knocks on the wall to call for Mr. Lin and thinks to himself that Mr. Lin might even thank him because he gave Mr. Lin a chance to help him. Then he calls for Mr. Lin asking if he is there. Then Mr. Lin responds, yeah, is there anything you need help with? This guy smirks and tells Mr. Lin that his TV is having some problems and it's probably because of the circuits, but he's busy now and he can't leave right now. He asks Mr. Lin to go outside and have a look. The circuit breaker is behind the back door of his shop, right side on the wall. Mr. Lin being a good guy as he is says, sure, 
I'll check it out. But as soon as he starts to head out of the shop, he feels an ominous presence around him. The demon that he made a deal with to come to this world came back for Mr. Lin. Oh, nice to see you, long time no see, Mr. Lin says. Do you need something? Are you here to hurry me to lend more books? The demon then points to the doors and Mr. Lin asks if the demon actually wants to help Mr. Lin, which demon nods to and Mr. Lin thinks that this demon is so polite and cute. Last time it said lending books can help it, maybe he wants to show some gratitude by actually helping me now, that's why he's back Mr. Lin thinks. And because of this Mr. Lin thinks that he can't refuse demon's offer and tells him okay sure. I'll take your help, thank you very much. Now we can see Demon opening the door and going outside in the heavy rain, finding the circuit and flipping the switch. Now we go back to the apartment of the neighbor whose TV starts working and he gets surprised and happy, screaming all right thank you, I'll ask for your help next time too Mr. Lin. Mr. Lin says you're welcome while the demon is coming back in the bookshop. Now we see the neighbor again thinking that it's so convenient having Mr. Lin for a neighbor because he could just ask him to do stuff instead of him. Then he goes back to watch the TV and gets completely stunned in fear when he looks at the TV and sees a scary demon on the screen. We can't see what the demon did to Mr. Lin's neighbor but we can just hear painful screams coming from his window. Ah. Now we can see Mr. Lin back in the bookshop really happy, thinking to himself, another day of doing a good deed. And just as he thought about that, a doorbell rings and somebody starts entering in his bookstore. Then he wonders, hmm, what's this timing? I did a good deed and a customer shows up immediately. Now the customer is a familiar one, being old wild himself. He says, pardon me. Mr. Lin. Mr. Lin welcomes Old Wild in asking back so soon and then thinks that compared to the mask Old Wild always wears, his fashion sense isn't as bad because he looks like an English gentleman. Mr. Lin asks Old Wild if it's something urgent because Old Wild is visiting him in this bad weather. Old Wild then responds by saying the favors that you did for me are much bigger than this bad weather and I want to express my gratitude properly this time. Mr. Lin then says that he is quite satisfied with the last gift he receives from Old Wild, asking what kind of a precious item did he bring today and that maybe Mr. Lin will not accept it if it's too valuable. Old Wild thinks that Mr. Lin is being really kind once again to him and that Gargoyle is nothing compared to this present he's about to give to Mr. Lin. But still Mr. Lin is so modest and cares about Old Wild's feelings. Because of his help, there is only one step between me and the breakthrough to the indescribable level. Old Wild thinks. That's why only this gift I spent two years on is where the two years of kindness is shown to me, Old Wild thinks again. Then in order to make Mr. Lin accept his gift, Old Wild says no need to hesitate. It's not that important to me, but it might serve you better and if you don't accept it, I'll feel terrible. Mr. Lin says that Old Wild is exaggerating a little bit and that he didn't help him that much. Anyways, I still don't know what you've prepared so let me have a look first, Mr. Lin says. Old Wild tells Mr. Lin that he was working on this present for the last two years and he hopes Mr. Lin will like it. Then puts the present on the table. When Mr. Lin looks at it, he asks if this is a dream catcher and then thinks to himself, I didn't expect Old Wild would give me something like this. How nostalgic. Then he remembers his past. While he was still living on earth, there was this one time when he learned about dream catchers. They are a cultural symbol of American Indians. American Indians believe that the night air is filled with dreams and only a dream catcher can filter out the nightmares and capture the pleasant dreams. The elder also explained to Mr. Lin that the beings of a dream catcher are the strength and intelligence gathered from a sleeper and that they can bolster the communications between men and the spirits. Mr. Lin tells Old Wild that he didn't expect he'd see a dream catcher here. Old Wild calls Mr. Lin very well versed because he knew about dream catchers. Then Old Wild thinks to himself that this dream catcher is a magical tool, but what makes it special is a powerful dream that it contains. Mr. Lin realizes that the quality of this dream catcher is really really high, so this means it has been clearly made by hand alone. The Recent storms outside were making Mr. Lin sleep quite poor and this was a perfect gift for him right now. He tells Old Wild that this is just what he needed and thanks him very very much. Old Wild tells Mr. Lin that it's his honor to present him with such a valuable gift. 
and as the old wild is leaving the bookshop, he is thinking to himself that the dream contained inside of this dream catcher is a pleasant dream second to none, but it also contains a terrible danger. Without the willpower of an indescribable level, it will immediately crush one's soul. But to a powerful individual like Mr. Lin, it must be a rare enjoyment and joy. Old Wild leaves the bookstore and says, sweet dreams. We see a big explosion on a building and Kay falling through the air. But before she hits the ground, Chain wraps her around and pulls her to safety. Those are Max's chains and he just saved her life. Max then tells her that she needs to be careful in this battle because he didn't expect that their enemy would have mages fighting for them. Now we can see a mage speaking in a strange and a magical tongue and casting a spell from his staff trying to attack Miss G. She notices a huge snake rushing at her with the intent to eat her alive. Miss G jumps back while the snake is still chasing her, but then suddenly a white paw as big as the snake's head stops the snake, and a huge white wolf rips the snake in half. Amazed that someone the snake starts spitting blood and screams, How could this be? How is she maintaining control even while transformed? Helix didn't warn us about this. The other mage then yells that this wolf fears fire, so they shouldn't be worried, just bring nitre and sulfate, but it's raining, the first mage utters. But the second mage says that they can't delay now, she's just panicky level, so it shouldn't be that hard to stop her. We see a terrifying huge white wolf howling beneath the moon, and we can see Kay hovering around, thinking that this is the power that all of the hunters dream about, and maybe Miss G can lead the hunters into a whole new world. Kay then wonders about Mr. Lin, thinking about what kind of a person he is, since he helped Miss G achieve this power. Kay wonders what his goals could be, and Max tells Kay to not worry about that now, that their sole duty at the moment is to follow and share in the glory after they win the battle at hand. Kay agrees with Max and two of them head into battle. Now we see three mages together casting a fire spell from their magical staves, yelling fire spell, living fire. The fire starts emitting from their staves, hitting the great white wolf. Now we can see another building explode close by and the great black wolf coming to rescue. While mages are sending their fire spells on the black wolf now, we see Max and Kay finishing off one of the mages. Then we see a huge fire explosion and Kay and Max scream, Madam! Now we see two mysterious mages from afar commenting on the current battle. One of them is saying in admiration that he didn't expect that there would be someone this powerful in the Nokin region. So powerful that it can maintain control even while in the beast form. And then this mage comments that not even Old Wild can do something like that right now. He then asks another mage if he's seen Old Wild because they've gotten the report saying that he was seen on the 23rd street. But the other mage responds that he didn't see Old Wild yet. The first mage instructs the second one to go and find Old Wild because the second mage is a student of Old Wild. And while he's saying this, a great wolf appears behind him. He quickly turns around and yells, what? Thinking to himself, he got careless and let his guard down, and completely forgot that this wolf possesses the ability to dimensionally travel. But then he also thinks that how did she manage to find his coordinates and then teleport to his current location. He tries to dodge but the great white wolf is too fast and manages to bite his hand and while in immense pain he looks at the second mage seeking help and calls his name in an agonizing scream. Yuan! Yuan then assumes a powerful pose that allows him to cast even more powerful spells and then yells, Vertigo! Flash! The wolf thinks to itself that the language Yuan is using is really refined and advanced and that the spell he is about to release must be powerful and dangerous. Only a skilled black mage is capable of doing something like that. And while the great white wolf was having these thoughts, the first mage grabs its paw in a blink of an eye and throws the wolf on the ground, and then quickly takes out his dagger, wanting to stab the wolf and finish him off. But the wolf's eyes light up and it yells, Will of Steel! And with all of its force, rips the mage's arm clean off. But then it sees a huge purple ball of magic above it and looks at Yuan who utters magic words. Fire spell, son of decay. The wolf gets utterly petrified thinking that this spell is too powerful and dangerous and it has to run away quickly. 
it has to blink away quickly even if her body gets twisted. This is the only chance for her to survive and she actually manages to blink away. We then see Yuan approach the first mage and ask him, Mr. Helix, are you alright? Helix with his arm ripped off answers, I'm fine. He then says that the owner of the bookstore at 23rd street is even more powerful than they thought. Then we hear Mr. Helix's bones cracking as he is casting a spell to regrow his arm back. Yuan then asks Helix is it because she has the power to teleport, to which Helix replies by saying no, I mean she was able to extract Ryan's intel from his soul, accurately pinpoint our location and dispel your mind spells. Helix says that he's way more interested in that kind of power. What they are talking about is that Miss Jin's wolf form is so powerful thanks to Mr. Lin's teachings and that that's why they think Mr. Lin is way more powerful than originally expected. Then Helix orders Yuan to go and find Mr. Lin and tells him that unfortunately Helix says something more urgent right now and he also tells Yuan that finding Mr. Lin is more important than finding old wild out. Then Helix summons a magical egg filled with dark matter and asks Yuan what does he think will hatch from the egg. To which Yuan responds by saying a magical dream beast. Helix then replies by saying no, not at all, it's a god. Now we go back to the library and Mr. Lin and we can see him walking up the stairs towards his bedroom. Thinking to himself that this rain has been falling heavily for a long time now and who knows when will it stop. He says he'll go buy groceries once the weather gets better. He enters his bedroom and hangs the old wild's dream catcher above his head. He thinks to himself that this dream catcher is definitely a handicraft and even if he didn't have actual use of it to make his sleep better, it still looks exquisite, just like the gargoyle he got from old wild as well. Mr. Lin then thinks he needs to thank old wild next time he comes. We can see Mr. Lin tucking in his bed, getting cozy and saying I hope this dream catcher works. Good night and sweet dreams. And as soon as he shuts his eyes and starts sleeping, the dream catcher activates and starts glowing. Now we see Mr. Lin in his dream and it's snowing. He actually thinks to himself, is this my dream? The snow feels like ashes and it's not actually cold, it even feels a bit warm. Mr. Lin thinks that it makes sense though, because he's in a dream after all. Then he stutters for a moment after seeing beautiful scenery in front of him. He sees a giant tree in front of him and thinks that there's no way a tree like this would exist in real life, because of its twisting branches and sky covering crown. It's like its vessels are entangled within its skeleton. As he's looking around he spots a gorgeous elven woman sleeping near the tree. She looks so peaceful and beautiful. At that moment a strange yet familiar melody appeared in Lin's heart. I crown me king of the sweet cold north, with my carpet of needles and my crown of snows. And we see the image of this elven lady with a crown on her head. Mr. Lin utters that this is a spectacular dream, like a beautiful dream from a fairy tale. He says that Old Wild wasn't exaggerating. He picks up a flower with a delicate and fresh smell and after smelling it Mr. Lin thinks to himself that no matter how you look at this, this flower couldn't feel more real. He then thinks that he might be lucid dreaming right now and in a lucid dream a person sleeping retains his consciousness and knows that he is dreaming, thus being able to control the dream and do whatever he pleases. They can even make their sensations the same as in real life. Mr. Lin thinks that the dream catcher must have given him a psychological suggestion and combined with words of old wild, it caused this particular dream. Mr. Lin then thinks that his understanding of this is quite scientific, reasonable and even poetic, once again finding himself awesome. Then he looks at the sleeping elven lady and thinks that if this is his dream, he can do whatever he wants with her, right? He then stops himself thinking that there should be limits even in a dream but he wonders if he is dreaming of such a beauty and remembers that we dream about other people, they aren't so clear and unfamiliar. Then he says that Chinese people like himself usually love women with silver hair and that's why he's probably dreaming of her. At the end of the day, this is just a dream, nothing more, Mr. Lin thinks. And in dreams, anything can happen. He approaches a sleeping elven lady and after seeing her closer, he blushes a bit and thinks that this is definitely a dream and that there is no such perfect beauty in the real world. He then realizes that he can let himself go just a little bit because after all, this is just a dream. He then gives her the flower that he picked up earlier and starts brushing her hair. 
His face is covered in red because of the shyness he feels and he thinks to himself that being this bold with women is really exciting. But it's no big deal since this is just a dream. And just as he thinks that she's not awake, the elven lady opens her eyes, looks at Mr. Lin and stands up. After standing up, Mr. Lin sees how much taller she is and that he didn't expect her to be this tall. But in a dream, anything is possible, he thinks. She looks at Mr. Lin and asks him, Who are you? Mr. Lin thinks to himself that she made the first move and asked him about his name first, and then realizes that people make dreams usually from their own subconsciousness and that this is his opportunity to talk with his subconsciousness. He then finally responds to the elven lady's question, saying, a dreamer, you could say. She tells him that he's inside of a dream right now, and of course he's a dreamer then. Mr. Lin thinks that she's aware they are in a dream and how this mysterious person is full of surprises. He thinks that the projection of his subconsciousness is really intriguing and that this is definitely a dream of his. He then tells the elven lady at least his answer is true and that it's her turn to tell Mr. Lin who she is. But she can't use his answer saying she's a dreamer as well. The elven lady smiles and answers Mr. Lin by saying, Silver, my name is Silver. He then asks her only a name, thinking about her family name, to which she responds by blinking at him and repeating one of his answers, saying, at least my answer is true. She then approaches him a bit. Mr. Lin gets shocked as she says, now it's my turn to ask a question, right? Mr. Lin thinks that he didn't expect her to counterattack like that. He blushes and thinks that this is bad, her smile is deadly too. She then closes her eyes and tells Mr. Lin that she's been here for so long so long that she doesn't even know what time it is. That this place is so beautiful, but it's too quiet. She says it's deathly silent. She asks Mr. Lin if he can help her by telling her why. Why does she feel this way? Mr. Lin thinks to himself, isn't this just loneliness? Wait, can I expand my business in a dream as well? He thinks this dream fits him perfectly. A romantic dream full of beautiful flowers straight out of a fairy tale guiding a beautiful and elegant lady with his exquisite soul healing words and he thinks that helping others is such a relaxing hobby that it gets so addicting that he even dreams about his job. He remembers a saying that goes, helping others always brings happiness. But back to business he thinks, and for business he can't be in his pajamas, he needs to be in his business suit and suddenly his business suit appears on him. He realizes because he's lucid dreaming he can do whatever he wants and even turn his imagination into reality. He then tells Silver, why don't you have a seat? As he offers her his hand, Silver is pleasantly surprised and reaches towards his hands and holds it. What a cold and tender hand. Mr. Lin thinks as he blushes, but anyways, he needs to figure out this situation first. He then asks her if she's always been alone in this dream to which she responds by saying that no one has entered this place before, that no one can. And she tells Mr. Lin that he's the first person ever to enter this place. Mr. Lin thinks of Silver as Rapunzel, always living alone in this garden and that this life is an eternal resting. He thinks that this dream is like a fairy tale. He says to himself that too bad this is just a dream and that even though he understands her problems, he can never actually help her. Then he looks Silver in the eyes and tells her that what she's experiencing is loneliness and that she feels this way because she never had anybody to understand her and talk with her. He tells her that there's no novelty in her life, only pondering and that's what's causing her pain. The more she thinks, the more painful it gets and he tells her that a lot of people have this kind of issue. She then says, pondering is the source of pain? They never understood me because they fear me and that's why they alienate me. Mr. Lin thinks to himself that she's even a philosopher and tells her, there is an old saying, man thinks, God laughs. He says that after seeing the beauty Silver has, even the God would smile with a great big smile. She blushes as Mr. Lin continues speaking, saying that maybe pondering will no longer cause her pain if she remembers God while doing it. Silver continues to blush and tells him that he sounds like a romanticist for thinking like that. And Mr. Lin admits that he definitely is one. 
He tells her that there is a reason he's talking to her right now and that he can understand her. She responds by saying that this is true. If he can appear in this dream, he already understands her and that they are on the same level. She then tells Mr. Lin that he's probably even greater thinker than her, to which Mr. Lin blushes, thinking if this is the way philosophers compliment each other. Mr. Lin tells her that since she's approved of him, he has a favor to ask of her and tells her that he hopes she will accept it because this is his most sincere wish. As he grabs her hand and she gets shocked and blushes even more, he asks her if she will be his friend. She gets surprised and says, Huh? I mean, who wouldn't get surprised? He just saw the most beautiful girl in the creation and he just friendzone her? Mr. Lin is a Chad. Now back to story. Mr. Lin thinks that he needs to take the initiative because isolated people like Silver might reject other people subconsciously, so he has to do it in a way she can't refuse. A friend? She asks him. He tells her yes, a friend, and that even though this place is beautiful, it's never changing with the same scenery always, and that she'll get bored of it. But if they are friends, they can share everyday trivial stories which can destroy the boredom and make life more interesting. Mr. Lin's business sense turns on and even while in a dream, he thinks about recommending books to people who need soul healing and he uses the power of his imagination and being in a dream to summon a book he thinks would be a perfect fit for Silver in this situation. He then offers her this book and tells her that this is a gift from a friend to another friend. She tells him that she hasn't received gifts in so long and that nobody has talked to her. She says she doesn't have anything but this tree, its fruit and flowers and honey. She tells Mr. Lee that he can take any of these that he wants, that that's a gift from her to him. After looking up, Mr. Lin realizes that this tree has golden fruit and that they are of no use to him at all, but if it's a thank you gift, he will gladly take one. He then asks Silver if he can eat this fruit raw, to which she responds with yes and gives him a golden apple. Mr. Lin admires the beauty of the apple and goes for a bite. Hmm, crispy and sweet, he thinks, and it doesn't even have a core. It tastes similar to a normal apple, he thinks. Silver asks him if he likes the apple and Mr. Lin says that it's quite sweet. At that moment, the reality starts breaking around them. Does this mean I'm waking up? Mr. Lin thinks. And so soon, he feels as if he hasn't been here for long, but he can't be certain judging from an experience in a dream. He tells Silver that even though he doesn't want to go, he has to go now. And as a dream is shattering around him, she jumps towards him and hugs him. Then she bites his ear a little bit and tells him that she hopes that when the next night comes they can meet in this dream again. And the dream shatters. Now we see a major fourth with Mr. Helix against Miss G smoking a cigarette on a rainy street. He thinks to himself that choosing Helix might have been a wrong move, but it was better than choosing others. And it's not a big deal for him to betray his teacher because he already did that in the past. He betrayed his teacher and slain his teacher's students. Then we see a voice asking him what is so special about this mission that it needed him personally to handle it despite his current injuries. He then answers by saying that Lady G became much much stronger not long ago and even with his and Helix's combined strength they could barely hold against her. And then he remembers old Wild suffering a fatal injury, so he's probably not able to fight right now and is hiding somewhere to preserve his pride. Then the voice tells this mage that old Wild has reappeared again and was seen on a bookstore in the 23rd street. And this mage comments that both old Wild and Miss G were seen in that bookstore, so he thinks that the bookstore has something to do with their increase in power. Then the mage asks this voice that he was just talking to if he remembers his mission. And the voice answers that yes, it remembers. Its mission is to investigate the bookstore and the owner, to see how he looks like and try to understand how powerful he is. The mage then sends this mysterious person away, telling him that he hopes he will return with good news. He then thinks to himself that Old Wild reappeared again after becoming stronger, and that sounds terrifying to him, so he hopes the intel about this is wrong. 
Now we can see the mysterious man that the mage just sent off reaching the bookstore on 23rd street, entering and thinking to himself that it's a little bit weird because there isn't any magical reaction at all. Now we can also see that this man possesses some kind of shadow magic, so he's able to turn into shadows to move around. He then says that according to his senses, this is just a normal bookstore and thinks that maybe the higher ups have been mistaken about the information about it. And he thinks this is passing near the gargoyle that all while gave to Mr. Lin. He decides to go to the second floor and we can see Gargoyle's eyes light up but then it goes back to sleep, probably because it didn't feel any murderous intent, but we're still not sure. He then comes in front of the bedroom where Mr. Lin is sleeping right now and thinks to himself that he still didn't check this place and he feels an aura of life coming from this room. But the aura seems of a normal human, it doesn't seem like a powerful mutant. He then says that he was worried for no reason and that this mission is surprisingly simple. That Mr. Yuan, his master and mage, was worrying too much. But of course, what would a poor bookstore even have? A monster, this guy thinks. Maybe I should deal with this storekeeper while I'm here and report back. He then thinks about the report saying you've been worrying about a normal person all of this time and don't worry I've already dealt with him. How funny that would be. And as he opens the door and looks into Mr. Lin's bedroom, he gets absolutely shocked and terrified. He sees Mr. Lin sleeping peacefully, surrounded by bloody red vines all around him. This guy is completely confused and doesn't understand what's going on. But he realizes that this is some powerful magic. And at that moment the vines charge at him, attack him and take his eye out. His eye falls down on the floor as he tries to escape the room. He actually manages to escape the room and after closing the doors he starts going crazy saying Oh crack, I, I, I should, I, I should, I should remove all the threats, the Lord's existence. My Lord, your servant is here, eager to serve. As we see his face covered in tears, his eyes missing, and blood spilling out of his eye socket. Now we go back to Mr. Yuan thinking to himself that it's already been half an hour since this man has left to spy and saying knowing his efficiency he's taking a lot of time with this kind of non-violent mission. So Yuan thinks that this bookstore is really not that simple. Maybe he should have asked somebody else to go check it out. But the situation isn't too bad he thinks. Even if something happened John should have no problem escaping with his abilities, Yuan thinks. Because John, the man that went to spy on Mr. Lin, has the ability to turn into shadow really really quickly, to walk around and maneuver around, so he can escape many many dangerous threats that way. Especially because he can blend with other shadows and hide his aura to infiltrate or escape if needed. Yuan throws a cigarette to the ground, thinking to himself that maybe after John comes back, he'll have to do the mission himself. But then he gets surprised because he sees a shadow. How can I still have a shadow? I've already extinguished my cigarette. Yuan thinks. He then casts a fire spell blaze, lighting up his cigarette box on fire and causing a big fiery explosion above him to light up this entire place to check on the shadow. He then thinks that it's really bad for him because the rain has reduced the power of his fire spell significantly. So he needs to pull back. He doesn't understand why John betrayed him, but right now he just has to die. So he has a fire spell, Scorched Earth. And then we can see John actually emerging from shadows trying to ambush Yuan. He attacks Yuan with his shadowy blast wave magic and actually manages to hit Yuan in his broken arm. Yuan is impaled to the wall, screams in agonizing pain and lets out an agonizing roar, which causes a fire explosion to burst out of him. As his arm is completely mangled, he manages to break free and tells John that he knows more about betrayals than him and asks him if John really thought Yuan wouldn't be prepared. How naive and foolish of John. He then makes John light up in flames, telling him it's over and trying to finish him off for good. And after finishing him off, we can see John's heart still beating on the ground and Yuan gets surprised because he doesn't understand what's going on. He screams, what? As the powerful beast emerges from the heart and charges at Yuan. And he's screaming, you're not John. Who are you? My lord, your servant will clear obstacles for you. The beast responds to Yuan. 
You are surprised, says Lord. John isn't some church disciple. Could this be the bookstore owner? This is his warning, Ewan thinks. Now we go back to Mr. Helix's headquarters, where he gets report from one of his subordinates that Mr. Yuan is dead. Helix is surprised, asking what happened, and the subordinate explains the situation, telling that there are photos and magic forensic analysis of the scene. He says they got this report from the black mages of the Scarlet Cult, and after looking at the photo, Helix is utterly surprised. He reads the report that says that Mr. Yuan sent someone to investigate the bookstore on the 23rd Street, as per his orders, and on the photo he can see the mangled body of Yuan, surrounded by the same red bloody vines that are around Mr. Lin as he's sleeping right now. The report states that the person Yuan sent to investigate the bookstore betrayed him and killed him when he returned. And this photo shows Mr. Yuan's final moments where just before he died wrote run using his own blood. So these were basically his last words to Helix. Helix then thinks that unknown creature hijacked and manipulated John's mind making him betray Yuan and kill him after coming back. And even the black mages couldn't identify this creature. Then he asks his subordinate what are the black mages planning to do next and what is their next step. The subordinate explains that black mages are collecting the evidence back to Scarlet Cult headquarters. They will analyze the evidence and see what's going on here. But that they also suggested that any investigation of the bookstore needs to be abandoned in order to guarantee the hatching of the spawn of the magic mirror from the egg we saw earlier. Helix agrees with the order saying that he will cooperate as best as he can. And after his subordinate leaves, Helix wonders if this is a warning from the bookstore owner. He thinks that he's even more powerful than they imagined and they didn't expect him to be so brutal. But this is a critical moment for the hatching of the magic mirror spawn, so he can't have any complications. So no matter what kind of a creature the bookstore owner is, the egg is so close to hatching that Helix says that he won't allow anything to interfere with his plans. Now we go back to Mr. Lin who's finally waking up from his dream. He looks happy and thinks he needs to thank Old Wild because he gave him the dream catcher because dream catcher caused him to have the most beautiful dream ever which also resulted in Mr. Lin having the best night of his sleep. He then remembers the elven lady and hopes he will be able to meet her tonight when he goes back to sleep. As he goes to the bathroom to brush his teeth he realizes that something is not quite right. When he opens his mouth to check, he sees that he has 8 more teeth. He then thinks that the demon that helped him come to this other world maybe thinks this is a good thing and he caused this. And from a Buddhist point of view, having 40 teeth is a blessing because they believe that Buddha had 40 teeth. Mr. Lin doesn't understand why would Inky do something like this and Inky is the name of the demon given to him by Mr. Lin. So he doesn't understand why Inky would do something like this, but Mr. Lin thinks to himself that he will ask Inky when they meet again. Then he opens up his store excitingly because he hopes he will have new customers today. But then Mr. Lin realizes that he doesn't hear the news and his neighbor usually blasts the news on high volume around this time of day. So Mr. Lin doesn't understand why is he quiet today. Did he get sick maybe or there is a chipped fuse again? Mr. Lin decides to check on his neighbor and knocks on the wall, asking him if everything is okay. The neighbor is completely scared and screams, Ah! Mr. Lin, confused, asks the neighbor if there is something wrong. The neighbor, still covered in fear, thinks to himself that in the movies the characters who get exposed for doing something weird all die in the end. So he screams to Mr. Lin, It's, it's fine! You, you want the TV? I'm, I'm turning it on right now. I'm really sorry. I'm switching it on right now. And as he turns the TV on, we can see the demon fly out of the screen. Then we go back to Mr. Lin, who's standing on the other side of the wall, listening to the news, and he hears that an accident happened today. And Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this weather has been causing a lot of accidents for many other people. Maybe he's worrying too much as well. But his neighbor does sound a little bit scared. So Mr. Lin asks him if his body is fine and tells him that he should rest if he wants to have a better life. Of course another misunderstanding happens and neighbor takes this as a threat thinking Mr. Lin is trying to tell him if he doesn't obey his command he will die. The neighbor gets so scared that his eyes literally become complete tears and he thinks to himself that he's still too young and he doesn't want to die. 
So he thinks Mr. Lin realized that the neighbor wanted to call for a priest to do an exorcism, but maybe it's not a smart idea to send a message now. And Mr. Lin calls for the neighbor again and he gets so startled that he accidentally sends the message and bursts into tears thinking it's all over for him now. Since the message is already sent, it's too late now for regrets, the neighbor thinks, and he hopes that the father of the church of the Dong will be able to exorcise the demon and help the neighbor. He then answers Mr. Lin while huffing and puffing, saying, I'm, I'm fine. There's no need to worry. Thanks for caring. Mr. Lin then says, okay, I'll leave you be, but he still thinks to himself that there is something wrong with the neighbor, and he thinks that maybe he needs to buy him a gift to cheer him up. And at that moment, we can hear the doorbell of the bookshelf ring, as Mr. Lin puts on a happy face, turns around and says, welcome, as he gets happy because he got a new customer today. And we get to see that the new customer is Knight's Joseph's daughter. Mr. Lin thinks to himself that he has a new and energetic and young customer today, while well, the girl wonders if this is the bookstore mentioned in father's documents. She looks at Mr. Lin in a confused way as he asks her if there's anything she needs. She looks around the bookstore and gets a little bit disappointed because everything looks so normal. She doesn't understand why was this bookstore classified as class I secret. As she leans on the table, she asks if Mr. Lin is the owner of the bookstore, which she of course confirms and tells her if she has any questions, she can ask him anything. If she wants to borrow a book, purchase a book, or just look through and see what kind of books there are in the bookstore. But she isn't impressed and thinks that maybe her father made a mistake. Then she gets even more disappointed because she thinks that she risks getting scolded by her father to see this normal man in the normal bookstore. This isn't fun at all, she thinks. Then she finally starts talking and asks Mr. Lin if she can actually really have anything she wants from the bookstore. Mr. Lin gets a little bit surprised and thinks that kids these days are way too spoiled. And he tells her as long as her demands are in the borders of normal, she can have anything. If her demands are outrageous, of course she can't have it. She slams her hand on the table, looks at Mr. Lin in a mean way and tells him that she wants to have an arm wrestle with him. Is that too much, she asks. Mr. Lin gets surprised as never before, as he thinks, if I offer a normal person to browse books, read books, borrow books, or buy books, would they really choose arm wrestling? He doesn't understand the situation as it makes no sense, but his life instincts tell him that there is something wrong here. He then thinks that she washed her boots in the muddle outside of the bookstore, so she doesn't bring the dirt in. So she is well-mannered. She also has beautiful thick red hair, so she must be from a rich family as well. And after she saw me, Mr. Lin thinks, she looked a little bit disappointed as well, so she had some intentions to come to the bookstore and not just to get out of the rain. But all of these thoughts are making Mr. Lin even more confused. Why would a girl like this come to his bookstore and ask to arm wrestle him? He then thinks that his bookstore isn't that popular, so how did a young girl like her hear about it? Maybe some of his old customers recommended the bookstore to her. He then tries to remember his old customers and try to find a connection between one of them and the girl. Then he thinks to himself that this girl strikes an amazing resemblance to Joseph. Yes, yes, she must be blood related to Joseph in some way, Mr. Lin thinks. And while he's thinking all of this, the girl actually gets a little bit uneasy and scared thinking to herself, what's with this strange intense pressure that's coming from him? And she asks him what's wrong, arm wrestle shouldn't be too unreasonable, right? Then Mr. Lin realizes that he's been staring at her for too long and maybe she got uncomfortable. So he says, no, arm wrestling isn't a problem, but I first want to ask you some questions. She tells Mr. Lin what questions and his first question is, are you here because of Joseph? And she loses her mind. She gets absolutely scared, yelling, how did you know? Then Mr. Lin gets a little bit more easy, thinking to himself he got it right, so he pours her some tea and tells her the two of them look quite similar. Now from being scared, she gets angry because she looks similar to her father, so she asks Mr. Lin how, how do I look like him? After seeing her reaction and attitude, Mr. Lin thinks that Joseph and she must be father and daughter. Then he asks her why does she want to arm wrestle him. She then explains that her father told her that if something is bothering her, which she can't resolve because of some other restrictions, she needs to find someone to arm wrestle. 
Miss Selina a bit disappointed asks her why arm wrestle specifically and she explains that her father told her that this kind of a game can make the opponent look weak if he refuses and even if he refuses you can still make him play. And also you'll have a reason to beat them up if they get angry and make a move. Mr. Lin is quite intrigued and a little bit disappointed thinking to himself is this really how Joseph raises his kids. And then Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this is really a military attitude and mindset and he can't expect a retired soldier with PTSD to act any differently. He then agrees to arm wrestle with her asking what's the rules of the game and she tells who wins two rounds first wins the game. And then Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this means that this kid must have had some argument with Joseph and wanted something to vent her frustrations on and that something is him. So he gets really angry and takes back what he said about her good manners. He thinks that he needs to correct this kind of behavior, apologizes in his head to Joseph saying he won't pull his punches against his daughter and that this is for her own good. After they grab each other's hands... The girl thinks that this feels like a normal adult man's strength. Is this guy really a class I? She thinks that she doesn't feel anybody in arm wrestling except his father and maybe she needs to go easy on this ordinary person so she doesn't hurt his arm on accident. She then starts a countdown. 3, 2, 1 and as she utters one, Mr. Lin flops her hand on the table. She gets completely surprised not understanding what's going on as she yells, how is this possible? She still can't wrap her head around how is this possible and how did she just lose arm wrestling to a normal guy with normal strength. After looking at him, she sees Mr. Lin is getting all worked up, thinking to himself that he is really really good at arm wrestling. But the girl thinks to herself that she could beat 10 people at once that have the strength that he has now when she was 6 years old. So she still doesn't understand how did she lose the arm wrestle. Mr. Lin then compliments her strength saying that for a young girl that she is right now she possesses a lot of strength. And he then tells her that at the beginning of their arm wrestle he struggled a little bit and they were in a stalemate, right? This makes her completely angry thinking to herself, yeah right, stalemate, that took no time at all, he won so easily and he's being sarcastic, this guy is awful. But Mr. Lin is a little bit confused because he was genuinely apologizing to her. And then she thinks to herself that as a knight she needs to protect her dignity and she will not accept losing like this. She then yells at Mr. Lin saying whoever wins twice wins. This time I'll definitely win. Come on again as her face gets completely angry and furious almost turning to a monster how angry she is. Mr. Lin now gets a little bit scared thinking to himself what's going on with this kid. Is this really going to be arm wrestling? Why does it feel like she's going to eat me alive? He then answers, okay, again, and they grab their hands. They start the countdown. Three, two, one, go. Then she starts using all of her force. Her face is all tightened up, her muscles working, her arm is shaking. Who's going to win? Mr. Lin thinks to himself like father, like daughter. But seeing a feeble girl like this struggling is quite likable. Then with the most casual face at no effort at all, Mr. Lin slams her hand down again. She starts crying and saying it's over, it's all over. To which Mr. Lin responds, huh? It isn't that bad. Now now, it was just arm wrestling. Is winning that important? And she gets completely surprised by his statement. He then pokes her head and tells her that if they were fighting with knives, she would be dead now and she needs to pick her fights wisely. She then starts crying even more calling Mr. Lin a meanie. And Mr. Lin thinks to himself that he needs to make her feel small so she doesn't grow up into some delinquent who's gonna cause more trouble for herself and other people around her. So he thinks to himself that he'll do a good deed and save this kid. Then he tells her that he met her demands. Now can she tell him why did she come to the bookstore? And she answers with a sad face saying to borrow a book. Mr. Lin's eyes immediately turn to dollar signs as he tells her that she should have mentioned this earlier and asks her what kind of a book she would like to borrow. She's interested in a book that her father borrowed earlier since she started reading it already but couldn't finish it because her father interrupted her and she was scared to read this book in front of him. 
She then thinks to herself that she should have just borrowed this book from the start and never arm wrestle Mr. Lin because maybe he won't lend it to her now. Mr. Lin thinks that she's maybe scared of her father, judging by the way she's talking about him. And he thinks that this book was probably a reason which caused their recent conflict to occur. He tells the girl that he has the book and asks her why she doesn't talk to Joseph first. And she says that if Joseph found out that she knew he was reading, he would be furious. That's why she can't ask him for his book. Mr. Lin disagrees with her, saying that if she shows some understanding, he will probably not get furious at her for asking to read this book. She answers in a shaky voice, almost ready to cry, that her father never understood her to begin with, that every time she shows good results in practice, he scolds her, saying that she didn't do well enough and she must do better. Comparing his daughter to himself when he was her age, she says that no matter how hard she tries, she never gets his approval. Mr. Lin thinks that the problem here is that she has bad grades and tells her that he'll give her books which will make her impress her dad after studying them. Mr. Lin thinks that the problem is that Joseph is a workaholic father who didn't pay much attention to his daughter's school life. Causing her grades to drop and since he's a retired soldier he doesn't know how to express it properly and does it in a way people in the army would do, nagging her to move forward but in the eyes of his daughter she sees it completely differently. Mr. Lin thinks that it's hard being a parent but that this book is perfect for a situation like this one. As the old saying goes, if the child is misbehaving it usually means it's not studying enough. Mr. Lin then starts piling up books he thinks would prove useful to this girl and he slams four books on the table as she asks, what are those? He then tells her that they are for impressing Joseph, while she thinks to herself that something like this is impossible because she was training all her life but never got complimented at all, because everybody around her expects so much from her being Joseph's daughter. She gets a sad look in her eyes thinking that even Joseph always says that when he was her age he was already panicky level. Mr. Lin then explains that no matter what, her father only wishes for her to grow and as long as she lives an honorable life he'll be happy with her, even if he doesn't say it. The girl is confused because Mr. Lin acts as if he knows her father so well, but he does sound convincing she thinks, and asks Mr. Lin that if she studies these books she'll get stronger and impress her father. And then she gets curious, thinking what kind of a book would those be then? Bodybuilding techniques or secret mana skills? Mr. Lin misunderstands again, thinking she doesn't mean literal power, but more like knowledge is power, and tells her that if she wants power, as long as she can bear the pain of studying, these books will be the key that opens the doors towards the power. Now as we know, the books he recommends are normal books, but in this world, characters that get books from Mr. Lin get supernatural books designed to empower their souls and the book this girl sees is titled Key of the Void Origins. She feels the power coming from the book and as she opens it she finds herself in front of a huge magical door. She gets shocked but starts to open the door and on the other side she starts floating as her body is slowly vanishing away. While well, she remembers the words of Mr. Lin that she needs to bear the pain if she wants to unlock this power. She then realizes that the world is deconstructing and reforming in front of her right now and she suddenly closes the book while being utterly terrified of it. Lightning strikes outside as she's completely covered in cold sweat, asking herself if she just died right now and came back to life. She then understands that the material that forms her soul has been replaced by other sources. She wants to know more about it. She thinks that it's the skeleton key that can unlock every door and that as a knight she can use it to obtain the full power of a knight, without any obstacles and bottlenecks. Is this the indescribable level she thinks? Is this how it feels? Never in her wildest dreams she thought a power like this could exist, but Mr. Lin easily passed the limitations and created a new version of her. She gets terrified of Mr. Lin, thinking to herself that he is a demon incarnate. While these thoughts are racing through her mind, Mr. Lin is just casually standing there, thinking that maybe he needs to offer her help if she needs it. He tells her that if she has any questions, she can ask him freely. She misunderstands this, thinking that Mr. Lin is talking about some kind of a horrifying demonic thing and that this help will probably bring her an unimaginable pain. 
Mr. Lin then decides to encourage her as he tells her that he feels like she's a very gifted child who deserves a better future. She is still terrified, thinking that if she starts following this path, she will never be able to return. And Mr. Lin then tells her that if she works hard, she can definitely receive the power to change everything, including making your father proud. She exhales in relief, thinking that there is no other choice for her now and that she needs to accept this. She thanks Mr. Lin for the books and apologizes for her behavior earlier. Mr. Lin says that it's not a problem at all and that having this attitude is good for her because being humble and curious will help her acquire even more knowledge. She buys the books and leaves the bookstore. She then says, but wait, didn't I just come to borrow some books, not to buy them? Never mind, I need to hurry back home quickly so I can begin studying immediately. We can see an area between dimensions and Miss G traveling in it, thinking to herself that it's too dangerous and she needs to escape quickly. Then we see her regain consciousness while screaming in pain and remembering that she was just fighting with Helix and Yuan and that she barely managed to escape their attacks by teleporting twice, which would usually destroy her body, but luckily she's still in one piece. She then remembers her comrades, realizing that she doesn't know where they are right now, but after looking around the room, she also realizes that she doesn't know where she is right now. We then see another girl enter the room and tell Miss G that she is wounded badly and should stay still. After Miss G looks at this lady, she sees that this is actually an elf and wonders what is an elf doing in Nokin region at a time like this. She then asks the elven girl what happened here, to which she responds by saying she saved Miss Lin and tells her that she herself recently came to live in Nokin, but it was torturous to live here because of all the mana fluctuations going on, which is usually a huge pain for elves. But that wasn't even the strangest part of it all, but as she was walking home, an injured girl appeared in front of her while still unconscious. The elven girl thought that someone was hunting this beautiful girl, and since the elven girl lived close by, she carried Miss G to her house, both to help her, but also because she knew whoever was hunting Miss G would find the elven girl as well since she lived close by. She then explains that it was better to avoid this kind of situation and that it would be best for Miss G to relax now and not worry since nobody can find her now because elves are natural hunters so this girl hid the traces left behind well. Miss G thanks the elven girl and asks her how long she was unconscious and the elf tells her that it's been 5 hours since she brought Miss G to her home but that judging by the freshness of her blood she might have been unconscious conscious for one more hour. Miss G then thinks that she's lucky she didn't lose her life during the last transportation because while exhausted the risk of dying while teleporting is extremely high. But no, it wasn't luck Miss G thinks. It was because Mr. Lin, he made her more powerful both mentally and physically. We can see Mr. Lin sneezing in his library because somebody is talking about him. Miss G then thinks that even though the tainted blood healed her wounds, her body still needs more time to recover, but as soon as she recovers, she needs to finish the battle with Helix, but before that she needs to learn more about this elven girl. Then the elven girl compliments Miss G healing abilities and tells her that she's a remarkable hunter. Miss G thanks her and asks her what brings her to Nokin region, since there's not many elves living here. Then the elven girl introduces herself as Doris, an elf with the pure bloodline and a member of the Iris family, the most ancient and sacred family in the Azir region, and that she came to Nokin region in search of the lost glory of her family. She gets surprised after hearing this because she remembers the stories she used to read about the Iris family when she was little, because this was the most noble elven family in the world. The legend says that their kingdom was destroyed after King Kendala went mad, and after that, some elves signed a contract with the witch to receive a new guardian, and that whenever they needed something from the witch in the future, they would ask her on the first night of May. Miss G remembers that they call these elves spirit animals blessed by the witch. Then Miss G asks Doris if she's here to find this witch, to which Doris replies with yes. Doris then explains that this witch is an ancient mystery because no one has ever seen her true face and that according to legends, 
This witch resides in a dream world covered with snow, a world that only has white irises and a towering tree formed by the skeleton of an ancient dragon. And as she's describing this witch, we actually see that this is Silver, a woman from Mr. Lin's dreams that we mentioned in one of the previous episodes. Misty is surprised because she knows that nobody knows anything about Silver, only that she's the original witch and because she thought this was just a myth and didn't expect this to be real at all. Then she tells Doris that there's no way this witch would live in a dream world in the Knockin region because the Truth Society's magical surveillance system covers the entire region. Doris says that she doesn't understand it either but that the great sage said, the great lady Silver, who can control snow, will descend from the dream world to the city of steel, Knockin, and care for the people favored by the stars. Miss then asks Doris on how long she's planning to stay in Nokin because it's a dangerous place for an elf to live in and tells Doris that she must have felt something wrong here. To which Doris responds by saying, You mean this rain? It isn't a big deal. Miss G tells her that that's not what she's talking about and then Miss G thinks that she meant that what's wrong here is that the spawn of the magic mirror has the power to manipulate minds of other people and can also create a powerful dream beast. But Miss G thinks it's best to keep this a secret from Doris for now. She then tells Doris that it would be for the best to lay low for a couple of days because it's dangerous outside. And Doris asks her why is she warning her because Miss G is the one who is in more danger right now. Miss G explains that she is a hunter who hunts dream beasts and protects innocent people. Doris then gets really excited and tells Miss G she reminds her of predecessors and that this is exactly what being a hunter is all about. Miss G realizes that maybe Doris was also and both of them get interrupted by the burning smell from the kitchen where the food Doris was cooking caught on fire. She then serves Miss G with a plate of fresh lamb soup and after tasting it and seeing how delicious it is, Miss G slurps all of it immediately. Doris then asks Miss G if she can help her find Silver, at least by providing some clues. Miss G said she'd gladly help Doris, but that the current situation that she's in is dangerous and thus she can't be of much help. But she instructs Doris to visit a guy named Mr. Lin, who works in a bookstore on 23rd Street. He can definitely give you the answer you are looking for, Miss G says, without even realizing how right she is because Mr. Lin personally met with this witch in his dream last night. Now Doris asks about Mr. Lin and Miss G says that he's a powerful individual she sworn loyalty to and that his power level is indescribable. Doris then asks Miss G why is Mr. Lin not in the mutant list of the Nokin region since there is every single mutant who lives here on that list. Miss G says she understands Doris' concerns, but she has to trust Miss G because she's talking from her personal experiences. He's the reason why Miss G got more powerful, and we can see Mr. Lin sneeze again because somebody is talking about him again. How cute. As Doris admires Miss G's firm belief, Miss G tells Doris that Mr. Lin gave her all of this as she takes her shirt off. Doris gets surprised because she sees no wounds on Miss G and she should have at least some because a couple of hours ago when Doris found her, Miss G was near death. Doris tells Miss G she believes her about Mr. Lin and Miss G continues complimenting Mr. Lin saying that the power he gave her was trivial for him. Doris then says that she'll definitely visit this bookstore after the rain stops and get to know more about this Mr. Lin. As Miss G is headed to the bathroom, she thinks that she needs to contact her comrades, but she also needs to rest to regain her strength as quickly as possible. While diving in a nice and hot bath, Miss G thinks how kind Doris is. Then we get to see Doris in her kitchen with an ominous face, thinking to herself that besides original witches, nobody is omniscient and that if somebody claims he is, he is a liar. And if their lack of skills causes their customers to be disappointed and retaliate, that is their own fault. Now as the page ends, we can see a mutilated body of a man and a goat in Doris' basement as she says, All right, I should deal with the food waste. Meaning that the soup that Miss G ate was not a fresh lamb soup, but a soup from this mutilated body gruesome. Now we go back to Mr. Helix who's asking his subordinate about a spy who's gone missing 
and the subordinate just says that they've confirmed that Hound Parker, the abnormal hunter, is indeed actually missing. Helix getting visibly irritated then asks about the location where Hound Barker went missing and about the news from the people of the Scarlet Cult, to which his subordinate just responds by saying they don't know. Helix quickly grabs this poor guy by the throat and lifts him up, his face completely angry and shaded as he asks what do you mean they don't know. He gets furious and starts yelling at this guy, saying that this situation is really serious, to which this subordinate responds while barely breathing. These tracks have been erased completely, not even magical forensics can deduce what's going on, that's, that's why. Helix throws him on the ground, still yelling at him ordering him to continue the investigation no matter how many of their people die. The main focus is to find her. He then asks about Charles and if he's better, and this subordinate finally with some good news answers that Charles has awoken since Yuan managed to preserve his corpse in perfect condition. Priest Murphy was able to revive Charles and even manipulate his memories, giving him memories that suitable to their cause. Helix then grins because he finally got some good news. He then remembers that Rat Ryan reported a while ago that Charles was Old Wild's favorite disciple, and that's even the reason Yuan killed him after betraying Old Wild. Helix wonders about the reaction Old Wild will have after seeing his student return back from the dead wanting to kill Old Wild because of the manipulated memories he have. Helix hopes that he will be able to provide the energy needed for hatching the spawn of the magic mirror. Now we see a man with a huge magical staff walking on snowy mountains towards the skeleton of a giant dragon. After reaching the skeleton he starts yelling saying, My teacher, the most ancient king of words, the black emperor, the dragon tongue, the last descendant of the giants, giant king slayer Augustus. My name is Wild, and I come to call upon an audience with you. Please, bless this pupil with power and bear witness to my great work. Then Wild gets surprised after hearing a voice that claims that there is no need for magic, and the voice says that it yet has to decay to stone. We can see purple energy shooting all around, and a giant hand appeared, slamming the skull of a dragon right next to young Wild. Then we can see he summoned the giant king of mages, who greets young Wild and asks why did he come here. Wild then summons the gargoyle that we see he gives to Mr. Lin in the future and asks giant mage king to take a look. This giant mage king brings the tip of his finger next to the gargoyle and starts scanning it with his magic eye, and then complimenting young Wild for this work because this gargoyle is near perfect. The giant mage king then tells young Wild that his journey is done and that he successfully graduated. Young Wild is completely happy because from this moment forward he is an independent black mage. Young Wild says that this is a great honor and thanks the giant mage king. Mage king warns him to not forget his destiny and wishes him the best of luck as young Wild is leaving. Now we go back to present and see Old Wild remembering all of this, thinking to himself that he didn't quite understand these words, especially since he was ecstatic after graduating to an independent black mage. He remembers that he tried to act as a black mage in every way possible, being powerful and mysterious. But now when he thinks about it, he understands that it was that arrogance that led to that chain of events. Now Old Wild remembers a different event from his past, this time when he visited an orphanage to adopt a child. As the man working in the orphanage is speaking and thanking Old Wild for deciding to adopt, Old Wild points to a child sitting in a corner, sad and lonely, and then asks for the name of this kid. By the way, this kid looks exactly like that one frame of Levi from Attack on Titan when he was a skinny hungry kid. Tell me down in the comments below if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, back to the story. The caretaker at the orphanage explains that this boy arrived recently and still doesn't have a name. And just then, Old Wild approaches this boy and introduces himself. He also mentioned that he is a black mage and offers this boy two choices. Choice 1. Stay here and die. Choice 2. 
come with old wild. Caretaker gets angry and the boy starts crying, saying that he doesn't want to die and begs Old Wild to take him away. Old Wild says he will take the boy, wrap his coat around him and tells him that from this day forward he will be Old Wild's disciple. Then Old Wild gives him a name and tells him that his name is Charles. And yeah, Charles is the guy from earlier that was revived after dying that was Old Wild's favorite disciple. The boy is a bit confused at first, but then gets happy and says, Okay, master. Old Wild then thinks to himself that black mages pass their knowledge with language, and that's why the relationship between a master and disciple is oftentimes more closer than one with family members. He also remembers that later on he took another disciple whose name was Yuan, and Old Wild remembers how he thought that protecting these two boys would be no problem for him because of how powerful Old Wild was. Then he remembers the moment Charles died, his body completely gone, only his right arm remaining. Old Wild found and killed off all the black mages who took Charles' life, but he never could find his body and soul, and without those two it would never be possible to revive him. Old Wild thought he lost Charles forever. Then Old Wild gasps as he wakes up and thinks to himself that it's rather unusual for him to dream about his teacher and disciple. Then wonders if his teacher, Giant Mage King, actually foresaw that Old Wild will receive Mr. Lin's help and gift Mr. Lin with the gargoyle statue. He then regrets not having more wisdom to save Charles' life but hopes that Charles is still maybe alive somewhere and that he managed to escape through cracks of the dream world. I can't dwell on the past, Old Wild thinks. It's pathetic. A miracle isn't going to happen. And just then, someone knocks on Old Wild's door, surprising him. Old Wild asks who's there, realizing nobody except him and Charles know about this hiding place. Then outside in the rain, we see a robed boy saying, Teacher, it's me. I'm back. It's me, Charles. Are you there? Charles explains that the black mage that tried to kill him threw him into a crack of the dream world, but that the crack wasn't too deep and just now he managed to escape. Charles continues speaking saying, Are you not there? I'm waiting for you here. It's just like back in that orphanage. How you came back to me back then. I... I don't want to die. Please, take me away. The chair and Charles faints. Old Wild opens the door, standing in disbelief as he looks at this boy and says, Charles? Now we go back to Mr. Lin in his bookshop and he's checking his teeth, wondering what's wrong with him since he feels that something's not quite right, but he can't precisely understand what. While looking at himself in the mirror, he thinks that he still looks the same, but that this behavior is becoming more and more like a motivational speaker. So much so that he says if he wore a robe of a priest, people would confess on the spot. Maybe it's all because of the eight new teeth that he has, he thinks, because in Buddhism, it is believed that Buddha possessed 32 marks that made him special, and one of those marks was that he had 40 teeth. And these teeth symbolize the soft way Buddha had while speaking to other people, and having 40 teeth is the symbol of a perfect man. But that's not possible, Mr. Lin thinks, because he's just a simple bookstore clerk. He can't be a perfect man like that. So yet again he thinks to himself that he will ask Inky, the demon that he made a pact with, because Mr. Lin's guess is that Inky caused him to have 40 teeth. Then we can hear a bell ringing and somebody knocking on the door, even though it's so early that Mr. Lin hasn't even opened his shop yet, plus the weather being as bad as it is. He wonders who would come at this early hour, and as he opens the door with a curious look on his face, he sees Old Wild soaking wet, looking a little bit sad as well. Old Wild apologizes for causing Mr. Lin troubles this early in the morning and Mr. Lin asks him what's the matter and is there any problems because he came so early, saying that if Mr. Lin was still sleeping, Old Wild would have frozen outside waiting for him to wake up and open the bookstore. Mr. Lin also tells Old Wild he needs to be more careful at his age because he could get into an accident more easily as well. 
Then Mr. Lin thinks to himself that it's a bit strange that Old Wild is visiting him so often recently. And not because he's having problems with his research, it seems. What could it be, Mr. Lin wonders. Maybe something urgent happened in his life. Mr. Lin then pours some hot tea for Old Wild and offers him a cup saying let's first get a bit warm and then we'll speak. As Old Wild expresses gratitude, Mr. Lin realizes that Old Wild probably won't borrow any books today, so Mr. Lin decides to use this chance to build rapport with Old Wild and starts telling him a short story of the farmer and the snake. Old Wild says that he didn't hear the story before and Mr. Lin says that even though it's a simple story, it's definitely a classic. He then begins the story. During a cold winter, a snake was frozen at the side of the road and was about to die. And it was then that a passing farmer found the frozen snake and out of pity put the snake close to his chest to warm it. And using the warmth of the farmer's heart, the snake is fully recovered. And the first thing it did was bite the farmer's chest out of instinct and the farmer died soon after. The End it's a simple fable, Mr. Lin comments, but it has a deeper philosophical meaning. So he asks Old Wild who is at fault in this story, the farmer or the snake. Because this story isn't about fairness, because even after the farmer helped the snake, he died in the end. So is his own ignorance a reason that he died, or was it the snake's cruelty? Old Wild gets completely surprised, thinking that Mr. Lin immediately realized why he came and told him this story as a warning. The lightning strikes outside while Old Wild says that neither were to blame, the farmer tried to be kind, and the snake? Snake just followed its instinct. Mr. Lin says that he thinks Old Wild's opinion is sensible and objective, but at the end, the point of view dictates who is at fault in this story. Because if you put yourself in the farmer's shoes, how would you feel then? Mr. Lin asks Old Wild. Old Wild, shocked yet again by Mr. Lin's words, answers that he would probably feel regret. And Mr. Lin tells him he needs to have more certainty in his voice. And says that the biggest regret definitely is that the farmer didn't understand the snake's character sooner. And that having blind kindness is never good, because there are a lot of bad people in the world who would use it and abuse it. So you should always be wary of those people and don't trust them easily. Because if other people don't have hearts and will try to abuse you when they get the chance, they won't even appreciate your kindness and will only take it for granted. Old Wild then draws similarities between Mr. Lin's words and his own life. Thinking that if someone doesn't have a heart, he's already dead, and that his Charles is already dead as well. Mr. Lin smirks and asks Old Wild if he understands the point Mr. Lin is making, and Old Wild confidently answers, yes. Mr. Lin is happy now because he was able to make Old Wild more relaxed now with this short fable, and since the atmosphere is more relaxed and casual now, Mr. Lin needs to figure out what's the problem that Old Wild is having in his life right now. Analyzing the situation and thinking that this matter is so big that he came to Mr. Lin to ask for a helpful advice, and for an old man like himself, there can only be one issue that's this big, and that's his family. Then Mr. Lin remembers that Old Wild mentioned before that he has two adopted sons, one which left abroad for work and lost contact and the other one who tried to find his real parents and had a fallout with Wilde and that's why Old Wilde doesn't even want to talk about him. The second one should not return, Mr. Lin thinks. So the problem must be the first adopted son. Then Mr. Lin asks Old Wilde about Charles, to which Wilde responds by saying that yes. Charles has returned, and Mr. Lin says, if that's the case, I can understand your situation completely. Now, another misunderstanding is in the making here, because Mr. Lin thinks that Charles returned back to get inheritance from Old Wild, because Old Wild is quite old, so Charles probably thinks he'll die soon, and has come back for Wild's money. Then Mr. Lin tells Old Wild that the Charles that returned now is not the perfect Charles which Old Wild remembers, saying that people who suddenly return and start talking and acting nice to their family members are usually there to get something in return. 
Mr. Lin thinks that even though old Wilde would wish that this is his old Charles and that he didn't change at all, is it really him though? Now, imagine what's going through the mind of old Wilde. His hand is shaking while he's holding his cup of tea and continues to listen to Mr. Lin, who tells him that even though this might sound a bit cruel, old Wilde, do you really want to become like that farmer? Do you really want to show your soft side to a cold-hearted snake? Old Wilde thinks that Mr. Lin is definitely right and that Old Wild was just lying to himself about this Charles that has returned, wanting him to be the old Charles but it's obviously not. He remembers his recent interactions with Charles, where Charles showed no respect towards Old Wild, and Old Wild thinks that he was just remembering Old Charles because he has beautiful memories about him, so much so that he trapped himself in this situation with new Charles and he wasn't even able to tell the difference between what's real and what's not. He missed his Charles so much that he allowed himself to be fooled now by the new Charles, and thanks to Mr. Lin, Old Wild finally knows what he needs to do. Old Wild thinks to himself that he needs to kill the fake new Charles once and for all, and all those who are using his decaying body as well. Old Wild starts crying and saying that he just wanted to stay with him a bit longer, but that it's time to wake up from his dream. As he prepares to leave the bookstore and thanks Mr. Lin, Mr. Lin tells him that he trusts in Old Wild's decision and tells him if he changes his mind, he might regret it more down the line. Then Mr. Lin again thinks to himself that even though it's hurtful, people who try to scam old people for money need to be exposed, and as Old Wild's friend, it's Mr. Lin's duty to offer him guidance. As Old Wild leaves the bookstore, he tells Mr. Lin he won't give Charles a second chance, and tells him that soon there will be a gathering where Old Wild would spread Mr. Lin's word, and Mr. Lin says he's looking forward to it. Now we see mind control Charles back in Old Wild's hidden base, thinking that the mission is going smoothly and he'll learn all the Old Wild spells soon. He hears Old Wild at the door and as Charles opens it, Old Wild orders him with a happy face to bring him his sacrificial knife. Charles runs to get the knife as Old Wild tells him he has a very important spell he needs to test right now. As Charles brings the knife to Old Wild, we can see the person controlling him thinking that soon he will learn Wild's very important spell and after learning it, he will use Old Wild's favorite disciple to end Old Wild's life. Just then we see Old Wild stab Charles in the head and while Charles is falling to the ground, with his last breath he looks at Old Wild and Old Wild tells him to rest in peace. Old Wild uses a spell to learn who was controlling Charles and says, So it was you, Murphy. We see the headquarters of the Scarlet Cult, and after going in we see a female mage slash priest praying and doing some kind of blood magic. She then gets shocked and screams Old Wild, how is this possible? So we learn that this is actually Murphy who was controlling Old Wild's adopted son with this blood magic. Then we see a huge explosion happening, blowing up everything around it. Scarlet cult members rush in to see what's going on as they get completely surprised not understanding how something like this happens. Lady Murphy is missing, and the entire Scarlet prayer hall was destroyed. We can see Murphy emerging from the rubble, bloodied up and barely surviving. She says that she's okay since she's still alive, and her subordinates ask her what caused this huge explosion. The reason for the explosion is because it got interrupted by Old Wild, she thinks, but she never expected that the explosion would be so big. Then we see a special artifact known as the Coffin of Eternal Rest, which is a powerful tool with unimaginable power to bring the dead back to life. That's why it's forbidden and dangerous to use. Then we see a conversation between Yuan and Murphy that happened not so long in the past, where he suggests that they use this artifact to bring Charles back to life, control him and use him to get closer to Old Wild. Murphy is surprised that Old Wild's second best disciple would betray Old Wild like that to which Yuan responds by saying he's not Old Wild's student anymore, to which Murphy responds that this is not a matter she needs to get involved in, saying that Yuan killed Charles out of jealousy and ran away, this is all between him and Wild, then asks Yuan why would she make an enemy from Old Wild who's a destructive black mage. 
Yuan gets shocked because he didn't expect this but tells her that the spawn of the magic mirror feeds on life force, and that even though Old Wild's power level is that of destructive, he was still defeated by Knight Joseph, making him more weak now, and that even Charles is his weak point, so he shouldn't be as big of a threat as he was before. Murphy gets surprised as Yuan continues explaining that Old Wild's life force would be perfect to feed to the spawn of the magic mirror, and Murphy thinks to herself that Yuan is right and that this powerful life force of a destructive level mage would be perfect for the spawn, and that Yuan is right about Old Wild being weaker now, and that's why he's in hiding and waiting to recover, so Murphy agrees to follow Yuan's plan. And now we go back to present where she's thinking that everything was going perfectly according to plan until now, and doesn't understand why would Old Wild after leaving Charles's side for half an hour return and kill his favorite disciple and adopt it soon so mercilessly. Murphy gets angry because she doesn't understand what happened during this half an hour time period, which made Old Wild so cold. Then she starts casting purple magic spell, and yells the name of the spell, Coffin of Eternal Slumber, Secret Doctrine, Blood Revival, as we see her suck up life force from couple of her subordinates into herself, thinking that because of the explosion that happened just now, which Old Wild caused, she lost half of her soul, and had to regain it back by take it from these poor subordinates. Now we see another subordinate telling her that Helix, the leader of White Wolf Clan, wants to talk with her. Murphy says she's in a bad mood and doesn't want to talk with him now, to which her subordinate responds by saying that Helix said he knows why she just failed, and as Murphy gets surprised, she tells them to let Helix in. Now we see Helix bowing in honor saying it's nice to finally meet her, and that he came many times before, but that this is the first time she's allowed him to speak to her directly. Murphy tells him to stop being so formal, and asks him how he knows why Murphy's ritual just failed, and why he rushed over here before the things went wrong. He had to know in advance they would go wrong is what Murphy is implying. She then tells him if his reason is not good, she will have no other option but to think he was a part of the reason why she just failed. Helix gets a bit scared thinking that even just talking to a destructive rank person is so fearsome. He apologizes and says that the reason she failed is herself and asks her if she remembers, to which she responds that yes she remembers when John's corpse was possessed by a parasite from Dreamworld who was stronger than panicky level but had a short lifespan, and that why she felt like it poses no threat for her, because it was merely stronger than panicky level, while her power level is destructive. Now what she's talking about here is that shadow spy who infiltrated Mr. Lin's bookstore while Mr. Lin was sleeping and some entity from Old Wild's Dreamcatcher which he gave to Mr. Lin possessed this shadow spy John. Helix then tells her that because of this she stopped investigating the bookstore, and instead focused on the spawn of the magic mirror's commands. But when Old Wild left for half an hour before killing his disciple Charles, he actually went to that very bookstore Murphy stopped investigating. She gets surprised by this, because what caused Wilde to change his heart and finish off his disciple Charles, was the owner of the bookstore. Now we go back to Mr. Lin who is sitting in his bookstore thinking to himself that he didn't get any customers today and that he should use this time to think and analyze the dream he had, with the elven lady named Silver. And just then a bell rings as a new customer is entering the bookstore, so Mr. Lin thinks to himself that this is a bit odd, because there have been so many customers recently he doesn't even have time to read a book but he can't complain because he lives for these moments. He then welcomes the customer and says that if she has any questions she can freely ask. The customer replies by saying, really, any questions? To which Mr. Lin replies by saying as long as they are related to the business then yes, and as he looks at the customer he sees an elven lady, whose name is Doris, girl that saved Miss Gia. Mr. Lin thinks of her as a beautiful and perfect forest elf. He then thinks that this is probably a really well-designed cosplay, as he remembers his days on Earth and all the amazing cosplays he has seen there. He never expected to see such a professional cosplay in the city of Noken, thinking that this cosplay is so good, he even thought she's a real elf for a moment. He then thinks that he's into elven cosplay and no wonder when he had that dream about silver last night, he dreamt of a beautiful elven lady as well. While he's thinking all of this, Doris wonders if this is actually the guy that Miss Gia called omniscient bookstore owner, but he didn't seem surprised after I walked in she thinks, maybe he really knew I was coming, but still, he should have been shocked even a little, but his facial expression shows emotions of nostalgia and appreciation, and not shock or surprise. Doris then uses mana sense to see if there's anything unusual in this bookstore, as she gets surprised realizing Mr. Lin has 40 teeth, thus he can't be a normal human, 
but what is he? Doris thinks as she's unable to realize what kind of a creature Mr. Lin is. Doris even gets a bit scared of Mr. Lin thinking that if he really is omnipotent, maybe the price he paid for gaining such power is to be locked in this bookstore forever, an ancient, unknown being with the appearance of a human and the heart of a long-lived species, who possess a terrifying power. As she completes the mana scan of the bookstore she realizes that the original witch, Lady Silver lives somewhere here, that her dream world is in this bookstore. That means that the powerful witch Silver lives here and has probably blessed Mr. Lin. Doris gets increasingly terrified as she looks at Mr. Lin and thinks he possesses some unimaginable powers. Doris then thinks whether Mr. Lin is the person blessed by stars, a person mentioned in the prophecies of Lady Silver. Doris then thinks that maybe Silver led her to Mr. Lin, and that maybe Silver still hasn't decided whether to re-establish the contract with Doris's family or not. Doris is scared that if she makes a wrong move now her family won't receive the witch's blessing so she decides to be more cautious, as she tells Mr. Lin her name and mentions that Miss Jia recommended this bookstore to her. Saying that Miss Jia talked about Mr. Lin as a god who helped her solve her problems. Mr. Lin gets absolutely surprised by this, because he didn't realize Miss Jia thought so highly of him, he's flattered but thinks this kind of hero worship isn't good for Miss Jia, because all Mr. Lin did was help her get over her ex. He then responds to Doris by saying he's not a god, but a normal bookstore owner, and that Miss Jia over-exaggerated. Doris tells Mr. Lin that he's humble, and says that Doris talked about him with so much admiration, so much so that after learning about Doris's family troubles, she sent her to Mr. Lin to see if he can help Doris. Now Mr. Lin starts thinking, and of course misunderstanding the whole situation, thinking that Miss Jia's family is a noble and rich family, and is probably friends with Doris's family, meaning Doris's family also must be a noble and rich family, which makes sense, since she can afford this high-end expensive cosplay designs. Mr. Lin thinks that the relationship he has built with old customers is finally starting to pay off, since they recommended his bookstore to all the new customers he's been getting lately. He then tells Doris that he understands her situation and asks what's the problem. Now Doris thinks Mr. Lin is a favored person of the original witch, Lady Silver, whose blessing is what Doris is seeking, so she thinks she should take Mr. Lin's help completely. Then she tells Mr. Lin that she comes from an ancient and noble family, but that recently her family has been in decline after losing their faith, thus becoming dreamless wanderers, so what Doris wants is to change the past of her family, and become a blooming family once again. She tells Mr. Lin she hopes he can help her. Change her family's past, Mr. Lin thinks to himself. Mr. Lin's previous profession, before becoming a bookstore owner, was that of a researcher of cultural customs of the world. He would research things like art, mysticism, families, historic books, calendars and so on. And the most important thing in these kinds of researches was the family emblem, which is often passed down by noble families. Maybe her family changed a lot, which caused them to lose their faith and thus not be able to understand the meaning of their family emblem, which resulted in losing their position among other noble families as well. So Mr. Lin thinks that Doris wants him to uncover the meaning of her family's emblem and with that make them more reputable among other noble families. Mr. Lin thinks that he can help her, but it's going to cost her a lot, since this isn't as easy as giving someone life advice. He tells her he understands her problem and can definitely help her but, and as Doris's face lights up with happiness lightning strikes outside, and a new customer enters the bookstore. But the light coming from outside is so bright Mr. Lin can't see a thing, thinking it's a car headlight pointing directly in the bookstore. But Mr. Lin thinks that the bookstore is parallel to the road, so someone has to do it intentionally right now, thinking that this is really rude and that person is probably not friendly. So Mr. Lin wonders if his undocumented identity is finally exposed, meaning that he came to this world but no one knows who he is, and there's no documentation about him in this world. Then we see what Mr. Lin envisions as outside, police cars in front of this bookstore, and police officers making a formation and one of them yelling on a speaker that whoever is in the bookstore, broke the law by entering the city of Nokan illegally, and even faked his identity. Mr. Lin thinks that the situation should NT be that bad, and as he gets up to walk outside, thinking that maybe Inky, his friend Demon will show up, actually Doris gets up first, telling Mr. Lin to wait inside as she deals with these people and afterwards they can continue their discussion. Mr. Lin is a bit surprised because Doris looks more annoyed by this situation than him, but it makes sense, Mr. Lin thinks, 
because he almost said yes to her request, but the people outside interrupted them. Mr. Lin thinks that she can probably see who's outside better than him, and thinks that maybe those are some new costumes who tried to cut in line, thus making Doris so angry. Doris is absolutely furious saying how dare they make a move against this place, such insolence. Mr. Lin then thinks that he must be right and these are other customers who are making Doris nervous because they tried cutting in line, but thinks that as the owner he shouldn't let his customers handle problems between themselves, as he tells Doris that she should let him handle the situation. He thinks he can maybe contact some of his previous customers to help him resolve the situation. Doris says that it's no problem for her to handle the situation, that they outnumber her but that's also no problem, their leader is a bit dangerous and even though she might expose her identity now, it doesn't matter since Mr. Lin agreed to help her with her request. She says that she'll earn Mr. Lin's approval by making people never want to come to the bookstore in such a rude way, and tells Mr. Lin that this will be an honor for her. Mr. Lin misunderstood again, of course, thinking that Doris would find it belittling if he refused her request, so in order to not underestimate her again now, he tells her that he understands and will let her deal with the situation. Doris nods in approval and starts walking towards the exist of the bookstore, while thinking to herself that Mr. Lin probably wanted to talk to Lady Silver to bless her family, but when these people arrived, Mr. Lin said that a new customer is here, and after telling Doris to deal with the situation, it means that he wants Doris to deal with them to prove her resolve. After going outside she uses her magic vision and finds the source of this light, which wasn't in front of the store, but high up in the sky. Then we can see mages floating up, and amongst them their leader, Murphy, flying with her powerful artifact, Coffin of Eternal Rest. Then one of her subordinates warns her that the secret instrument tower is heading their way to stop them, that they will try to delay them but can only do it for about 10 minutes. Murphy says in an ominous tone that she has completed her spell Nova Death Ray and tells them to prepare the teleport spell because Nova Death Ray will obliterate everything in its path, and that even Old Wild in his prime would barely survive. She then starts screaming that she doesn't care what kind of a bookstore owner he is, this is his final warning, and that whoever interferes with her plans in the future, this is the outcome that awaits them. As she starts manically laughing we can see Doris thinking that black mages are all completely crazy, because the Nova Death Ray spell is of destructive level, and if it gets released the entire area will get destroyed. But Doris thinks that Mr. Lin is testing her confidence, because even though Nova Death Ray has been has, Mr. Lin was still composed, meaning that this spell probably must be trivial to him. Doris gathers her confidence up, saying that she will definitely pass this test, in order for her family to receive Lady Silver's blessing once again. Now we get to learn more about Murphy's past, we find out that she was a priestess who lived her life in complete devotion to God, praying every day of her life, and deciding that she will do so for the rest of her life until one day a kind priest who was working in the church of plague with her for a long time now, completely lost his mind and assaulted Murphy while she was praying. She couldn't understand why this kind man suddenly started behaving like a wild beast, and why would he do something like this to her, and the only thing she could do in this situation was to offer more prayers. And as she clasped her hands together and said, please save me, this priest that assaulted her had suddenly died. Her face got covered with his blood and as she was getting up she was thinking why was she saved, she couldn't understand it at all. The only thing that she knew was that there was an artifact in front of her, which appeared from the statue that she prayed to every day, and that this artifact fulfilled her wish, and saved her, so naturally she thought that this artifact was her special tool given to her by her god. This artifact was the coffin of eternal slumber, a powerful tool that had both spells of resurrection and death and all of these spells were destructive level. Murphy used this artifact to create her own cult, which was known as the Scarlet Cult and with the help of this artifact her own power increased as well, becoming a black mage of destructive level. Over the time her personality changed as well, from that of a humble priestess, to the one of a tyrannical ruler. She thought she was chosen by God and that other humans around her were unworthy. Now we go back to the present where we can see Murphy completely pissed thinking that she will destroy this bookstore and its owner, because he interfered with her plans. She will have to use 80% of her total power and mana to cast Nova Death Ray, but it will be worth it, because she will teach this bookstore owner a lesson he will never forget. As she lifts her hand up to send the Death Ray to the bookstore, she thinks to herself that only indescribables can hope to survive this powerful spell, but that Mr. Lin is not on the list of indescribables of the Noken region. 
Then we can see her fire this powerful spell. Nova Death Ray at the bookstore. The sky completely covered in red as the ray flies toward Mr. Lin's bookstore and Murphy's subordinate get absolutely amazed by the power of a high-level black mage. As the death ray is traveling towards the bookstore and destroying all other buildings in its path, Doris comes out of the bookstore, which causes Murphy to get surprised not understanding what is an elf doing here. Then we can see Doris conjuring a wooden staff, which is known as the Staff of the Sage, which makes Murphy scared because she realized that Doris is a member of the Iris family. Doris slams her staff on the ground asking Lady Silver to bless her family, and then lifts it up, as we can see trees sprouting all around her, and she yells, Upon my authority as the elven sage, I command the forest spirits to protect this place. Then a huge tree quickly grows in front of Doris, blocking Nova Death Ray, which scares Murphy's followers, and Murphy as well, because she realized that Doris is also a mage of destructive level. Then we see the tree completely blocking Nova Death Ray, as Doris chants a prayer which causes the tree to start levitating. My lady is covered in frost, she holds a longbow and hunts on the endless plains, Milady, please grant me your light, and point me towards my prey and I will return your generosity with a victory. As we see a wooden longbow appear in Doris's hands, and she yells that she prophesizes that her arrow will cut off my opponent's path of retreat. We see an amazing picture of Doris holding a nature longbow, with a magical arrow made of a giant flower and emanating light. She fires the arrow towards Murphy who is completely scared at this point but realizes that Doris is aiming the teleportation gates that Murphy's subordinates prepared for their escape. Her subordinates scream that they won't make it in time as the arrow lands and destroys their means of escape. As Murphy's subordinates mangled body parts are falling around her she thinks that she never expected Doris to target the portal and she realizes that Doris and she are of the similar power but that the secret instrument tower's forces are about to arrive to try and stop her. She then goes completely crazy yelling and screaming that Doris forced her hand, as she summons a coffin of eternal slumber behind her and tells her subordinates she will use their souls as fuel to power up the coffin, which they actually agree upon saying that it will be an honor. We can see the coffin sucking up their souls and out of a dream beast emerges. Shantak is the name of the dream beast. She then yells that the coffin of eternal slumber can even revive dead dream beasts and subdue them to Murphy's command. She then rides the dream beast towards Doris while she continues to yell that she will kill Doris and afterwards that bookstore owner. However Doris remains unfazed calling Murphy uncultured and uncouth, and that will be the reason that she will day, Doris says. Murphy doesn't understand what she's on about, as Doris says she'll understand in a couple of moments, as she casts a spell transient foresight, dispel. She then tells Doris that her family was originally protected by the witch who ruled the dream world, and you think you can stop them by using a dream beast? However Murphy continues her charge thinking that Doris is bluffing. Doris calls Murphy foolish saying that she doesn't understand anything about dream beasts, and then she summons her own dream beast, Nightgaunt, which leaves both Murphy and her dream beast completely mortified. As the Nightgaunt grabs Murphy and her dream beast, before crushing them and ending them for good, Doris utters that nothing is certain, unless the prophet says so. Then we see Mr. Lin in his bookstore thinking that an earthquake is happening outside because everything is shaking so much. He tries looking through the window but can't see anything because it's so dark outside, but he hopes that the young elven lady is fine. As Doris enters the bookstore again, Mr. Lin realizes that the car lights are off, meaning that the discussion went well, he thinks. Doris then apologizes because it took her a bit longer than expected, but says that the problem has been resolved. She asks Mr. Lin if he wasn't disturbed and asks him to continue their conversation. Mr. Lin thinks that Doris's face is a bit pale and her clothes didn't even get wet, so it didn't take much effort for her to persuade the other customer not to cut in line, as expected from a noble family member, he thinks. He then tells no problem, the rain was pouring so I couldn't hear anything inside anyway and Doris thinks that it wasn't the rain but her silencing spell which she used so Lady Silver's favorite person doesn't get disturbed at all. She also used a spell to block all of the incoming attacks as well, and thinks that it's impossible that Mr. Lin doesn't know this, but he still says it was all rain. Maybe there's a hidden meaning in these words, Doris thinks, a riddle. As she tried to understand the deeper meaning of these words she thinks that maybe the battle of two destructive level mages is but a raindrop in the ocean for Mr. Lin and that even the sound of the battle was so insignificant to him. She wonders if that's really how the world looks like for all powerful beings. 
Dora still isn't sure whether the consequences of this battle just now will be good or bad, but it will be up to fate to decide that, and then she tells Mr. Lin that she's glad he wasn't disturbed at all. He thanks Doris and tells that the weather in Noken has been increasingly worse lately, but that it brought him many customers and that's a positive side of it. He says even though he gets more customers he'd prefer the life as it was before, sunny weather, with fewer customers, meaning he can spend more time reading and relaxing. He then says that he hopes this terrible weather will soon come to an end, and that if everyone worked together it would definitely help as well. Yet another misunderstanding is occurring here, as Doris thinks that what Mr. Lin is implying is that everything is under his control, and that he was not being serious when he said he misses his peaceful life, thinking that everything that happened so far in Noken was because Mr. Lin willed so, because he was bored. Doris then thinks that Mr. Lin has a strange personality which causes shock in people, and as she's thinking this, Mr. Lin notices her being slightly uncomfortable and thinks it's because she was out on the rain talking to customers trying to cut in line, and instead of offering her a cup of tea, he's babbling about bad weather. He then asks her to change the topic of their conversation and offers her some tea. Doris still a bit shocked thinks to herself that she has to behave well and not anger Mr. Lin because the future of her family is in his hands, and as she sips the tea, she falls in the state of ecstasy because of how delicious and well-made this tea is, reminding her of nature and she realizes that this kind of tea is not usual tea noken humans make and thinks that this kind of tea was specifically prepared for elves. As expected of Lady Silver's favorite person, of course someone like that would pay attention to details, while we get to learn that Mr. Lin made a simple green tea. She then continues to admire Mr. Lin thinking that the battle of two destructive mages didn't faze him so much, that he could have even made tea for her, how relaxed he was. She then thanks him for the tea and asks him to continue where they left off before she went out to fight with Murphy. Mr. Lin tells her he can definitely help her but that it will be a difficult and longer process. He will do what he can but mostly the success of this operation would rely on her. He then thinks to himself that he needs to show how difficult this task is, so he can charge more after he helps her. He then plans on what exactly to do, thinking that it will be difficult to restore the reputation of her family because there must be no mistakes in the process, and that everyone working on restoring the family's reputation must be 100% focused and if she can't find people who are willing to focus this much, it's best to completely do it herself. Then Mr. Lin remembers a book he wrote that could help them in this situation, the book titled Signs and Symbolism. He then offers this book to Doris telling her to read it carefully and that it will help her regain the glory of her family, which is definitely not an easy task to accomplish. Now yet again, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, Mr. Lin offers his customers normal books, but in this world the books they receive are powerful and contain hidden knowledge that usually unlocks their powers even more and the same happens in Doris's case as well. As soon as she touched the book, from her perspective, she got teleported to a place that she doesn't recognize at first, but then realizes that she's inside of a dream world fracture. She then sees dream beasts all around her, of such a powerful level that she can't even begin to imagine how to summon them. As one of those beasts reaches towards Doris, she thinks that definitely she'll die now, but then sees some magical barrier which is keeping the beasts imprisoned. Could it be, she thinks to herself as she looks behind her, and then suddenly closes the book, returning back to the bookstore utterly petrified. She then realizes that this book is all about dream beasts, their powers and their worlds, and caused a strong and unpleasant feeling of uncertainty in her, also known as the premonition state, which completely goes against every prophet's common sense. Mr. Lin then tells her that she will benefit greatly from this book, and that this book will help her immensely to deal with the task at hand and tells her that he won't explain anything now to avoid causing problems. And then he thinks to himself that this book is great for a beginner like her, and that after reading a little bit of it she can ask more relevant questions in the future. Doris says she understands and will definitely thoroughly read and understand the book as well. She then thinks that it takes prophets centuries to enter into the premonition state, and it took her hundreds of years to receive a clue about Lady Silver, and even then it was a simple and confusing prophecy. However, thanks to this book she instantly entered into a premonition state, and she thinks that this book poses a vast and terrifying amount of power in just the symbol on the cover of the book. How much more knowledge can the entire book like this poses, not just this book, but the entire bookstore Mr. Lin has at his disposal. Mr. Lin then tells Doris that it would be for the best that everyone in her family reads and studies this book, 
so they can all understand how to return their family to its former glory. And that way Mr. Lin won't have to waste time saving them all from the brink of death, he's speaking metaphorically here, but of course Doris understands him literally. He then tells her he has plenty of other customers and thus his time is limited. She gets a bit disappointed and shocked after hearing this, but Mr. Lin thinks he's using a business strategy to make her feel like he's a busy man, so he can increase his prices even more after he helps her. Then Doris says she'll buy all the copies of this book so everyone in her family can study it carefully. They will do their best to follow Mr. Lin's command. Mr. Lin then gets a big confused thinking that it feels as if she understands him, but also doesn't at the same time, thinking that something doesn't feel quite right. Is he finally catching on to all the misunderstanding happening, we'll see. And then he thinks that there's no need to dwell on this thought any further, that he has to help his customer. So no, he's still not catching on. He packs 30 copies in the box which makes Doris confused even more, because how can a book this powerful have 30 copies and be sold normally like any other book? She thinks that Mr. Lin's power must be incredible since this is all so normal to him. He also gives her his green tea as a gift, saying she seemed to really like the taste. And tells her if she wants more she is always welcome to visit him. Doris blushes a little bit and express her gratitude saying that if the Iris family regains their former glory, they will act as Mr. Lin's lapdog. Mr. Lin finds this a bit over the top as well. He does not understand why all of these people feel so grateful towards him, so much so that they call him a god, or say that they will be his lapdogs, when most of the time all he ever does is lend them books and gives them some small helpful advice. But what can you do Mr. Lin thinks as he says goodbye to Doris as she is leaving his bookstore. We can see ruins and rubbles in front of the bookstore from a fight that happened between Doris and Murphy in the previous episode, and the Truth Society, which is basically the police of this world, at the scene investigating to find out what happened. Then we see Knight Joseph who is completely pissed while looking at the scene, because there has been so much destruction that they didn't prevent because they were too late. His subordinate Claudie, who was pointed to me as a boy and not a girl, is telling Joseph that they shouldn't wander around the area carelessly because the Truth Society forensic team is currently doing research in the area. Knight Joseph gets even more pissed and starts yelling and screaming now, which of course, startles Claudie as always. Joseph is screaming how the Truth Society let a destructive black mage do whatever it wants to the place, and that they should be ashamed of themselves for not preventing this sort of damage on time, calling this the biggest joke of his life. We then see a couple of guys working in forensics, and one of them getting angry at Joseph, wanting to throw a stone at him, while the other one calms him down saying that former Radiant Knight Joseph was always short-tempered like this, and that he needs to get used to it, and actually study the rock as well since it was evidence of the battle, so he can't throw it at Joseph anyway. Two of them get frozen in fear when they realize that Joseph is behind them, but he calmly tells them that they should cooperate since this is the fastest way to figure out what has happened here. Claudie then reports that they've gotten reports that the target of the Black Mage's attack was the bookstore, and asks Joseph if they should go in to investigate, but before finishing the sentence gets frozen in fear again when Joseph gives him an angry look and yells no. In a shaky voice Claudie utters that the Truth Society has already went, and Joseph interrupts him again by yelling and ordering to recall them immediately. Now we see another person working in forensics casting a spell called Magical Forensics. Locate mana traces and saying that these black mages are completely insane for using destructive level spells in an area like this, and that prior to this incident the Truth Society didn't detect anything suspicious going on in this area here. Now we get to learn that this guy's name is George Bryan and that he's a 24-year-old scholar working for the Truth Society. He thinks to himself that either the black mages involved in this battle had a way around the surveillance system of the Truth Society, or that there's a mole working in the Truth Society. He then thinks to himself that as a civil servant he shouldn't be working as a forensic on the crime scene and that his specialty has always been logistic support for the alchemy tools. He then looks at the list of deceased, and on the list are a couple of black mages, but more notably, destructive mage Murphy, the leader of the Scarlet Cult. Then he analyzes the situation thinking about what could have happened and he thinks it went something like this. They were probably targeting someone or something that was causing problems with their operations, Maybe the target was the secret instrument tower or even the Truth Society, because Murphy's Scarlet Cult was always in conflict with these two organizations. Even when they worked together they could never find the location of the spawn of the magic mirror, 
which was a primary operation and focus of the Scarlet Cult, to hatch this spawn. None of the members of the Scarlet Cult were caught by the Truth Society before, usually because they would either use teleportation to escape or even if some of them got caught, they would end their lives, just so they don't give out any information. Another reason might be because Murphy was creating so many zombies with Coffin of Eternal Slumber, which are relatively weak, but still cause a lot of trouble, and the target of this retaliation was a group of hunters known as Spider, whose leader Miss G used to work for the White Wolf Clan, and White Wolf Clan and the Scarlet Cult are allies, thus the group of hunters known as Spider was a threat both to White Wolf Clan and Murphy's Scarlet Cult. But what George Bryan doesn't understand is how did Murphy, a destructive level black mage manage to lose her life in this battle, if she has a perfect plan for this battle. George then realizes that this assault had a clear target in mind, a bookstore on 23rd Street, but doesn't understand why they would focus on an ordinary bookstore all of a sudden, when they always battled with the Truth Society in the past. George looks at the bookstore wondering what might its secret be, and then decides to go in to investigate. One of his comrades tries to stop him, due to Knight Joseph's command, but Brian ignores his comrade and heads straight to the bookstore thinking that it's strange how this bookstore looks absolutely normal but it must have some secret power because powerful people always seem to be attracted to it. Just as he reaches out with his hand to open the door of the bookstore, we can see Knight Joseph's hand grabbing Brian's shoulder, telling him to stop and asking what is he doing. Brian tells Joseph that that's a weird question, that he's going in the bookstore to investigate and figure out what happened on this scene, which is immediately outside of the bookstore. Brian continues speaking, saying that the person working in the bookstore is also suspicious and he needs to answer some questions in order to help Brian reach the truth, because naturally, that's the Truth Society's goal here. Knight Joseph warns Brian telling him that it would be best not to do it, to preserve his sanity. Brian gets surprised saying that Joseph shouldn't worry about his sanity, because Brian is a scholar after all, and that truth helps keep his brain sane, not make it go insane. He also tells Joseph that this is a clear insult to his character as a scholar, and with a crazy face continues saying that even though Joseph is a destructive level knight, and a respected senior, he cannot insult a scholar's sanity like this. Joseph gets a slight headache thinking that it's always a hassle to talk to scholars and try to persuade them to do something else than what they've set their mind on. Maybe I should punch him in the stomach, Joseph thinks, but no, I can't because my organization, the Secret Instrument Tower, is still dependent on the Truth Society's alchemy tools, Joseph continues to think. Wow, what a reason. He then thinks about Claudie, thinking that he'll ask him to do it, and we can see Claudie sneezing because someone is thinking about him. Joseph then tells Brian that this bookstore is classified as Class 1, and this completely surprises Brian, because he never expected there would be something in Noken as Class 1. Joseph then explains that the Secret Instrument Tower recently classified this bookstore as such, but just didn't yet update the Truth Society's database. He then tells Brian that the bookstore owner is helping Joseph's tower, and then in a threatening voice, while pointing his finger at Brian says that he thinks the owner of the bookstore wouldn't like being interrogated by Brian, which makes Brian shiver in fear. Then he thinks to himself how the Truth Society almost knows everything in Noken, and that it's a bit strange how they didn't discover something that's class 1 powerful. And that their magic surveillance network was built by the worldly wisdom himself, and as such they shouldn't have missed anything. Joseph then asks Brian if he thinks Joseph is lying saying that just a couple of hours ago a black mage activated a destructive level spell here, and that the Truth Society didn't detect anything regarding this, and that this spell was stopped by the bookstore owner, that even the secret instrument tower managed to reach the crime scene before the Truth Society, telling Brian they should investigate themselves first. And in that moment the bookstore door opens, Brian and Joseph both a bit shocked when they turn around and see who just exited from the bookstore. It was Doris, and while Brian is looking at her he's thinking what would an elf be doing in Noken, while Joseph thinks how he was right, because after meeting Mr. Lin, he thought of him as a noble elf, and if he's getting elven visitors, this confirms Knight Joseph's theory of Mr. Lin. Not only that, but elves usually don't work with humans and that this elf is pure blood, and after leaving the bookstore, she had a respectful facial expression, meaning Mr. Lin can't be a human, no way. Just then Joseph remembers that he still didn't return the book and he should do it, and that the sword Candela could maybe even get a new owner too. Doris looks at Brian and asks him what an ordinary human is doing in front of her master's bookstore. 
This scares and shocks Brian, but being a scholar, he quickly realizes that only the four original witches could be masters to elves, and thinks if this means that this bookstore, which was right in front of the Truth Society's noses, has a dream world in it, with an original witch living inside of that dream world. Doris then says that her master's favorite person, also represents her master's will, and tells that the Truth Society is getting more and more insolent, asking Brian in an ominous tone, is it because her master is so kind, that they are showing this ignorant bravery? She starts emitting a powerful and scary aura around her, with murderous intent, and when zoomed on her face, one can see her completely covered in rage, asking Brian if this is really what makes them glance at her master. Brian completely frozen in fear, so much so he almost started crying, thinking to himself how he shouldn't have ignored Joseph's advice and entered in the class 1 area, and because of this he's now standing face to face with an angry elven prophet of destructive level. He's so scared that even though he's a scholar he can't figure out what to do now, as Joseph steps in saying, my elven lady, please forgive him, he means no offense, saying that Brian only wanted to perform his duty and report what happened in this area here. Joseph then says that her master is so understanding and forgiving he wouldn't mind an ignorant researcher. This calms Doris down a bit, as she starts explaining what has happened here. She tells Joseph that black mages appeared in front of a bookstore all of a sudden, trying to release a powerful destructive level spell called Nova Death Ray on the bookstore, and that she put a stop to it and killed them for trying to do something like this. Joseph thinks to himself that what Doris is saying makes sense, and how Mr. Lin must have done something outrageous to cause such a reaction from the Scarlet Cult to get targeted by them, even when their operation to hatch the spawn of the magic mirror was in its final stages. And that he's so powerful he wouldn't even deal with them himself personally but has sent his subordinate to take care of the business. But also this means that Mr. Lin is on our side, Joseph thinks, and then he asks Doris what's her opinion, why would they target the bookstore? She says that she has no idea that Joseph and his organization should know more than her, because she just recently arrived in Noken as a representative of her family, and all of a sudden there were these violent attacks on the favorite person of her master. She also says that she had no other choice but to defend herself, and to stop them, and that that was Joseph's job and he should be thanking her right now, but instead is interrogating her. Joseph then admits they haven't acted properly and says that the bookstore owner has his utmost respect as well, because he once lent him a book and helped Joseph resolve a problem that was troubling him for a long time, saying that this incident didn't happen today, Joseph would visit Mr. Lin to return the book. Brian, still a bit shaky, thanks Doris for her help and says that he has to go back to report the truth to the Truth Society. Just then he receives a call from the Vice President of the Truth Society, who asks Brian to give his communicator, basically a phone, to the Iris family representative. As Doris takes a phone she hears a voice saying, Doris, it's been 300 years, how have you been? She gets completely surprised as she remembers that she knew Andrew since he was a little boy, who is now a president of the Truth Society. Now we go back 300 years ago, in a village where Doris's family, the Iris family used to live. We can see a couple of young elven girls telling Andrew how they feel sad that he's leaving them, and asking him to stay a bit longer to which we see Andrew responding by saying that unfortunately he has to leave, but that he's thankful to them because he managed to gain a lot of useful knowledge from them, but he has to leave to continue the research for the Truth Society. And even though he doesn't want to leave either, he has no other choice but to go now, and he hopes that they can understand his situation. He then looks at them in a charming way and tells them that no matter how many years go by, he'll always remember their elven beauty. He then strokes a young elven girl's face as he says that it's unfortunate that he can't look at this cute face and admire it whenever he wants, and that if he had the chance, he would definitely have some unforgettable experiences with her, and as he says this this girl loses her mind, blushing like crazy telling him that he shouldn't act like this now, not in front of everyone else, as he pulls her closely to him and hugs her. Then they get interrupted by Doris who shoos them away telling them to stop bothering their guest. As the girls run away, Andrew turns towards Doris, now he being the one who's blushing, greeting her, while she asks him if he is returning home today. He then asks Doris if she has finished another prophecy to which Doris responds by saying that she had a prophecy of great importance regarding her family. This is why it takes time to complete this kind of a big prophecy, but that's not a problem for elves, since they can live close to eternity. She tells Andrew that in order to receive her master's blessing, she has to receive guidance either from her master directly, or from her master's favorite people, 
and that she will try to achieve this no matter how much time it takes. Andrew looks at her confidently and says that he will help her any way he can, by asking the Truth Society for help as well, because everything in this world is relative, and can change, but the truth, the truth will always remain the same. He then tells Doris that in a couple of hundred years he'll become an influential part of the Truth Society, and will always be at her help if she needs him. Doris then pets his head as he loses his mind how much he starts blushing, as she proceeds to say that she appreciates this and that people generally consider elves prideful and as those who don't want to mix and cooperate with other races, but what they don't understand is that because of their long lives, people who they actually respect and admire are even more important to them than would usually be and says that there are not many things worth remembering, while Andrew with a bit of a disappointing face thinks to himself that he knows, that's why she doesn't remember, as Doris interrupts his thoughts by saying that touching his hair feels so nostalgic, and that it reminds her of the last time she touched it when he was just a tiny boy. Andrew screams in embarrassment how that was a long time ago, and she should stop acting like he's a child. Doris laughs saying that if he wants her to see Andrew as something else, he needs to give her a reason to, and tells him that this time she'll store his name deep inside of her memory, until her body fails her, and asks for his name, as young Andrew starts saying his name, we can see a perfect transition from past to present, where Andrew is talking to Doris over the phone where she completes the sentence asking, Andrew? He closes his eyes as he tells her that it has been quite some time, Lady Doris. We then transition to a giant dragon skeleton which is placed in front of an entrance to the headquarters of the Truth Society. Then we go into Vice President Andrew's office and see two people playing chess. One of them comments how it's unexpected for Iris' family to resurface again after losing its former glory. We learn this man's name, and he is Chief of Alchemy, Walter Leonard. Leonard then looks at Andrew and says in a teasing voice that a crush from his youth has came back again, but that Andrew is not young anymore and even though he could have had any woman in his life, he never managed to get the woman of his dreams, especially now, because he's an old man now. The other man playing chess with Leonard teases Leonard saying he should watch his words, or else he might receive a payment cut, saying that even though Andrew is old, he's still the most desirable man among noble ladies in the central district, and this leaves Leonard speechless and jealous. Leonard then comments that after 300 years who knows if that popular guy had had a change of heart or not, to which the other man responds that they should change the topic, and that someone recently took a mission to find and hunt down Old Wild, meaning the Truth Society will need to spend a lot of money in the near future. This other man's name is Raoul Feige, and he's chief of mechanics in the Truth Society. Leonard gets surprised that someone took a bounty mission on Old Wild, especially since nobody cared about Old Wild for hundreds of years now. Leonard yells that Old Wild is dangerous, because he's a black mage of destructive level, and however took this mission must be out of his mind, because he's asking to get himself killed, Raoul answers by saying that Leonard should take his head out of the lab sometimes to keep up with the new events. Raoul continues speaking, saying that it wasn't surprising that nobody took this mission before, because usually taking care of evil in the world is a duty of the secret instrument tower, and also because Old Wild is a destructive level black mage, why would anyone dare to take him on, that's not a radiant knight at the very least. He then says that even Old Wild's biggest nemesis Joseph didn't take this bounty mission. Leonard says how that makes sense since if the mission went south, they would be in trouble without gaining anything, and also saying that if someone is a destructive level knight, they would almost always be rich and not need money from this bounty on Old Wild. And just then we see Knight Joseph sneeze because he is being mentioned. In this world everyone has to sneeze constantly I guess because everybody always has to be mentioned by somebody else, but anyways, back to the story. Then Raoul tells Leonard that his messy research project will be delayed because every department of the Truth Society is currently lacking funds, because of the huge money price on the bounty for Old Wild. Leonard gets angry because Raoul called his research messy, saying that if his research is messy, then his mechanic project would be useless saying that they could have had a choking collar invention by now, if Raoul wasn't trying to figure out how to create a device that will wash your hair while you're hanging upside down, and he also says that no one but the interrogators from the secret instrument tower would buy these tools, and that realistically President should have withdrawn all funding for these mechanic projects. Raoul then says that all of these inventions are made by his subordinate and that he'll relay him the feedback, to which Leonard answers by grumping and saying no need. Leonard then tells Raoul to continue their chess match, and as soon as he looks at the chessboard realizes something is off, 
and tells Raoul that he was trying to distract him so he could cheat to which Raoul awkwardly laughs and says even though Leonard is trying to falsely accuse him, he's still Raoul's best friend. They continue their quarrel but then Raoul tells Leonard that his clay idol is at its final stage, and after acquiring the Philosopher's Stone, he will be able to complete the final stage. And thanks to Lady Doris's help, they located this stone in the coffin of eternal slumber, and claims that this stone from this artifact is way more powerful than anything that Leonard's alchemy could ever produce. Leonard then teases him back by saying, able to complete the final stage, I've heard this excuse one too many times, but that every time someone would hand in a fail report asking for more funds and for the research to continue for longer. Raoul says that's because the philosopher's stones provided by Leonard weren't pure enough, to which Leonard responds that it's clearly because Raoul lacks the required skill. They continue to argue like little kids for a bit more, and then Leonard asks Raoul how actually took the bounty on Old Wild. Raoul says that this time a destructive rank didn't take it, but a petrifying level hunter. Then we transition to a man slaying demons on the streets of Noken, thinking to himself how he lost his target, but is sure it's somewhere near. Just then a huge gargoyle ambushes him, and in one fell swoop this hunter slices the gargoyle in half saying, oh, found you. He then looks at the contract in his hands saying that after he's done with this conraft he will get his destructive rank, and when we zoom in on the contract itself, we see that this is actually a bounty on the old wild. Then we go back to Leonard and Raoul playing chess, while Raoul is talking about this guy saying he's the pale night watcher, Burton Ackerman, come on now, there's no way these guys didn't watch attack on Titan. Raoul explains that Burton wants to use this bounty as his achievement to gain the destructive rank, and that after injecting himself with tainted blood he reached the power of destructive rank while transformed, and that's why they approved of him to take the bounty as well. As they continue talking we can see Andrew interrupting them as he enters the room and asks them what's going on. Leonard then asks Andrew if he dealt with the problem on his end to which Andrew responds that there's no need to worry, but that 300's years have passed so quickly, and how he's an old man now, but Doris is completely the same, not even changing the way she speaks, and says that he feels as if he is in a dream. Raoul thinks to himself that of course she hasn't changed, she's an elf and elves live for eternities. He also doesn't understand why Andrew is so melancholic right now, because he didn't think about Doris at all for the last 300 years while he was with many other women, but he decides to keep quiet in order to not lose funding for his department. Leonard then asks Andrew about the bookstore, and if Doris has really offered her family's servitude to the bookstore's owner. Andrew comments that she didn't offer the servitude to him, but the entity behind him, and shows them the report about the bookstore that was recently sent to them by Joseph's secret instrument tower. He then tells Leonard that the administration has decided to cut his department's funding by 30% next month, and Leonard gets so shocked that he immediately starts crying. Andrew then comments that he never would have thought that there's an indescribable power person in Noken, without being in the Truth Society records, but Knight Joseph himself graded this individual as such, and while he's saying this, Leonard is crying all over the chessboard. He says that Joseph and this bookstore owner are friendly, so there's no need to rush the investigation of him, but that it's still troublesome that someone of this power could exist in Noken without being in the records. Andrew then orders for Burton Ackerman to be sent to this bookstore, since there were reports of Old Wild visiting it as well. Raoul says they need to be more cautious about this, and maybe not send someone to spy on an indescribable level person, to which Andrew responds that their top priority now is the spawn of the magic mirror and that's why letting Ackerman investigate this is the best course of cations right now. He then says that this mission will definitely be dangerous for Ackerman, but that they at least need to know something about this bookstore owner, and his motivations, saying it's not enough to just call him friendly and leave it at that, they need to investigate him for millions of people of Noken who put their trust into the Truth Society. He then comments that the purpose of the Truth Society isn't just finding knowledge, but also preserving peace and order, and that whenever an organization gains too much power, it starts decaying from the inside. Raoul and Leonard, both surprised, comment asking if there's a mole in the Truth Society. Andrew then says that this last incident, and many prior, have shown how the Truth Society is slowly failing, because both the Scarlet Cult, and the White Wolf Clan have managed to elude them many times now, and if they don't handle things better in the near future, they will lose credibility and will fail as an organization. Andrew then comments that he trusts Raoul and Leonard, and hopes that they can develop some system to monitor people inside the Truth Society to find a mole, 
and says that's what President Maria also wants. He also comments that if she wasn't fighting an indescribable level foe right now, she'd be giving orders instead of Andrew. He then says that their first and next step is to send Ackerman to investigate the bookstore, saying that even indescribables can die so there's no reason to fear them, and that only truth is eternal. We then go back to the bookstore and see Mr. Lin tired and sleepy listening to news which talks about the damage that was caused on the 23rd Street last night, but they don't mention the black mages caused it, but say it's the fault of the terrible weather and thunderstrikes. But luckily firefighters arrived on time to stop the fire without spreading any further and causing more damage and casualties. Saying that the 23rd Street Road has been completely destroyed, with ruins on one side, while on the other houses weren't even touched at all. Mr. Lin gets surprised after hearing 23rd Street, because that's where he lives, he then rushes to the doors, and after opening them up, sees the road in front of his house completely devastated, thinking to himself that he only slept for a bit, how could have there been such a huge explosion without him even noticing? He thinks how life can be quite strange. A lady bought 30 books from him, and on the same night a huge explosion happened. Mr. Lin thinks that it's a good thing the explosion stopped just right in front of his door, otherwise his life in this other world would have ended as well. He then remembers the gift Doris gave him before she left, because she couldn't just take his gift without giving him something in return. Mr. Lin gets a bit embarrassed because he didn't give her a gift, but actually sold her books, because that's his job. He then remembers her words about this seed, saying that it's really valuable because it has its own thoughts, and that it feasts on desires. He thinks Doris is quite cute because believes something like this to be true, but he credits her naive thinking to her being young, so it's quite understandable. As he's watering this seedling, he thinks that it will be a nice air purifier once it grows up and that hopefully it will improve the looks and environment of the store. Mr. Lin really hopes it will grow into something nice. As he's watering the plant, on the last page we see a suspicious worm-looking thing under the plant. Now we skip ahead one week from where we left off in the last part, when Mr. Lin was talking about the plant he got from Doris. And we see how this plant has sprouted into a beautiful, rose-like looking flower. As Mr. Lin is thinking to himself how his hard work around the plant is finally paying off, since it's finally blooming, and it looks beautiful as well. He then remembers how every time in the past when he tried to take care of plants, he would always fail and they would die. But also realizes how it's a bit strange for this one to grow so fast in only a week, so something definitely feels odd, especially since there's only one flower on it and roses usually tend to have more. But then he remembers that Doris said this flower is unique, so maybe that's why it's so different from usual roses, he thinks, because it might not even be a rose, because Doris never mentioned it like that. It's probably another type of flower that looks like a rose and is way easier to maintain, since even Mr. Lin managed to do it. He then decides to put the rose on the counter where he works, wishing to show its beauty to his customers as well, especially since this might ease their mood into buying more books as well, Mr. Lin thinks. As Mr. Lin is walking towards the door to open them and start working, he thinks to himself that it's been a bit lonely lately since he didn't have an opportunity to talk with people, and hopes he'll get more customers today who are in need of his soul healing, so Mr. Lin can give them useful advice. We then see some tiny tentacles and even an eye in the middle of the flower. Now we go out of the bookstore and we see a hunter sent by the Truth Society, whose name I honestly don't remember, but whose surname I could never forget, Ackerman, and he's standing in front of a bookstore while smoking a cigarette and thinking how he got a mission to investigate a completely ordinary bookstore. As he looks at the exterior of the bookstore, he doesn't find it appealing for customers, so Ackerman thinks that maybe the bookstore owner never intended to sell books here, and that it looks more like it's not working than it is working. He then uses his special sense of smell to try and detect anything out of the ordinary in the bookstore, and actually smells faint ethers of Old Wild's aura coming from the bookstore. He then realizes that this smell is coming off of the gargoyle Mr. Lin got from Old Wild, but also understands that this gargoyle isn't very powerful, so using it as an entrance guard might be fine, but nothing more than that. 
commenting that if a less skilled mutant came here, it would stand no chance against this gargoyle. Ackerman then thought how the Truth Society was probably right about this bookstore being an area of operation for Old Wild, basically his headquarters, but maybe it's not an HQ base, but rather a temporary hideout, he thinks. After all, it has been reported that Old Wild visited this place only twice. And after taking in all the smells with his nose, he realizes Old Wild's scent is the strongest, meaning he comes to the bookstore more often than other customers, which also might mean that he's going to come back soon, Ackerman thinks. So even though he was assigned to investigate this place, he still might get his chance to slay Old Wild and get promoted. He also thinks that's the reason why the Truth Society still didn't make a move on this place, and also because of all the cases regarding White Wolf Clan and the Scarlet Cult. As Ackerman is rummaging through his bag, he also smells magic and blood from the last battle, but compliments the Truth Society and the Secret Instrument Tower for being able to cover it up so well. And he also concludes that since Murphy is dead, the fate of the Scarlet Cult is also doomed now, as we can see him putting on his normal attire to not look suspicious after going into the bookstore. As he's walking towards the bookstore, he thinks that Murphy must have lost her mind trying to attack this bookstore, that even if the great Elven Sage wasn't here, she would still die to how powerful the bookstore owner seems to be. And he also thinks whether the power of the spawn of the magic mirror is so big that it can actually cause people to go insane like that. He then stops and just looks in the direction of the bookstore, thinking his job is to wait for his target to appear. So as a hunter, he shouldn't be curious about these sorts of things, but how his attributes need to be patience and caution. So even though this bookstore doesn't look like anything out of the ordinary, he still has to stay cautious. After finishing his cigarette, he starts walking towards the bookstore again, thinking how his mission right now is to investigate the bookstore and pretend he's a normal customer. Then the doorbell of the bookstore rings as Mr. Lin gets a new customer, Hunter Ackerman. After entering the bookstore, he immediately realizes that there's no supernatural aura in here and that the bookstore itself also looks quite ordinary and normal besides the gargoyle on the table, which was Old Wild's creation, Ackerman thinks, and also figures out that the gargoyle can detect murderous intent and attack immediately. So basically, if Ackerman doesn't mean to hurt Mr. Lin, he should be completely safe, but also thinks how his disguising skills are pretty good, so good that even another destructive level mutant wouldn't realize he's trying to attack him before Ackerman actually attacks. Now he focuses on the bookstore owner, and even though he looks like a normal person, he's still Old Wild's contact, so Ackerman thinks he needs to be careful around him. As we see Mr. Lin so happy for getting a new customer, greeting him and welcoming him in. He then thinks how he didn't get new customers for a while, and how even though it's sometimes nice to be peaceful and not have to work, he prefers giving people soul healing advice, especially since it usually leads to him selling books. He also thinks how there were a lot of people in front of the bookstore after the explosion, but no one entered, and maybe I need to renovate the bookstore to attract more customers, Mr. Lin thinks. So in order to earn money for this, he can't let go of any new customers that he actually gets. He then tells Ackerman his usual opening lines to new customers. Are you here to read, borrow, or buy any book? If you have any questions, feel free to ask me anything. Ackerman responds by saying that he's just browsing, thinking that this kind of an answer makes him look like a normal customer, and he thinks how good his acting is, so he'll just randomly look around as if he's browsing, so he doesn't look suspicious. And as he's looking around the bookstore, he kinda gets surprised after noticing the rose Mr. Lin got from Doris, thinking how it's a normal rose, quite beautiful, and it doesn't seem to fit in the style of this bookstore. But still, it's a normal rose, as the tiny eye inside of the flower of the rose stares at Ackerman, making him literally frozen. What? I can't move! What's happening? He thinks. 
he then notices that the flower is somehow extracting something from his soul. Is this a trap, he thinks, thinking if he really got caught. But that's impossible, since he didn't detect any magical fluctuations here. His entire body frozen and shivering, as Mr. Lin, without noticing it of course, asks Ackerman if he has any questions. Mr. Lin also tells him to browse however he likes, and Ackerman, now getting more and more scared, thinks to himself, how am I supposed to browse when I can't even move? Thinking how Mr. Lin has seen through his disguise from the start and planned doing this. He also thinks how Mr. Lin's face looks like a happy hunter who just caught his prey in a trap. And that even though at first his warm and pleasant smile might look like it's full of enthusiasm, it's actually full of mocking malice. Ackerman starts thinking of Mr. Lin as someone who's so powerful that even though Ackerman was disguised and pretended to be a normal customer, Mr. Lin immediately realized this and made him frozen and then said to browse however he wants just to mock him and to show him how powerful Mr. Lin actually is. Ackerman thinks how this bookstore owner just wants to see the fear and the helplessness in the eyes of his prey, also thinking how Mr. Lin is being too obvious with this and taunting him by saying to look around even though he clearly knows that Ackerman can't move. Ackerman then thinks how he has never been so humiliated before in his life and that even death would be merciful now, but how this bookstore owner wants to destroy his entire being. Ackerman is completely terrified as he has never been before. We then see the eye from the flower slowly draining something from Ackerman's soul, but even Ackerman doesn't understand what exactly is the eye extracting from him. He is completely confused since his power and consciousness are still here, but he's completely frozen and unable to act. And how this hopelessness and feeling of slowly getting devoured are so terrifying that even if he manages to get back those pieces of his soul that the flower is devouring, he still won't feel complete. What if I stay frozen like this until the moment I die, Ackerman thinks. He slowly starts crying and drooling, thinking about why Mr. Lin just doesn't kill him. At least that would be quicker and less painful. He must be some kind of sadistic devil, Ackerman thinks. He screams for help, but just in his mind, thinking that he will never do something like this again and thinking if anyone can actually save him now. Mr. Lin then looks at Ackerman, a bit confused, again saying, My dear customer, is everything okay? Do you want to ask me something? Didn't you just say you're browsing? And what's confusing Mr. Lin is that even though Ackerman said he's going to browse, he's been standing in one place this entire time looking at the flower. Oh, you think the flower is pretty, Mr. Lin says excitedly. Bros, Mr. Lin is so oblivious that everything can go over his head. Must be really nice and easy in his mind. Now, as Mr. Lin lifts the flower up, Ackerman regains control over his body and is able to move again. He gets a bit more relaxed now, since he managed to survive, thinking if this is how it feels to be flirting with death. All these emotions, anger, helplessness, desperation, the feeling he wanted to scream but didn't even have the strength to do even that. As he looks at the flower again and sees million tiny creepy little eyes and tentacles in it, which makes him more scared again, and he responds to Mr. Lin in a shaky voice saying, <laughs> yeah, the flower is pretty. He then thinks to himself that if he didn't feel this deep inside of his soul, he probably would have thought those were all hallucinations caused by the tainted blood he injected into himself to make himself more powerful. He then thinks about his mission here and his mission to hunt down Old Wild to get promoted and gain destructive rank thinking all of this doesn't matter at all. What matters is that I am alive and how good that feels. As we see his face drooling in a peaceful bliss, we learn that Ackerman has completely lost his will to fight and only wants to sit in a wheelchair and think about what's the meaning of life. Come on man, this character is inspired by Levi Ackerman and they do him dirty like this. Not fair. But then again, maybe Levi would have ended up in the same position after meeting someone as powerful as Mr. Lin. 
You never know. <laughs> you never know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's go back to the story. Mr. Lin thanks Ackerman, saying how he appreciates kind words about the flower and says that the flower feels the same towards him. While we see the eye staring into Ackerman's soul, but Mr. Lin cannot see this eye. Mr. Lin is thinking about all the hard work he put into the flower and how now that customers see it and appreciate it, the work is paying off, thinking that the key to making more money is within tiny details like this, working little by little. He also remembers once again how Miss Doris mentioned that the flower has its own mind, but how Mr. Lin doesn't believe this. But that doesn't mean that every little thing has a soul. And if you care for something, something good will come back to you. For example, here, he can just gain a new customer. He also thinks about how much he actually cares about the flower because he spent many hours over the last week caring for it. And naturally, you grow to like something you take care of. While Mr. Lane is thinking all of this, Ackerman is looking at him completely terrified and confused, not realizing what's going on thinking how Mr. Lin is toying with his prey, but also seems close to that demonic flower, as if this flower's power is like a child compared to an adult when it's compared to Mr. Lin. Ackerman even thinks about how when destructive level black mages worship their dream beasts after summoning them, but Mr. Lin looks at the flower as if it's not powerful at all, let alone not worshipping it. Even destructive level black mages would treat something vile and powerful like this flower with respect, he thinks, and wonders how powerful the owner is when he treats the flower as a little kid. Maybe he's not human, Ackerman thinks, while envisioning a huge demonic force around Mr. Lin. Maybe he's like the flower. On the outside he looks human and timid, but on the inside he contains vast amounts of power, so much that even Ackerman, after trying to detect it, couldn't detect anything. He thinks that Mr. Lin might be so powerful that he is a higher form of existence, probably even above indescribable level. As he quivers, Ackerman comments by saying, I can see you've put a lot of effort into that flower. I'm just telling the truth. He then thinks how the truth society must know what's going on here and they sent Ackerman as a scapegoat intentionally to confirm the situation. He then also remembers Old Wild, thinking there's no way he could use this place for hiding, he probably just comes here to make offerings to this higher being since this place is too dangerous to actually hide here. Ackerman thinks how he needs to use the first chance he gets and leave this place hopefully without anger in Mr. Lin, and then comments saying that it's getting quite late and he doesn't want to bother Mr. Lin, so it's better if he goes, to which Mr. Lin comments back by saying, my dear customer, you look a bit sick. Ackerman is left speechless by how scared he is, as Mr. Lin continues, I can see you're a bit pale, do you want to rest for a bit? I've prepared this chair for relaxing and chatting, so why don't you take a seat? This frightens Ackerman even more because now he thinks Mr. Lin figured out he's trying to escape. Maybe he got mad because I was lying when I complimented the flower. Why is he stopping me anyway? All of these thoughts race through Ackerman's mind. He answers in an even shakier voice now. No, 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 I'm feeling completely fine. Mr. Lin tells him he shouldn't force himself while thinking how stubborn this customer is because he doesn't want to show his weak side in front of other people. So Mr. Lin begins his analysis of his customers. Naturally, a complete misunderstanding of an analysis, but an analysis nonetheless. So he thinks how this person is probably a 9 to 5 worker around 35 years of age, and people like him have a nagging boss and a wife and are approaching midlife years causing midlife crisis and stress, because they want to be young again, but it's not possible. So this type of person is definitely worth swindling, um, steering? Steering, Mr. Lin thinks. So in order to help this customer, Mr. Lin needs to make him a bit more relaxed, as he says, don't worry, just sit down. There isn't anyone else here. No one will know what happened here. 
And what Mr. Lin means by this is that this guy doesn't want to show his weak side in front of other people, but there are no other people here, so no one will know that he relaxed and showed his weak side. But what do you think? How does Ackerman understand this? Then Mr. Lin continues speaking, telling Ackerman to look at him as his old friend, and if there is anything that's on his chest, he should let it out and tell Mr. Lin about it. Mr. Lin makes a scary face accidentally, because in his mind he admires how good he is with his customers, while telling Ackerman, I am great at opening other people's hearts. Ackerman takes this literally, of course, so this has to be a threat. No, not a threat, an intimidation, he thinks. So if he doesn't listen to Mr. Lin, something bad will happen for sure. Can I tell him everything? He thinks while yelling at Mr. Lin. What else could be bothering me, beside the current situation where I got screwed by you because I wanted to ambush Old Wild? Just then, demonic tentacles rush out of Mr. Lin towards Ackerman, completely grabbing him from all sides, as Mr. Lin yells in a demonic voice, Since this is troubling you, let me open up your heart. Then Ackerman snaps back to reality, and we see that all of this is just what he thinks is going to happen if he openly tells Mr. Lin everything, as Mr. Lin is looking at him with a slightly dull and confused face. Mr. Lin then yet again invites Ackerman to have a seat, and all this time Ackerman is completely terrified, thinking how he's being toyed and humiliated. But what can he do besides obey commands of such a powerful creature? He's barely holding back tears as he finally sits on the chair. Mr. Lin is satisfied with this because he thinks this is a first step towards healing the soul of this poor man and thinks how he has to choose his words carefully because a person like Ackerman looks like someone who's very difficult to confide in. Mr. Lin thinks his approach has to be like when you're eating an oyster. You have to carefully open up the hard shell to reach the soft part. So just like the oyster, he needs to choose words carefully to pierce through the hard side and reach the soft side of Ackerman. And while he's thinking this, Ackerman looking at Mr. Lin thinks how Mr. Lin is looking back at him as if he is food Mr. Lin is preparing to eat. So he has to be really careful with his words. And just as he tries to speak, Mr. Lin interrupts him by saying how it's okay even if he doesn't want to talk right away and asks him if this is about pushing himself. This surprises Ackerman since he misunderstands this of course, thinking that Mr. Lin knows Ackerman was trying to get a promotion and receive a destructive rank. But of course such a powerful being would know everything about me. What Ackerman doesn't understand though is if Mr. Lin knows everything why is he just trying to chat with Ackerman? What are his goals? Mr. Linden thinks how this phrase, pushing yourself, can have so many meanings, so it's a good phrase to use when you don't know the situation of a customer, since they will always understand it from their own perspective. Ackerman, now sweating because of how scared he is, decides to tell Mr. Lin the truth, since he probably already knows everything, so there is no point of lying now. And as his sweat drops are hitting the floor, he says, I've given up already. Saying how his organization is using him as a tool, and even though they say their system is fair and truthful, it's actually not, and they are just looking down on people like Ackerman. Mr. Lin says that he understands, which of course he doesn't, because he thinks that Ackerman is being used by his boss because he wanted a promotion and a raise, but his boss didn't allow it, which made Ackerman realize that he's the company's slave. And since he didn't know what to do, he just wandered around the city until accidentally entering Mr. Lin's bookstore. Mr. Lin starts pouring tea for Ackerman, thinking how Ackerman must be slaving away in his company, constantly working and never getting a raise or a promotion. He then offers Ackerman tea and says that he understands his problem and asks Ackerman if he has ever given any thoughts to finding another way, implying working for a different company, but guess what? Another misunderstanding. Ackerman gets completely surprised, 
thinking what could Mr. Lin mean with this and how this is just a normal word but it has awoken some spark in him now. Mr. Lin then says that if you know that you are just a tool they use for their own gain, why do you still put up with it? Is it really worth it? Saying that they also demand so much from him without giving him the respect he deserves. He then tells Ackerman that he can see Ackerman is a smart man, so he should understand what Mr. Lin is talking about. Ackerman actually agrees with this, thinking that of course he isn't okay with this. Now he thinks of the process of becoming a hunter, where you get injected with the blood from a dream beast known as tainted blood, which makes you more powerful, but it corrupts your sanity. You also get the ability to transform into a beast, but with each transformation your sanity is fading more and more. So much so that some hunters have completely lost their minds and became dream beasts themselves and caused a lot of destruction. So from the perspective of the truth society and the secret instrument tower, hunters are a gamble since they can turn into dream beasts any moment, thus becoming enemies, which means that these organizations don't care about their people. But even so, Ackerman thinks how he's honored to be a hunter because he uses his body and soul with tainted blood as weapons, hunting dream beasts and always being in battles to death. He thinks how hunters don't have the spirits of knights or the magical abilities of mages, nor knowledge of scholars, but that doesn't mean hunters are inferior to these other classes. He also thinks how he's already lived 30 years as a hunter and to a mutant this time period is nothing, but for a hunter this is such an old age. He remembers how his tainted blood is from the dream beast known as the Pale Man and that he already has exceeded the limit of this tainted blood and how every time he uses its powers he can feel his sanity slipping away bit by bit. And because of this he has to consume so many pills in order to not completely go insane and become a dream beast. But even those pills aren't as strong as before, because the tainted blood's insanity is always increasing. So in order to avoid this state of insanity, Ackerman has taken Old Wild's case, but didn't expect they would send him to this bookstore and use him as nothing more than a tool. They probably wouldn't respect me even if I got a destructive rank. But where else can I go if I stop following the truth society? He then tells Mr. Lin he did not consider any other choices, because this company has the complete monopoly, so he has to rely on them. Mr. Lin then thinks that he must be working for a really, really big company, so it's probably not worth leaving it maybe, but Mr. Lin then remembers how Ackerman said didn't consider, so there must be something else stopping him. Mr. Lin then asks Ackerman if he really thinks his company is the ultimate authority and is it really impossible to leave them and find something else besides them. He instructs Ackerman to think about his future and future of other people who might fall into the same fate as him and says that he doesn't want to scare him but hopes that he can make the right decision. Ackerman then gets happier, screaming he understands how he needs to find his own path and use his strength to control his future, and how it doesn't matter what these authorities say. Ackerman gets a fire burning inside of him how motivated he has gotten from Mr. Lin's words, thinking how he doesn't need a truth society because as a hunter he can prove himself without the help from others. Mr. Lin first a bit shocked at how invigorated Ackerman has become, but then happy, thinks to himself that he probably wants to start his own business now and take this gamble, telling him that to this company his power alone might not be enough, but that he is not alone and how there are people he can ally with. Mr. Lin tells him to think carefully about this and after thinking it through, Mr. Lin can send him to his previous customer, someone who Mr. Lin would definitely recommend, telling him that he has a customer whose name is Ji Zitsu and that he will introduce them next time. 
Mr. Lin is thinking this because he thinks Ji's father is a rich company man, so he can definitely help Ackerman start his own company. This is part 12 of the story. If you want to know what happens before, you can find previous parts and the playlist in the description if you want to binge watch it. Now, after Mr. Lin recommended to Ackerman how he'll introduce him to Miss G, because Mr. Lin is thinking she can help with Ackerman starting up a new business because she's from a wealthy family, we can see Ackerman actually getting surprised as he's saying, G, isn't she the... To which Mr. Lin responds by saying that yes, she's that young lady. Now Mr. Lin is probably thinking Ackerman knows about Miss G because she's rich, thus probably famous, but what Ackerman really meant is probably something else that we'll find out later because his hand started shaking as he utters, it's really her. I see. He then asks Mr. Lin if this is all part of his plan and if this is what he expects Ackerman to do and Mr. Lin being confident and oblivious as he answers by saying yes exactly. Now we see Ackerman thinking to himself again that Mr. Lin probably set up events long before he just walked into a bookstore in order for Mr. Lin's plan to come to fruition. This makes Ackerman more surprised because he thinks in order to know things like these, you have to be an omniscient being, which Mr. Lin is not, is he? Now we see Mr. Lin admiring his conversation skills and thinking to himself that when you have a customer who's as closed and distanced as the person in front of him, you need to use a lot of vague language in order to guide their thoughts, even if you don't understand their thoughts exactly. So I guess Mr. Lin isn't omniscient then, mm, who would have thought? Mr. Lin continues thinking that he has soul healing words ready for all situations, and when using vague language with people like these, you just have to wait for them to interpret your words how they best understand it, which will ultimately reveal their thoughts as well, even though they can be more of a reserved type of a person not willing to open up. Now Mr. Lin thinks that it's probably for the best for Ackerman to start his own business, because most people really can't stand working 996 or 007. The first one basically means working from 9am to 9pm 6 days a week, and the second one meaning working from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. 7 days a week. I think not even someone as powerful as Mr. Lin would be able to handle these kinds of working hours. So Mr. Lin continues to think that yes, it's better for him to try and start his own company than to continue to slave away for the current one and constantly get bullied by his boss, but it's still completely up to Ackerman to decide. Mr. Lin also realizes how difficult it is to go from a corporate slave to a company owner, especially at the start, because you need so much time, money, and you also have to have a thorough plan on how to do it. He especially must not have any worries in order to be able to completely focus on his startup company, so Mr. Lin thinks he needs to give him some motivational words to help him out, but also to keep him as a customer. He also remembers that thanks to Miss G, Ackerman won't be jobless if he doesn't succeed in making his new company, because Low Resources is currently one of the biggest companies in Nokin, which is a company owned by Miss G's father. We then learn a bit more about this company, learning that it has the monopoly over all mining in the Lower City District and is a percent owner of almost all the major companies in Nokin making it one of the most influential companies in Nokin, from daily life to business. You can find this company somehow involved in all of it. And even though Mr. Lin has been in this world for about 3 years now, he can spot the influence of this company everywhere. He also remembers that after he came to this world, he spent a bit of time learning of its history, and this is when he found out that this company has been existing for a long long time now. In the early stages, it was also in charge of the army in the lower city district, and that it has such a complicated history that it's so hard to learn everything about it, no matter how deep you dig. Now Mr. Lin explains that this company is so dominant and powerful because of how Nokin as a city is designed, being divided into two parts, the upper and lower city districts. 
upper part is literally in the air above the lower part and it's a man-made city built of steel, looking like a giant sphere from a bird point of view. Also it's huge, so huge that the streets near Central District have their own names, but the rest of the streets are just marked with letters and numbers. Also the upper district has no natural resources because it's completely man-made and all of the natural resources are found in the lower district which is also known as the underground or transition zone. And for now the lower district is only accessible by the truth society because residents of the lower district all suffer a strange illness caused by the fog of the high wall because they are close to the border of Azir. And because of this illness, they have been in quarantine for millions of years now. Now we see some interactions between the people of the lower district, where a grandma is chasing her daughter and talking to her, while both of them look like lizards with Cthulhu looking like tentacles under their chins. Grandma is taking her daughter back home for food rationing, which is a dinner in their world, I guess. And while they are going back, the child comments how she found another rock and that they will be able to get another bowl of food because of this. Child's name is Red, and her grandma praises her, saying that she's really impressive and as a reward for today, grandma will give her her part of the food today. Red then asks grandma what it's like in the city above them and if its denizens also need to dig rocks all day in order to get some food to eat. Grandma tells Red how one day she'll be able to see it and tell them grandma's stories as well. The grandma is holding a book from the Church of Plague and now we go back to Mr. Lin who figured out that the Church of Plague originates from the lower city district and that it's still the most widespread religion there. And because these districts are so different this led to many companies specializing in traveling between districts in order to gather resources for the upper city district and all of this led to one mega company forming and this one being the Lao Resources Development Corporation, the company whose owner is Miss G's father. Mr. Lin thinks how all of this seems so absurd but how it would also be really nice if a company this big would actually find his bookstore and purchase the distribution rights. But that's just a dream, Mr. Lin thinks. And because of that he needs to focus on how to do his business properly. Now we go back to present and Mr. Lin thinking how he never expected that the daughter of the owner of this company would become his regular customer and how that's all thanks to this con conversation skills Mr. Lin thinks and what he originally wanted to say is conmanship skills. Now he thinks about Ackerman as well and how he should get a job easily in Miss G's company because this shouldn't be a big deal for her Mr. Lin thinks. He then tells Ackerman how Miss G will probably be able to help him and how recently she had some problems which Mr. Lin also helped solve and how she should probably be back in the bookstore in a couple of days because she needs to return a book she borrowed. Ackerman thinks how it all makes sense now. Thinking how the Scarlet Cult and the White Wolf Clan started operating after Helix's White Wolf Clan lost the battle against Miss G and her hunters group known as Spider and how the White Wolf Clan lost this battle so bad they had to sacrifice their second in command Casper in order for Helix who's their first in command to escape alive. And all of them lost because Miss G suddenly became stronger. And it makes perfect sense to Ackerman now because Miss G received help from this bookstore owner which made her more powerful and able to win this battle. Ackerman now thinks that the reason why Mr. Lin wants to help him is because he wants to bring the truth society to its knees and this is why he sparked the conflict between spider and truth society. Ackerman realizes that causing conflict between other people and doing with their emotions is how the devil usually operates but even so Mr. Lin's words still had such a strong effect on my heart, Ackerman thinks. So Ackerman presumes Mr. Lin's next step is organizing scattered hunters into a group which can rival the truth society and the secret instrument tower. And if that's the case, it will turn knocking upside down and change the situation completely. And he's doing all of this 
because he is bored and wants to have fun, Ackerman thinks, and also how lucky he is to be his pawn. He then thinks how Mr. Lin used the flower at the start to extract his strongest desires but didn't consume all of them. So now all the motivation Ackerman had to earn the truth society's approval is gone and because of this he is really looking forward to trying this new path Mr. Lin is offering. And even though it's unbelievably dangerous Ackerman thinks he still wants to do it and is probably crazy because of this. He then realizes there's one more thing he doesn't understand as he asks Mr. Lin about borrowing books. Mr. Lin grins because he finally managed to reel in this new customer to borrow or even maybe buy a book. Mr. Lin then answers by saying he just wanted to mention some books because since this is the first time Ackerman is tackling these kinds of problems, there will be a lot of difficulties and Mr. Lin has a perfect book for this. As he pulls out the book which title is Starting a Business with Zero Capital. Ackerman thinks how Miss G also borrowed the book from Mr. Lin and unlocked more power. So it's obvious Mr. Lin transfers power to people through his books, Ackerman thinks. He then gets a bit scared realizing that this library is filled with books and if all of these books contain forbidden knowledge used to unlock powers in individuals. His thoughts get interrupted by Mr. Lin offering him a book, saying that this book is a perfect match for Ackerman right now, since it can help him find a new path and understand his aspirations. Mr. Lin tells him how they won't treat him as a tool anymore and how he'll no longer lose his dignity and the respect he deserves. As he offers Ackerman the book, we can see the true form of the book, and its name is Void Sacrifice. This surprises Ackerman a bit and he reaches to open the book. As soon as he opens the book, he finds himself in a different dimension now where everything around him is black. As he's walking through this black dimension, we can see void monsters all around him and suddenly he feels a pain in his chest and in it a hole appears as more and more monsters become visible around him, so much so that there is not an inch of empty space and it's all crawling with void entities. Ackerman suddenly closes the book, trembling in fear, not realizing if this was a hallucination just now or maybe reality. He can still feel traces of the void in his body and he feels connected to the void now. He thinks how the void creatures have taken notice of his existence now as he utters, So, this is the new path? Mr. Lin confirms this and says that he has to use all the opportunities given, saying that if there's no risk in doing a business, anybody would do it, but that this book is a knowledge gifted from the others who have reached the end of that road, and if he understands the book, everything will be a lot easier. Now what Mr. Lin is implying here by people who have reached the end of that road is people who started their own businesses and were successful and after making a lot of money, they wrote books to help other entrepreneurs when they decide to start their own business. But of course, Ackerman understands it completely differently, thinking how Mr. Lin is talking about void entities Ackerman just met, and also thinks how after his body has been connected to the void like this, and he can establish communication with these beings whenever he wishes now, and if he can offer them worthy sacrifices, he'll receive their blessings and gifts. And these gifts will also depend on the mood of these beings. So catching opportunities means finding the right moment to receive their blessings, is what Ackerman thinks. He then thinks how void beings are all definitely of indescribable level and how powerful Mr. Lin must be to be able to receive their gifts whenever he wants. Ackerman then thanks Mr. Lin for these helpful lessons and Mr. Lin responds how this journey will be a long and difficult one and how Ackerman needs to be strong both mentally and in other ways and that being opportunistic alone won't be enough. Mr. Lin tells Ackerman that next time they see each other, he hopes Ackerman will achieve his goals. Ackerman bows down in honor saying he'll do his best and won't disappoint Mr. Lin. 
as he's leaving the bookstore he thinks of Mr. Lin as a selfless and magnificent being and how it's a great honor to be a pawn of someone like Mr. Lin. As he leaves, Mr. Lin tells him to come back again, exhales in satisfaction, thinking that he has helped another lost soul after teaching it the ways of life. The weather is still terrible with heavy rain falling constantly and now we see a huge luxurious mansion that we learn is located on a private island near Nokin, known as Egg Manor. After looking through one of the windows, we can see this is where Miss G lives as we go into her bedroom and see her performing something like a ritual. She compresses the ash that's in some kind of a special bowl then puts a mark in the ash using a seal and then adds incense powder to it. As she lights it up we realize that it's just like a candle with a nice smell and after the beautiful smell spreads through the room she puts on her reading glasses and reading gloves. As we see a book Mr. Lin gave her in front of her and she's ready to relax and dive into the book. As she slowly lifts the first page up we can see dark purple magic coming out of it and as she starts reading a black mass forms behind her without her noticing it for now. Then at the entrance to her mansion we see some security guards standing in the rain as a car approaches and the butler runs out carrying an umbrella. A man leaves the car while security guards bow down in honor and we can presume this is her father, one of the richest people in Nokin. He mumbles something to his servants and as Miss G hears him come back home, she closes the book with a tired look on her face and as the sweat is going down her body she says that a couple of days ago there's no way she could have handled reading the book for so long as she just did now. She thinks that she's becoming better and better at controlling her body as she's gaining power from this book as we see her chest completely covered in sweat. She realizes now that she has such a control over her body that she can control the growth both outwards and inwards of every hair follicle on her body but if she ever did that simultaneously it would be such a torture because of how difficult it is for her to do now. But the best thing about her gaining this new control of her power is that she almost gained the complete control over the dream beast inside of her so much so that she's closer than ever to becoming a destructive level mage now. And all of this is thanks to Mr. Lin who helped her unlock this new power and how this favor he's done for her far surpasses the ability to control the tainted blood running through her veins. She thinks how blood and spirit are the literal foundation of everything alive that exists and the control of the flow of those is what generates ether and magic. She understands now that she needs to control the blood in her in order to convert the power of the dream beast in her as her own power. She then thinks how in order to return a favor to Mr. Lin, she needs to become even more strong and advance to a higher ranking of power. How for only now, all she's learned is just to control the blood within her. And that if she could gather more diverse range of dream beasts tainted blood, her power would significantly increase. She knows that she can surpass this and how this is not the maximum limit of the strength of the hunters, people who possess tainted blood of dream beasts, and how they can use this power to gain political strength as well, and how her goal is for the hunters to be of equal power in society as the most influential political forces now, like the Truth Society, the Secret Instrument Tower and the different churches. But she also understands that in order to achieve this goal, she will need more people to work with her, because doing this alone is impossible. She didn't mention this to anyone before, because it was all new for Miss G as well. So she had to be careful in case something would go wrong, like her losing the control over the dream beast after shapeshifting into it. But now, since she has already proved that she can maintain control while shapeshifted, it should be safer now, she thinks. It's time for hunters to expand Miss G things and how this book will be their gospel and Mr. Lin will be their guide and leader into the future. As we see Mr. Lin just chilling back at the bookstore, watering his terrifying flower which looks cute now by the way and thinking how he's been having a peaceful day today. Then Miss G hears footsteps coming up the stairs and hides her book into a drawer just as she hears knocking on her bedroom door. It's just her maid notifying her that the dinner is ready as Miss G leaves the room and goes to have dinner with her father. When she meets her father in the hallway, she smiles and asks if he has any business with her now. We learn that her father's name is Ji Bonong, 
and I swear I thought G is her name, but I guess it's her family name, but for convenience I'll continue to call her Miss G and her father Mono. Now her father then asks her to have a little chat with him, and she tells him that chatting doesn't look like him usually, to which he responds that he's still a father who wishes to eat dinner with his daughter and have a chat as they enter a huge dining room. She then says how if she really thought this is all he wants, she would be underestimating him, because someone as secretive as him would never prepare a casual dinner just to have a chat with his daughter for no significant reason. Especially since he never eats at home and never sends maids to remind Miss G that it's time for dinner, unless there is some other hidden motive behind all of this. He comments saying how she's grown and she gets a bit surprised saying, oh, you really just wanted to have a simple chat, which also surprises Bonong after hearing it. He then tells her how even though she has matured so much, he still thinks of her as a young girl, but that her maturity did catch him by surprise. He tells her that as an adult, of course she can decide things for herself, but it's still his duty as her father to give her advice where he thinks advice is needed. She asks him what advice would he have for her and as he's slicing his food answers by saying that he never before asked her what does she do because both organizations she was in, the White Wolf Clan and now the Hunters, are all nothing more than pawns meant to be used by bigger fish, probably implying himself. He then continues by saying that he assigned Kay and Max to her because he thought this would be enough. But now it's completely different because now she would represent their company when she stands in front of everyone else and asks her if she understands this. Misty smirks and answers that she does understand as her father gets visibly angry, dropping his knife and yelling at her, saying that if she really did understand she wouldn't act so recklessly as she does now. Miss G looks at him seriously now and in a serious voice says that she actually does understand and that's why she's talking to him and agree to talk with him now because he had probably seen her planner in her diary thus he asked to talk to her and she tells him that she wrote that on purpose which surprises her dad as he yells back asking if she wrote it on purpose so that the people he assigned to her would see it and force him to come back. Miss G answers that she would never be so foolish to write her plan in a diary so that other people can discover it. I know my plan by heart, she says. Her father thinks for a moment and then says that she has really grown up and that it was a mistake for him that he still saw her as a child. As Miss G smiles and says that if he didn't see her like that, it would be more difficult for her to trick him like this. Her father then gets serious, saying that if that's the case, she has to have confidence to convince him and asks her what her bargaining chip is. Miss G comments how she thought he had already sent someone to search her room for it as the lighting strikes outside. Her father gets surprised again asking her, how did you know? Miss G thinks to herself how she really caught him by surprise this time as she laughs and says that he needs to give up because he will never find an answer he's looking for. We can see transparent magic tentacles coming from a giant eye swarming the mansion now as Miss G continues speaking saying that everything in this mansion is controlled by Iron Will and how if he really wants to know she can tell him her plans. With one hand she reaches behind her back as we get the shot of her back literally completely opening up so much so that we can see her spine as she pulls the book Mr. Lin gave her literally from her back. As another lightning strikes she comments this is my bargaining chip. Now we get to learn more about Miss G's father and we learn that he's so famous and rich in Nokin that everybody knows about him. Basically he's Bruce Wayne or Tony Stark of this world. He maintained his high position by being friends with many different owners of other huge companies and businesses in Nokin, like the Truth Society, the Secret Instrument Tower, hunters, mages, churches, ordinary citizens and so on. He's a strategic mind who has had so much experience he knows how to handle every situation calmly and almost never faces situations and people which would make him lose control. And his company Lao Resources, with him as its leader, monopolized all the mining rights in the lower city district and also maintains a close connection with the hidden world of mutants who live in the lower city district. So much so that one could say this company is a part of this world as well, because many of the employees working for this company are mutants themselves. People talk about Bonong in such a way, saying that if he stares at you with his chrome yellow eyes, he will reveal all your deep thoughts. We then see an interaction that happened in the past, 
when he entered the private gym in his mansion where his daughter was training. He's followed by a mutant with an eye fold over his eyes whose name is Max who was mentioned earlier and as he's entering the room we can see Miss G training very hard, lifting weights, doing squats and all different sorts of exercises. After entering the gym she takes a break and the character we also saw earlier by the name of Cake praises Miss G telling her how she's done a good job as she is completely gassed out and turns around to notice her father entering the gym greeting him kindly as well. He asks her how she is doing recently to which she responds that nothing has changed and how she has been training her body as was his wish. He answers by saying good and orders Max to take out a special package that is brought with him. After seeing what's in the package, Miss G gets surprised as she saw injections with red liquid inside. She realizes that this is tainted blood and asks her father if it's finally time for this. He confirms this and says that he thinks now is the best time and that from this moment on she will be recognized as a mutant. He asks her if she's ready to undergo this because a huge responsibility will befall her after receiving tainted blood's power and Miss G answers by saying yes father. He then explains how their family due to their genes are just regular people and in order to become mutants they have to inject tainted blood to become hunters and how the price of this is a risk it brings upon a chain reaction. He then comments that there is a 10% chance for corruption and that he personally would also inject tainted blood in him but he can't risk the future of the whole Lawi resources company if something goes wrong after he receives tainted blood. He then comments how he personally watched over this tainted blood and how it's of the highest quality there is, meaning the chance of corruption happening after injecting is maximally minimized. How in the worst case scenario Miss G would receive mild effects of lycanthropy on her extremities or ears. He also reaches into his pocket telling her that he also has a personal special gift for her as well as he gives her a highly pure philosopher's stone which she later wears as an earring what we can see. He describes that this stone has a resurrection brand inscribed in it by a white mage of indescribable level and that its name is the Tear of Flame. He then says how he's barred from the world of mutants but tells Miss G that she'll thrive in it. He asks her once again if she understands all of this to which she answers by saying that she does as she's putting this philosopher's stone on her ear as an earring. He then tells Max and Kay how from now on they will be responsible for Miss G and tells Max there's something else he wants to tell him and calls him out with him. After he left Miss G got happy telling Kay how she's waited for this moment for so long and had been asking her father but now it's finally time for her to become a mutant. Her father always said that it wasn't time yet for her to become a mutant but he finally agreed to do it now. Miss G says she's a bit nervous to which Kay responds by saying how there's no need to worry and how Kay will crush anyone who tries to harm Miss G. G then explains how she didn't mean that but that her father has a high renown in society both among mutants and ordinary people but what's more important is that he's a businessman meaning that if there is profit to be made he'll risk everything for it and how this time the wager for this profit is Miss G. Miss G says how she thinks her father wants her to become a mutant so she can run the company from the world of mutants allowing Lawi resources to go from mega corporation to a gigantic being that terrifies even the mutants. She then says that even though he has fulfilled her wish he also has some profit to gain from it so it's her duty to meet his expectations now so that's why she needs to mature and grow as fast as possible. Kay comments by saying that this is a test and that the only way for people to grow is if they win a battle against their past immature selves. Miss G asks Kay to help her pass this important test of her life and Kay blushes saying of course my lady that even if she has to sacrifice her own life she'll help Miss G fulfill her wish. Now we see her father talking to Max. We don't hear the first part of their conversation but her father comments how this must be what she's thinking because after all she's his daughter and it wouldn't be surprising if she realized. He then tells Max he has gathered all the information about all the hunter groups in Knockin from the Truth Society and asks him if Max has decided which one should Miss G join. 
Max says that the best group for her to join now is Helix's White Wolf clan and Miss G's father then comments how according to the intel he got about Helix, Helix is a calm, sensible person who's also an excellent strategist, so this is a good choice for her. He also asks Max if he understands why Bonong is sending him with Miss G, and Max responds because you want me to monitor her every move, and G's father confirms this, but also says that Max needs to protect her with the best of his abilities, which leaves Max surprised a bit because he didn't expect this. Bonong describes Miss G as a steadfast, calm and patient individual, which will make her into a great hunter, and this is why he will support her becoming a hunter, and how helping her join some hunter's organization also isn't a problem, but anything more than this would be difficult in such a short time span. He also comments on Kay, saying he trusts her loyalty and capabilities, but how she can be impulsive. So in situations where logical thinking is required, Max composure and intellect will be Miss G's best weapons. Bonong also explains that if a mutant was to run a company as massive as Lao Resources, that would cause other big company owners to feel unsettled and if this would happen it would be an end for this company. So that's why Bonong needs to be cautious and distance himself from his own daughter in public and keep her away from anything related to Lao resources. He also explains that the more rebellious she gets, this is for the better and would also be for the best if she ignores Lao resources completely and focuses on her hunters group and how the best case scenario is for her not to care about this company at all. He then tells Max that Lao resources isn't the goal he has in plan for Miss G, but it's more of a starting point for her. He tells Max that this is the last thing he'll ask from him and asks him to protect Miss G at all costs. This makes Max emotional, he kneels down and he says that he'll protect Miss G with his own life. So we actually learn here that her father actually cares about her and is not supporting her for his personal gain but because he really believes in her. After Max leaves and Bonong sits alone in his office, he takes out a book which we learn is a top secret book with instructions on how to make an elixir of immortality and we see that this was also used to make Miss G's earring. He then thinks to himself how he's granted Miss G all the protection he can and how everyone eventually grows up and leaves their nest, saying that once you go on this path, there is no turning back. He then wonders what she will grow up into and says how he's looking forward to it and the surprises it will bring after she has grown even above his expectations with a smile on his face. As we go back to present and can see him completely petrified now, looking at Miss G as she took out the book and told him that this book is her bargaining chip. We can see two of them sitting close to each other on the table while another lightning strikes and shadowy tentacles surround them. And Bonong thinks to himself how he was too careless and has now lost twice to his daughter and how he once could understand her completely but now she can predict his thoughts and actions. As he looks at confident Miss G, he thinks how she has grown into a capable hunter who can fool her father easily. Bonong then comments how that bargaining chip she has has changed her a lot as well, as he stands up and says that she can't convince him with this book because that book is not important but its origins. He warns Miss G how this plan is too dangerous, which can also cause a fall of their company, so she needs to proceed with her plan carefully and asks her what can his company gain from her plan. Or in other words, why does the person behind you who's helping you why is he actually helping you? Mijji starts pouring some more wine as she quotes her father saying, when there's enough profit to be made, a businessman will do anything. Her father responds by saying that this is true for an ordinary businessman, but how they are different. Mijji responds by explaining that she didn't grow more powerful because she injected more tainted blood, which she didn't, but that she gained all of this power from this book alone and that a book like this can be purchased whenever you want and asks her father if he can get the distribution rights for the book. Would it be a good thing for the business or not? Her father responds that they still don't know much about Mr. Lin and how he needs to be careful if he wants to make contact with him. Ji then explains that from her own experiences, Mr. Lin always just follows the logic of a normal bookstore owner and that if you follow his wishes, he's actually quite friendly. 
She then tells her father that she's not good enough to talk about this kind of a business with Mr. Lin and that he needs to go there personally and talk to him and just after that he can decide whether this is good for the business or not. This leaves her father surprised. Now we go to Helix's headquarters where he's having a meeting with his followers and they're saying how their situation is becoming more and more desperate because they've lost over 90% of their people because they're fighting with the secret instrument tower. Others disagree saying they can still win and as all of them start yelling and arguing with each other, Helix gets angry and yells silence. He says that their objective is to hash the spawn of the magic mirror and if they do this they will win. Helix then says that the Truth Society will make a delivery on 78th Street and they need to raid them and steal those valuable items that are being delivered. His subordinates agree with him and after he leaves and is sitting alone in his office, thinks to himself how even if they manage to get this shipment, it's still not enough for their plan to succeed. But he can't let them know this because the White Wolf Clan would fall apart then. Helix thinks to himself if there is anything he can do now and we see a black demonic mass appear above him saying Your problem? I can help you solve it. Helix screams asking who's there and we see this demonic mass arising and taking form and we see Old Wild emerge from it saying that the spawn of the magic mirror is a torch and the most precious fuel for it is life. Now we see a huge building in the middle of the city resembling an Eiffel Tower from the future and we learn these are secret instrument tower headquarters. Now we go into a conference room of this building and we can see a former Radiant Knight Joseph, now head of the intelligence, sitting and drinking his coffee. We see that he's talking to somebody and saying that if you want me to tell you more about the bookstore owner, you first have to tell me what do you think when you hear the term indescribable. Is it the ancient black dragon from the prehistoric era or maybe the giant from the first era, maybe King Candela from the second era? Or maybe you think about four primordial witches who are the symbol of absolute power. Joseph then continues speaking, saying that there is no doubt that the power of the beings he just mentioned is indescribable, but how the bookstore owner just gives off a different impression. Not powerful, but grand. In order to explain it better, Joseph uses a metaphor. He says moths have something called phototaxis, which makes them fly towards the fire because of its light. But most of the time, they're not as foolish as to fly straight into the fire. Because no matter how tiny they are, they still possess basic survival instincts. But if there is a moth who had a chance to gaze upon the sun, what would it do? Would it tremble before the heat of the sun or would it admire its glory? and in that moment it would abandon all of its instincts and just fly straight to the sun. Even though its body would start burning, it wouldn't mind, it would be honored to be sacrificed for the power of sun's fire. That's what the bookstore owner is to a normal person, Joseph explains. Then calmly he says how the bookstore owner wants to help Joseph with the curse of Candela's sword and suddenly gets ecstatic screaming, do you think I will refuse? We see the person in front of Joseph now who gets a bit scared from this sudden reaction of Joseph as Joseph continues saying how no one knows more about this sword than him and saying that this sword is a weapon that even terrifies people of indescribable level because no matter how powerful you are it can still pierce through your mind and soul which will always lead to your doom at the end. He then explains how Secret Instrument Tower always chose the next wielder for Candela from the most powerful of Radiant Knights, but even still they could only temporarily suppress this curse and use the sword. But eventually all the Radiant Knights would fall to the curse and die one by one. So much so that Secret Instrument Tower started losing faith in subduing this curse. But now we've discovered something new, Joseph says that the book Mr. Lin gave him has the power to suppress the sword, which would logically imply that he has a better way to keep it. And the reason why he wants the sword is only because he wants to help Joseph not meet the same fate as previous Radiant Knights who wielded the sword and lost their minds because of the curse and in the end ended their own lives. So no matter what you think and how you look at it, the best option regarding this sword now is for me to give it to Mr. Lin, Joseph says. 
This man now starts talking, yelling a bit and saying, what if the sword falls in the hands of evil? What consequences will it have then? And how will this affect the reputation of Secret Instrument Tower? Joseph turns around and says how he doesn't know and he doesn't need to know because the reputation of the organization is best left to the Elder Council. The man shows worry and fear in his face as Joseph leaves the room and says that Radiant Knights only trust justice in their hearts. Now we see all of this was a video which was recorded to be presented to the Elder Council of Secret Instrument Tower so they can take into consideration Joseph's plans with Sword Candela. Now we see the inner office of the Secret Instrument Tower and four individuals in robes sitting around a blue table with blue energy coming from it as they are preparing to discuss this issue. Now we go back to the Joseph again who is walking through the hallways past his subordinates who are all greeting him honorably and then Claudie tells him how there are new reports regarding the White Wolf Clan saying how those hunters are way more familiar with structure of knocking than them and how they are like rats scurrying everywhere. Claudie explains that whenever they were tracing them, they would disappear without a trace and because of that Secret Instrument Tower has devised a new strategy where they will find the places these people are found the most and by connecting these places they are able to locate a part of the White Wolf Clan's hidden passage, saying how White Wolf's Clan area of operation has been drastically reduced. Joseph comments how this city is way too old for us to be able to get a complete map of it and how the real maps are in the minds of old people who lived here for a long long time. He then comments how there is no one that old in the White Wolf Clan and how they are receiving help from the outside. Glory gets surprised and then admires Joseph's cunning wit and says how in the last couple of days Secret Instrument Tower managed to destroy three of their hideouts and have captured over 20 of members of the White Wolf Clan who are being interrogated right now. He then explains how their minds are quite fragile so mind spells didn't work on them saying that they probably injected tainted blood which would cause them to go completely mad and not snitch out on their clan. Joseph gets intrigued admiring this smart way of avoiding interrogation because this way they will never rat out because they will always go crazy before doing so. Claudie then says how White Wolf Clan's recent actions have been more and more crazy with less and less logic behind them probably because they also realize how they will soon come to an end so they just started killing for the joy of it. Claudie clenches his fist because he gets angry since this is causing a huge panic among the civilians. Joseph comments how the logistics sector of the Secret Instrument Tower is definitely busy because of the recent White Wolf Clan's actions and also says that how to the normal people of knocking, mutants are just myth and because of this it will be hard to completely wipe out this clan and maintain public relations. Joseph also comments saying how they always use a gas leak explosion as cover up for these mutant battles, calling this a bowling hazard which makes Claudie gets a bit more comfortable and relaxed and even laughs a little bit at this comment. Joseph then continues as he says that you can't just look at the surface of the actions and think that there is no pattern behind the actions of White Wolf Clan if nothing shows on the surface as he explains that the special thing about the spawn of the magic mirror is to influence minds and how this would cause them to ignore all their other desires thus meaning they wouldn't need a reason to vent out and just cause chaos for fun. So if this is not a diversion, there has to be a reason behind these actions Joseph states. Clody comments how the clan has been collecting certain body parts after their killings, probably because they are trying to replicate Murphy's rituals and how they can't find anything that connects these rituals and these conditions. Suddenly Clody realizes something and asks Joseph, why can't the Truth Society give them an entire blueprint of Nokin and only ever provides them with fractions of it? Joseph states that just a fraction should be enough for them from the architectural point of view and how then they would be able to uncover other secret passages and chambers but that some of them were built by the Truth Society itself so that's the reason they refuse to give out the full blueprint. Joseph then teases Claudie telling him that he's pretty dumb and if they opened up his skull there would be an empty area instead of a brain. 
Claudie laughs a bit while being a bit uncomfortable as well, thinking how Joseph is in a good mood today. Claudie then thinks how they will have to find a different way if the complete help from the truth society is not possible, and wonders what are they using these secret passages and chambers for. Joseph then encourages Claudie, telling him how they will soon finish the White Wolf Clan once and for all, but if they ask the hypocrites in the Truth Society for help, they would probably say something along the lines of gathering intel, analyzing evidence and following suspects are the basic duties of the intelligence division, but if they can't even do that on their own, maybe it would be better to merge them with the logistics division. But if we manage to actually locate their secret passages, the Truth Society will pay us a hefty amount to keep our mouths shut and not spread this information, says Joseph. As Claudia and Joseph are entering into Intelligence Division quarters, he asks Claudia about the Scarlet Cult, to which Claudia responds by saying that after Murphy died the cult fell apart, mostly because most of its members were zombies controlled by Murphy and after her death they stopped their activities and the remaining black mages either ran away or joined the white wolf clan, but basically the scarlet cult itself doesn't exist anymore. Murphy then comments how that elf must be extremely powerful even for a destructive rank, because she single-handedly crushed Murphy and her entire cult, but then gets a bit scared of Joseph, seeing how of course Joseph is stronger and how he is the strongest destructive level in the world. Joseph comments how what's even more impressive than this is that this elf calls the bookstore owner her lord, meaning that the entire Iris family, which is the family of this elf, is willing to serve Mr. Lin. Claudie then explains how not many people know about the bookstore owner, but those that do know about him also have the same attitude of submission towards him, and not only submission alone, but fear as well. Joseph comments how anyone smart should have that attitude towards Mr. Lin and how this time they should thank Mr. Lin for handling Murphy before she managed to do even more damage in knocking. Because of this, Joseph wants to give his sword Candela to Mr. Lin and says how those fossils in the Elder Council should soon reach their decision and would probably not dare send someone to investigate the bookstore at this moment in time. Joseph gets more angry as he remembers how useless the Truth Society was regarding the Murphy incident and how it would be better if they used their resources to catch fish. Joseph tells Claudie to go back to his work and after Claudie leaves, Joseph receives an email from the Elder Council in which they stated that they refused his request to transfer the candela to Mr. Lin but that they've sent someone to investigate the bookstore and if Joseph's story is true, they will approve his request then. This leaves Joseph completely surprised. Now we see a beautiful white haired lady sent by the elder council walking down the 28th street and reaching the bookstore which she was sent to investigate. Now we see the elder council talking and commenting how the bookstore truly does look like a normal bookstore, but how Joseph personally classified it as class I for indescribable. They also comment how the bookstore owner played a major role in the spawn of the magic mirror project and has also caused the fall of the scarlet cult and a rapid decline of members in the white wolf clan. And because all of this, Joseph considers the bookstore owner as a worthy successor for the cursed plate candela. The first record the elder council has about the bookstore owner is how he wants to claim the sword for himself and he wants to do this to save Joseph, is what Joseph reported. But the elder council can't just follow Joseph's words blindly, especially not since they don't know much about this bookstore owner. So after discussion amongst all the elders, the best course of action is to investigate this bookstore owner, to gather more intel about him and then make a decision. They have to find out more about his identity, goals, but most importantly how powerful he really is. But also they can't send any ordinary spy to investigate someone of supposedly indescribable level and the best person they've chosen to send to investigate Mr. Lin is Lucy Caroline, the vice chief of logistics. She has harpy blood in her and also the ability to mind control and that for this specific mission she would be the best to send as a spy. Now we go back to Lucy who is standing in front of the bookstore and get to learn all about her credentials 
and she has more credentials than Pablo Picasso has words in his full name. She thinks about her strategy and how she needs to act as a normal customer and conduct this investigation undercover while filling out the O113 file as much as possible, which is needed by the elders to make a decision. As she enters the bookstore with hopes everything will go smoothly, Mr. Lin greets her warmly, and after looking at Mr. Lin she thinks how he's that legendary bookstore owner and the person in the middle of the storm that has been brewing in Nokin. And at the first glance, just as she expected, he looks completely ordinary and normal. But that if he truly is an indescribable level being, then it's no problem for him to hide his true power. And how he even incapacitated Joseph face to face without Joseph even realizing this. So Lucy thinks how she always needs to stay respectful towards Mr. Lin and never try to antagonize him. As she's slowly and cautiously approaching him, while Mr. Lin is still reading his book, she sits in front of him and with a friendly smile says, Hello. Mr. Lin closes the book he was reading and immediately starts blushing, thinking how this lady is impressive from the get-go, because she has such a beautiful and natural smile, but somehow still professional. As Mr. Lin keeps admiring and looking at her face, thinking how such a beautiful and professional smile cannot be a result of her subconsciousness, but forged over the years of experience, he realizes that she has to be his colleague, in a way that she is not here as a customer, but probably to even sell him something. By the way, Mr. Lin also finds this lady quite hot because of her silver hair, so do with that information what you wish, and if you watched previous parts you already knew he has a thing for silver haired girls. Now back to the story, Mr. Lin thinks that she has already exposed herself, but still isn't quite sure whether she's here to sell something or just do a survey. He even gets a bit more angry and serious as well, thinking how people like her usually waste other people's time, even if other people won't buy anything already, and thinks how she probably has no desire to buy, borrow or read any books at all. But Mr. Lin decides to treat her as a customer, even though she's here to promote the product she's selling. But he will try to have a conversation with her to try and make her feel as if she's on a shaky ground. So he realizes what her next sentence might be and says, Are you the bookstore owner? And actually both of them said it at the same time. This immediately shocked her and scared her, thinking how he read her thoughts, but how she didn't feel any magic mind reading coming from his side. She thinks of this as a warning from Mr. Lin and doesn't realize why did Joseph call him friendly, when he's obviously terrifying. Now Mr. Lin thinks how he exposed her without much effort, and thinks how this tactic of showing your opponent that you've read them imposes his will on the opponent and shakes their rhythm. Basically, if this was a video game, I've already taken half of her health, Mr. Lin thinks. Because no matter how good her sales pitch is, it won't be of use if she is nervous. He thinks how these salespeople usually use psychological tricks to sell their products, but if you use words carefully and not allow them a moment of hesitation, this will allow you to shift the conversation and you will control its rhythm, and the most simple way to do all of this is just to ask them questions instead of allowing them to ask you. Mr. Lin casually sips his tea while Lucy is already completely terrified and he thinks to himself how years of experience of a life teacher and the soul healer have allowed him to shake her confidence so fast. He puts his tea on the table and tells her how there is no need for her to be shocked, since she came to this bookstore on her own initiative. Didn't you think about what might you find here, because her target is specifically a bookstore owner. Didn't you think I would know about your intentions? Mr. Lin asks her as he thinks about how she came here to promote a product, thus she asked for an owner right away. He also thinks this is because maybe she was doing good so far in her job, but that doesn't mean she can talk her way into anything. And Mr. Lin finds this as a trait of youngsters, thinking it's a bit arrogant as well. He then tells her that her goal is obvious for him, and that she mustn't be rash because she's still young so she needs to think about her future. Lucy is so scared she has started sweating, so much that her face is becoming sweat, thinking that he already found out about her mission 
and how she annoyed him with her recklessness, so that's why he gave her this warning. She thinks so Mr. Lin probably already knows everything about her, and he intentionally said the same thing as her at the same time to show her that she can't hide anything from him. She feels as if her existence is a toy in the palm of Mr. Lin's hand. She then starts apologizing to Mr. Lin saying how she's sorry for bothering him, but how she still has some questions she'd like to ask him, thinking she can still maybe get something out of all of this. Because Mr. Lin still looks peaceful and has done all of this just to let her know where her place is. She then explains so these questions are important both for Mr. Lin and for them, saying that if he answers these questions it would mean a lot to knock in. Miss Lin admires her courage because she is still persistent and wants to ask questions, so he thinks she wants to ask questions to gather information which would help her sell her product, but she even pulled the entire city of Nokin into this. So Mr. Lin gets interested and says, what kind of questions? Let's hear them. Lucy gets a bit relaxed and thinks about how this shows that at least Mr. Lin is not evil, and she takes out her pen and paper and asks him the first question. Why did you set up your bookstore here? This confuses Mr. Lin now because if she's a saleswoman, she wouldn't ask these kinds of questions. Maybe she's doing a survey of different sort, he thinks, but also realizes how he can't answer this question honestly because he can't say a demon helped him come here from another world and he's selling books to make a living. So he answers by saying that his own interest and fate brought him here. We see her writing down her analysis of this answer, looks back up at Mr. Lin and asks him for his opinion about the event that had happened here recently. She's referring to the battle between Doris and Murphy, but Mr. Lin thinks this was just a gas explosion and how maybe they want to renovate the place, so that's why they're doing this survey, he thinks. And he thinks this is great and actually says it out loud as well and starts coughing saying no, 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 I mean what happened here was quite tragic, but that some people truly do deserve death because life is too precious and not something you could just throw away. Thinking to himself that on the news they reported that the explosion happened because some of the workers were negligible for years, so they need to be held responsible. Lucy writes down how Mr. Lin shares the standpoint of the Truth Society and also despises black mages of the White Wolf Clan and the Scarlet Cult. Because guess what, another misunderstanding just happened. She then tells him that her last question for him is to tell her how he feels about what he is doing here. Now this confuses him even more, because this question is not related to the other ones at all. Thinking if she's here just to waste his time, and then a sudden realization hit him. As he thinks that the first question she asked him is because she wants to evaluate the worth of the land here, the second question is pretty straightforward, and the third question is about the current status of the shop. So a goal of this survey must be to find out the overall situation of shops and buildings that were near the explosion because they want to rebuild the mess that was made by the explosion and the reason why she's so secretive about it is because they have other companies as competition so they don't want the word to spread out. But Mr. Lin again thinks how he can't answer honestly because Inky brought him here but he might use this chance to promote himself and his business more because judging by how beautiful she looks she must be working for a big company which has researchers of these qualities. So if he uses this chance to promote his business this might be great for his sales Mr. Lin thinks. So he tells her that he gives suitable books to suitable people helping them take another step in their paths, and even though he doesn't make much doing this, seeing his customers happy is what drives him forward to do it more. He is happy with providing guidance to people and helping them resolve their problems. For example, a person like you, who's troubled by her work life. And this leaves Lucy confused yet again. Mr. Lin thinks if he uses his smile to promote his business more, this would be good, but even if he can do that, he can still turn her into his regular customer. Thinking how he actually opened the shop for the money, but needed to say what he did say in order to promote the bookshop. Now, Lucy thinks how she suddenly became Mr. Lin's target, but how he's right, and that she feels overworked lately because of everything going on with White Wolf Clan and the Scarlet Cult, and this causes her to feel really fatigued. 
She starts thinking about all the responsibilities she has to do on her job and as she's thinking this her face gets worried and tired. And as soon as Mr. Lin saw her face, he used this opportunity and said that there's no need to be shocked and asks her if her company plans to take full responsibility for what happened outside, which Lucy confirms and says they have no other option and that this is her job and that she will do it. Mr. Lin thinks how she is yet another corporate slave as he tells her, poor child, if you don't mind, you can take some rest here and of course, read some books. Now we go back to learn more about Lucy when she was younger as she remembers that when she was still a young girl, she realized that she saw this world differently from other people. That only she truly saw the world as black and white, basically meaning she had the power to control minds and sense good and evil inside of other people. But when other people learned of this ability she has, they didn't believe her and would ridicule her saying that she is too young to even know the meaning of words good and evil, let alone see if someone is actually good or evil. People thought she was weird because she would claim she has such a power, so they just chose to stay away from her. But not all people, we can see a mystery man approaching young Lucy and praise her talent, saying how such a power would benefit the secret instrument tower greatly and how their family position would be more secure if she was recruited by the secret instrument tower. So we learn now that this man is her family member, probably her father, who also tells her how she possesses a harpy blood and tells her that it's natural for eagles to push their youngs out of the nest when they grow to a certain age, which is what he did to Lucy as well metaphorically, saying how those eagles who are useless would just fall and die, as he told Lucy that's why she needs to be useful, or else the same fate would await her. Since she was still just a child, these words made her scared and caused her to cry, causing a long-lasting trauma in her. Her father then told her that he'll find someone to recruit her to the secret instrument tower and order her to stay away from him for the rest of their lives. And from that moment Lucy has joined the secret instrument tower, she joined the logistics department because her talent suited it the best and was sent and successfully completed many dangerous missions which also gradually increased her rank in the organization. But no one ever complimented her because of her achievements. But just like when she was younger, they would all stay away from her because of her abilities. So she realized no one ever cared for her personally and they're just using her because of her talents. She also thought how no one will ever care for her in this life. So she didn't understand the purpose of her life then. She then remembers the moment she received the mission to go investigate Mr. Lin's bookstore and would receive orders through a TV screen, but that's normal to her because they would always give her orders this way so she can sense whether they are good or evil and so that she doesn't try to mind control them. But Lucy got used to it and her only goal was to always just complete the job successfully and everything would be fine. Man, I feel really sorry for this girl. Just imagine, out of all of the customers Mr. Lin got so far, he decided to pick on her because whatever his reasons were. But come on Mr. Lin, fix this situation, please. Now back to the story, we see Lucy's preparations for the mission to investigate the bookstore. She knew that it was class I for indescribable because it had an indescribable mutant in it. So she had to prepare thoroughly for it. So after spending a lot of time studying all the reports on this bookstore, from Joseph but from other people they've had reports on as well, she found some logic behind the indescribable level mutant who resides in the bookstore. And the logic being that this bookstore owner is an entity that completely acts like a regular bookstore owner would, with intents of selling or lending books, and that if you don't approach him in a negative way, he will stay calm and not act, the reason for this conclusion is that Joseph got incapacitated probably because he usually comes off as arrogant. Second thing about this bookstore owner entity is that it's close to if not completely both to omniscient and omnipotent level and this conclusion was made because of the conversation between Andrew and Doris so it would be for the best not to hide your thoughts as well after approaching the bookstore owner. And the last thing is the books themselves which are written in an ancient language and possess unbelievable powers 
but only if they are carefully selected by the bookstore owner and given to his customers. And they are considered as gifts because their price is nothing compared to the power they provide. Thus Lucy thinks that he asks for money for these books only because he is just role playing and doing all of this for fun. And she also thinks there is this famous line now that he says which after he says it you're completely under his control. Now we go back to Mr. Lin saying this line to Lucy as well now and the line being sit down and read some books. Bros, this gave me goosebumps when I read it for the first time and even now when I'm saying it again I'm getting goosebumps again. Mr. Lin is just running a regular bookstore in Ohio now it seems. <laughs> now back to the story. After Lucy heard this sentence, she got both a bit surprised and excited since there's not a lot of information about these books, but this is her chance to investigate them as well. But she also has a weird feeling how everything has suddenly become so surreal and it feels like she's living in an illusion right now, while her soul is being extracted from her body by some unknown higher entity. She then accidentally utters something saying if she can take a look at these books and then gets scared because she didn't want to say anything and Mr. Lin might have gotten angry because of this now. However, just the opposite happened because in his mind, Mr. Lin thinks how only with a couple of sentences he turned the researcher into a regular customer, thinking to himself how awesome he is for accomplishing this. He thinks she wants to choose a book herself instead of getting recommended one because she likes reading in general and Mr. Lin thinks both is good for his business because he makes money either way. But as Mr. Lin is thinking all of this, we can see something happen which never happened before. His shadow actually starts moving away from him and we learn that this shadow is inky. He swooshes away over the bookshelves as if it's searching for something. Mr. Lin then tells Lucy how there's no need to rush, she can slowly browse books while chatting with him. Lucy then thinks how Mr. Lin is so friendly and kind and thinks how she finally understands why Joseph wants to give him the cursed sword Candela and she decides she will finish her evaluation as soon as she picks a book. As she gets up to browse books, Mr. Lin tells her that there are more books in the back because it's more spacious and this completely scares her because she realizes that no one ever mentioned this kind of space in the bookstore before, meaning she's the first one to get offered this from Mr. Lin. She doesn't understand why he's doing this, but thinks so she has no choice now and has to follow his orders as she steps into the area in the back. After going in, we can see this space expanding almost to infinity, how huge it is, which Lucy realizes as well, thinking there is no bigger library in the world and how it must use some huge warping magic since it's way bigger on the inside than on the outside. As she's walking through the library, she thinks that all the books and knowledge of the world must be at Mr. Lin's disposal. She realizes that her sanity is slipping away as she's trying to analyze this, so she decides to quickly pick a non-dangerous looking book and leave this place ASAP. She was scared this whole time, but after looking at the names of these books, her fear increases even more because she thinks how even just reading the titles is making her so tired. So maybe it would be better to ask Mr. Lin for a recommendation and just then she notices a row of the same books called Soul Gazing. She thinks that maybe she should pick this book because its name sounds the best for her kind of job because her job is to understand the people's souls and evaluate if they are good or evil. But wait she thinks, it's like something is whispering to her to pick this book as if she has no other choice and she gets even more frightened now. We see Inky's eye and mouth appear behind her ominously laughing, but she doesn't see it. As soon as she touched the book, she got teleported to another dimension, standing on water on a dark night while a huge red moon is lightening up everything. She gets petrified because she doesn't understand what just happened and as she tries to speak she realizes that she can't. She sees lost souls all around her trying to reach her. Her eyeglasses crack as the blood starts pouring out of her eyes. She turns around and looks behind her while her body is leaking blood everywhere. She sees two shadowy figures of a man and an ox. Shadow tendrils wrap around her, squeezing her even more and causing even more blood to gush out of her and the piercing shadow runs through her eye. 
she can see a demonic figure controlling her every movement and as she screams in fear and pain, she falls down on the floor of the library, realizing she teleported back. She looks at this book again, seeing souls trying to leave it, and she starts sweating how scared she is. As small tentacles grow out of her eyes, she recollects her thoughts for a moment, thinking how she needs to leave this place immediately and find and talk to the bookstore owner. As we see Inky's shadow flying over bookshelves and highlighting two books, soul gazing and to live. Bros, I wanted to make a shorter video today because I was a little bit busy and to end this one here, but this is the cliffhanger I mentioned and there is no way I could end on this cliffhanger. So let's go back to the story. Now we see Mr. Lin being satisfied with how he's done business with this new customer and just casually sipping tea as we see Lucy all tired and sweaty come back and ask if she can borrow this one book. Mr. Lin sees the book and realizes that this book is really difficult and will not help her relax at all. And after looking at her, he sees that she looks even more tired now after trying to find the book than she was when she first entered the bookstore. He asks her if she's alright, to which she responds that she is, but that those souls did make her feel a bit uneasy. Mr. Lin, of course, misunderstands this, thinking she's referring to the characters in the book as souls, and that's how deep she dived into this book, he thinks. He then tells her that they should chat a bit to relax and thinks about how either she is highly empathetic or maybe she sees herself in some of the plot points in the book. Maybe she's both, Mr. Lin thinks, and figures it would be for the best if he gave her some after sales service in the form of advice. Thinking how soul healing his customers will make them regular and they will come back for more books. He tells her that it's normal to get shaken after reading the book for the first time this book, but over time she'll learn so much from it. Lucy understands this as Mr. Lin's approval of her choice of the book and thinks how she's probably too weak since for someone like her it's normal to be shaken by this kind of a book. She tells Mr. Lin how he's right and it's still difficult for her to understand the reality in this book and Mr. Lin responds how this is fine and normal since empathy is a part of human nature as he dramatically spins around saying that life is tough and all lives are the same. So how are others different from us? Saying that the universe is a cruel void and it has always been like that. But not everything is bad, since we are living surrounded by humans with emotions, and Lucy thinks how these emotions Mr. Lin is talking about are much higher than actual emotions ordinary people would possess. Thinking that these emotions Mr. Lin has have elevated him to the height of a deity, and how there is a reason he is an indescribable level, so much so that even elves of the honorable Iris family are his mere servants. And all of this is not just because he's all powerful, but also because he possesses an unending compassion and empathy towards everyone around him. She remembers how indescribables are usually selfish because of the power they possess. And they carry this title because it's hard to understand how powerful they are and how this bookstore owner's power is definitely that. She then asks Mr. Lin, is this why you are doing all of this? And he gets a little bit confused, not understanding what she initially means, but of course he figures it out, thinking how she means helping his customers, and answers by saying that if he understands his customers' troubles, he feels as if he needs to save them from their suffering, and then thinks to himself how this is also good for his wallet too, but that it was always in his nature to help people around him if he can. He then tells Lucy that she shouldn't look at what he's doing as something selfless, because anyone who has the heart would do the same. These words intrigue Lucy because she thinks that maybe he's implying she could do the same as well. Maybe he wants me to help him from within the secret instrument tower, Lucy thinks, and change this situation in knocking as well. She thinks this must be it, and how this is why he intimidated her at first, but then treated her as a customer and even allowed her to glance at his infinite wisdom. She thinks about how she needs to decide now 
whether to stand on the side of Mr. Lin or not, and how this wakes up some unpleasant memories in her, remembering when her father forced her to join the secret instrument tower. She asks Mr. Lin if he thinks she's really suitable for this. Mr. Lin smiles as he thinks that his soul healing session is going smoothly. But it's a problem because she's asking if she can, not how she can, which means she still doubts herself and wants other people to approve of her, so he needs to choose suitable words to answer and he tells her that this isn't about if she's suitable or not, but about how she thinks of herself, asking her did she ever think about what is causing all of this self-doubt within her. She gets completely surprised at this while Mr. Lin continues speaking, saying that the biggest problem is her job because she faces human suffering more than regular people and how facing these hardships causes you to feel pity for those people but how compassion can help others, but not yourself. So the stronger she gets in this way, the harder it will hit her as well and that this is the reason she doubts her performance now and is troubled by her job as well. She thinks how Mr. Lin has completely seen through her, thinking about how her talent helped her complete many missions, but is also like a leash on her neck, slowing her down and making her life more difficult. Now Mr. Lin thinks how this girl got too involved in her job, thinking how her whole life revolves around it, and it's a common problem of corporate slaves. He then remembers Ackerman and how changing her workplace like Ackerman changed his will not help her. What will help her is for her to realize her self-worth. By the way, thank you Mr. Lin for actually going in the right direction and maybe really helping your customers since Lucy really deserves it. He tells her how she needs to understand the deeper meaning of the book she picked out describing how he once witnessed a revival of an ancient civilization and how its people had to endure great hardship and develop land and they could never rest and how this book is a small feather of that great civilization. He then continues explaining how the most significant trait of this civilization was its tenacity which was a part of every soul in it and its courage and will to live. Mr. Lin tells Lucy this is exactly what she needs right now. She gets surprised and asks Mr. Lin if the souls in this book and he interrupts her and tells her that yes, they were all real ones. This scares her a little bit because she thinks how powerful he is to be able to capture billions of souls into a single book and how he even witnessed the development of the entire civilization. And as thoughts start racing through her mind, she stops and says that she shouldn't overthink as always. She then asks Mr. Lin if what he means is that she can fix her current situation if she reads and understands this book. Mr. Lin thinks that she's smart because she immediately understood him and he tells her that she's right and how this book is a perfect fit for her right now, saying that if she understands it completely, it will help with all of the problems she is facing now. He tells her that she's been wrong her entire life, how the most important thing about her isn't her ability, but herself entirely. Lucy starts feeling unfamiliar happiness as she sees light coming all around Mr. Lin because of how much he helped her right now, and hears him saying that she should shed off everything outside of her soul and live your own life for yourself only and how only this way her mind will return to peace. She then sees the man and the ox again as they are slowly vanishing and after they are completely gone she sees young Lucy sad in front of her and crying as she slowly approaches her and hugs her while still hearing Mr. Lin's words saying that when she faces her soul directly this way, only then she can say how she's given her best and feel proud of herself. As the young Lucy is crying, we see this illusion shatter, with all the trauma Lucy had within her. She starts crying out of happiness and Mr. Lin gets surprised, thinking how she's lacking in love so much, even these simple soul healing words made her cry. 
She tells Mr. Lin how she's fine now and that this book is incredible for her and thanks Mr. Lin for his guidance. Mr. Lin, relieved, asks her if she knows what she should do now and she answers by saying she will understand the book to the best she can and utilize it completely, telling Mr. Lin that from now on her entire being belongs to him. And the harem expands bros. Mr. Lin is trying to understand what she means by this but he can't and just tells her to think hard about it, how it will change her life for the better. She leaves the bookstore and sends a message to the secret instrument tower, thinking how she gained even more power and how incredible the power of soul gazing feels. She thinks how she can understand even deeper secrets of people's souls now, thanks to Mr. Lin, and how it's an honor for her to be his eyes. She then remembers her father's words, how eagles are pushed off of a cliff and how weak die. But now she finally knows this is not truth, because no matter how strong or weak they are, as long as they are alive, the moment they spread their wings, they will be reborn. Now we see Lucy and Joseph talking in the secret instrument tower where she's giving him the report about the bookstore owner and explaining how even the elder council admits they were wrong for doubting Joseph's comments about this bookstore, which also means that they have officially approved of Joseph's request to give the cursed sword candela to Mr. Lin. Joseph says that it was about time for those old fossils in the elder council to realize that the peace in Nokin can only be achieved if the secret instrument tower works with Mr. Lin. Lucy admires Joseph and tells him she never saw someone as pure white as him, implying that his soul is pure since she can see the good and evil of people's souls. But Joseph comments how this is just a Radiant Knight white suit which other Radiant Knights also wear. So we can see that Joseph has been hanging out with Mr. Lin because he's learning about misunderstandings from the best guy out there. Lucy also comments how the Elder Council will return Joseph his rank of a radiant knight once again and Joseph comments nothing about this just asking for the approval document for the transfer of the sword candela. As Lucy is leaving the room Joseph smiles and asks her how she feels now after receiving his help. Lucy first surprised but then turns around shining bright like a diamond because of how happy she is says that Mr. Lin gave her a new life. Lucy leaves and Joseph tells Claudie to come out while we see Claudie hiding behind a wall. A little embarrassed because Joseph knew he was there the whole time, Claudie tells Joseph that there are some urgent important documents for him to sign but how he didn't want to interrupt him so that's why he was hiding. Joseph teases Claudie saying that knowing him if they were really some urgent documents he would immediately tell Joseph about it and how that's not the reason for him spying but rather because he was curious about what happened to Lucy. Claudie admits this being the reason and comments how in the past Lucy always seemed depressed but now she's like a whole different person who makes you feel relaxed when you are around her. Saying that he didn't feel such a nice atmosphere in the secret instrument tower for so long and how the last time was when the great knight Daria and then immediately stops as he gets scared realizing he just indirectly somehow insulted Joseph. Claudie apologizes and Joseph, at first looking a bit disappointed, tells Claudie he's not good at making excuses, but then Joseph smiles, calling Claudie pure and foolish, and tells him how he always needs to finish what he's saying, no matter to whom he's talking to. This makes Claudie blush and get embarrassed really 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 much, because Joseph realized Claudie has a crush on Lucy, and Joseph continues saying that if you don't say something properly, you'll regret it later, while he remembers someone who looks like his daughter. Joseph then turns around and leaves, and as he's going away, he tells Claudie to do his his best or else he'll get transferred to a different department. Claudie was left speechless but then thinks to himself how Joseph wants the best for him and that's why he told him all of this and starts going crazy while thinking how he needs to approach Lucy no matter how embarrassed he feels about it. He decides to just start off with small talk since he didn't even talk to Lucy ever before. So they first need to get to know each other before he confesses anything to her. As he approaches Lucy, he tells her in a shaky voice how he wants to double 
double check the damage done by White Wolf Clan and the Scarlet Cult and as he's saying all of this, Lucy looks at him and immediately her face becomes red how shy she gets because she can read people's souls and after seeing Claudie's soul, she can only see words like I like you, I love you, you're cute, please go out with me. She tells him that the damage report is finalized and turns around, now not only her face being red, but her entire body, as she calls Claudie to her office. Bros, where is this going? If something happens here, this has to be motivation to you as well to go and talk to that girl you like, because if clumsy Claudie can do it, you can do it too. Uh, just hope that your crush can't read your soul like Lucy can. Anyway, anyway, as Claudie follows Lucy to her office, he thinks how everything went smoothly and is so happy about talking to her. Now we go back to Joseph, who's standing in front of Candela in his office, as he remembers something from the days of his youth, an interaction he had with Radiant Knight Daria. She calls him and tells him how she's gotta go on a mission soon, so he'll have to take care of dinner and she also asks where Melissa is, and we get to learn that Daria is Joseph's wife. He comments how Melissa and him were just practicing with a sword and how she's probably sleeping now and we can see young Melissa crying in her bed because of how difficult it is for her to learn all of this. Daria tells Joseph how it's good that they are training but he needs to remember that Melissa is still young so he needs to go easy on her and Joseph responds teasing Daria and says how Melissa was actually complaining that training with her mama is too hard and Daria laughs as Joseph continues talking saying how Melissa still needs to train much because when he was her age boom he gets interrupted by a flying towel that Daria threw at him and told him bragging time is over I already know that you're the strongest radiant knight ever so there's no need to always brag about it but how it's funny how the almighty Joseph can't even cook. They continue chatting casually in a way that really reminds me how single I am and then Joseph tries to tell Daria something about her mission but a sharp pain interrupts him and he falls down. Daria worries about him and he says that this curse is getting more and more frequent. Daria tells him to relax and starts massaging him to help him relax. She then warns him how even though he's powerful, not even he can withhold this curse. And Joseph comments saying that she shouldn't worry about it, because it's difficult to find a suitable wielder who would inherit the sword. Saying how if the curse only corrupts him, but he can save more lives before that, it's fine with him. Him. Daria comments how he'll die if this happens and Joseph says he doesn't mind dying because he needs to protect everyone around him because with great power comes great responsibility. Oh hi there Uncle Ben Joseph Parker, I didn't recognize you. Daria tells him that if one day he finds a way to solve this curse, no matter how, she hopes he'll make the right choice. How she doesn't want her loved one to suffer so much and to actually start to live for himself once. Joseph tells her that as long as she's by his side, no curse will ever stop him and this makes Daria blush. Joseph lifts her head up as he gets closer to her and asks her, what's wrong, do you have a fever? Daria starts yelling at him, telling him that he's an idiot for not understanding what just happened as she starts hitting him, while he tells her to stop because it hurts. Then both of them start acting like little kids after Daria tells Joseph to tell her that he loves her. Both of them are mega embarrassed now as Joseph turns around and tells her after she comes back from the mission he'll say it to her. She tells him how they've been married for so long now and how he still did didn't say it to her and he promises that after she comes back he'll definitely say it. She kisses him and tells him that she trusts him this time and from now on after this mission he'll have to say it to her often. Joseph tells her no problem how this will change after she comes back from the mission as we go back to the present and we see Joseph sad because that was Daria's last mission and he thinks how maybe if he stayed with her then things would have played differently. As he picks up the sword with intent to carry it and give it to Mr. Lin, he utters, I love you Daria. 
pros. I thought the last episode was sad, but look at my boy Joseph here. No, Joseph. Now, we go back to Mr. Lin looking through his book of customers and thinking about each customer and the books he gave them, thinking how every one of his customers is so good, they always return books on time, and not only that, but also bring him gifts as well. He then thinks about Joseph and how he planted the seed in him to turn him into a regular customer, especially because his daughter is also a customer in this bookstore as well. Mr. Lin thinks how it's been so boring recently and how it has been three days since that beautiful silver-haired lady borrowed a book from him. He thinks how there used to be a time before where he wouldn't get customers for months and now when it's only a couple of days he feels bored and it's probably because he built good rapport with his customers and enjoys talking with them. Just then we see Joseph enter the bookstore and Mr. Lin gets excited and happy and comments how he was just thinking about when Joseph will return the book. Joseph apologizes for not returning it back sooner and Mr. Lin says no problem and asks Joseph if he decided about what they talked about last time and Joseph answers by saying yes as he slams his sword candela on Mr. Lin's table and says this is my decision. Mr. Lin is left completely confused, way more than usual, because he has not the slightest idea what's happening right now and what does Joseph mean by this. Joseph thanks Mr. Lin for the book as well and Mr. Lin comments how Joseph looks way more happy because it seems he really liked the book a lot. Joseph says he's never felt more relaxed than now and that's why he made up his mind and Mr. Lin again has no clue what Joseph is talking about and why is he trying to give Mr. Lin such an expensive looking sword. Mr. Lin realizes that Joseph is for real and actually wants to give him this sword and after looking at it, Mr. Lin thinks how even for someone who doesn't know much about swords, he can tell that this one is really valuable and expensive. So he guesses that it's a ceremonial sword and not the one used in actual battles. Mr. Lin thinks that this sword for Joseph is a symbol of his military experiences and honor and that giving this sword to Mr. Mr. Lin must mean he wants to put those memories and burdens behind him. So yes, Mr. Lin thinks he finally understands what's going on and then asks Joseph if he's certain he really wants to give Mr. Lin this sword because it must have been passed down for generations so this is not a small decision. Joseph confirms and says he's sure about this because even though it has been passed down for generations, there's no one else to pass it to anymore and that it has become too heavy for Joseph to bear it and he needs to learn to let go of things. So that's why this decision is final. He also states that if Mr. Lin takes it, they will be greatly in debt to him and Mr. Lin understands this as another declining organization probably because Azir is at peace now so there's no need for military anymore. Great thinking Mr. Lin, you're definitely right as you always are. Now Mr. Lin thinks how this sword is a show of gratitude from Joseph to him because he also helped with his daughter's relationship and as he lifts the sword he tells Joseph that he's always enjoyed helping his customers because that makes him feel great too. Mr. Lin realizes this sword is way lighter than it looks, so it has to be a ceremonial sword after all. Mr. Lin admires the sword as he starts swinging it around like a child would. Joseph thinks how usually he would be surprised by this, but he knows that Mr. Lin is so powerful, he can swing this heavy sword so easily without even using any ether, and this is something not even Joseph can do. What? Okay, this is really getting interesting now. Joseph thinks about how this sword was made of materials from the dream world and this is maybe where Mr. Lin's power is connected to as well. Mr. Lin continues to admire the sword more and with a happy face thanks Joseph and asks him if he can pull the sword out to see it. Joseph starts trembling thinking how Mr. Lin has already noticed that the curse is connected to the blade itself, because after the original owner of the blade, King Candela, 
took his own life with the blade, his soul got trapped in the blade and this way the curse was born. He then thinks how Candela was so powerful that even indescribable level beings were no match for him and remembers an ancient text that was preserved about King Candela that says, Candela commanded the lion and the eagle. Millions of citizens supported him. When he raised light and fire, it was akin to lifting the sun. He broke obstacles, fought against the current, and cast himself towards the immortal who brought light last night. Joseph thinks how Candela was so brave to stand up for people in the darkest moment against the most powerful immortal of the night at the time, but how in the end, he failed. But the power that remains in the blade even after his death was so strong that even the powerful indescribable radiant knights could do nothing about this curse and would all succumb to it at the end and whoever touches the sword would get inflicted with this curse and how the kilt itself was designed to suppress the curse but only for a short while and that after the blade gets unsheathed the curse will befall the wielder immediately and if his willpower is weak he will go mad instantaneously Joseph's face is frozen and both eyes and mouth wide open as he looks at Mr. Lin and thinks how this time he is the one that's going to open the blade. So what will happen then he thinks and tells Mr. Lin that he can take a look if he wants but he needs to be very careful with it. Mr. Lin of course understands this in a way thinking that Joseph is implying for him not to cut himself with the blade accidentally. As Mr. Lin pulls the blade out, his eyes get wide open and he gets surprised because the blade is emitting light so bright that it's shining across the entire bookstore. As he looks at his reflection in the sword, he thinks of this sword is so beautiful and Joseph starts shivering because the evil forces start overflowing out of the sword and because this is the true curse of Candela. We can see shadows emerge from the blade looking like snakes and representing this curse as they charge towards Mr. Lin. Mr. Lin notices an ancient inscription on the blade and brings it closer to his face to take a better look as we see both the flower he got from Doris and the gargoyle he got from Old Wild trembling in fear as well. Joseph thinks how oh, this is bad, really bad, because the curse is about to swallow him whole and he still didn't act at all. And Joseph thinks how oh, even in the biggest battle against Old Wild, he didn't feel the fear he feels now. Joseph is trying to figure out what Mr. Lin is planning to do as we see a huge demonic being appear covering the entire library and as soon as Joseph saw him, he couldn't comprehend what's going on at all, but his instinct sent shivers down his spine because right now Joseph is witnessing an unfathomable taboo being appearing in front of him. We can see the dark demonic force taking shape and appearing behind Mr. Lin while he's holding the sword and the sword curse trying to reach him. This demonic force spread its tentacles and touches the diamond in the candela sword and we can see the curse feeling an immense pain and trying to run away towards Joseph and just before reaching him it vanishes. Joseph is completely frozen in fear this entire time trying to realize what he just witnessed happen in front of him and from what he can understand is that the powerful curse of candela felt what a target of a serial killer feels just before it gets slaughtered. The last moments of life when it has the strongest will to survive but life gets taken away from it is what this curse had just experienced. Even though the room is completely silent, Joseph can still hear cries of the curse's dying breaths. Only small bits of this curse are left in the blade, but enough for Mr. Lin to notice them as well and think how the bottom part of the sword looks a bit dark, thinking that this is maybe dirty, and since he doesn't have anything to clean it with, he'll try to shake the dirt off. He actually manages to shake the last bits of the curse off as we can see the demonic force behind him conjure a horrifying mouth and swallow the curse. Mr. Lin notices that the sword is shining even brighter now and thinks maybe it wasn't dirty after all 
but just some advanced sword craftsmanship. So he tells Joseph how this sword is really interesting, how he thought it was dirty, but it's actually just a part of the design. Joseph loses his mind now, thinking if this is actually happening, the curse that has been taking lives of indescribable level radiant knights for ages is now completely gone, and it was so easy for the bookstore owner to destroy it, that he even joked about it and called it dirt, meaning that all of this is just like a toy to him. Mr. Lin comments how he doesn't have anything to give Joseph in return for this favor, but tells him if there is any book he wants, he can get it for free. While we see this demonic force like a shadow of Mr. Lin lurking behind him. Joseph answers in a shaky voice because he's never been so scared in his life saying, no thanks. I greatly welcome this gesture, but you decide about the book. Now we see Mr. Lin thinking how after receiving such an expensive gift from Joseph, a free book is the least he can give Joseph back, and by letting Joseph pick a book, Mr. Lin can even advertise his stockpile of books as well, and increase his rapport with this customer, so this is not just a free gift, but it's also quite good for business too. He tells Joseph to pick some book for free, but Joseph responds by saying Mr. Lin can pick for him, and this leaves Mr. Lin surprised because there's no better feeling than discovering a new book. He encourages Joseph to actually try to find something, but Joseph still answers in the same manner, saying it's better for Mr. Lin to recommend a book. Mr. Lin thinks how Joseph might turn into his regular customer, like Old Wild, but is a little bit disappointed because he was hoping to show Joseph his book collection. And Joseph notices Mr. Lin's disappointment and thinks so it's because Mr. Lin thinks Joseph and the secret instrument tower are so weak that they couldn't deal with this curse at all. And Joseph thinks how now he truly feels how ignorant and powerless he is and justice without power can never save anyone. And he remembers his dead wife. But still, Joseph thinks the best option is to rely on Mr. Lin's recommendation because only an idiot would try to pick a book on their own here. And we see Lucy sneeze because indirectly Joseph is talking about her because she picked a book on her own. Poor Lucy can't catch a break. Now Mr. Lin is thinking about what kind of a book would fit Joseph the best now and as he picks out one book, he tells Joseph that this book should be perfect for him and his position now. After seeing the title of the book, which is When Stars Align, Joseph gets surprised and thinks how he could always maintain self-control easily, but now even his metal arm is shaking. He thinks it's partially because of the being he witnessed a couple of moments ago that ate the curse like a lollipop, because that being had power so huge it was incomprehensible. And what's even more terrifying is that it didn't even show its full power, but maybe like 1% of it, Joseph thinks. He thinks that this being might might even be literally the most powerful entity in the entire cosmos. He even thinks how cosmos itself is such a scary and taboo topic because nothing is known about it, but that it's a cold void spreading to infinity and now this being that's more powerful than the entire cosmos is giving Joseph a book that's about stars and universe in a way. Mr. Lin tells Joseph that he should look at the story in this book as a fiction, and as a story about a lost civilization from another world. Joseph interprets these words in a way, thinking there are civilizations even outside of the universe, and their knowledge and secrets are written in this book. Joseph slowly opens this book, a bit scared of what's waiting for him now, and then he finds himself floating in infinite darkness and saying how he's been here before, but now it feels a little bit different. He then hears a voice as it pierces through the darkness and tells him that he shouldn't be scared, there's no danger here for his customers. Joseph suddenly turns around yelling and asking who's there, as he sees a faceless man sitting on a chair with a book in his hands who says, looks like you've calmed down, welcome. When he looks at the face of this man, 
Joseph sees his reflection in the mask and the man continues speaking, calling Joseph a person who tried to gaze upon the stars in vain. Joseph interrupts him and asks for forgiveness, but he doesn't know who this person is. This person stops for a moment and then responds by saying that where they are now, his name is not important, but if Joseph needs to call him something, then he can call him L. So first I thought they are just copying L from Death Note, but I'm not as smart as Joseph it seems, because Joseph realized L stands for Lin, as he tells this person, alright Mr. L, can you please tell me what this place is. L then explains that where they are now is not really a place, and if it had to be described with words, it's Joseph's last chance to decide before he falls into endless insanity, explaining that if Joseph stays here, nothing will happen, but if he chooses to leave, his mind will not be protected anymore, and that only those people whose will hasn't been consumed by stars can become a beacon for lost travelers. He then asks Joseph to decide if he truly wants to leave this place and continue forward. Joseph puts his hand on his heart saying, even though he doesn't know much and doesn't understand much, he'll do all that is in his power to prevent further tragedies. This man interrupts Joseph, telling him that he doesn't have to decide right away, as he snaps his finger, dice disappear, as the man comments that they should play a game first. Now Joseph realizes that he's frozen in place and can't move as he tries to understand what's going on. He thinks that maybe this is the game this L is talking about, but he also must be quite powerful because with just one sentence he took away Joseph's ability to move. Joseph wonders what are the goals of this man as the man tells him that it's time to start the game and tells Joseph to move with his companion and then suddenly a humanoid figure starts appearing next to Joseph while he wonders if this man possesses the ability to create life out of nothing. Even though this humanoid figure is blurry, Joseph can sense that it actually is alive, and Joseph even feels close to it in a way like this is his partner or a friend, so he thinks if this man actually altered his emotions and made it so that Joseph feels this way. We see L throwing dices and telling Joseph that his partner and he are in an old and damaged building and how this building has been abandoned for a while now. Suddenly, around Joseph and his partner, the said building appears and Joseph, still speechless, thinks how this man can even create objects out of nothing and how maybe this guy is some powerful existence from the dream world. Or maybe he's using dream world to cover reality, meaning all of this might might be an illusion. Just then L comments and says, perception successful. Suddenly your spirit sense notices something strange. You feel like something is looking at you and your instincts tell you to look behind. This man is narrating this game the same way it's done in Dungeons and Dragons, but for Joseph this is all reality. As Joseph turns around, L says, an unspeakable creature appears behind you, and Joseph thinks how this man can even make monstrosities like this one with just his words. As Joseph tries to use his ether, he realizes L also removed his mutant abilities beside his ability to move. The monster wraps around Joseph and Joseph starts screaming and losing his mind as L says that after touching the taboo thing, magnificent and uncanny images filled Joseph's mind as the world around Joseph from his point of view starts melting and spinning, El continues speaking and says, the deranged words of blasphemy have polluted your mind. You can no longer separate reality from illusion. You slowly lose consciousness as an overwhelming fear crushes your mind. You feel like you've fallen into a boundless void and there is nothing around you. Your existence is about to be consumed by this mysterious force and with your last remaining Sanity, what is the last thing that you will do? Joseph on the brink of death and just before getting swallowed by the monster completely utters, 
I push my companion forward. We can see reality crack and a huge dream beast appears above Elle as Joseph starts falling down into the void, having a hard time understanding what he's seen around him and Elle says that Joseph did it. Joseph falls on the ground, still incomprehensible but looking like Black Sea, he's lying on it like it's solid. Joseph gets up thinking how he's still alive and doesn't hear that voice in his mind anymore so maybe the game is finally over. But then a wave rises behind him and as he looks behind he sees a huge monstrosity walking and causing these waves with its steps. This creature's name is the Crawling Chaos, Nyar Lathopet. For those of you who don't know, this is a monster from H.P. Lovecraft's books, just like Cthulhu is, and we've also seen like Cthulhu looking like creatures in the dream world. And some of you guys even noticed this and told me about it in the comments. Now we can see it stare with its many eyes at Joseph, and it starts floating upwards. It's difficult to describe what Joseph sees, because this dimension is like a nightmare mixed with reality. A fever dream that you had, but don't remember if it actually happened or was just a product of your mind while your body was sick. Joseph starts floating as he hears a voice reciting a song called Demon Sultan as a Thoth and he hears these sentences. Demon Sultan as a Thoth Bubbles in confusion Center of the universe Sprouting foul protrusion Muffled man in beating drums, hellish flutes are playing. Round him dance the others, voiceless, mindless swaying. As the entire universe is collapsing around Joseph, he makes a sudden gasp for air, and as he regains a tiny bit of his ability to think and move, firstly he remembers his name, and thinks how he wants to get out of this dimension, he wants to scream out his lungs, his head gets dizzy and his brain starts overheating, but he closes his eyes, recollecting his thoughts, trying to stay calm and remembers Mr. Lin's words how this novel is fictional. But Joseph thinks how it's not fictional at all. But Mr. Lin told him this to stop him from panicking and so Joseph could preserve even a slight part of his sanity. But Joseph thinks how he doesn't mind living like this because he's used to getting by. He looks at Mr. Lin and thinks how his assessment on Mr. Lin's power was completely wrong. But that's because the highest rank to give to someone is class I for indescribable. He then finally manages to utter something as he asks Mr. Lin if those great beings were a part of that civilization. Now Mr. Lin completely confused again wonders what kind of a question is that but maybe he's asking this question because the book is too difficult for Joseph to understand as we see that the book Mr. Lin originally gave Joseph is decisive moments in history. But he responds to Joseph saying how they were the monuments of the old civilizations and witnesses and makers of history. But also says that nothing is eternal and no matter how great they were were time still overpowered them. Joseph is shaking in fear as he thinks about how this book is keeping these powerful entities in it, like some kind of a seal, and how if you fulfill some requirements you can summon them, but this summoning is of high risk as well. Joseph thinks how these beings, according to Mr. Lin, were a part of a great and more advanced civilization from ancient history, but how they fell and were sealed in this book, and how the person who trapped them in this book is the incomprehensible bookstore owner in front of him. As he looks at Mr. Lin, who has a dull smile on his face as he still has no idea what's going on. Now from Mr. Lin's perspective, he thinks Joseph is thinking about something ridiculous, so Mr. Lin decides to give him some words to help him understand better and then says that even if Joseph feels slightly lost, it's quite normal. And if he can't understand many parts of this book, he shouldn't think too much about them. And the most important thing is that he can understand the minds within the book and make them useful to him. Joseph smiles uncomfortably and asks, make them useful to me? 
that might be a bit tricky for me. But Mistelin encourages him and says that giving this sword was his decision, so now he should let go of the past and face the future with greater resolve. And how having challenges after starting a new life is always difficult, but he can use this book to guide him. And Mistelin tells him to take this book as a gift and read it carefully when he goes back home. Joseph bows down and thanks to Mr. Lin and Mr. Lin says no need to be so kind and how he's just passing others ideas and then tell Joseph one quote millions of people within a nation are always necessary for one genius to come into being millions of idle human hours must always pass before a truly historical decisive moment in history makes its appearance if such a critical moment occurs in the world it's decisive for decades and centuries when the strong personal will collided with the historical fate the sparks flashed and the moment forever shined in the sky of human civilization every such fleeting moment is a stage for heroes after finishing the quote Mr. Lin also tells Joseph that he doesn't need to be a hero, how he's just a human and should know that there are limits to what you can do and also tells him that he shouldn't either overestimate or underestimate himself and just fulfill his duty when the time comes. This leaves Joseph surprised as Mr. Lin continues and says that he doesn't need to shine for eternity but just follow his will and stick to his beliefs. How his existence will become the light that will always illuminate the night no matter how dark it may seem. Joseph remembers a day he was knighted when he was just a boy and made an oath to devote his life to justice and how he'll forever fight for the light. Mr. Lin then also says that Joseph should never forget emotions he feels now and how maybe this book will help him fulfill his destiny. Joseph clenches his fist as he utters I... I will. Now we see Joseph as he exits the library and gets overwhelmed by his emotions, feeling nostalgic like never before, but decides to calm down. He stops and takes a deep breath. As he clenches his iron fist, he thinks how he didn't feel this alive for a long time now because he's been having to deal with the curse of Candela for almost his entire life and had to protect his mind from its maddening whispers, which has caused him terrible headaches and made it so hard for him to keep his head cool, which would cause him to go on anger fits often, also resulting in him having less power because he couldn't maintain the discipline over his power. He remembers how because of these problems he even lost his right arm after the battle with Old Wild, but now, finally after so long and once and for all, the curse is gone thanks to Mr. Lin who literally ate it, is what Joseph is thinking. Joseph feels like he was sick for a long time and is finally fully recovered now, which makes him feel completely free. Even though he doesn't have his sword anymore, he gained so much confidence thanks to giving it to Mr. Lin and he even got a book from Mr. Lin in return, which will help Joseph unlock even higher power levels. So this was a fair trade he thinks. As he's walking down the rainy street, he plans to focus up and get used to this new change, which will allow him to be as powerful as he was at his peak, and bump. Just then he accidentally bumps shoulders with Ackerman, who apologizes to Joseph, and of course Joseph doesn't know who this is. So he gets immediately surprised because after feeling Ackerman's aura, he realized that Ackerman is a hunter with extremely pure source of tainted blood. By the way bros, even the writers of this manhua are calling this guy Ackerman now and I think just like me, they forgot his real name, his first name and are just going with Ackerman because everyone can remember this one more easily. So Joseph realizes that this guy is at least a destruction level hunter but how there's no one of that power in the white wolf clan so maybe he's working alone joseph thinks 
Joseph wonders what could this strong level hunter do in knocking all of a sudden, but changes his mind and decides not to ask him about it, because it's too dangerous to interrogate someone of the destructive level, because this could cause problems to the secret instrument tower. Joseph also thinks how he didn't sense any killing intent from this guy, so he can just ignore him for now. We look at Ackerman and see his eyes glowing red in bloodthirst, and he even unsheathed his hidden blade because he also realizes Joseph is powerful and was getting ready to defend himself, which also means that he actually had murderous intent, but just he hid it so well that even Joseph couldn't sense it. But when Ackerman realized Joseph was walking away, he also calmed down and went his way. Now we go back to Joseph who's talking on the phone to Claudie, asking him how's the mission going regarding the White Wolf clan and search for their hunters. To which Claudie responds that it's going smoothly and Joseph asks him to do a research on the language of Kingdom of Elphaz, because the Candela sword had something inscribed on it on that language which caused some intrigue with Mr. Lin. Joseph also warns Claudie to be careful when gathering intel on the white-haired solo hunter because he's probably a destructive level hunter, so it would be for the best to gather as much intel about him as possible, but to be careful while doing it. Bros, I think it's safe to say that we're not getting to see what happened between Lucy and Claudie after they went to her office. Not cool guys, not cool. So Joseph decides that he needs to relax a little little bit so he will take a week off from work because he has been working so hard for so long. As he goes home, he remembers he has some materials in his study room which he hasn't read for years that could contain some information about this ancient language. As he's entering his house, he thinks how it would be nice if Melissa didn't take it after him when it comes to reading because she starts having headaches as soon as she starts reading books. But it's not that important since a knight needs to know how to fight and not how to read. After entering his house, he gets completely surprised because there are books lying on the floor everywhere, as Joseph wonders what happened to cause this mess. He looks at the clock and figures this is the time when Melissa usually has dinner, but he can't smell or sense anyone or anything in the kitchen. He thinks how this is odd because Melissa is an excellent cook and thinks about what food she might be cooking now if she was in the kitchen, because he is hungry and tired after work, so it would make sense for her to welcome his dad with a nice and warm meal, is what Joseph thinks. As he looks around the room to see what kind of books she was reading, he picks up one titled A Knight's Justice, and he remembers that the author of this book is Joseph Winston. Joseph the Radiant Knight remembers this Joseph the author and remembers when this Joseph was a commander but got fired because of his combat style that was not suitable for other knights to learn from, but he wrote all about it in this book. Joseph was also a knight whose commander was Joseph. Come on guys, what's up with giving the same name to multiple characters in the same webtoon? I'm already struggling with remembering all the names and now you do a brother like this? Pfft. Anyway, Joseph the author was yelling how the way the knights fight should not only be chivalrous and as long as you believe in the holy light, you can fight in any way because chivalry is a burden in fight. Now our Joseph, the Radiant Knight, remembers how his commander Joseph would prefer stealthy combat and the one of an assassin, stalking its prey and killing it from behind, using throwing knives and poisons to achieve his goals. His motto was, knights can kill people, but they are outsiders. As our Joseph is going through this book, he also remembers the first disciple of this Joseph the Assassin Knight and how his disciple was also a troublemaker. I swear, if his disciple's name is also Joseph, I'm using this window in my room not for sunlight, but for jumping through. We learned the disciple's name and his name was... Hana Yamakoru. Oof, my life is saved. And this guy looks like the nerdiest, buffest dude in the history of the universe. Joseph remembers asking Hana Yamakoru about his mission, to which Hana Yama responds by saying that if you can't win against your opponent, 
you train and study him well, and how this is what only the weak do. And then Hanayama tells Joseph a story of the knight order, and as he's trying to tell the story of a rogue knight, Joseph interrupts him, slamming his fist into wall and getting absolutely angry, saying that if you don't study your opponent and train because you don't want to look like you're weak, you expose yourself to unnecessary dangers. Now we go back to the present and Joseph is just closing this book, thinking how he needs to stop remembering Hanayama now because it causes his blood pressure to rise. He looks at the books Melissa was reading and realizes that all of these books are about basics of becoming a knight, how even though these are fundamentals, for someone new to become a knight this knowledge is still really really useful. But for Melissa these books should be useless because she was personally trained by Joseph, so he doesn't understand why she would read them now. He throws the book on the ground and marches towards Melissa's room and as he enters the room and calls for her, he can see Melissa sitting at her desk reading books while her room is swarming with books on all sides. This surprises Joseph as he yells, Melissa, what are you doing? Melissa, with a blank expression on her face, responds to her father, saying that she's learning, which confuses him even more. And as he's slowly walking towards his daughter, he tells her that from what he remembers, she doesn't like reading books and learning this way. And she had this opinion ever since she was four years old. Melissa responds by saying that she was foolish and she didn't understand the true meaning of learning because she was ignorant back then and how because of her limited potential she couldn't feel the joy of learning. She also says that if she could talk to her 4 year old self, she'd beat her badly for having these opinions and then tell her to start learning and while she's saying this she has a crazy look in her eyes. Joseph grabs her by her head as he leans in closer to ask his daughter if she's okay to which Melissa responds by saying that she has a clear head now and she never felt this good before because she finally understands her weakness and stupidity. She comments how she wasn't disciplined enough when she was younger, thus she gave up on reading and learning, which caused her to be weak and not reach her goal of becoming much more powerful, which causes panic for her now because she is such a failure. Joseph is left speechless because he can't recognize his dear, naive and easygoing but reckless and adorable daughter anymore. It's like someone switched places with her. But his thoughts get interrupted and he gets surprised after Melissa starts to blame him too because as she says, his methods are barbaric and actually his experience has no methods, but how he doesn't need to worry anymore because Melissa already read all the books in this house and even though she's older now and lost so much time, she can still find her own path and start again. Joseph left surprised yet again, asks her if she really read all the books here and she answers that she really did. So he asks her for how long has she been reading and she comments how she borrowed all these books and have been constantly reading them for 3 days straight. As we see Joseph's hand flying towards her and grabbing the book out of her hands. With bloody eyes, because she has been reading so much, Melissa yells, Daddy, what are you doing? And as she's looking at Joseph, she starts feeling dizzy and faints. But before she hits the ground, Joseph catches her and puts her down slowly. As he turns around, he sees a special book on her table. Lightning strikes, and then we go back to Ackerman, who's standing in front of the Truth Society's headquarters, thinking how he never expected to come back here so soon. He thinks how he wishes there was no need for him to come to a place like this ever again, because he is a hunter, and it's hard for a hunter to fit in this environment, because a hunter's life consists of brute force and fighting, of chaos and madness. 
He thinks how hunters are just wild beasts disguised as normal human beings, and how this is the complete opposite of an organization like Truth Society, which is an institution built on rationality and knowledge. He also thinks how he can't smell anything special here, how all the members of the Truth Society have pretty much the same and average smell, and the only smell that spreads in the cold that they have is the smell of curiosity. As he's entering Andrew's office, he thinks that even though this place is so luxurious, its dullness can never be concealed, as Andrew comments and tells Ackerman that he is late. Ackerman responds, saying how hunters are never late and are also never early, and that hunters always arrive on time. Uh, is this guy a hunter or a wizard? If you get this reference, let me know down in the comments below, broskies. I'm not gonna give you any more hints, it should be quite obvious. Now, Ackerman then asks Andrew if he only has more patience when ladies come to visit him, and if that's the case, he's sorry for his negligence. Ackerman comments. Andrew tells him to stop joking and start talking business and asks him if he really wants to give up on his mission to hunt down and kill Old Wild. Ackerman with a cocky smirk says, can I not? Now we see Andrew wondering what could have happened to Ackerman because only three days ago he was so excited to take on the Old Wilds case but now he's refusing it with even more passion and he even has a different aura around him. Andrew is trying to figure out what happened in the bookstore after Ackerman went in because this is when he received this sudden change of heart. He also thinks about how they use the detector to spot if there are any ether abilities activating, but no such thing happened during his stay in the library. So Andrew figures out that maybe Ackerman decided to abandon this mission even before entering this bookstore, but this is highly unbelievable, Andrew thinks, but he can't find any other logic behind all of this. Maybe just having a normal talk with the bookstore owner is what caused Ackerman to lose his will about this case. But that's outrageous. Andrew realizes that he cannot use only his ration and logic to understand what has happened here, so he tells Ackerman that the reason he took the Old Wilds case in the first place was because after completing it, he would have been promoted to a destructive level hunter, and Ackerman responds confirmatively. Ackerman says that he actually did feel very motivated to do this bounty because of this promotion. And Andrew then asks him about his choice to abandon this mission, because out of all the destructive bounties right now, the easiest target currently is Old Wild. And he also mentions that the reward for completing this mission was bigger than usual rewards. And then Ackerman interrupts him and says that it's none of Andrew's business why did he choose to abandon abandon this mission. Ackerman states that he's not breaking any rules by abandoning mission and even not telling the reason why he's still not breaking any rules. So Andrew shouldn't be concerned about it. His eyes glow red with bloodthirst again as he calls Andrew a bit anxious right now. Now Andrew thinks to himself how he did use Ackerman to investigate the bookstore that was classified I for indescribable, but now that Ackerman is choosing to abandon this mission, things will become more complicated because Ackerman has the upper hand in this conversation now and if Andrew tries to convince him to stay on this bounty, Ackerman might realize about other motives that Andrew has. Andrew realizes that he shouldn't be scared now and just try to go with the flow of the conversation as he says that he definitely does feel anxious but because he's concerned about the future of the city of Nokin, because there has been many incidents recently in this city. So the Truth Society hopes someone could help them make this city safe yet again, make Nokin great again. Andrew tells Ackerman that he hopes Ackerman can understand his motives. Now Ackerman smirks as he thinks to himself how Andrew is losing his cool and as he's looking at Andrew ominously, he's thinking to himself how he he would never really thought something like this was possible if it wasn't for Mr. Lin who made him realize that they are actually using him and how after Mr. Lin's guidance it seems obvious now that Andrew and the Truth Society are using him to investigate the bookstore 
owner. He also thinks that the life of a hunter is filled with killings and slaughter, but that's not all a hunter can do. Ackerman finally responds to Andrew, saying that he doesn't care about maintaining law anymore and is abandoning the mission because of his personal reasons. He also tells Andrew how he's certain Andrew has already done research on his background and the life of hunters in general, where they will only hunt valuable prey because they are egoists. Because even the beasts in the wilderness just seek their own benefits while avoiding potential harms. Now he thinks to himself again how his new goal is making an organization of hunters and how this organization would basically be the enemy of the truth society. He also thinks how people working in the truth society are too ignorant because they don't even realize how powerful Mr. Lin is and how Mr. Lin is leading them on to hunt him. So Ackerman decides to keep the truth society in the dark and not give any reports about the bookstore owner. Now we see Andrew getting surprised because he doesn't understand what Ackerman means by saying avoiding troubles because he doesn't understand who Ackerman is is talking about that's in trouble. Andrew, being observative as he is, thinks that there's no point in asking Ackerman who is in trouble, but since he abandoned Old Wild's case, it's not Old Wild. And if it's not the bookstore owner as well, then he must be talking about the truth society. Andrew is trying to figure out if Ackerman found out something about the truth society and then it hits him. His attitude changed completely after visiting this bookstore owner, so maybe this bookstore owner gave some secret information to Ackerman. This is what Andrew thinks. If something like this actually did happen, then the bookstore owner must have manipulated Ackerman in such a short time and this is why he doesn't have to do anything personally himself, but can just provoke people to make them do his bidding. Andrew gets irritated because there are so many questions he wants to ask, but he can't ask anything directly. He then comments how he won't convince Ackerman further if this is his decision, and says so after he accepted the bounty, these news were made a public knowledge, so according to this logic as well, his decline of this bounty will also be made a public knowledge. He asks Ackerman if that's fine with him, and now we can see Ackerman getting visibly angry, thinking that Andrew Andrew is trying to manipulate him by threatening to ruin his reputation if he makes the information about his decline of this case public because people might think of him as a coward. As he stands up he responds by saying of course and continues thinking to himself how this was to be expected from the vice president of the truth society to threaten him the moment he sees his opportunity slipping away. Ackerman remembers how Andrew had great talent when he was younger and would also often flirt with many women, the most notable of which was the prophet of the Iris family, the elf named Doris, but how nothing happened between Andrew and her at the end. As Ackerman is leaving the room, he thinks that he underestimated Andrew, but how even though if his reputation does get ruined, it means nothing to him, because hunters are known for being infamous over having no reputation at all. He thinks that he was always hiding on the down low while being a panicky level hunter, but now that he's a destructive level, he will need to advertise himself more if he wants to gather other hunters to follow him. He exits the room and tells Andrew no need to see me off. Now we see Andrew staying alone in his room and as the lightning strikes, he also thinks to himself how he underestimated Ackerman, but thinks how after talking with him just now, he has a sense of his behavior, how when needed, he has a lot of patience when facing his target, and that he's exactly as the rumors describe him. But how does he dare take on the truth society, while only being a single destructive level hunter, Andrew thinks, while well, he gets enraged so much that he starts breaking the glass of wine he's holding in his hand, as he continues to think, that if this bookstore owner is as kind as everyone says he is, he should have helped Ackerman complete his mission right away and not make him abandon it, causing Ackerman to ruin his reputation as well. 
Andrew is trying to figure out what Mr. Lin's plan is because he must have foreseen the actions turning out this way. He also thinks that maybe this bookstore owner likes Old Wild, thus saving him from Ackerman by making Ackerman abandon his mission on Old Wild. Andrew picks up his phone or a communication device as it's known in this world because apparently they don't have technology and he thinks how he needs to obtain as much information as possible about Old Wild. He calls Joseph's office but Claudie answers because Joseph is on a vacation right now. Andrew asks about where Joseph is and Claudie explains how he's on a temporary leave. And if Andrew has any problems, he can tell Claudie about it. Andrew asks about the report about the Class I bookstore and if they have all the information and Claudie responds by saying that Andrew is lucky because this info has just recently been updated but how it's very valuable and then feels a little bit shy thinking to himself how it's still difficult for him to sell this information for money as well as Joseph can do. Andrew exhales, asking how much is it, and Claudie asks him to wait a moment as he turns around and sees one new email in his inbox. By the way, if the phone is not called a phone, but a communication device in their world for whatever reason, how do we call computers then? Hmm? What do you guys think? Tell me down in the comments below, what would be a suitable name for computers in their world? Now let's go back to the story. After opening the email, Glory has gotten an order from Joseph to not sell any information about the bookstore, no matter the price. He apologizes to Andrew, saying, it's not for sale after all. Andrew is left completely surprised by this as he thinks why wouldn't they want to even sell them this information and how in the past the Truth Society and the Secret Instrument Tower have always been cooperating because they always have to revise and update the lists of the powerful mutants in knocking together. But this time, even when Andrew didn't try to negotiate the price, he got blatantly refused. Andrew also realized that Claudie used the same tone of voice Joseph uses when selling him information usually, but after 3 seconds of conversation, Claudie said how the info is no longer on the table for sale, meaning that if they concluded the deal 3 seconds ago, he could have bought the information. So he figures out someone must have stopped Claudie from selling information literally in the period of those couple of seconds and that the only person who can order Claudie like that must be Joseph. Now we see Joseph who's sitting next to his daughter while she's lying in bed sleeping, completely exhausted from reading many hundreds of books in a period of 3 days. Now back to Andrew and Claudie having a conversation on the phone where Andrew asks Claudie to connect him with Joseph so he can speak to him directly. Claudie apologizes and says how Joseph is currently busy and that he can't talk right now and if he has any questions he can ask Claudie directly and Claudie will try to help him as much as he can. Andrew asks Claudie to explain why the files are not for sale all of a sudden and Claudie responds that he made a mistake for even trying to sell them in the first place because the files confidentiality has been changed from top secret to sealed meaning no one can get access to them outside of the secret instrument towers. Bros, are you telling me Claudie is really a boy with a trunk like this? Come on, look at this. This is a hard test for me to pass. Now Claudie continues speaking, saying that if he sold these documents to Andrew, he would be violating the rules and get a severe punishment for it, and explains how as of recent he's been required to take over Joseph's job until Joseph returns, so he was not familiar with all the details, so he made a mistake of thinking of selling sealed type files. But if Andrew really needs these files, he can talk to Joseph personally after he returns, or talk to the elders of the secret instrument tower. We can see Andrew getting really pissed and whispers some bad bad words so bad that we can't even see what they are. Now Andrew thinks that what's making him angry is that he can't find any loopholes in the excuses Claudie is giving him and how maybe Claudie is speaking the truth and if either is true Andrew can't refute him in any way. He also thinks how every time he speaks to Claudie, Claudie is very polite, but this time in particular it's making him so nervous because now it feels like Claudie is making a fool of him. He also doesn't understand why the confidentiality of the files changed all of a sudden. He exhales to calm down and asks Claudie why did the confidentiality of the files upgrade now to sealed after half a month of being top secret and not sealed, because these are still the same files after all. 
He then starts yelling, saying how the person in these files is the bookstore owner. So why are they refusing to provide information about him? Did he mind control all of them? So Claudia apologizes now and tells Andrew that it's not only one file in question now, which leaves Andrew confused as Claudia continues explaining how after a detailed investigation a new subfile has been created, how the previous file was a region archive and how this new subfile is people profile, and how recently the elders have sent a professional examiner to check Mr. Lin and this professional examiner came to the same conclusion as Joseph, which is that the bookstore owner truly is friendly and kind without any obvious motives to his actions. As Claudie is saying all of this, we can see Lucy sorting books in this office. Bros, are we getting the office in between Claudie and Lucy? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Andrew then starts yelling, saying that what if the negligence of the secret instrument tower and their lack of cooperation with the truth society causes danger for citizens in knocking? What would happen then? He tells Claudie this is not how you are supposed to be responsible for the safety of the citizens. He says he's disappointed in how the secret instrument tower is handling this situation and how he will definitely talk to the elders about it later. Claudie, relieved, tells Andrew that he hopes hopes he'll have a fruitful conversation with the elders. Andrew feels as if Claudie is hiding something, but since he has no proof he can't say anything. Claudie then asks him if he has any more questions, to which Andrew responds by saying that he still didn't get an answer to why the file's confidentiality has been upgraded. Claudie responds how he has no say in this matter and doesn't know why or how would the confidentiality of this file change, as Lucy is bringing him some tea. My boy Claudie went from a simp to a gigachad in a couple of chapters, even having Lucy serving him tea. He then tells Andrew that it will be more beneficial for him to talk to elders than to talk to him, as we see Andrew still pissed, thinking how Claudie inherited Joseph's cunningness. Andrew then comments how he'll personally go to the bookstore to investigate, to which Claudie responds by saying that he hopes he has a pleasant visit and how Mr. Lin, besides being super kind, also helps people solve their problems. After hanging up the phone, Andrew pours some wine, takes a sip and comments like he's some kind of a fashion diva saying, me going there personally, forget it. <laughs> he decides he'll send some scholars to go instead of him. Now we see some factory belonging to the truth society and a lot of scientists commenting about clay child plan and how this project is growing in difficulty with every passing day, how the higher ups are not sending enough funds which is slowing down the progress considerably and how since this plan is a top secret project, they can only only stay and work in the laboratory. Then a voice interrupts them, saying that they need to stop complaining and how it's a great honor to work for the Truth Society. But they continue complaining, saying that if the research follows the current trajectory, everyone here will lose their minds. They talk about how many failed projects they have had and one of them points out that this is the only successful one they've had, as we see a woman floating in one of these capsules. Science Scientists comment how she is the best experiment they've done and how with her they've achieved that her body can withstand ether compatibility of 200%, but because of this and the sage stone amount in her blood, her lifespan is shortened to one year only. After a year, the power of the sage stone in her blood will lose its regeneration properties, basically causing her body to inflate like a balloon and burst out. And if this happens, while she is in this laboratory, the explosion will kill everyone in it as well. They continue complaining and commenting about how their jobs currently are dangerous and bad because of the crazy working hours as we see the face of this young girl, both without expression but with a huge sadness and emptiness in her eyes. As she looks up towards the moon, she moves her hand towards the glass of the capsule she's in and after touching it, causes it to start cracking. Now we see G standing on a spacious balcony gazing out in the distance asking Kay and Max if the men of spiders have arrived. Max confirms their arrival and says that they gathered all of their men in order to attack the white wolves. Sensing that it's probably their last base out there, G decisively explains that attacking this place would be their final battle with the white wolf clan, which 
could also be the end of the magic mirror event, making her revenge come to an end. She further explains that it doesn't matter how strong the new batch of hunters is, because if they don't get acknowledged by other organizations, they won't be able to stand their ground. Kay and Max just stood there listening to G saying that the conflict between the spiders and white wolves is happening because there is no need for two large scale hunter organizations in Noken and that's why they have to be exterminated. Miss G then recalls the times when Kaki told her about the tainted blood formula which is the most important thing to white wolves. By the way bros this Kaki guy was the guy Miss G killed. I mean found dead in the church when she invaded the church with Kay and Max. His name wasn't Kaki, I don't remember his name but I don't feel bad about not remembering his name because even the authors don't remember his name. They should have given like all the characters Attack on Titan names like Ackerman so everybody would remember them easily. <laughs> anyway, back to the story. G was surprised that he wanted to tell her the top secret of the organization, despite her being promoted to just the third leader of the White Wolves organization. Kaki, being the second leader, told her she might take over his position and said that Helix personally ordered him to bring her so he can talk to her. After they enter Helix's residence and Kaki asks him about tainted blood formula research, mentioning that he fulfilled his order by bringing Miss G. Helix, the first leader of White Wolf's clan, looks at them with a terrifying expression on his face, asking if this is G Bongong's famous daughter. Miss G nervously observes Helix, thinking he's staring at her like when an evil wolf stares at its prey. Helix senses Miss G's great potential and assigns her to lead a part of the White Wolf's organization. He then passes her a part of the original formula from the White Wolf clan, saying she needs it because fresh blood of the Dream Beast is very toxic, proposing she uses this to train her subordinates. He instructs Miss G to master and perfect the formula and only then she can create hunters since the current formula is harsh and very few make it out alive after the first injection, but the ones who do survive would greatly increase their power. Standing on the balcony, Miss G tells Max and Kay about the tainted blood formula. She also thinks about how she needs to cover her source of information so Ryan's soul could have more space for improvement. Miss G finds a way to do it and wanting to put an end to this, sends Max to investigate and locate the original formula and tells Kay to order the killing of all the White Wolves hunters except one. A few moments later, the battle on the 52nd street started. Meanwhile, there was a heavily wounded man sitting in the sewers looking as if he cannot move while rats are eating his leg up. A group of white wolves have approached him and one of them stepped on his leg and crushed it and then another one of them grabbed his hair and slit his throat like a savage. These white wolves had a crazy look in their eyes, veins popping on their faces with razor sharp teeth. They looked like zombies, literally. They turned into wolves and ate the man's flesh until there were only bones left. Now we see the chamber where the spawn of the magic mirror needs to hatch and we can see tainted blood pouring into a pool like hole in the sewers with body parts falling into it as Helix arrives and stands there saying that the plan is going smoothly. There is an Amazonian looking like lady named Theresa who approaches Helix and tells him that they successfully injected excessive amounts of tainted blood in every and how now they'll become irrational and their only purpose would be killing. Helix mentions that it doesn't matter if someone is human or not and as long as the spawn of the magic mirror can be born, he would be prepared to sacrifice as many people as possible. He tells Theresa to prepare new fuel as she tosses a carcass into the pool of tainted blood. 
While the carcass is falling, before it reaches the ground, it bursts in green flames as Helix stands and watches it burn, thinking that the altar looks like a huge fire pile. Looking down at the fire, he realizes that everything thrown into it starts blazing immediately, but just until there is enough energy provided for the incubation of the spawn of the magic mirror. Helix's heart was filled with darkness as he stood in front of the egg and watched it incubate hearing the sound of the flames. The egg seemed to be incubated healthily at a fast pace as Helix smiled at a beautiful view, feeling the whole place shake and he associated this feeling as the one of a heartbeat, thinking how this is the heartbeat of the spawn of the magic mirror. He stood in front of it spreading his hands in the air and calling the egg his lord and savior promising to guard its arrival at all costs, knowing that soon enough he and his men will no longer have to hide and live like gutter rats. He recalls the words of the snake-eyed mysterious man and realizes that the event is unfolding exactly how he said. With hands on his back he proudly watched the green flames blaze, thinking to himself how dark wizards bodies are indeed a good fuel and thanks to them the incubation speed is doubled. The dark wizard lost their hope after Murphy died and their pride and ego destroyed them in a way that Helix provoked them and then they were just dumb enough to fall into his trap. These dark wizards he's talking about are probably the Scarlet Cult which belonged to Murphy but for some reason the, all the names are changed, maybe the translator change for this manhu as well. So yeah, he's probably talking about the dark wizards from the Murphy Scarlet Cult. And after falling into Helix's trap, these wizards then surrendered and now here they are, being used as fuel. Helix knew the dark wizards communicate with ether and have a high ether affinity, so their flesh is perfect to be used as a fuel for this ritual. He was still not sure why the snake-eyed man wanted to help and rescued him and wondered if he was his life savior, thinking that even if it's some kind of a snake-eyed man's trap, it's still worth stepping into it. Now we know it's a fact that feeding through this ritual is far more efficient than extracting the life force. Even now the snake-eyed man's words sound a bit scary since he ordered to burn the whole city of Nock into ashes and bring nightmares and suffering to everyone. He convinced Helix that doing exactly this is his destiny and now we see the first sacrificial ceremony being carried out by Helix. He caused havoc in Nokin and almost eradicated every single dark wizard from the Scarlet Cult but knew it was far from enough and he needed to do more. As he couldn't keep his eye from the magnificent green flames, Theresa arrived, informing him about having no more dark wizards to burn, asking if they should continue hunting though it might be quite dangerous doing so. Helix feels displeased with this information, knowing that even though there are no more dark wizards, they still need way more sacrifices. He puts his hand on Theresa and makes a decision, saying they should stop hunting. Theresa knew what he was talking about and she blushed standing next to Helix as if she was ready for whatever awaits her. Their intimate moment gets interrupted by one of his men who arrives injured and covered in blood, reporting that the spiders have found him and discovered their stronghold, saying they are nearby. As Helix asked if they were finally here, Theresa looked at him as a lover would looked at his loved one. With hate and disgust on his face, Helix utters a name, Jijitsu, and says she's more annoying than the Knights of the Secret Instrument Tower, knowing her arrival means the 52nd Street is not safe anymore. Theresa brings a tainted blood injection and Helix tells Duo Gang, the huge man, to take it as it is a destiny of a white wolf hunter and it would make him fear nothing and no one. But Duo Gang looks at the injection with fear and terror as if he's not sure whether he wants to take it or not. Helix then calls Theresa and with excitement and love in her eyes for what's about to happen, she says it's an honor for her to become one with him. She decapitates her head and honor offers it to Helix, wishing him victory. Helix takes her head and as the green flame burns the skull, he puts it on his face. Helix knew that everything in the stronghold would be destroyed anyways and if they wanted to come in there, there would be no way out. 
He calls Duo Gang to come with him as he steps on the remains of Teresa's scalp. Duo Gang stands up after injecting himself with the tainted blood and follows his master. 52nd Street was in chaos because of the battle and we can see G and K side by side fighting quite fiercely. An explosion happens and they stop for a moment trying to figure out if that was the place where they could find Helix. Now after they realize that it's no wonder how the White Wolf clan could escape from the secret instrument tower and the true society all these years, she notices a gigantic 50 meters deep hidden tunnel. K and Miss G stood at the edge of the hole and took a look down, seeing what G thought was a hellish picture of death. Skulls and arm and leg bones were everywhere and the longer they looked it made them feel worse. Miss G thought there's no way this was an act of a human knowing it must be something that only the white wolf mutants could have done. She turned her head away and started walking away as she recalled hearing these kinds of stories before about the evil acts done by the white wolf clan which included massacre too. What really made her concerned was all the butchered bodies as she never expected they would do that kind of atrocity. Thinking that this act must have been going on for some time and that this might be just one of the many sights. Now Duo Gang appeared behind her from the underground and fiercely tried to attack her. Mishji stopped realizing she made a mistake by not being careful enough and tried to think of a way to dodge this attack. K screams but Duo Gang slams his fist towards G wanting to smash her but we see K swiftly intervenes holding her weapon in the air and blocking Duo Gang's attack. K starts coughing blood, telling Duo that with her around nobody should attack Miss G, calling him a fatso. Miss G seeing what just had happened, screams in anger and startles Duo gang. She jumps forward with sword aiming for Duo's head and piercing his body makes a huge hole. Then she quickly turns around and hits him with a leg kick in the stomach despite him already missing one arm and the head due to her piercing attack. Now K looks at Miss G with great admiration as G worryingly asks her if she is fine. K then collapses and Miss G holds her telling her that she wasn't even a target of the attack and she didn't have to take on the attack. Miss G also tells K that she'll need at least a few weeks to recover from the attack. Wounded but with a smile on her face, K told Miss G that it was her duty to protect her and that she couldn't bear seeing her injured and she apologizes for causing Miss G to worry. Showing great concern, Miss G tells K that it's not her fault and apologizes for the incident. Miss G tells K to hold on and orders her team members to take her to the base for treatment. Miss G's steel mind instinct activates and she realizes that Duo is still alive and might attack them again and at the same time the enemies are firing tower arrows towards them so she quickly alerts her team and picks them up bringing them to safety. The spear hits Duo and causes a huge explosion setting Duo on fire. Astonished by her strength and speed they promise her they'll leave immediately since it's too dangerous for them to stay. Miss G notices that one of the spears has the white wizard's lightning inscription, thinking the inscription was probably the cause of the explosion. One of the lightning spears hit the roof where G was standing, but G jumps in the air dodging the electricity. Miss G swiftly turns around and sees the tainted blood pouring down the cliff. She walked towards it in hope to find Helix and then she finally sees him. She calls his name, gritting her teeth in anger. Helix stood at the top of a building with his comrades, with the sky behind him ablaze with lightning bolts. With the mask made of Teresa's skull on his face, he greets G and tells her she's gotten stronger. He takes a step forward and jumps down slamming the ground with great force, landing right in front of Miss G. He tells her she's been lucky to gain full control over the tainted blood and asks her if that bookstore owner helped her in that endeavor. They stood across each other with their claws out ready to start the fight. Helix told Miss G that Mr. Lin is nowhere to be seen and he won't come to her rescue now. 
G looks at the huntsmen surrounding and protecting Helix and asks him what happened to them, realizing they are looking kind of abnormal. The demon-like huntsman stood there while Helix explained that he just used the highly concentrated tainted blood and now they are going berserk, plus their strength increased by multiple times and they became able to remain conscious in their beast form. He further explains, saying that the only drawback was that if they become unable to remain in control in berserk mode, they would all explode and die. Then he raises and spreads his arms as if he's threatening to attack and says that as long as they can move, they're the perfect killing machine. Helix continues the monologue in laughter, saying he had to use his life in exchange for power G easily obtained, complaining about the life being unfair. G cusses at Helix and tells him that he is the one doing harm to the huntsman and promises to eradicate him and free those poor souls from suffering. She looks at him with determination, saying he is the horrible one and asks whether these are his last men he has gathered to fight against her. Miss G also tells him that she didn't know her one month old huntsman group has such influence so he had to intervene and fight her and that they didn't even gather like this even when they were fighting the secret instrument tower or the truth society. Terrifying looking Helix tells Miss G he won't retreat until one of them dies in their battle and the survivor side would be the future of all hunters. Miss G talks back telling Helix to stop mumbling like a cuckoo as she transforms into a wolf saying that it's time to settle the vengeance and to prepare to die. Helix invites her to attack first and Miss G opens her beast like mouth saying she can't wait to tear off his throat Throat, but also thinking that the taste of his blood must be extreme. They square off and start running at each other at the same time and the fight to death between beasts ensues. G thinks that in their final fight she believed she could win, but maybe she underestimated his madness considering the uneasiness she felt during the fight. Miss G bites his neck and now she knows that the hunters with the conscious blood lack the strength to face against the white wolf hunters because they have the strength of the tainted blood. She feels it would be shameless of her to let her subordinates face heavy casualties as she tries to fight Helix, hitting him on the neck with her razor sharp paw and making him bleed. Miss G really wanted to cause as few casualties as possible, wishing the newcomers could read her intention which was to escape from the place as soon as possible. Now we see a girl with blue hair running away from the battlefield with hope to report the situation to the leader, seeing that the white wolf guys are on a rampage. She looks back and starts crying, knowing her leader's intention was to save her and all of her team members. Everything was going as planned as she fought side by side with her squad leader, but a large number of monsters being appeared and surrounded her, K, Max and other guys. They screamed at them causing horrendous sounds and attacked them but they didn't have any strength trying to fight them so the battle turned into a one sided slaughter as the monsters killed some of their team members in just a few seconds leaving no space for escape. She recalled being attacked by one of the white wolf guys and just as she was about to get killed she closed her eyes not wanting to see the scary monster in front of her but shortly later she heard a loud gunshot being fired. As she opened her eyes she saw a cowboy boot and lots of shells falling on the floor and a voice telling her to run. It was her squad leader, a guy in a cowboy outfit quite skilled in handling guns, telling her that one of them has to survive, promising her to hold them back. He yells at her saying her name and ordering her to leave this dangerous place and find their leader. Pava, the girl's name, tries to object as if she wants him to go with her and survive, but he, with incredibly weird look on his eyes, guys, bros. What the hell? Why did they do my boy dirty like this with these eyes? What the hell? So back to the story, I'm sorry. He tells her to stop worrying about him because he, Iskar Virgil, is the spider's first battle squad leader and it wouldn't be a problem for him to hold them back or even beat them down. Now after his narcissistic introduction, Pava didn't hesitate at all and started sprinting as fast as she could following his instructions. She runs and thinks she'll never again say that his eyes are looking weird, 
But at that moment, Iskar gets attacked and hit by a red masked mutant. The mutant then stood behind Pava and called her a weakling and she panicked knowing he'd attack her wanting to kill her. She recognized this monster, wondering if he's the one Helix has talked about. She lifts up her skirt and picks up some throwing knives and throws them at the mutant. The mutant deflects the knives with ease and tells her her knives are useless, kicking her in the face so powerfully that she flies flies back and collides with a pile of stones. Pava coughs blood and falls on the ground, seemingly unconscious. The mutant approaches her and stands in front of her, like calling her a weakling, saying she made him yawn as if he's trying to say that defeating her with such ease made him feel bored. He tells her he thought it would be a battle of strength, because since it wasn't it, it would be the best for him to look for Miss G and fight her instead. He takes off his mask and sticks out his tongue like a maniac, telling her she's a lucky lady and she should be honored dying in the hands of him, Babar. He continues walking towards Pava, who lies down covered in ruins, and says out loud that Helix should give up his position to him since he dealt with Pava personally, calling her trash. Clenching her hand and holding onto some ropes, Pava shows sign of life which surprised Babar. He realizes that these steel wires were a trap made by Pava and finds her sneaky move quite interesting. Pava calculates that she has full control within the 20 meters of the wired area. She tells Babar to leave her and her squad leader alone if he doesn't want to get hurt and he responds by saying she's an idiot if she thinks she can hurt him. Babar smiles at Pava's threat, saying he doesn't even have to lift a finger to destroy her iron wires, as he calls somebody named Clara, ordering her to cut and destroy the wires. A green-eyed, what seems to be a midget, jumps from the wall and snaps the wires with her mechanical legs with ease. Pava watches her in disbelief, not knowing what to do next since the wires were her last trick that she had. Clara then tells her that her threading skills aren't so bad, but using them to hurt somebody is a joke. Clara tells Babar she likes Pava and requests to bring her back to have fun, but Babar declines, saying she's his prey. While Clara keeps objecting in a childish way, Babar grabs Pava by here and lifts her up asking whether she's willing to be his plaything and in return he'd spare her and her as Babar calls him a goldfish-eyed squad leader. Babar yells in her ear forcing her to say something nice about him and make him happy but she calls him a bastard and tells him to dream on. Clara couldn't believe Pava would say such words as Babar angrily swung at her with his trident-like weapon. Pava screams and kneels on the floor with her hand on her face and one of her eyes on the ground. Babar. He dug out her eye and now he's standing above her, saying that she still doesn't fully understand her current situation, telling her he changed his mind about killing her. Babar puts his hand on her cheeks and opens her mouth. Then he leans his sharp trident-like weapon in and attempt to cut off her tongue since she called him a bastard using that tongue. Suddenly a bullet scratches Babar's cheek and Babar turns around only to find wounded Iskar covered in debris aiming his gun at him. His gun was shaking and Iskar probably missed because he's heavily injured and exhausted thus unable to aim properly. The goldfish-eyed squad leader looks at Barbar with a smile and tells him he hurt him with the bullet shot. Pava calls the squad, looking scared and worrying about the squad leader's safety, but Babar tells him it looks like he's really eager to die. He then tells Clara she can have Pava and have fun with her, and Clara gets excited, saying she'd use her life skill to torture Pava for 7 days and 7 nights. Pava puts her hand forward as if she's trying to reach Babar and stop him from hurting the squad leader Iskar, thinking if this goes on, both of them would die, wondering if there's anything she could do to stop it.
As Clara jumps at Pava's back, already looking like she wants to start torturing her, Pava recalls her leader, saying that everything that's happening is just a part of the master's plan. She also thought that he doesn't care about their existence and if she could, she would do anything if her squad leader could be saved. Babar stops next to her squad leader and picks and lifts him up when suddenly somebody in the distance comments how he's finally found the guys who are creating this mess and noise. The voice seemed to be louder and louder as if the person was approaching, saying that the truth society lacks efficiency and they've made him angry, complaining about being woken up and unable to sleep because of the noise Babar and the others have been making. Ackerman appears behind the wall and leans his elbow on it and carefully observes the crew that woke him up, asking them if they have any manners at all. With one hand in his pocket and smoking a cigarette, Ackerman keeps complaining, saying they've interrupted his sleep by causing lots of noise, killing someone in the middle of the night. Babar and Clara look at him in confusion and Babar responds, telling him that he doesn't give a crap about his rest and threatening to kill him if he came to ruin his business. Babar again says he doesn't care who he is, but Ackerman says that he is indeed nobody of importance, but just a wandering solo hunter. Injured Pava wondered about Ackerman's identity as Clara pressed her head down on the ground, not giving her any chances of escaping. Babar starts laughing out loud, listening to Ackerman's introduction, asking him whether he's joking by saying he's a solo hunter, and Ackerman responds saying he's not joking, describing what a solo hunter actually is and degrading himself by saying that as every solo hunter, he too cannot get anything done. Ackerman and Babar keep staring at each other as Ackerman analyzes Babar's identity, saying that there are two organizations in Nokin. One of them is Spider and the other one is White Wolf Clan. Concluding that having a naughty attitude and having a smell of a beast, Babar was definitely a White Wolf organization member. Ackerman said it was an eye opener for him, seeing they got hurt, despite having two panicky rank hunters fighting two abnormal rank newbies. Babar felt a bit insulted and took a firm grip on his weapon, asking Ackerman if he's looking for trouble. Ackerman, still smoking his cigarette, replies saying he's not looking for trouble, but just trying to figure out how to silence the noise they produced. Then he asks them which side he should assist to speed up the process of making the area silent again, mentioning that there's maybe no need to choose the side, since Babar approached him aggressively, so sides have been chosen already. Babar gritted his teeth, saying he definitely came to get himself killed and advances trying to attack Ackerman and finish him quickly. Ackerman just stands there smoking his cigarette, then flicks it and dodges Babar's attack with ease. As the smoke clears away, thinking he hit and killed Ackerman, Babar disappointedly and surprisingly looks at the cigarette, but he hit with his staff and then looks to the side trying to figure out where Ackerman has gone. Clara feels Ackerman's presence and a second later he grabs her face and does something to her chin that makes her very dizzy. She falls on the floor, unable to move or speak, as Ackerman asks Pava about her identity and the reason why the White Wolf is after her and her team. Covered in blood but with a glimpse of relief on her face, she introduces herself to Mr. Ackerman, saying she's a newbie from the Spider's first battle squad and thanks him for saving them. That information made Ackerman concerned as he wondered whether the timing of the conflict between the Spider and White Wolf is just a coincidence or not. Pava, trying to get up on her feet, tells Ackerman they were ambushed and she was instructed to report the incident to the leader but was unable to do so because Babar interfered at a wrong moment. She said she felt helpless and too weak for an enemy as strong as Babar and expressed her gratitude to Ackerman for saving them. Pava recalled her squad leader saying that whatever happens is all part of the master's plan. Ackerman gets concerned about Pava's statement and thinks that it is indeed all the bookskeeper Lin's will. As Pava still tried to get up and stand on her legs, Ackerman was in a deep thought, guessing Lin must have helped Lady G to start a fight with the White Wolf and unite all hunters. 
Ackerman recalls Lin's guidance to break free from the Truth Society and hinting him that Spider would provide him help. He concludes that White Wolf's pursuit of the spider was not a coincidence but just Mr. Lin's master plan and all of the events happening are a product of Lin's enlightenment. Thinking that Lin's master plan gave him a chance to let Lady G owe him a favor for smoother cooperation in the future, he starts believing that such a plan might seem random but actually all of the steps are linked and Mr. Lin's far-sightedness is incredible and since he feels he's a part of this chess game, he should play his part as well as he could. Ackerman injects the tainted blood into Pava's shoulder and she heals in seconds, feeling rejuvenated as her physical strength gets restored. Ackerman stood in front of Pava, explaining that he used the tainted blood to heal her wounds and telling her that tainted blood is a necessary item for all experienced hunters. He also says that the grade of her tainted blood isn't that bad since she healed quite quickly. Ackerman decides, since he already helped a few spiders, to see if he could help some more. He guarantees Pava and her team safety, since leaving so many prey alone isn't the way of the hunter, such as himself. Ackerman then tells Pava to give his greetings to Miss G and Pava rejoices hearing what Ackerman just said, wondering if he really meant it. Suddenly a few syringes fall on the ground as Babar appears injecting the tainted blood in his neck, mocking Pava and Ackerman, calling them trash and saying they have no idea how to maximize the blood's power. Babar's hand becomes hairy as if he's turning into a werewolf and calls himself a genius, explaining the best way of using the tainted blood is to increase the strength and control of one's brain and not going insane, maximizing the tainted blood's effect. He praises himself for his genius use of tainted blood as he holds his staff and being completely covered in hair now, looking exactly like a werewolf. He then threatens to kill them and Pava calls Ackerman Senpai, advising him to be careful because Babar became very strong using the tainted blood. Ackerman wasn't afraid of Babar, saying he's just a wild dog barking in the face of defeat, wondering why Pava thinks he's strong, thinking that Babar's mindset is weak. Ackerman starts taunting Babar, saying that he's not even close to a genius, to which Babar responds, asking if Ackerman is looking down on him. Ackerman answers, saying he isn't looking down on him, but rather he pities him, since he's trying very hard to control his sanity, and if it weren't for the current situation, he wouldn't even lay his eyes on him. Babar goes crazy hearing Ackerman's trash talk and charges at him with his staff, wanting to kill him for belittling him. Ackerman panics as he realizes how fast Babar is and knowing he can't dodge the attack, he just stands in place and Babar pierces his chest area. Iskar and Pava watch in disbelief as Clara makes it obvious that Ackerman is a fool for making Babar use that move. Clara explains that this attack causes the internal organs to burst, which means that it doesn't matter how good your recovery is, you die because of the damage whatsoever. They stood there for a few seconds seconds when suddenly Ackerman grabbed the staff with his hand. Everyone got shocked, having their mouths wide open, wondering how the hell is he alive. Babar missed Ackerman's heart and Ackerman tells him that if anyone else was Babar's target, he would have definitely died. Ackerman mocks Babar saying he doesn't have enough experience for killing and the talent is just not enough. He calls him a puppy and explains that next time he should aim for the head if he wants to kill somebody without messing it up. Shocked, Babar realizes that he didn't hit Ackerman at all. Actually, the spear disappeared into his chest, into a black hole in his chest. Babar tries removing the spear, but realizes he is unable to move it at all this time. Some white tentacles start crawling on Babar's and Clara's body, and Clara starts panicking, begging Babar to help her. Ackerman smiles and tells them that nobody could save them now. He then tells them that they are the first offering for hell, saying that their life, strength, 
talent and future are the best nourishment for them. Babar begs Ackerman to release him, but Ackerman sends him to eternal darkness. Babar arrives at a strange dark place, screaming for somebody to let him out. Then he thinks that it's just some kind of a trick and wishes to leave the place as soon as possible. Some strange, disgusting, sticky black matter appears on his palm and he hears the sound of sheep wondering where the sheep is. But strangely, instead of the sheep, a monster-like head with sharp teeth appeared in front of him. Babar gets petrified as the monster tries to swallow him alive. Meanwhile, a white monster that Ackerman turned into keeps Clara trapped as Pava carries the squad leader, looking at the monster and not blinking, wondering what it is. The monster, or rather Ackerman, looked like some kind of a skeleton and had one red eye. Ackerman controlled his body, being happy he's able to transform into the creature he is right now without going insane. He feels great feeding Babar to the demons, feeling they are quite pleased with the offering, hoping for some kind of reward. Clara recognizes Ackerman's new form, calling it a ghoulish white, commenting that it's impossible since this beast can't be controlled by anyone, believing that Ackerman would definitely die trying to tame this beast mode. She wondered how a hunter could retain his sanity while controlling this kind of a monster. Ackerman heard what she said and told her that increasing her knowledge before death is very good, promising to fulfill her parents' wish of showing them a real nightmare. Iskar and Pava look at the event unfolding before their own eyes and Ackerman's voice suddenly speaks to Pava, telling her to find her leader and explain that it's not a good idea to stay close to him at this moment. He orders her to tell her comrades that tonight the gatekeeper Ghoulish White joins the hunt as he opens his mouth and devours Clara in an instant. Wow, <laughs> Ghoulish White on the hunt, let's go. Now seeing what just happened, Pava immediately starts running away, holding the squad leader by his hand. And now we go back to Mr. Lin, who's looking outside of the window in his library, thinking about Nokin's weather getting weirder, hoping the rain should be stopping soon. He puts his hand on Candela's sword, feeling a bit uneasy having it on display, and decides to bring it to the bedroom and considers getting a soul holder later. He leaves the sword on the table across the bed, thinking of it as an evil warding talisman. While the slaughter and massacre in the city of Nokin continues, Lin goes to bed in hope to have a good dream, falling asleep, as we see the dream catcher Old Wild gave him activate again, meaning he should be having another lucid dream. As Mr. Lin falls asleep, he can see a raindrop and a lightning strike. Now he slowly opens his eyes and wakes up in a dream. He takes a couple of steps and stands while saying that this is another lucid dream. Since this is another lucid dream, he wonders where that beautiful silver-haired elf was. He was waiting for so long to have another lucid dream so he could talk to her, but now she's nowhere to be found. Mr. Lin slowly exhales and thinks how he shouldn't worry too much about it because he can't fully control his dreams anyway, as he wonders what kind of a dream he is in right now. He remembers reading Freud's work about dreams, where Freud states that dreams are usually an interpretation of subconscious desires one can have. Mr. Lin thinks he might be dreaming that he's in a video game right now, because ever since he traveled to this other world, Nokin, he couldn't play video games at all, so maybe his subconsciousness is yearning for them. Yes, that has to be it, Mr. Lin thinks, and as he's always right and never misunderstands anything, he's probably right now as well, bros. So he thinks how no wonder he would dream about video games, since Nokin is an ancient city and how the technology here is not yet advanced enough for video game consoles to exist. He imagines that he will be fighting a huge boss while the dramatic action music will be playing in the back. He picks up a stone and realizes that it has some special engravings on it. After looking at the ruins around him, Mr. Lin realizes that this place used to be some magnificent landscape while it was still intact, and after inspecting the piece of rock he's holding in his hand, and realizes it is somehow familiar to him, and then it hits him. He saw similar engravings on the sword he got from Joseph. 
He thinks yet again how awesome he is for remembering this, even in his sleep, and how normal people could never think of that. And he realizes this is because he used to be a professional folk sculpture examiner back in the day. He figures how his subconsciousness is definitely putting things he recently experienced in his life into this dream. He decides to explore this area because he already is here, thinking about what kind of surprises his subconsciousness has for him now. As he's walking through the ruins, he remembers how the last lucid dream he had, the area he was in was much smaller compared to this one, and thinks how this one even looks more realistic compared to the first lucid dream. He says that this place has received so much damage, and as he touches one of the walls nearby, the wall immediately crumbles, and Mr. Lin gets surprised because he didn't expect it to be this fragile. Then suddenly the entire building in front of him collapses, as Mr. Lin gets a feeling of satisfaction similar to popping bubble wrap. So he decides he'll crush a couple more buildings, since it's not a big deal because this is a dream after all, he thinks. He still thinks that this dream is a video game and how even after exploring for a bit, nothing is still happening, but how he did find more and more corpses the more he explored. He finds one body that looks more preserved than most of the others, and after closely inspecting it, he realizes this man has longer ears than normal. He flips the mangled body over, and while one of the eyes spills out of its crushed head, Mr. Lin casually rips its ear off to inspect it even further, thinking how this must be an elven ear. Just look at this savage, even if all of this is nothing but a dream, even in a dream I'd feel scared and disgusted by inspecting mangled bodies up close like this. But I guess Mr. Lin is not an ordinary human being like me. He also remembers Doris, thinking how she had a nice and realistic looking elven costume. Yet again, Mr. Lin thinks to himself how this dream is definitely a mixture of all the recent events that happened to him while awake. He feels like a folklore researcher once again while he is exploring these ruins, so he magically conjures a pen and paper in his hands and decides to write down his observations. By the way, he can conjure these items easily, because this is all just a dream after all. He also thinks how after waking up, he should definitely try to draw these ruins. As he continues walking through these ruins and after reaching the center of them, he stops for a moment because he sees a bright light shining on something in the distance. As he moves closer, he sees an elven figure kneeling down with a sword piercing his chest as if he committed seppuku. Now we know this elven guy is the ancient King Kendala, who was a warrior of indescribable level and one of the most powerful indescribable people ever. As Mr. Lin is slowly approaching him, Kendala lifts his head, opens his eyes and comments, saying how after waiting for millennia, his savior has finally arrived. Mr. Lin, at first a bit confused, figures this must be a cutscene in the video game dream he's having right now and decides that he should just follow along the roleplay, but how he was expecting a huge final boss and a fight of historical proportions and not something like this, but this might be an opening cutscene after which he'll receive such a quest, Mr. Lin thinks. He then thinks about the plot of the game, thinking how savior is usually used by people from ancient civilizations in games, so he figures out that some disaster must have struck this place and thinks how this elf is either the reason for the disaster or he tried to stop it but couldn't and he decided to take his own life after realizing he couldn't save all the people around him, but he didn't die and was trapped like this waiting for someone who can save the world to come by, and that someone should be the main player of the game, in this case Mr. Lin. And he also figures he understood the plot of the game perfectly, and honestly, He's not far from the truth, beside this not being a video game. Now, after coming close to Candela, Mr. Lin realizes that the sword that pierces through Candela is actually the same sword Joseph gave him, and Mr. Lin gets even more sure that his subconsciousness had just created a story behind this sword. He admires his subconsciousness, thinking it did a really good job, and figures out that reading so many books has had this effect on it to do this good of a job. 
King Candela then thanks Mr. Lin for making the blade shine again and continues talking, saying how this is the third unforgivable sin that he has committed. Mr. Lin thinks how the sacred blade this guy is talking about is probably the blade that pierced his body and that it's the same blade Joseph gave him and he also remembered how he thought the blade was a bit dirty and cleaned it up so his subconsciousness has made up this scenario for that event. He then yet again admires himself because he managed to give himself credit in his dream and then he even thanks himself for it as well. Mr. Lin thinks how in books that he read, characters like this elf are usually very lonely and rarely talk to anyone, which also causes a huge burden on their shoulders. And this burden is too difficult for them to carry and as Mr. Lin sits on Candela's throne, while Candela is just casually kneeling in front of him with a huge sword coming through his chest, Mr. Lin continues thinking how he should help this man in his dream. Mr. Lin asks the man to tell him more about himself and other sins that he had committed since this is the third one. Mr. Lin figures that this man would want to share his story with Mr. Lin, so that's why he mentioned his sins in the first place, so it isn't a bad thing for Mr. Lin to ask him these questions. Candela, with a slightly confused but also relieved face, bows down and tells Mr. Lin how it will be his honor to tell him the story of this sinner. Mr. Lin thinks how this man desperately wants to talk about his pain and how in the books he read, villains also have big talks before finalizing their plan or sometimes authors of the books make the villains talk for a bit before succeeding with their plan so that the main character gets enough time to stop the villains. Candela then starts talking, saying how a millennia ago he got too arrogant and tried to kill one of the immortal rulers of the cosmos and just after looking at this infinite immortal being, Candela lost his sanity. So this is the first sin of his foolishness. Then after came the sin of betrayal, which happened after King Candela slaughtered all the people that followed him because he had lost his sanity and went completely mad. And because he used the holy blade of elves to kill all the elves of this kingdom, he decided to seal his own fate as well with this very blade and that was the last sin the sin of being ignorant. He continues explaining, saying that he built this kingdom into the most powerful in the world with his very hands, but how his own hands were the end of the kingdom as well, and thus he got a name, the Exile Candela. Now Mr. Lin is sitting and carefully listening to this story, thinking how he almost got the entire plot correctly and asks King Candela why does he call Mr. Lin his savior, because he didn't save neither him nor his kingdom. So he asks Candela if there's anything he would like for Mr. Lin to do and Candela starts shaking because of how kind Mr. Lin is towards him and apologizes to Mr. Lin because he never expected to be saved. Also, Mr. Lin asked him if there's something he'd like Mr. Lin to do because he thinks this guy is an NPC quest giver. <laughs> so, Candela is shaking while telling Mr. Lin that he has already helped him immensely, but how his kingdom is just a point in the history now and he doesn't have any right over this land anymore, and that no matter what happens, he will never be able to atone for his sins. Mr. Lin thinks so this guy has been so hard on himself for all these years and that's why he's acting like a child getting scolded by his parents right now and now even though he looks composed on the outside, he started crying as soon as someone asked him a simple question. So Mr. Lin decides to enlighten him with his usual soul healing words, saying that he already realized that he is sinful, but not wanting to atone for your sins means you are running away from your responsibility and tells him if this is really the outcome he chooses then he is a true coward, while looking at him with a strict and judgmental face. Mr. Lin continues speaking, saying that Candela didn't even think about the survivors of his people and what are they doing now and how are they coping by, and as Candela looks at him in utter shock, Mr. Lin continues speaking, saying how he's so powerful, but decides to condemn himself and do nothing about fixing the situation, saying that he should have been tormented in front of everyone, and how this would have been an atonement for his sins, and not just sitting here idly, waiting for nothing forever. 
Then Mr. Lin gets furious and starts yelling how Candela has no rights and deserves nothing more than this punishment for the actions he has done and how even after spending a thousand years here waiting, he learned nothing and is just waiting for someone to pity him and forgive him while his people who survived are suffering even more than he is right now. Mr. Lin then puts his hand on Candela's shoulder and says how the only person who can save him right now is himself. Candela starts crying and telling Mr. Lin that he is right and how he was so ignorant that he couldn't realize this on his own, but how thanks to Mr. Lin's guidance he finally realizes what he needs to do, but he is afraid he'll do the same mistake one more time. Mr. Lin thinks so this quest probably wants him to give him guidance to this man for every decision he tries to make. As he looks at Candela, who falls in prostration in front of Mr. Lin, begging Mr. Lin to allow him to be his soldier. What is going on, bros? Candela is one of the most powerful warriors ever in the history of the world, and he is begging Mr. Lin to be like his king or something. Now Mr. Lin is left confused by this, not understanding why does Candela want to be his sword and thinks how maybe this questline wants Mr. Lin to have a party member traveling with him, thus offering him Candela as a party member, thinking how he gets a king of the entire elven city to be his follower, plus he will get the strongest sword right at the start of the quest. Mr. Lin clears his throat and asks Candela if he's really given this enough thought and if he's certain in this decision, while thinking to himself how he's not sure how long will the dream last, so he might as well give some soul healing words to this man here. Maybe it would be a good practice for when Mr. Lin wakes up. Mr. Lin then tells Candela how if he really wants to achieve his goals, he can't just listen to the words Mr. Lin says and do nothing, but how actually he needs to take initiative to accomplish his goals, because all of the sins he has done and all the time he has wasted while waiting here for thousands of years. Mr. Lin then thinks how he chose the perfect words for Candela, again admiring himself because the words he just told Candela are not going to break him even more, but will be a great guidance for him and his future actions. Mr. Lin continues speaking, telling Candela that people that he has long forgotten will never forgive him and if he really chooses to stay here and do nothing about it, he'll stay a coward forever. Candela responds by saying that he understands what Mr. Lin is talking about and describes his soul as a worn out one because all of the time he has spent here wallowing and how this feeling caused deep hatred within Candela, which was the reason for the curse to manifest on the sword as well. But after Mr. Lin has cleansed the curse, all that's left for Candela now is his obsession over his soul. He clenches his fist and tells Mr. Lin how he's right about Candela trying to use forgiveness from others to justify his escape. Candela continues speaking, telling Mr. Lin how he's also not wrong about saying Candela has no right, but what that means is that he doesn't have the right to stay weak anymore and how he needs to return to his people, but not as a king this time, but as a simple exile. And before disappearing forever, Candela decides he needs to do something instead of just waiting for forgiveness and comments how even though his land isn't his kingdom anymore, there are still elves alive in these lands, as he thinks to himself that after tens of thousands of years, even the strongest titans and elves who walk the lands are all just history now. How there were thousands of people killed because of the sword's curse as well, and all of their hatred intertwined with Candela's soul. He thinks how he witnessed the history of Azir unfold and even see the mightiest kingdom become nothing but a legend in the end. He also remembers how humans built a large city called Nokin, similar in glory to his kingdom that once was, and realizes that this kingdom of elves can no longer be rebuilt, because time waits for no one. So the only thing Candela can do now for his people is to ignite all that's left within him instead of disappearing 
disappearing silently. He tells Mr. Lin there is one last thing left for him to do and as Mr. Lin is carefully listening to him talk, Candela asks Mr. Lin to take this sword as his weapon and use it to slay the immortal being from that dream. Mr. Lin thinks how the quest is finally starting, but thinks how this quest sounds way too difficult for a beginner because the first boss fight is versus an immortal being right off the get go. But maybe it's all just a tutorial Mr. Lin thinks, while Candela continues speaking, telling Mr. Lin that thousands of years ago he himself tried to kill this immortal being, but after reaching it and looking it in the eyes, he lost his sanity, and this resulted in his kingdom paying the price as well, and how even after thousands of years, he still has this same ambition, not for his own personal gain, but for the good of the people of his lands. Candela swears his complete loyalty to Mr. Lin, and tells him that he'll give him the most valuable item item he possesses and hopes that Mr. Lin can forgive him and Mr. Lin interrupts him with a tired look on his face saying that he's not really good at fighting, thinking to himself how he's just a normal bookstore owner and he doesn't have any higher power and that even though this is a dream, He's never tried fighting in real life so it would probably be burdensome for him in a dream as well and thinks how this is the bad part of lucid dreams because you are aware you are dreaming so you probably are not capable of doing things which you usually can do in real life as well. Thinking that even if he can slay this boss easily because it's a dream, he can't really swing a sword and would look really bad while doing it, which would be embarrassing for him and this would destroy his look as a soul healing instructor and as such he needs to preserve his reputation because without it he won't be able to give guidance to his customers. As Candela comments how there is no need to worry and takes off his crown, he continues saying how he will be Mr. Lin's strength and his very sword while offering Mr. Lin his crown. He continues saying that even though he's not a king anymore and how this kingdom as well is long gone, there is no one left to take the crown and he's offering it to Mr. Lin, saying that this is his most precious treasure even though if others might consider it worthless, but to Candela it symbolizes that he's letting go of all the glory he had in his past. As Mr. Lin picks up the crown, he thinks how it's very light and how it's maybe made of branches of laurel, and suddenly the crown shines bright and vanishes in his hands, but after looking at his arm, Mr. Lin realizes that the crown didn't vanish, but he absorbed it somehow because now he has engravings from the crown on his arm. Candela explains how that mark on Mr. Lin's arm is the mark that represents the King of Elves and that's the only way he can express his gratitude towards Mr. Lin. Mr. Lin with a bit of a disappointed face thinks how he doesn't feel anything has changed but it just feels as if someone drew a bracelet on his hand. As the bright yellow light starts emitting from Candela, he grabs his sword while trying to stand up. And after he stands up completely, Mr. Lin looks at him and realizes that Candela is really really tall, much taller than him. As Candela tells Mr. Lin to pull out the sword out of his chest and now after doing so, Candela will fight alongside Mr. Lin from now on. Lin places his hand on the handle of the sword as a bright yellowish aura shone around it as if it's being ignited. King Candela shatters into pieces like a mirror glass and Lin sees the king's happy moments that happened to him throughout his life. He sees him as a baby and being crowned as a king, holding his sword in the air as if he's going into a battle. Lin puts his hand into one of these big glass like pieces and walks forward coming through to the other side of the glass seeing King Candela's corruption, looking at a being that was definitely an immortal one that Candela told him about. His eyes were red as if he's controlled by the strange being who looked more like the devil with his slender ghastly hands and legs. The being had some bright light shining in his chest and face area which seemed to be his soul and vision. Lin stood behind Candela watching him look at the what he described as an immortal being to him and charging at it at an attempt to defeat this being. Candela took a firm grip on his sword and shining in bright flames jumped towards the being. Lin watches him in action and thinks that Candela was actually very brave and despite him going crazy he was the only one brave enough 
to in this era without light and fire, fight against this formidable enemy, carrying his bright sword, looking like he's carrying a sun, trying to defeat the evil and bring brightness to his kingdom. A thunder strikes the ground and Lin finds himself in another place, thinking that the scene in this video game just changed. His voice changed and his hair too, looking exactly like Candela, having elven ears and wielding a bright Candela sword in his hands. Lin figures out he is in one of the scenes from Candela's memory, seen in the broken glass, thinking this must be a dream in a dream. Lin turns around seeing a huge griffin who seems to be friendly. Then he tries understanding Candela's life by stepping into his shoes, realizing that Candela was powerful but also afraid of these immortal beings. So he begged Mr. Lin for guidance and then used his sacred blade to defeat the demon immortal. Petting the griffin, Lin proudly sees himself as Candela's savior, guessing he's now in control of Candela's soul. He pets the griffin and thinks about getting a pet cat in the shop because it's so comfy to pet this creature. He snaps out of his cute interaction with the griffin and starts focusing on the main task, remembering that Candela's main goal was to protect his people getting ready for a battle. He holds his sword gently, thinking that the atmosphere is definitely a boss-like one and looks around for some kind of a huge boss to appear. Lin grips his sword knowing that Candela became a spirit of his own sword and feels like having it as a weapon is very exciting. Titan. He flexes his sword and Griffin hitting some poses and hears a rumble in the distance, wondering if this is the immortal being that Candela mentioned. Just a few seconds later, a huge hand holding an axe emerges from the fog illuminated by the lightning strikes. Now we see another rumbling. Not in Lin's dream, but in knocking streets this time. Miss G in her wolf form breathes heavily in a stance of alertness, thinking to herself that white wolf mutants are too strong. The blood starts dripping from her body as she stares at Helix, thinking that he and his team are here just to kill and they aren't human anymore. They're just beasts. Helix attacks her but misses, hitting the ground and causing great damage. He then turns towards Miss G's direction, looking at her jump over a hole filled with tainted blood. She gets a bad feeling about Helix never moving away from the hole and pushing all the dead hunter's bodies into the hole, as if he's benefiting from doing so. Miss G then figured out that he definitely defended the hole on purpose and exactly at that moment Helix changed his form back into a human again and yelled at Miss G, saying that the offerings he provided are more than enough. The tainted blood shines brighter and G finally understands the reason why they don't care about the injured beasts and just throw them into the hole, Helix's plan being to create as many corpses as possible. The ground starts shaking and a strange symbol appears in the sky as the incubated egg cracks and blasts giving Miss G chills to the bone. We see a monster appear in the sky and we know that this is the spawn of the magic mirror finally hatching and coming to this world. And what's more strange is that this same monster looks like the monster Lin is about to encounter in his dream. Helix now in his human form welcomes the monster calling it his lord, the lord of the rain. Helix looks at his lord with great admiration, looking exactly like Candela when he encountered this monster and says that he finally did it, thinking about successfully summoning him. He stands in front of him and celebrates screaming on top of his lungs saying, Foolish mortals, rejoice! He's born. We see the spawn of the magic mirror appearing and chaos that follows it, while Miss G, still in her wolf form and petrified, looks at this being, realizing his power level is of immortal level and how if she didn't use her ability Iron Will, the pressure she's feeling now just from watching this being would cause her to lose her mind and go insane. Then we see Helix uttering words of an unfamiliar language and himself going crazy as he's maniacally laughing while the tentacles are growing all out of him. His body starts swelling and exploding limb by limb as he's watching at Cthulhu and praising him in his last breaths. Miss G looking at Helix feels sorry for him because the magic mirror mind controlled Helix into worshipping this being and this mind control stay in his mind until his last breath, thinking how Helix has sacrificed so much to summon this being to this world and after summoning it, Cthulhu didn't even notice Helix at all and just caused him to die miserably. 
Misty decides to run away since her power level is destructive and Cthulhu is probably even stronger than indescribable and we see blood oceans covering Nokin as she's running away. As Cthulhu is running rampant over the streets of Nokin, we can see Ackerman observing these events from the distance, thinking how they actually did manage to summon a being from the dream world with the help of the mirror egg. But he also realizes that a normal dream egg can do something like that, and how it needed huge amounts of sacrifices to actually be able to summon a dream entity as powerful as Cthulhu. Ackerman also figures that the barrier between the dream and the reality has been cracked, and both are seeping into one another. Bros, if the dream is merging with reality right now, and Mr. Lin is in a dream right now, ooh, this ought to be good. Now, as Cthulhu keeps on marching, causing oceans and oceans of blood, followed by rain and thunder, Ackerman realizes he needs to run away as well, so he doesn't become its prey now. Now, we see an emergency meeting being held in the Truth Society, where they just got approval to activate the Destruction Star Cannon, as we see Andrew trembling in fear here knowing what this means. Now we see a knight organizing members of the secret instrument tower in order for everyone to be on their positions and be ready to clean up and fight dream beasts leaking into reality after the truth society fires the first round of the destruction star cannon. And we also learn that this knight is Winston Grimsam, captain of the secret instrument tower's combat squad and one of the currently active radiant knights. We see Claudie shaking in fear, thinking about what Joseph would do, as Vice Captain Cloud interrupts Claudie and explains that normally it wouldn't have been possible for the mirror egg to hatch so quickly and how they never expected the White Wolf clan to sacrifice its own members in order to speed up the hatching. Claudie keeps on crying and sobbing, saying how Joseph is not here to help them and just then Vice Captain Cloud tells Claudie to raise his head up and as he does Cloud slaps him like a little bitch <laughs> he's acting right now and yells how they need to be brave now and how long ago Ago, Joseph thought him that if you are a man and a knight, even if you think you are weak, you always need to stand up no matter how many times you fall in order to protect the others. How he received slaps from Joseph as well while getting yelled at that the tears he's crying right now will not help him maintain peace in knocking so he needs to always stand up and continue training until he becomes strong enough. Then Cloud starts yelling at Claudie, saying that even if the Knights of the Secret Instrument Tower cannot stop this chaos happening now, and even if they can't win, they need to do their best in order to try and protect people living in Nokin. Clody gets invigorated, yelling that he'll do his best to help in any way that he can. Just then, Joseph calls Cloud on his phone, uh, I'm sorry, on his communicator device and tells him that going after the dream beast directly is a suicide and they just have to wait here and clean things up ending their hype in an instant with these words and by the way bros i just realized out of the two disciples that we know joseph has one is named claudie one is named cloud Claude, Cloud, Claudy. Mm, I see a pattern going on here. Now, now we go back to General Winston, who, after receiving this report and news from Joseph, was also left surprised because he never expected orders like that. Winston starts wondering why Joseph is so confident, and just then an explosion happens in the air because the first round of destructive star cannon has been fired. Winston, first surprised that they fired it so soon, realizes that that's not actually the destructive star cannon as he wonders what it could be. Now we go back to Andrew's office who's thinking how because the truth society underestimated the white wolf clan now they have to use a destruction star cannon and pay this huge price because they made a small mistake before. He thinks that even though the Truth Society might be able to deal with the immortal level threat, it's still a huge problem even for the Truth Society. As he slams his fist into the table, breaking the table and his fist starting to bleed, he thinks how recently many things have not been going according to the Truth Society's plans and he thinks 
all of this must be a plot of the bookstore owner and no, not even him. Andrew actually thinks that the bookstore owner is a cover-up for some kind of other unknown character. Oh, my boy Andrew is actually pretty spot on. So as Andrew is thinking all of this, he gets a sudden report about something else going on. And as he turns on the screen to see what's going on, he sees the same bright light that Winston confused for the destruction star cannon a couple of moments ago. Now we go back to Cthulhu causing chaos and this light flying towards him directly. And as we zoom into the light, we actually see this is missing. Mr. Lin in the body of Candela, riding his griffon with his sword glowing so bright and flying towards Cthulhu to kill him once and for all. We can see the determination and focus in Mr. Lin's eyes and seriousness on his face as never before as he lifts up his sword like he's lifting up the sun itself and swings it at Cthulhu, literally splitting its head in half with a single blow. Cthulhu's body starts falling apart as its pieces are falling down on the floor and we can see Mr. Lin descend from heaven like an angel which left everyone witnessing this legendary event in complete awe and lack of words. And at this moment the view that was engraved onto the eyes of the people is of the king of the elves who was shining as bright as the sun, giving out glorious brilliance and his form was the one of an immortal himself. Ooh, bros, if this manhua is not goat manhua, then I really want to find out which one do you think is better than this one. Now as everyone keeps staring at Mr. Lin baffled and still speechless because they don't understand what just happened, Winston receives a call on his communicator asking him what should the secret instrument tower's next move be because the dream beast is dead. Winston orders them to proceed as planned originally because the fight isn't over and he tells his subordinate Tifa to get more intel about who the angel looking guy is because what Winston is thinking now is that maybe this creature, referring to Mr. Lin, might be a threat to them as well since they don't know its intentions and how it probably is another dream creature because it looks like it seeped out of the dream and came to this reality as well. Then Winston remembers the legends about King Candela, thinking how this event that just unfolded in front of his eyes reminds him of the legends of the King Candela, where he battled the great evil immortal to save his people from its darkness. But in the legends, Candela failed, while this guy in front of them easily ended this dream beast in a matter of moments. He proceeds to think that maybe someone reawakened Candela's spirit, but figures that it would take extraordinary power to do such a feat, as he notices that Mr. Lin is holding the sword Candela in his hands and realizes that this sword used to belong to Joseph, so he immediately calls Joseph through his uh, communicator, <laughs> not a phone communicator, and Joseph responds by saying he saw everything and how he's on the battlefield right now. Then Joseph thinks how he expected Mr. Lin to do something, but never something of this magnitude. Joseph then tells Winston that Sword Candela was just given away a couple of days ago and that this was also approved by the elders of the Secret Instrument Tower and Joseph tells Winston that the person flying on the griffin right now is actually King Candela himself and Joseph says he knows this because he's been listening to Candela's whispers for a lifetime now. Winston completely loses it as he starts yelling at Joseph, asking to whom was the sword given to, and Joseph in a relaxed voice answers to the class I bookstore owner, Mr. Lin. Winston relaxes a little bit after realizing this and asks if Joseph knows what Mr. Lin's next move is and how did he even manage to summon Candela here in the first place. Winston suddenly realizes something as we see Mr. Lin still on a griffin raising his sword as some purple light is advancing towards him from a distance. Tifa yells how it must be the Truth Society's Destruction Star Cannon and how they didn't cancel it 
and now we go back to Ackerman who has given out the order to shoot the cannon at Mr. Lin because even if he has slain the dream beast Cthulhu he's also from the dream world himself and because of this needs to be stopped while other members of the truth society are trying to calm Andrew down and make him recall his order but he gets completely furious saying that there's no way this apparent King Candela is on their side and they need to fire the cannon as soon as possible because this being came from a dream and dream creatures feel no human emotions and have no remorse towards human life. Andrew continues yelling saying there's no justice when it comes to dream creatures because their sole existence is a game of hunter and prey where they try to hunt down weaker targets and how this King Candela dream creature is a bigger threat than Cthulhu since he basically one shot at Cthulhu and Andrew yells to fire the destructive star cannon now. We see members of the Truth Society making everything ready to fire and as we see this destructive star cannon we can see that it looks like literally some weapon out of Star Wars movies but calling a phone, cell phone instead of a communicator would be a problem. Mm -hmm. They continue preparing everything that needs to be done in order to fire the cannon and then the countdown starts. 3, 2, one fire as we can see a huge laser like beam fired out of it and flying straight towards mr lin who's just casually waiting for it thinking how maybe this is a second phase of a boss fight he's in right now and as his face literally literally turns into saitama's face because how powerful he got he thinks to himself that no problem if this is a second phase i'll just cut through this beam like a piece of cake like saitama would in the first place as well man references in this manhwa are wild like old wild now we see mr lin thinking to himself how he did a good job in this dungeon and cleared it completely but regrets not knowing what actually happened to king candela in the past since this is all a figment of his imagination and not the actual reality he thinks but then suddenly he turns around as he sees a group of people in the distance and as he gets closer to them he realizes that they are the people of King Candela who was yelling at them saying that they deserve to die as they try to calm him down saying that he did try to beat this immortal and failed but how that's not the end of the world because they have a plan to save their land and they explain to Candela how a small sacrifice is necessary in order to survive. Then they point to zombie like elves saying that these are all people who willingly gave their lives and power for the kingdom to be saved and after Candela sees a child he gets even more furious yelling that at least they shouldn't be using children for their wicked experiments. He leaves the palace saying he'll fight the dark immortal once again. After returning back for the second time, Candela's people are barely surviving, asking him if he managed to do it and saying how their failure is not his fault, how he was actually a really good king, but that his people were actually bad. And as this elf is crying, he begs Candela to fulfill his last request. As the camera zooms out, we see these elves becoming half monstrosities themselves after failing their experiments and their final request was for Candela their king to end their suffering and just kill them. Candela agrees and starts swinging his sword ending the remaining lives of his people. Then we see Candela climbing a snowy mountain amidst a huge blizzard and as he barely reaches the top he falls down on his knees saying he'll give anything to save his people and let them live on. As we see that he is talking to original witches who symbolize the eternal power of this world and they agree to Candela's request. Candela gets happy as he swings his sword one last time but this time to strike himself down. Mr. Lin suddenly wakes up as we see him lying down in front of Lady Silver who's covering his eyes and leans in close to his ear and whispers 
long time no see. She pulls back Mr. Lin, placing his head upon her thighs as he blushes after realizing who this is and responds back by saying, ah, long time no see, and thinks how her skin is so soft. He calls her name, saying silver, and she laughs, answering he is right and explaining that he got caught in her dream. So he asks her if the reason for that is because they are friends, to which she answers in a flirty way, if you say so. Mr. Lin then comments, saying this feels as if it was her plan and she asks him if it was, would he like it? And Mr. Lin answers that he would love it. Silver comments how Mr. Lin looks more tired now than when he came to her last time and asks him what did he saw in the previous dream. Mr. Lin, still lying in her lap, answers that he saw history of the self-proclaimed criminal, King Candela, and then Silver asks him why would Mr. Lin call Candela like that and does he think Candela was not a criminal. Mr. Lin answers that from what he knows, this is his opinion, but how he doesn't know the entire truth and comments that Silver looks like she knows the complete truth. Silver happily answers that she does and asks Lin if he'd like to hear it and Mr. Lin thinks how both Candela and Silver are parts of his subconsciousness, meaning whatever she would tell him he should probably know already, but he realizes that lying in her soft lap and listening to this beautiful lady tell him stories is definitely a heavenly experience. He then tells Silver that he listened to the truth she has to say and Silver starts explaining that Candela and his people faced an overwhelming dark that would cause anyone who just lays their eyes on it to start mutating. But how this isn't their curse. What brought their downfall was their greed, because after mutating they wanted to control it to gain more power. So they started doing experiments, but they needed a huge amount of test subjects, so every innocent person in their kingdom would become their lab rat. But after a while, they lost control over this mutation and every single person on this elven island was affected by it. So in order to stop this mutation, their king raised his sword against his own people and after killing all of them, he ended his own life as well. Linden says that if this is the truth, Candela is not the one who went crazy, but his people, and how Candela probably suffered the most while killing his own kinsmen. But if a kingdom ever comes into a situation where its king has to lead the kingdom to its downfall by killing all the people in the kingdom, the king is also a maniac, and how Candela's soul now has to carry the sins of all of his people. It's a sad fate, Mr. Lin comments, and then he explained that Candela actually exiled himself because as a king it was his duty to protect his kingdom at all costs, and how now he's just willing to suffer forever because of his failures. Silver responds by saying that no matter if he was crazy or not, his name will never be cleared because this history has turned into ashes many ages ago and how it will never be made beautiful again. Mr. Lin conjures the sword Candela next to himself, commenting how from his perspective, after all is said and done, he still thinks Candela is a good king and how Lin will remember him like this forever. Silver then comments how because of that, Candela gave Lin this mark which symbolizes a king of the elves, meaning that he crowned Lin as one now and if Lin is able to find descendants of the elves that followed Candela, they should be willing to take Lin as their king. Mr. Lin comments how he could never do that because he's just a normal bookstore owner. He can look after the books easily but never after the entire nation of people. Plus, he doesn't want to end up the same way as Candela. Silver giggles and comments how she knows Mr. Lin is lazy as she gets surprised and realizes that the dream is disappearing right now, how she doesn't want it to end but they have no choice and have to say goodbyes for now. She lets Mr. Lin get up and finally remove her hands from his eyes, saying that they should witness this together and we can see the barrier between the dream and reality broken 
a silver comments saying that this is the result of what Candela protected with all of his strength. And as we look down below, we can see beautiful grassy plains, a silver comments that Candela's land has survived for over many millenniums past. Now we see members of the secret instrument tower witnessing Mr. Lin casually splitting the destruction star cannon's ray in half and just stopping it there and as they are looking at this scene they're trying to not lose their minds but this is not going their way. As Winston tries to calm them down and tell them to follow the orders, he realizes that it's near impossible now for them to do so because of the fear running through them and thinks how even he, a radiant knight, still has a cold sweat over his back because of what he just witnessed, thinking and comparing that dream creature, King Candela, to Kratos, basically. He then gives an order with his communicator telling his subordinates to clean up the battlefield. As we can see sun rays pierce the cloud and the terrible rain is finally over, Winston relaxes, exhales and thinks how it's finally over and how this bookstore owner, Mr. Lin, seems to have quite a temper. As he gets surprised hearing Joseph approaching him from behind and saying how that's quite normal. Because if you imagine a wild dog invading your living space, you would also lose your temper easily. Winston asks Joseph if what he means by that is that these all-powerful dream creatures are wild dogs and how they are the good guys, to which Joseph responds by saying that all of them are nothing but tiny fleas. This irritates Winston who thinks that he should punch Joseph in the face and if this is not the cutest irritated face of an army general you've ever seen, then you must have seen some weird things in your life. However, Winston exhales again to relax, thinking how as a general, he needs to keep his cool as he tells Joseph that it doesn't matter anymore and how what's important is that this thing came to an end. Then Joseph responds by saying how it's still far from over because the secret instrument tower spent so much time trying to find the magic mirror egg but didn't manage to do it at the end, meaning that there is probably some bigger mastermind behind all of this who threw these demon beasts into knocking. As we see a blonde man and his levitating sword somewhere on the mountains and we can see that he's carrying a medallion with a green symbol on it and he giggles thinking everything is going according to his plan. Hoo <laughs> bros, it's getting interesting, there's a new villain appearing soon it seems. Now, now we go back to Winston and Joseph, while Winston is thinking that it has been such a long time since he last saw Joseph confident like he is now, as he remembers an interaction they had in the past, 10 years ago. Now we go back to the past and we see Winston approaching Joseph and yelling at him because Joseph was sending Winston's people to do his missions, which is causing trouble for them and saying that if he doesn't have a good excuse for it, not even the elders of the secret instrument tower will be able to save him. Joseph responds by saying how he's sending Winston's men on his missions because they are trained well and come quite in handy, as he winks at Winston, which makes Winston completely lose his mind. Winston then gives mission papers to Joseph, saying he should complete these tasks. As Joseph is leaving, dissatisfied because there are too many missions, Winston asks him about Dahlia and asks if something happened because he's not used to seeing Joseph without her by his side. Oh, how cute. Joseph answers how she went on a mission by the tower yesterday, but probably it's not an important mission, Joseph thinks, because he wasn't sent with her. Joseph then comments how he hasn't seen her in a while and she should be back soon, as he also says how he's starting to miss her. At that moment, the door slams open as one of the subordinates rushes in and while fighting for breath yells that Dahlia is dead. 
Silence suddenly spreads throughout the room, as Joseph is first left shocked, but then charges straight through the wall to go rescue Dahlia. Winston and other subordinates go out to follow him, while we can see Joseph returning back already, carrying the dead body of Dahlia in his arms, and Joseph, with a cold look in his eyes and a blank voice, asks Winston to help him get a vacation, because he has to bury his dead wife. Winston is left speechless and sad as he's looking at Joseph walking in the distance and carrying his wife's lifeless body. Bros, I feel so bad for Joseph. He even started missing his wife and he even promised her before that after she returns back from this mission, he'll tell her he loves her. No, why you gotta do him like that? Now we skip a bit into the future where Winston is ordering extra people to go with Joseph on the mission because ever since Dahlia passed away he wasn't himself completely and how most of his free time he would spend in his room doing nothing and just torturing his own mind like a prisoner. How when he first returned to the secret instrument tower after Dahlia passed away he started training like crazy and completing missions like a robot. And Winston thinks how even though others still see Joseph as a bright light fighting for peace, only Winston knows how he really feels and that Joseph is constantly putting his life in danger in order to forget the death of his wife because from that moment his life stopped as well. And as Winston is sitting in his office, Claudie rushes in giving the latest report to Winston about how Joseph is planning to go and fight Old Wild by himself. Winston realizes that even though Joseph is really powerful, there's no way he can take on Old Wild on his own, so Winston runs to Joseph's room and as he barges in, we see Joseph all messed up and covered with bandages, holding the candle a sword, as he turns turns around and asks Winston why did he come and how Joseph was just about to go on a mission. Winston slams him with his fist, yelling it's time for Joseph to wake up, then grabs him and starts shaking him, yelling how Dahlia's death was an accident and how it was not his fault so he shouldn't eat himself about it and blame himself. And how if he continues acting like he is right now, he's only making it worse for people around him. And Joseph is left surprised while listening to Winston continue yelling, calling Joseph his old friend and telling him how he understands he's hurting right now, but he has to stay alive and endure and no matter how precious something was, if it's lost, it's lost. And if he continues to beat his mind up about things that he lost in the past, it will only get worse and how he needs to focus on the present. As Joseph is looking at Winston, still in complete shock, he remembers the moment he reached Dahlia just as she was dying and she apologized to Joseph for leaving him alone with their child and as Joseph is crying and sobbing, begging Dahlia to not die, saying how he'll find a way to save her as she responds that there's nothing that can be done now and how these are her last moments. She apologizes again for not being able to stay with Joseph until the end and says that she really hoped two of them can watch their child grow up and become a knight as tears are flowing down her cheeks and Joseph yelling on top of his lungs how she can die and just as he tells her I love you, she passes away. Come on, it's so hard to do this recap with keeping my voice cool and not shaking, crying. What the hell, mon? Now Joseph pulls her closer and starts crying like he never did and like he never will. Then, thanks to Winston's words, he remembers how he still has Melissa, their daughter, and needs to take care of her. Winston tells Joseph to rest now and recover and not go on a new mission just yet because Melissa is still waiting for him. Now we go back to the present present as Joseph is looking confident and happy for the first time in so many years and Winston thinks how he finally can look at Joseph again and see that unbeatable son. Then we go back to Andrew's office as Andrew is losing his mind how nervous he is because of these dream creatures and the last words King Candela told them after stopping their ray and going away and stopping Cthulhu as well the last words were, you are welcome. 
Andrew thinks about how these words were said to make fun of the truth society and let them know how there is no need to thank him for beating them up, because that's something that he can do whenever he likes. Andrew thinks how from the records that they have about King Candela, he wasn't so goofy and how probably summoning him was the intention of the person behind all of this, but how even the power required to summon King Candela alone would be enough to wipe out almost the entire truth council. As he continues thinking about all of this, he gets surprised as the masked and armed authorities enter his office and their leader, a second vice chairman of the Truth Society, Damon Ainsbaron, tells Andrew how because of breaking the regulations and rules of the Truth Society, he's being stripped of his authorities and is now under the investigation and how he should try not to do anything funny now. Damon continues explaining that because of Andrew's decision to launch a destruction star cannon, he has caused a huge amount of damage and lost huge amounts of money for the Truth Society. Andrew gets irritated, thinking how Damon just recently got promoted to the vice chairman and how he's probably using this situation to get rid of Andrew, but Andrew decides to calm down and try to turn the situation in his favor, saying that he admits he made some wrong decisions, but how there is nothing wrong with the reasoning behind his decisions and how his biggest mistake was misjudging the enemy's strength as Damon interrupts him and tells him to stop talking because from his research he has found out that Andrew was personally investigating the bookstore classified I for indescribable and how Andrew was very hostile towards it. As Andrew responds by saying how the current problem has nothing to do with the bookstore because people who summoned the dream beast were the members of of the White Wolf Clan, and Damon responds that according to the latest reports, the one who summoned King Candela was none other than the bookstore owner, Mr. Lin himself. So this gives them the reason to think Andrew ordered the attack because of his selfishness and because of Andrew's decision, the friendly bookstore owner decided to make a move, causing huge losses to the Truth Society. As Andrew yells that this has to be some kind of a joke, Damon interrupts him again, saying there's no need for him to speak now and should think how to fix the upcoming problems he is going to face. And bros, is it me? Or does Damon's shadow look awfully familiar to Inky? Hmm, we'll see, we'll see. Now, just then, they hear an alert saying how the mechanical reincarnation is under attack and Andrew comments how according to the rules, if code A, like this one now, is happening, staff that are under the investigation should keep their authorities while code A action is active. And with a smirk on his face, he asks Damon whether he's right or not. Now we go to the underground base of the White Wolf Clan as we see members of Miss G's spy their clan walking through this space. Miss G proudly proclaims how all the members of the White Wolf clan are now dead and how with this she managed to get her revenge, but now their goal is to search through this underground base and loot everything left behind by the White Wolves. As they continue exploring, they reach a chamber filled with blood and body parts and they enter it and start exploring it while blood mixed with human flesh is forming a goo-like substance. Then Miss G sniffs some awful smell which makes her body shiver and she realizes that this smell is just from the lack of cleaning of this place, thinking how could anyone live here when it's so dirty and smelly. She obviously didn't come to my room. <laughs> now as she enters another room, she can see cracked pods and as she gets close to the biggest one and looks at it, figures that this had to be hatching pod of the magic mirror egg. Then Max approaches her, telling Miss G that he managed to complete the mission she gave him, and after seeing him and realizing his left arm is missing, Miss G asks him about it, and he answers that it's not a problem at all, because his master instructed him to do his best to help Miss G, and how now he managed to do it. By the way, the master he's talking about is Miss G's father. He then offers Miss G a small container, 
telling her that this is the formula of the tainted blood from the sky wolf. Miss G takes the box and praises Max for doing a really good job as she instructs him to go rest and heal. But as she tries to touch this box, a purple lightning bolt fires out of it and she comments how this might be the secret rune for protection made by the white wizard. Max suggests that maybe they should ask Haywood to take a look at this and Miss G thinks how Haywood is her father's friend but how after Ryan got eaten by Mr. Lin's gargoyle because he was a spy and because he tried to kill Mr. Lin she can't trust Haywood as well thinking how both of them have the truth rune made by the white wizards but how probably even this rune can be hacked since Ryan could do it as well. Miss G tells Max how she'll think about it after going home and suggests they leave since this place is too dangerous right now. But all of a sudden she feels an aura of a destructive rank person and as she looks up she can see a shadow in the corner of the room and this shadow responds by saying how her senses are impressive since she could detect him even after he was hiding his presence. We see this is Ackerman and he tells Miss G how she shouldn't panic because he's not her enemy and it's an honor to meet her finally. He tells her he came here to check what kind of a person is the famous up and coming hunter who took care of the white wolf hunters. As we see their dream beasts squaring off, Ackerman thinks how Miss G is quite impressive because even though she is young, her eyes are sharp and her aura calm, just like a wolf who's patiently waiting to pounce at its prey. Ackerman also realizes how Miss G is so close to reaching the destructive level herself. He then comments and tells her that she has an extraordinary talent to be able to almost reach the destructive level while still being so young and tells her how now he understands why the owner of that bookstore was willing to help her. Miss G gets surprised by this and asks Ackerman how does he know this bookstore owner as her subordinates rush in interrupting them, specifically Pava, wanting to report that their lives got saved by some unfamiliar hunter. And as she enters the room, she sees Ackerman and yells that this is the person that saved their lives, as we see her cowboy looking squad leader with eyes as weird as always. She tells Miss G that the pale white knight riser Mr. Omen saved her, which leaves Ackerman completely in disbelief, thinking how did she manage to get every single one of his names and ranks wrong. Miss G thanks Ackerman for his help and he responds by saying how he was just doing what he was supposed to do and that there is no need to thank him for it. Now we see Ackerman talking to Miss G and he asks her about the help Mr. Lin offered her and what power did he give her. To which Miss G responds by saying that thanks to Mr. Lin, she can now control the tainted blood in her veins and how she'll use the power Mr. Lin has given her to help all the hunters in knocking. Ackerman thinks to himself how Mr. Lin did mention something similar to this and how Mr. Lin doesn't only want to help Ackerman but all the other hunters in knocking and the way he wants to help hunters is to rid them of the curse of the tainted blood which would cause them to get consumed by the madness of the dream beast that they have the tainted blood of. Ackerman praises Mr. Lin and calls him the savior of all the hunters and starts yelling how his family and friends all fell to the curse of the tainted blood and how he witnessed it personally as they slowly lost their sanity and transformed and got corrupted by the dream beasts slowly becoming beasts themselves but how thanks to Mr. Lin this will not be the case for hunters anymore. He starts crying out of excitement and Miss G calms him down saying that Mr. Lin will give them a new purpose and Ackerman agrees saying that they will be reborn under Mr. Lin's protection and guidance. Two of them shake hands and call Mr. Lin infallible. Their passion for Mr. Lin made them quickly agree with each other so much so that they immediately became soulmates. 
Then the weird eye cowboy looking guy tells Miss G how he has found some kind of a map and after inspecting the map, Miss G excitedly comments how this is the map of all the underground passages that allowed white wolves to move so freely around knocking without ever being caught. She orders her subordinates to loot everything they can and how they need to gather up as much explosive as possible because their goal right now is to destroy all the other eggs of the magic mirror so Nokin will be safe from Dream Beast invasions forever. Ackerman tells Miss G how now he's fulfilled Mr. Lin's wishes and is going to leave them to their plans and that he will help Miss G in future when his help is needed and calls her his leader, saying he hopes the day he will serve her again is not too far. Miss G winks and in a flirty way tells him that she might need his help soon and Ackerman completely missing her point responds by saying that he will do whatever she wants from him in the name of the bookstore owner. My bro Ackerman has negative riz. He also continues speaking, saying that she should act faster too and try to fulfill Mr. Lin's orders as soon as she possibly can and as we can see the shadow of his dream beast with familiar bloodthirsty glow in its eyes, Ackerman tells Miss G that no matter what, she should never try to betray Mr. Lin. Miss G is left speechless for a moment as he leaves. My girl was hoping to get some Ackerman juice tonight, but all she got was a live threat. No! Oh no, Ackerman, what did you do? She orders her men to place the explosives now, and as soon as they set them off, they should run out so they don't get caught in the explosives, and they follow her order, placing the explosives and running away. As they are running out, Max tells Miss G that Ackerman's last words were a threat but how he didn't feel any murderous intent coming from Ackerman and Miss G responds by saying that both her and Ackerman are customers of Mr. Lin and this caused them to form a partnership now but how he wanted to pass her a different kind of message just now and from her understanding the message was that there's not just one destructive level aura around here but two. And this shocks Max as Miss G continues explaining, saying that Ackerman has felt this other destructive level aura but couldn't find the exact position of this person, so he came to Miss G now to protect them if this other destructive level person was to attack them. And as the explosion goes off, Miss G says that now they owe two favors to Ackerman, for saving Pava and for saving them from this other destructive level guy. As the underground base is getting demolished by explosions, Miss G explains that her next step is to go to Mr. Lin with this locked box containing the secret tainted blood formula in hopes Mr. Lin will help her open the box. Now we see a familiar shadowy figure in these underground tunnels, probably the other destructive person Ackerman sensed and we learn that this is Old Wild. My boy Old Wild is back! He was impressed by Ackerman's and Miss G's detection skills because they could find out his aura even though he was concealing it completely. As he's walking out, he thinks how times have definitely changed now and admires the new hunters and their amazing talents and thinks how this is maybe what Mr. Lin wanted to see all along. Old Wild now thinks about Ackerman specifically thinking how he managed to keep his senses of Old Wild's aura active the entire time he just had a casual conversation with Miss G and how before leaving, after telling her the threatening message, he could actually direct his murderous intent specifically and only at Old Wild so the other hunters wouldn't feel it. Old Wild compares Ackerman's power to the one of a top-notch black mage and thinks how he can still feel lingering effects of his murderous and cold aura and remembers how Ackerman not too long ago accepted a contract on Old Wild thinking if Ackerman didn't abandon this contract, the fight with him would be troublesome for Old Wild. He then admires Mr. Lin, thinking how he's magnificent for being able to acquire such powerful people as his chess pawns, and how Mr. Lin probably has some kind of a grandiose plan for all of them. 
Old Wild feels grateful for receiving Mr. Lin's blessings as well and thinks how it's his time to repay back his master Mr. Lin. As he finds Helix's dead and mutated body, lifts it up saying how he didn't guide Helix so long for nothing and thinking how Helix is the perfect material. He then remembers Mr. Lin's words to him when Mr. Lin advised Old Wild to always be firm and ruthless and never give an opportunity for things to return back to haunt him, saying that he'll never allow the same mistakes to happen ever again. Now we go 10 years into the past and see a new day dawn in Nokin, as Old Wild's first adopted son and disciple Charles is happily walking down the street because he's going out to buy all the ingredients Old Wild needs and thinks how tonight he'll probably receive a delicious meal as a reward for being such a good disciple. As he's looking at the list of the items he needs to buy, he meets the second disciple of Old Wild and his foster brother Yuan. Bros, they're changing these guys' names every two chapters and are just making it more difficult for me to remember all of their original names. Not cool, not cool. <laughs> Charles gets happy after seeing Yuan and asks how his tasks are coming along, to which Yuan responds by saying that he's still doing them and making progress and then Yuan asks Charles why is he alone and not with Old Wild. Charles responds how Old Wild is sleeping and he wanted to surprise him with all the ingredients he needed for the new method he came up with a couple of days ago, but after finishing the research for this method, he immediately fell asleep because of how tired he got from it. So that's why Charles is out now all by himself. Charles also explains how his duty was to clean the workshop and how in order to buy these materials before Old Wild wakes up, he couldn't finish cleaning the workshop, so he hopes he won't get scolded for it after Old Wild wakes up. Yuan tells Charles he won't snitch on him to Old Wild and also offers to help him find the potion shop he's looking for, which gets Charles really excited and even more happy. As they are walking off together, Charles continues praising and thanking Yuan, admiring how Yuan is able to train outside by himself and says how he hopes he will be able to train like that too, while we can see Yuan's ominous smile as he tells Charles that he'll be able to do it soon too. After walking for a while and entering an abandoned alley, Charles gets a bit suspicious and asks Yuan if this is really where the potion shop is located and Yuan responds that it is and how it's probably located in this remote place because people who sell potions usually are all weird. Charles comments how this place maybe isn't that dangerous since Old Wild comes here often too and explains how on his right hand he has a ring made by Old Wild that allows him to teleport quickly back to the workshop so Yuan should also stay close to him in case something bad happens so they can go back to safety to the workshop together. Yuan responds again in an ominous manner saying that Charles shouldn't worry and how if any danger occurs he'll definitely hold on to Charles's ring too so both of them can teleport away. As they continue walking more and more into deserted alleys and blocks, Charles comments how he never wants to come back here again because of the foul smell this place reeks of and then they hear a voice and look up, seeing a guy up on a building commenting how nothing smells more foul than that old dirtbag old wild and the next worst smell is the smell of his first disciple because Charles carries the smell of old wild. Charles gets scared and shocked as he looks up at this guy and realizes that this is the destructive level black mage Harper Red. Harper Red asks if Old Wild did not actually mention any details about him before and continues saying 
that if this is the truth, it doesn't surprise him at all because Harper Red ruined the reputation of Old Wild and humiliated him and that's why Old Wild doesn't talk about him at all. As he starts manically laughing and screaming how Old Wild never expected that his favorite disciple will die by Harper Red's hands. Charles gets shocked and yells telling Yuan that this guy is dangerous and they need to get away as soon as possible and warn Old Wild about this. But as he turns around to tell Yuan to grab his hand so they can teleport, Yuan rips it clean off leaving Charles even more shocked than he was. Charles falls down on the floor surrounded by a pool of blood spilling out of his body as Yuan tells him that it's time for him to die so they can use his dead body as a puppet and send it to Old Wild to learn all of his secrets and after learning all of them they will kill Old Wild too. Charles, still lying on the floor, calls Yuan crazy and asks him why did he betray Old Wild. And as Yuan is taking the ring off of the Charles chopped off hand, he comments by saying that how does Charles even dare ask him this and as he inspects the ring also says how this ring is really really valuable and that Old Wild must really care about Charles to provide him with such a gift. He then starts yelling in jealousy at Charles, saying that all of Old Wild's attention should have belonged to him because he is way more talented than Charles. But for some dumb reason, Old Wild always favored Charles over Yuan. As he kicked Charles, he continues yelling and insulting him, saying that someone as weak as him doesn't deserve to receive better knowledge from Old Wild and how Yuan never gets the treatment Charles gets. He continues kicking Charles and hitting him in the spot of the open wound and as Charles is screaming in agonizing pain, he tells Yuan that maybe Old Wild did like him more but when it comes to teachings and transferring his knowledge to his disciples, Old Wild never prioritized his favorites. But it's just that Yuan wasn't qualified enough to receive the best lessons from Old Wild. This makes Yuan even more angry and as he tries to finish Charles off, a magic rune appears on the floor out of which rock spikes emerge, hitting Yuan and causing the scar on his face as he drops the teleportation ring which falls to the floor. Now we see the teleportation ring that fell in front of Charles as he's reaching out for it and trying to grab it so he can teleport back to Old Wild and just as he was about to pick it up the destructive level mage Harper attacks Charles and before finishing him off explains that maybe if this was some other destructive level black mage Charles would be able to escape and explains that why he managed to catch Charles from a distance is because his body has no shape and that's why he's using these bandages to maintain even a tiny bit of human form. Harper then turns around to Yuan and tells him that his prey almost got away because Yuan got distracted and asks him if he really is much stronger than Charles. Harper also explains how Old Wild will probably find them if they stick around here for too long, so they need a new plan now and instructs Yuan to take Charles' body to Helix, who's the current leader of the White Wolf Clan. With his last breaths, Charles is looking at Yuan and Harper who are devising a plan to trap Old Wild and kill him off too by using the chopped off arm of Charles as bait. Charles' last thoughts were how he wants to meet Old Wild at least once more and he apologizes for dying as the tears fall down his face, his last wish is not to die right now. Now we see Old Wild who was sleeping while all of this was happening and being a destructive level black mage he had a dream about this and suddenly wakes up realizing Charles has died which hits him so hard he starts yelling and screaming in sorrow with such force that he even breaks walls around him as he leaves the house to go find Charles.
Now we see Harper patiently waiting for Old Wild to come with Charles's arm as a bait, just as he intended. And as he looks up at the full moon, he feels the aura of Old Wild, realizing he's finally come and sees him walking in the distance. As Old Wild gets closer, Harper starts taunting and teasing Old Wild, but Old Wild just remains silent, wanting to find out what happened to Charles. As he sees Charles' hand, Harper starts manically laughing, screaming how he both mutilated and killed Old Wild's favorite disciple, and asking Old Wild how does that make him feel, while we still see Old Wild completely silent. Now we also learn about a trap rune that Harper has prepared on the ground and if Old Wild would just take a couple more steps he'd walk right into it, get trapped and killed by Harper and his men hiding around them. Harper continues thinking how Old Wild is one of the most powerful destructive level black mages out there, but if he steps in this trap, all of his powers will be useless because Harper will be the one that would kill him. But Harper needs to bait him a little bit more in order for Old Wild to walk into the rune trap. So in order to bait him, he starts taunting Old Wild more, saying how Charles was tougher than he expected, because while he was being brutally killed by Harper, he didn't beg for mercy. He now yells at Old Wild, saying that if he wants to get his revenge, he should come at Harper, and Old Wild actually takes one more step and steps on the magic rune trap, completely shattering it, which leaves Harper surprised and scared, because this rune trap was made to be able to trap destructive level mages, but Old Wild just destroyed it with a single step. Harper's beast men start charging at Old Wild, not realizing he destroyed the spell, thinking he stepped in it and got trapped, and Harper screams at them telling them to fall back, as Old Wild turns around and utters. The corpses are talking, as we see all these beastmen explode and their bodies fall apart in an instant. As their blood is raining from the sky, Old Wild's ominous reptilian aura starts emitting on all sides and with a death stare he looks at Harper, who now realizes that Old Wild is way more powerful than he was before and how Harper's probably going to die now. He decides to run away, but before managing to escape, his body starts decomposing and he thinks how words of a destructive level black mage like Old Wild shouldn't have this kind of an effect on the physical body of another destructive level black mage. As Old Wild is slowly approaching Harper, he breaks down, starts crying and begging to be spared, saying that if Old Wild lets him live, he'll give him everything that's left of Charles, as he takes out that ring and says that if Old Wild decides to kill him, he'll crush the ring so Old Wild will have nothing left from his adopted son. Now Old Wild finally speaks to Harper, telling him how he even once told Charles that that there's no need to get emotionally attached to items of dead people. And as his magical black snakes start devouring Harper, Old Wild continues saying that it's just important to keep those people in your memories always. As Harper is getting devoured, he starts screaming in pain as we see giant black snakes emerge and swallow him completely. Old Wild comments how he's never heard such a terrible scream before, and as he flies upwards and looks at the full moon, he remembers his beloved Charles. While flying above the city, and still being in great pain because he just lost Charles, Old Wild comments how he'll destroy this entire city and send it off with Charles as well as a tribute to his deceased disciple. And Old Wild conjures a huge magic rune out of which dark energies start firing out and raining down on Nokin. And we get a shot of Joseph's wife holding their child in her arms as Joseph appears in front of her to save her and save the city as well. Bros, are we about to see the legendary battle between Joseph and Old Wild? Ooh, I'm so ready. And by the way, I gotta say, I like the angle of this picture too. We can see the back of uh, Joseph's outfit, which is definitely, um, yeah, definitely looks nice. Now we see Joseph is completely focused and determined to stop Old Wild and he charges his fist with holy energy and gets ready to unleash his attack 
endless sacred flame. He yells and releases the energy blast from his fist and we can see it fly upwards and collide with Old Wild's black wave and completely stop it, leaving Old Wild surprised as well. Joseph tells Old Wild how Nokin is under his protection and if Old Wild wants to cause these fireworks, he should go somewhere else. As he focuses up and we see a bright glow in his eyes, he orders Old Wild one more time to leave this city. After Old Wild sees the blade candle that Joseph has with him, he realizes that Joseph is one of the Radiant Knights. And with a slight tremble in his voice, Old Wild comments how this was supposed to be a tribute to his deceased disciple, but he still congratulates Joseph for being powerful enough to stop it. We can see that Old Wild also received some damage because there's blood spilling from behind his mask. He tells Joseph how he'll remember him after taking his life instead of destroying this city as a tribute to Charles, as dark energies start swirling around Old Wild. Joseph looks at his wife and daughter, which motivates him more as he takes out Sword Candela and jumps towards Old Wild, yelling that Old Wild should definitely try it. As we see both of them charging towards each other in epic fashion, we get to learn that this is the first time ever that they've battled, and that this battle lasted for 24 hours and happened completely in air above Nukin, and how from this battle onwards, they both see each other as their sworn enemy and will never stop until they kill one another. Now we go back to the present where Old Wild thinks how he still feels the pain from that battle with Joseph, commenting how he'll forever carry this as his sin because he committed a crime he shouldn't have and now he has to endure the consequences. He thinks about how Murphy's Scarlet Cult and Helix's White Wolves sealed their fate by meddling with Charles' dead body. He also thinks about how his plan went smoothly, the plan being that he taught Helix the special sacrificial method, which caused his clan to go crazy and kill each other without even realizing Old Wild's intentions. He also thinks how this gave him a lot of high quality materials for the sacrifice he is planning to make. Old Wild thinks how all of this is happening because Mr. Lin wants it to and how he'll do everything in his power to achieve Mr. Lin's goals as he also promises that this will not lead him away from the path of killing Joseph once and for all as well. We see him leave some flowers on Charles's grave promising to kill Joseph as a tribute to Charles. Now we go back to one of the factories that belongs to the Truth Society where they were doing experiments on people trapped in green pods and we see the factory burning in flames and as we go in to inspect we can see the destruction inside of the building too. If you remember from the last time when Andrew was talking to the new vice president of Truth Society, an emergency occurred which stopped this new vice president from firing Andrew and this is the accident, the emergency that had happened. Now we see Truth Society's special forces going in with the goal to find all the Philosopher's Stones that are still not destroyed and also to save all the other people who are trapped in this building and are still somehow alive but first to find Philosopher's Stones. We then see those two old geezers who were playing chess and I'm sorry but I forgot their names because I thought they will be irrelevant but one of them is the leader of this department and the other one is comforting him saying that he needs to stay strong now and from his analysis someone probably invaded this factory and killed all the humans that the experiments were being done on. They get many reports about the survivors and the deceased people where the dead people make up at least 90% of the bodies found. The leader of this department then comments how they've had some extraordinary experiments in this here building and comments how the security here is so tight that it's near impossible for an outsider to go in and cause this much damage. And this makes the other old guy realize that if it's not an outsider who caused this damage, they must really have an intruder in the truth society who betrayed them and is working on destroying the truth society. Society. Now we see the doctors carrying dead bodies out on stretchers, commenting how this lab and the experiments done in it sure are dangerous, as one of them comments how the injuries on this girl are terrible, but how even if she didn't die here, 
she probably wouldn't have lived long because of the experiments done on her. He thinks so he's never seen her before and my man straight up extends his hand to I guess try and touch her opai. If you know what opai means, shout out to you for watching my other recaps. But just as he was about to enter the opai heaven, he actually gets sent to heaven because this girl suddenly wakes up and slits his throat in a second. And that's why you should never try to touch opai's bros. As another doctor turns around, he sees the girl missing from the bed and the next thing he sees is darkness because she attacks him as well twisting his neck to the point of breaking and ending his life on the spot as well. After murdering both of them, she climbs up the ladders in hopes of escaping the building and she actually manages to do so and we see her walking through the streets of Nokin, all bloodied up and her clothes being ripped apart. While she's walking, a cat approaches her and after seeing the cat, this girl just floats up to the rooftop of the building reflexively. Her face is visibly confused and as she looks up at the full moon, her face relaxes as she admires the beautiful view. She reaches her hands towards the moon and gets a flashback while being trapped in a pod and trying to touch the moon. We learn that her name is Dirt Fetus S277. Uh, is Elon Musk her father because this sounds like a name he'd give to someone. I'm sorry Elon. <laughs> now, this is not her real name, but just her creation number. So this means she was the test subject number 277. We also see she has a barcode on the backside of her neck and we learn that the Truth Society has done over 3000 experiments on different humanoid subjects and all of these experiments ended up being failures. The same goes for this girl as well, but her compatibility with Yita was slightly higher than other test subjects. I honestly am not sure what Yitai is, but I think it's the like essence from the Philosopher's Stone that we've mentioned earlier. Now, after this girl heard that she has only one year left to live, she started waiting for this one night and having thoughts she never had before. And due to her superhuman hearing and eyesight, she could hear what all the researchers were talking about and learn many useful information from them as well. She learned so many things about this lab, building, experiments, researchers working here, all from hearing all of their talks and she also overheard one more thing, which led her to a conclusion that someone will make a move on this lab tonight and destroy it. As we see the spy throwing some explosive redstones, causing an explosion in this building, and while the fire is burning this whole place down, we can see his shadowy silhouette in the distance. We still see the memories of this girl that ran away from the Truth Society's lab, and she's thinking about the moment when everything exploded, and how she finally felt freedom for the first time ever in her life. She also reaches behind her neck and grabs the metal plate in her neck on which her experiment number or name is written and even though she feels intense pain, she rips it out of her body and starts losing a lot of blood because of it. As she's running away, she finds a dead doctor on the ground and takes his clothes off of him, basically looting his body. After taking a couple more steps, she passes out due to the blood loss caused by ripping the plate out of her neck. And while she's unconscious, she hears someone counting something. And we learn that those were the doctors counting dead bodies and the doctors she killed before escaping this facility finally. She feels really hot right now for some reason, but is glad that she managed to escape this hellhole where she literally spent her entire life. She decides to run away even further from this facility, so she doesn't get captured by them again. And as she continues to run away, jumping from rooftop to rooftop, suddenly she feels sharp pain yet again and as she falls on her knees, she realizes that her body needs nutrient injections or else she'll die. But she also realizes how she will be able to adapt to this, but it will take a lot of time to do so. 
and she might die before that happens, as she feels bad for herself, thinking how finally, after escaping, she'll just die moments later. As she faints, she hears a voice calling her, saying that she's a good kid, and telling her to wake up, and this puts a smile on her face as the voice explains that she doesn't know who this is and doesn't know where this is from and this being introduces itself as the extradite of day and night, the bell ringer of dusk, saying that the sun and moon are its elder son and daughter and that the stars and rivers sing for it. It also explains how it's in charge for keeping everything that exists under the sun in order and how its promise is to keep safe from any harm every person that respects the sun and the moon. And the girl now awake lying on the floor in what seems to be a different dreamlike dimension, asking this being why did it choose her right now. And as we can see a silhouette of a person who looks like a girl walks over to her, it says that it chose her because she seeks freedom and as it hugs this girl, the girl blushes and as this being turns her around, it says that the real reason why it chose her is because she was always admiring the moon, purely and profoundly, and with thought clear of the world's pollution and distractions, and how even though this girl is not the chosen person this being has been waiting for, due to the admiration this girl had for the moon, this being decided to protect her as well. This leaves our runaway girl confused as she doesn't understand the meaning of all these words and this being explains how it doesn't matter, this girl doesn't understand what's going on, she has a soul as pure as water and says that her soul is a perfect vessel because of that saying that this girl just might be the right chance for this being as the girl interrupts her asking a chance for what? And this being answers how she'll know in time and needs to be patient. And as this being starts vanishing slowly, she explains how her powers are still limited since this isn't her dream and says that the only way they can even talk now is because there is currently this balance happening between the dreams and the reality. And what she's talking about is the disbalance caused by Mr. Lin after stopping the spawn of the magic mirror. This being now asks the girl if she wants to live, to which the girl responds by saying that yes she does, and this being says that if she has a desire to live, she needs to look at the moon and follow its light and it will guide her, and as this being leaves, it says his goodbyes and tells this girl to follow its fate and how they'll meet again in the future in dreams. And after leaving, the girl looks at the moon again and as she looks down under, she sees the bookstore where Mr. Lin works and takes a step towards it and faints and bros, I'm so hyped to finally see the interaction between Mr. Lin and this girl. Now we go to the forest that Silver showed Mr. Lin the last time we saw Mr. Lin and we learn that this forest is a hidden hideout for the remaining survivors of the Iris family. We see many elves in distraught, hoping that the great priest of their family will be their salvation, and this great priest is Doris. We see these elves living under the protective barrier in this hideout, and they have scouts and mages ready to defend them from any threats coming from the outside. And now we see Doris standing in front of this magical tree and warning her people that the upcoming danger is so big that it has the potential to wipe out their entire clan, so they need to be extra careful with it. Doris explains her plan and says that she'll bait a dream beast that's about to attack them and will bait it towards their combat squad and when the beast falls into their trap they will all use their combined powers to annihilate it once and for all. Doris tells her followers that all they can do now is patiently wait until this dream beast arrives as she extends her wooden staff and casts a huge magic circle underneath her, which fortifies a giant yellow barrier around their hideout even more, 
and she senses that the part of the barrier is already under attack. She comments how the underground wanderer has arrived as she thinks how she knows the name of this monster thanks to the prophecies she's received and she also learned the power of this dream beast as well and it is a being of destructive level but a higher destructive level than Doris. And Doris realizes that the crack between the reality and the dream world might only benefit this monster monster more as she senses a crack appearing deep underground and this dream beast will come into their world through this crack. Doris thinks how the situation is already not going according to their plan because this monster can cause so much damage to their hideout before even reaching the surface by destroying the terrain from underneath and terrain and nature to elves is a sacred thing so Doris thinks how she needs to do her best in order to protect both her people but also the nature that they live in. She then freezes in fear as she senses a horrifying gaze laying upon her and she doesn't understand where this gaze is coming from since she can sense all the creatures inside of this protective barrier right now but she can't feel the person who's gazing at her this way. So this must mean that this entity that's looking at her right now is so powerful that Doris can't even sense it. She then asks a rhetorical question I guess, asking if there's anything on her that's worth looking at. And what do you think bros, is it? Is there anything on her that's worth looking at? Tell me in the comments. Suddenly the ground starts rising as Doris gets ready to fight. We can see a huge tentacle emerging from the ground and it opens its mouth and starts growling terrifyingly. As we see Doris recite an incantation asking for help from Lady Silver as she conjures her powerful natural bow and pulls the arrow ready to shoot as this monstrosity charges at her. She releases the arrow causing a huge explosion after colliding with the monster's head. The monster falls on the ground and Doris is happy that her attack managed to do damage as she jumps above this monster and fires a volley of three arrows at it. But this time it seemed as if arrows did no damage to this monster as we get a nice angle to look at Doris's shoulder as the monster charges at her again and she decides to lure the monster to the trap they've set for it. Doris is visibly scared as she continues fighting and then out of the ground another monster emerges spewing molten lava all around it and destroying all the plants and grass in its close proximity. We can see Doris tired and worn out from the battle as she looks around herself to see the entire forest being caught on fire as she remembers her people who might be in danger too and when she looks at the other direction she can see this monster stopped following her probably because it realizes that Doris was luring it into a trap. Suddenly she starts receiving another prophecy about this monster and realizes that this dream beast lives in packs so there must be more of it out there as we hear screams of her people as they are trying to run away and survive. Doris acts quickly with the goal to protect her people as she casts a teleportation spell and vanishes away. Now we see her people surrounded by fire doing their best to survive but failing miserably. As Doris reappears behind them they start asking her what should they do now and while the panic is running amidst these people Doris slams her staff on the ground yelling that they need to calm down and tells them that as long as the bear barrier spell is active, these monsters will be slowed down, as she instructs her people to go to the altar because elders are there waiting for them to teleport them to Nokin, and Doris instructs her people that after they reach Nokin, they need to find help from the Truth Society. She instructs another group of people to recall the combat squad because the trap they've planned will not work and as they leave, 
Doris sits down on the ground desperate, thinking how if this plan she currently has fails, the entire forest will get destroyed, and why their original plan failed is because they never expected more than one of these dream beasts, as Doris thinks how multiple dream beasts of destructive level are almost impossible to beat. She gets scared, thinking how if the situation continues unfolding like this, there'll be no help for her people, as she hears a young elven voice calling her, and after she turns around, sees a young elf offering her some kind of a flower. The kid explains, and this kid is probably 500 years old, but whatever, the kid explains how his mother said this flower is the symbol of the Iris clan, and that with this flower, Doris will stop the dream beasts easily. Doris blushes and thanks this boy, saying how he shouldn't worry, because she will save all of them. Doris then thinks how the power of people in her clan is way lower than when they were a part of King Candela's kingdom and this is why Doris also needs to ask Lady Silver for help. Suddenly, she remembers that Lady Silver has a messenger in this world and this messenger is the owner of that bookstore and Doris remembers how Mr. Lin agreed to help her save the honor and glory of her clan and also sold her 30 copies of the same book in order for her to do so. So Doris thinks how the books he gave her are magical books and that maybe she needs to give these books to her people to read, but not everyone can understand the spells from these books, because you need to have the ether active in your body to do it. And there's currently less than a hundred people in her clan who can do so. So Doris realizes that maybe Mr. Lin sold her so many books so enough people could learn from them and save themselves in dangerous times like these. Doris also realizes how Mr. Lin must have known the future because he gave them a lot of books to help in a situation like this one. She starts yelling and calling for her people, ordering them that those who have already read and learned spells from the books Doris has brought from Lady Silver, those people need to cast these spells on themselves and others around them and that this is their only way of survival. They start casting these spells as a protection and also using them as attacks on these tentacles too, as we see the barrier crack while a huge tentacle pierces through it and charges at the elves. The fear among people spreads instantly again and the tentacle charges at the boy who gave Doris that flower and just as it was about to hit the boy it suddenly stops and starts bleeding green blood as elves rejoice because they realize that the monster is dead. They look up and see Doris charging her bow and casting the spell known as Wrath of Gaia, hundreds of spears. She then orders her men to stop celebrating and stay focused because every living thing will feel fear in the face of defeat. Every living thing besides dream beasts. We see the battle of elves and dream beasts continue as Doris is shooting her arrows at these beasts and ordering her comrades to keep on fighting as long as there is even one dream beast left alive. After the final beast falls, we see the elves scared but realize that they have been saved as Doris emerges from the fog, saying that they should be fine for now and we can see her face get relaxed as she inhales and starts yelling that they have been saved because Lady Silver answered their prayers and I swear bros the author of this manhwa has definitely a great sense of angles in his drawings because we could never appreciate this one strand of hair of Doris that always hangs behind her back if not for this angle. Truly marvelous. She continues speaking, telling her followers that they still need to stay focused and find the injured and take them to elders so they can get teleported to Nokin, but how they shouldn't be afraid anymore because now, finally, they are under the protection of one of the ancient witches again, and this witch being Lady Silver. Elves fall on their knees praising Lady Silver as Doris admires Mr. Lin because she thinks he knew that a battle of this scale would occur and thus gave them a lot of books, 
and Doris thinks how Mr. Lin definitely has to be omniscient since she is a prophet and couldn't predict this, but he knew all about it. She then wonders who Mr. Lin could actually be because Lady Silver values him a lot as well as Doris thinks that he's maybe her husband but she gets embarrassed just thinking about this because thoughts like these are too disrespectful towards Lady Silver. We see another tentacle now emerging as Doris thinks how she's at the end of her strength but she's still not scared because she feels protected by Lady Silver. She thinks that even if she were to die protecting her people, this will be an honorable death and her duty as the great priest of the Iris clan. She thinks about how she doesn't have much more mana left right now, but decides to use all of her remaining life force to cast the forbidden spell called Living Sacrifice, as she hopes that her soul, after the death, will be allowed into Lady Silver's dream. We see giant roots emerging from all sides, grabbing the last remaining dream beast and squeezing it to near death as Doris shakes while giving her all so the spell can finish casting completely until the last dream beast is obliterated as well. And another great angle if I might add. She starts coughing blood and thinking about her life, not being sad that it has to end now, because she is giving it to protect her people, as we see the dream cracks expanding and more tentacles rushing from them, as Doris falls on her knees, thinking how she can't fight them after they come out, but after finishing this spell and giving her life energy to cast it, the roots left behind should be enough to stop all of these tentacles. She looks up blood gushing from her eyes and mouth as she slowly starts losing consciousness hoping that her people managed to escape and teleport away while she was holding these monsters back. She closes her eyes and as she starts falling down on the ground she feels a soft touch catching her and as she opens her eyes she gets surprised because she sees a shadowy illusion of Mr. Lin who tells her that having nightmares is never good and says that he'll change this nightmare for her, Doris gets scared realizing this is actually the voice of Mr. Lin, even though it feels a bit floaty and way more scary than usual, as she's left confused, not understanding why is he all the way here and how come her prophecies didn't warn her about his arrival. She also realizes that she can't sense any other being's aura next to her, thinking that that maybe all of this is just an illusion her brain is producing in the last moments of her life. But the physical touch feels so real, Doris thinks, as she realizes that the gaze she felt earlier in the battle, but couldn't understand who it was that was gazing her, the gaze must be from this man, meaning that he had the complete control of this entire situation from the very start and just observed its unfolding from the distance, not interfering until now. Doris gets completely petrified now because she's never felt a power this incredible before and as she's left frozen in fear, she thinks how she mustn't turn around to see him directly or she might die out of fear. Now, we go back to the Truth Society who are monitoring this battle as well on their window observation things, not monitors, <laughs> while well, Andrew is asking why are these monitors going off one by one, one of the scientists gets up and loses his mind, starting to scream as the entire room goes into emergency mode and we can hear warnings that an unknown being with incomprehensible power has been detected and its power is so vast that even observing it makes the people go crazy and these systems start shutting down because of it as well. This leaves Andrew shocked as he worries for Doris but also wonders what kind of a being this might be. Now we go back to Doris as this shady illusion of Mr. Lin is standing behind her commenting how this bug is really ugly as he points towards it we see Doris still trembling in fear while Mr. Lin's shadow clone says that maybe it would be better if this monster was a cat instead. 
We see the monster rush towards Doris to finish her off as the black mass covers it completely and after the black mass is gone, cute cats appear on the ground just rolling around and playing, leaving Doris even more shocked now thinking that there is no way this is real and how all of this must be her near death illusion. But she realizes that this is actually a reality and figures out that this being just completely changed the body of the destructive level dream beast into cute little cats in a moment. She then thinks how no matter how powerful someone is, even the most powerful beings of history couldn't do something like this as she thinks that there is only one being capable of doing something like this as she continues trembling in fear thinking that nobody but God could possess this much power. This shadow entity then whispers into her ear saying that he'll turn everything back as it was as Doris is still on her knees with this Mr. Lin shadowy clone behind her as she's witnessing reality shifting in front of her own eyes and actually returning back to how it was before. Still frozen in fear she remains silent as other elves run back confused, asking what's going on and thinking that maybe Lady Silver did all of this as they start rejoicing and praising Lady Silver and also comment how they've heard some chaotic like voice coming from Doris and the voice was so strange that the more they were trying to understand what it was saying, the more it was causing the feelings in their heads as if they're going to explode. They continue celebrating, saying that this truly is a miracle as we we see Doris realize something as she looks up while the sun rays are falling down on her face. She thinks how as long as there's light in this world, there will always be hope. Iris clan elders run to Doris asking her what has just happened and bros, if these girls are elders, especially elven elders, then I'm the oldest man in the universe. Now Doris turns around explaining how the man that spends time with Lady Silver has just saved them as she thinks that even though he's inconceivably powerful, if he's willing to help them, they should be safe and use this opportunity to survive. She then explains that this man that just saved them is the same man that gave them those powerful books as the elders are left a little bit confused asking if this man really is as powerful as Doris is claiming him to be. A new world tree starts growing from the ground as light starts illuminating from every hole in Doris's body as she says that she just received a new prophecy and this prophecy says that this man is finally awoke and he's the one that saved them from this disasters, he is the one who holds power over space and time and what he wills manifests into reality while he's above life and death. His name remains a mystery because he's not the caretaker of the stars but the shepherd who watches over them since the dawn of time. Doris snaps back out of her prophetic state as she starts admiring Mr. Lin even more, realizing that she might be the only person who can truly grasp even the tiny bit of his power. She decides to stop analyzing this further, thinking that the best thing for her would to be to visit him in the future again to thank him personally for his help. She thinks that the first thing they need to focus on now is rebuilding their empire as the shadowy Gu spells out something in Chinese that was not translated so if any of you bros know how to read Chinese and understand it please help your broski out please. Now we finally go back to Mr. Lin who wakes up in his bedroom thinking how he's just had the craziest dream ever, basically what he thinks is a dream are all the events that actually just happened, from Candela stopping Cthulhu to this last battle of elves and dream beasts. Mr. Lin also thinks how he remembers all the details from this dream and how all of it feels kinda real but he's happy that he got to spend some time with the silver haired lady. He also dreamt of the meeting between Inky and Doris but how Inky had Mr. Lin's face while talking to Doris. 
Mr. Lin then turns around and as he lifts his curtains up, gets happy seeing that the heavy rain has finally stopped. He goes down the bookstore, thinking how it was finally time for the rain to stop, and as he goes out to take in a couple of breaths of fresh air, he sees a fire in the distance, and this fire is the factory that exploded from which the experiment girl escaped, and as Mr. Lin looks in front of him, he sees her lying down on the ground. Mr. Lin picks her up and carries her back into his bookstore, thinking that he just got himself some extra work to do now by taking care of this girl, but how if he left her out in the streets, she'd definitely die. He puts her on the chair on which Joseph was lying as well when he was unconscious in Mr. Lin's bookstore, and Mr. Lin thinks how the wounds she has on her are caused by an explosion, but how it would be the best for him to call the hospital with his telecommunication device and not a phone, of course not a phone, but the dial number was unavailable. After inspecting her further, Mr. Lin realizes that she's not wearing her own clothes, but someone else's, and thinks that someone must have given her these clothes, and he turns on his misunderstanding rate, I mean, his deductive brain, trying to figure out what's the story behind this girl as she slowly opens her eyes and wakes up. The girl senses no ether from Mr. Lin, realizing he's a normal human being and thinks how she should be safe for now as he tells her that he's trying to call the hospital to come and check on her, but she begs him not to do it. Just look at how cool his communication device is, bros. Mmm, sugoi desu de. She begs Mr. Lin to save her and then he starts wondering if maybe she's being chased by someone dangerous and he realizes, and of course he's not wrong at all, he realizes how this dangerous person that was chasing her probably threatened the researchers at the laboratory that just exploded and since this researcher realizes he's going to die anyway, he detonated a bomb inside of this facility destroying it completely but he gave this girl his clothes in case she survives so she can get away. Ah, I've truly missed this level of misunderstanding Mr. Lin has. Sensational. He then tells this girl that he won't call the hospital, but how she might still have some internal injuries that they are not aware of and this is a serious situation. He grabs her by her hand, telling that he can still diagnose some smaller wounds and asks for her cooperation while he's trying to diagnose her. He then, as per usual, starts admiring himself for helping random strangers like this, thinking how she was lucky that she bumped into him, otherwise she wouldn't receive this amazing help and would have probably died. Mr. Lin thinks that she's probably under some heavy trauma because of all of these events that happened in the laboratory that he completely got perfectly correct. So, because he thinks she's under the trauma, he decides to be extra sensitive to her as she feels this and starts blushing, agreeing to cooperate with him. As he starts inspecting her, he realizes that she doesn't have any serious outside or inside wounds, but thinks how maybe her bones might have been fractured. As he continues touching her to inspect her body, we see her thinking how all of this feels really nice, but she needs to keep her guard up since she's finally free after so long and she can't let this man know the truth about her, because he might turn her back in. Now Mr. Lin asks if she'd like him to get her anything, because he's gonna go get some tools to help him treat her, so he can bring her something along the way as well, as she points at at the door saying she feels cold and Mr. Lin realizes that he rushed in while carrying her so quickly that he forgot to close the doors. As he gets up and goes to close the door, he turns his back to her and she gets up thinking how now it's her chance to attack him and kill him in order to save herself and her freedom. But she gets frozen in fear after feeling the ominous aura coming from the gargoyle Old Wild gave Mr. Lin, which can feel murderous intent and will stop anyone trying to kill Mr. Lin. 
The girl realizes this and stops for a moment as her ether ability starts recovering and her senses come back and she senses the aura coming from the flower as well and she feels another aura behind her and as she turns around she senses a demonic presence coming from the books as well which makes her realize that everything in this bookstore is alive. She looks at Mr. Lin and in fear wonders how it is possible that he is just a normal human surrounded with these living monstrosities. She quickly runs back on the chair, realizing her best way of survival is to stay put and to follow Mr. Lin's orders. Now we see Mr. Lin turns around after closing the doors and after seeing Moon, we'll call her Moon from now on because a bro in the comments said that's her name, and after Mr. Lin sees Moon lying on the recliner, just looking weirdly at a ceiling, thinking how she looks like a penguin right now, cute but without a brain. Mr. Lin also remembers what I pointed out the last time bros, that this chair so far has been used by Joseph and Moon while Mr. Lin was treating them, so he thinks that besides being a good bookstore owner, he can call himself a doctor as well. He asks Moon if she's feeling any better and asks her to be patient while he goes and gets the medical equipment needed for him to treat her. He tells her to stay still, thinking it would be for the best for her not to move since she might have some fractured bones, but she thinks this is an order from a monster who is threatening her and she shakes her head letting Mr. Lin know that she'll obey him. As he leaves the room, she feels a monstrous presence around him, getting even more scared as she starts feeling dizzy because of all the monstrous auras she's sensing in the bookstore right now, as she thinks that if she doesn't obey Mr. Lin's orders, she'll lose her life, as she senses more and more dream monsters floating through the bookstore. She thinks about Mr. Lin again, not realizing how he is a normal man and is not scared of all these beings coexisting around him, as she thinks that his warm and friendly smile is actually not friendly but terrifying and creepy from the current perspective she has. She also doesn't understand Mr. Lin's motives as to why is he helping her right now and as he returns he apologizes for taking a bit longer because he had to clean all the tools and after coming close to her Mr. Lin sees that Moon is shaking nervously, thinking that maybe the reason for this is because young people are afraid of the doctors, especially of injections, and of course Mr. Lin you are right as always. So to lighten up the mood, he decides to make a light hearted joke as he tells Moon that there is nothing to be afraid of right now, how he is not like the monsters from fairy tales that eat kids, and of course Moon understands this literally as she feels that Mr. Lin is definitely going to eat her. She starts crying, thinking how she needs to escape this bookstore quickly, but realizes that the bookstore door is closed, so she won't make it in time, regretting that she told him to close the door in the first place. Moon abandons all thoughts as she accepts that she is going to get eaten now, so the best thing would be not to resist Mr. Lin as she rolls her sleeve back up and extends her arm towards Mr. Lin saying that he can eat her as her whole body shakes and now Mr. Lin is left flabbergasted as he starts apologizing saying that this was only a joke and he didn't mean it literally as Moon is still crying asking if he's really not going to eat her right now. Mr. Lin exhales thinking how his jokes are always understood by his recent customers, remembering that fine lady as well, who took his joke literally. And bros, I have no idea who is he talking about right now, do you remember? And uh, what do you think? Who is he talking about? Miss G, Doris or the girl with the silver hair? Tell me down in the comments below and why do you think so. Now, Mr. Lin decides to stick to telling his stories only and not jokes as he wonders what kind of an impression does he leave when he talks to people of knocking. Now Moon is thinking how she misunderstood Mr. Lin, thinking that maybe he's good after all, but after looking at him again and seeing one of the demon sultan's auras radiating around Mr. Lin, she takes back her last thoughts, thinking that there's no way someone like Mr. Lin is not an evil person. 
as he tends to her wounds and tells her it will hurt less as she gets used to it more, he also introduces himself, saying his name is Lin Ji and that he's the owner of the bookstore and asks for her name. She answers how she has no name as she remembers that the scientists only called her 277 because she was experiment number 277. Mr. Lin is trying to figure out what she means by saying she has no name, thinking that maybe she either wants to forget about her past and start anew or simply doesn't want to expose her identity to him right now. Mr. Lin thinks how she definitely has severe trauma caused by the explosion she was in recently. He looks at her as he feels bad for her and then pets her head saying how she needs to forget her past and move on with her life and not worry about things that happened before. He tells her how she needs to focus on the present and the future as she gets confused now because she thinks of him as an evil person but his words are so soothing she thinks. Mr. Lin tells her to turn around so he can clean her wounds on the back as he instructs her to take off her coat. And bros, you know Mr. Lin is a pure soul, but if this was Shen from the other manhua, nosebleeds would be running everywhere now. Anyways, after she takes off her doctor's coat, Mr. Lin gets surprised after seeing a deep wound on her neck which was caused by her ripping her nameplate out of the neck and as he comes closer to clean the wound, he warns her that this might hurt more because the wound is so much more deep now. After cleaning the wound, he tells her how there's no infections but she needs to rest because her injuries are more severe than he expected as he pets her head again asking if she has any aspirations or goals and Moon just answers saying that she doesn't know because there is nowhere for her to go as well. Mr. Lin now thinks that her face is radiating with confusion as he wonders about her past life which had to be terribly traumatic for her and thinks how she is the perfect subject for his soul healing words. He tells her that he needs to know her identity as he offers her to stay working with him in the bookstore until she decides what to do in the future. We can see Inky's aura behind her as she comments in a confusing manner saying that he wants her to be his assistant. He then explains saying that if she wants to work as a bookstore assistant he can keep her safe for now and provide her with food and drink and if she ever decides to leave and pursue something else in her future she's free to do so as well. Moon asks again in a confused manner just saying bookstore assistant and Mr. Lin again explains how it's not a complicated job and if you think he's 100% a good person for doing so his next thoughts are that if she was to do all the hard work around the bookstore he'd be able to relax and read books almost all day doing nothing. He explains that her duties would be as easy as just arranging the books, maintaining the books and logging them every day as he comments again saying how all of this is so easy. Moon still a bit shook is thinking how this does actually sounds pretty straightforward but what's difficult about this job is not the job itself but the terrifying presence she feels while in this bookstore. Even while just lying on that chair she couldn't relax because of it. She feels that as soon as she closes her eyes and relies on her other ether senses, she feels that the darkness in the bookstore is not empty but swarming with monsters. Still shaky, she thinks how all her instincts are telling her to run away from this place but how if she goes out in the world, the truth society will find her and capture her again and it wouldn't be hard for them to do so because the outside world is still so unfamiliar to Moon as she also thinks that if she declines Mr. Lin's offer, she'd die anyway for not obeying his command. So both running away and trying to decline the offer would be fatal to her Moon thinks. Her brain starts overloading as Mr. Lin thinks how for someone who doesn't look that smart she really likes to overanalyze things. As he comforts her saying he's not forcing her to stay with him and if she wants to leave she's free to do so without explaining anything to him. He kneels on the ground saying that for now she just needs to relax as he's showing her to climb on his back so he can carry her to a more comfortable place for her to rest and tells her that after recovering she can make a decision whether it be for her to stay or to leave. 
As she starts climbing on his back, Mr. Lin thinks how her best option would be to stay with him for now and thinks how he needs to be careful while carrying her now so he doesn't touch her wounds as he lifts her up and explains how the only bed in the bookstore is his bed but she can take it for now and how he'll go buy a new bed soon. As she gets closer to him she starts blushing, thinking how two of them are so close right now, so close that she can even feel his heart beating. And as he carries her away and they enter his bedroom, she gets frightened again after seeing Mr. Lin's dream catcher that he got from Old Wild as well. Mr. Lin sees her staring at the dream catcher and explains how he got it from a friend and how this thing helps people have good dreams while sleeping underneath it and he says how it's actually working because he personally tested it. Moon senses the same demonic aura coming from the dream catcher as she felt in the entire bookstore thinking how there is no way this thing could make anyone have good dreams. She remembers seeing something similar while being in the lab and remembers how both the dream catcher and this web she saw in the lab were made from the same material from the dream beast called the abyss predator and how the way this thing operates is that it gives the people sleeping close to it terrifying dreams that kill them slowly over time. She then wonders how powerful this guy that gave Mr. Lin this dream catcher is for gifting such a powerful thing so casually to a friend. As he continues carrying her, she spots Sword of Candela and Mr. Lin explains how this blade was also a gift from a different customer and how it's a symbolic ritual sword but Moon senses a powerful aura of King Candela coming from the sword as well as she thinks how this aura isn't as ominous as the aura she sensed before but it's still a powerful aura and not just a symbolic ritual sword. She even figures out that the legendary elven king's soul lives in this blade ready to protect Mr. Lin from any harm as well. She then thinks that Mr. Lin is giving her some warning by leaving her alone in this room as Mr. Lin is trying to figure out why she seems even more nervous now, thinking that she's so traumatized that even hearing positive words make her feel nervous and scared. As he's leaving the bedroom, he explains how there's nothing to worry about and if she feels scared, she should just call for him as he gives her his spare clothes and tells her to get some rest for now. She starts trusting Mr. Lin more as she figures that for now she'll just think of him as a normal human as she starts blushing and asking Mr. Lin if humans usually have such a high body temperature. Mr. Lin gets surprised by this saying that he doesn't have high temperature temperature but that she is the one that is cold right now and probably due to a huge blood loss she just experienced recently. So he tells her to cover herself with a blanket while sleeping tonight. As she's getting tucked in, Mr. Lin tells her how the only stuff he has is his own. So she'll have to make do with it for now as he turns around and tells her they need to figure out what her name could be and asks if she has any ideas. She blushes and covers herself completely under the blanket as Mr. Lin looks out through the window and sees a beautiful and huge full moon as he comments saying that a good name for her would be Moon. This makes her blush even more as they agree that from now on her name is Moon. Mr. Lin leaves and goes back to his store thinking how no one seems to be following Moon, at least for now, and thinks how he needs to figure out this fake ID problem that she has as he thinks that even he himself has somewhat of a fake ID after transmigrating to Nokin as he picks up his, uh, bros, I forgot, what's the name of this thing, it's not a phone, ah, yeah, his communication device and thinks he can ask one of his past customers to help with creating Moon's new identity. He also remembers how this communication device was a gift to him from his first customer ever and how she's the reason his bookstore started working normally and how all of these things that he got from her were a way for her to repay for the book he recommended to her that she was so satisfied with. Mr. Lin thinks how the vibe he was feeling 
feeling from her after she read the book he gave her was as if he changed her life for the better by tenfold, so now she thinks of Mr. Lin as her life savior. He also remembers that she told him that whenever he calls this number from this communication device she'll always answer, as he thinks how he never actually needed to call her in the past three years, also because she helped him too with creating his own fake ID, so she already did a lot for him. But he decides to call this lady now, by the way her name is Curly Chapman, and she's a new character that wasn't mentioned before. And she answers the phone, greeting Mr. So last time Mr. Lin called his special friend and the first customer he ever had. And now we go to her mansion and as we go in, we see a lady filling in some papers as she hears her phone ringing. And of course, like every normal person ever, she keeps it tucked in between her chests. Wait, you're telling me you don't do that too, bros? What? Are you insane? She gets surprised for finally getting the call from Mr. Lin as she answers and greets him. And Mr. Lin suddenly realizes that it's not the woman he originally called, whose name is now Irie, I guess, and based on the voice of this lady, he somehow figures out she has a good body, mm, nice. He then remembers hearing this voice before and the voice belonged to the maiden who picked up Irie last time she visited Mr. Lin. And bros, I'm not making this up, these balloons were not colored by me but were originally colored white on the website I read Manhwa's on because I guess they can't handle real balloons, what can I say? Anyways, she introduces herself, saying her name is Bella and Mr. Lin says that he feels special that Bella still remembers his name from that one short interaction they had the last time as she answers that she could never forget him but didn't expect him to call after so many years of not calling. She explains how she's been carrying this communication device with her for the last three years just in case Mr. Lin would ever call and as she asks Mr. Lin if the call is urgent and if he'd like for Bella to wake up her master, Mr. Lin, while cleaning the bloodstains left by Moon, tells Bella how there is no need to wake up her master right now and continues cleaning, realizing that he doesn't have to clean them completely since dark bloodstains are not that visible on this chair which is uh, not disgusting I guess. Bella then asks Mr. Lin if he would like to leave a message to her master so she can tell her after her master wakes up, explaining that Mr. Lin's requests will always be their top priority. Mr. Lin explains how actually there is a small favor he'd like to ask and starts explaining the situation with Moon while we go back to his room and see her sleeping underneath the Dreamcatcher and the Dreamcatcher seems active. Mr. Lin explains to Bella that he'd like to get a new identity for the girl who ran away from the factory on the 20th street as we see Moon in a deep sleep. Bella then apologizes to Mr. Lin, saying how they'll fulfill his request definitely, but since it's a bit of a complicated request, it will take them a couple of days to do so, as she explains how soon they'll send some professionals to help him out and will do their best to finish the job to Mr. Lin's liking. Mr. Lin then thanks Bella and tells her that it's so nice hearing her voice after so long, saying how he feels as if nothing has changed, while Bella answers saying that they have gone through some huge changes but their respect and admiration towards Mr. Lin is still unchanged. Bella also explains how her master was hoping all these years for Mr. Lin to call so she can receive his guidance again and she didn't dare contacting him first so that's why she just waited. As Bella asks Mr. Lin if it's fine for them to visit him and bros the harem expands. Mr. Lin says how they're always welcome and how he's looking forward to seeing and talking to them after so long. After ending the call, Mr. Lin has some strange guilty feeling because he thinks he disappointed them in some way, thinking that he doesn't understand why they respect him so much, as he turns on his non-misunderstanding brain to try and figure it out, 
but that the end gives up on it since he can't understand it at all, but thinks again that maybe they value their words so much because they come from the merchant family as he remembers them showing him crazy amounts of respect and admiration the first time they met, and Mr. Lin thought how this will dwindle over time, but it feels just as intense as the first time they've met. Mr. Lin realizes how it's almost morning now and he got no sleep at all tonight and decides to wait until the stores are open to go and buy a bed and then sleep a bit later. He then hears news on the radio saying that all the markets in his neighborhood are closed due to the factory explosion that happened last night. Mr. Lin realizes how he'll not be buying the bed to sleep in today after all as he turns around and starts walking somewhere else in his bookstore thinking how it's not a good thing for young Irene to admire him so much and thinks how the next time she comes out to visit him, he'll have to have a serious talk with her about this issue. He opens up a toolbox saying that he has to take the matter into his own hands as he takes a chainsaw out of the toolbox. We can see Inky behind Mr. Lin as he flies out of the bookstore and goes into the apartment of Mr. Lin's neighbor appearing in front of him as this man is shaking and shivering calling his mom for help. He thinks of this evil spirit is back to torture him more as he hears chainsaw sounds coming from Mr. Lin's apartment as he thinks that Mr. Lin is probably chopping up dead bodies over there and he gets another image of Mr. Lin looking like chainsaw man as Mr. Lin threatens Colin, that's the name of this neighbor. He gets more scary images of Mr. Lin being a chainsaw demon like creature and continuing to threaten Colin saying that he'll have to kill him because Colin knows Mr. Lin's secret about him not being a normal human being. As he envisions Mr. Lin bursting through the wall to try and finish off Colin once and for all, he gets so scared of his own imagination that he actually yells out loud screaming don't come near me as he goes quiet again thinking that maybe the evil spirit will hear him and find him if he is loud. His phone starts ringing now and as Colin runs towards it thinking he's saved he sees a message from Vincent and the message says listen to the moon, the moon will give you peace and mercy. Your prayers have been accepted by the Church of Dome. I will go and investigate soon, so please try not to do anything reckless in the meantime. If something were to happen, please prepare the holy water with the recipe below. Spray the holy water on the corners and doorstep of the household every day and perform the chanting below, as he sees that the chanting is encoded and will disappear after it gets read. And at the end of the message, he finds ingredients and the recipes for this holy water. This is probably the church that works as Ghostbusters in Nokin, because last time we saw Colin, he accidentally contacted them to ask for help with this evil spirit he's having troubles with evil spirit being inky. Now we go back to Iris mansion and see Bella approaching a huge door and knocking on them as Irie answers calling Bella in as we see Bella's balloon so big that they've actually started shining right now. She opens the door and goes in and we see a purple ether barrier protecting the room allowing Bella through and bros I don't want to make these jokes but come on. Why did they have to draw her up by going in first? Come on! She enters the room after being approved by this barrier and approaches a huge bed with a mountain of pillows on it and we can see Irie lying underneath all of these pillows. She yawns and wakes up asking Bella about the time and if there is something important happening right now because of what Bella woke her up. Bella apologizes for her next words telling Irie how she needs to keep her elegance at all times, saying that she's over a hundred years old now and thank god she is. I'm just gonna say that, thank god she is. She starts crying like a little baby, saying she doesn't care how old she is and asks Bella again why she woke her up because she wants to go back to sleep. 
Bella apologizes, saying that there will be no more sleep for Irie tonight, as she pulls out her communication device from the most usual place where people keep their phones, as she tells Irie that she'd like to report the conversation she just had with Mr. Lin. Irie gets surprised, not believing this is actually happening, asking Bella to repeat what she said, and as she gets all shy and lovey-dovey, saying that Mr. Lin finally made a move and called her after three years. She falls back on her bed, jumping and rolling in it out of excitement, while Bella is still telling her to keep her elegance at all times. But after a while, Bella gives up on trying to teach elegance to Irie, as she thinks that Irie is acting like a little girl who just received the first call from her crush, and how this doesn't resemble the leader she needs to be. Suddenly, Irie stops all the rolling and jumping as she looks at Bella asking what Mr. Lin said. Bella clears her throat and explains Mr. Lin's request about getting a new fake identity for a girl he recently took in and based on the information Bella managed to gather about this girl, she is related to the Dream Beast invasion and the Truth Society's factory explosion in some way saying that's all that she knows and she'll send more people to investigate details further. As she looks at Irie and sees Irie's face just went blank as she comments asking, a girl? Bella realizes that Irie just got jealous and doesn't believe how she can be thinking about such a thing right now, as we see Irie hugging a pillow shaped like Mr. Lin and mumbling some gibberish. She squeezes the pillow's head as Bella thinks how she needs to stop Irie from acting like this as she starts apologizing to Irie, saying that she asked Mr. Lin in her behalf for them to come and visit. And this makes Irie go completely red while letting out some weird noises and grabbing Bella's dress, yelling that she's not mentally prepared yet to go and meet with Mr. Lin, saying how this is too embarrassing and continuing to shake Bella, but then she suddenly stops and asks if Mr. Lin agreed to meet with them. Bella says that Mr. Lin did agree to meet with them and the emotions Irie feels right now are best described by just looking at this picture bros. She falls on her bed again and tells Bella how they need to do their best to fulfill Mr. Lin's request perfectly and also tells Bella to gather all the necessary information about the recent events in Nokin, saying that after the auctions and the market work is done, they will visit Mr. Lin immediately. She also looks at Bella seriously now, saying that Cangriff and the White Mage are too close these days and I don't know who this Kangriff is, is it some old character whose name they've changed now or is it a new character bros, we'll find out later. Now Bella bows down, saying that she understands Iris' orders, saying that they are one of the three Ash Market's elders and how there's no way he can do anything against her and how his petty tricks will not be able to stop Iri from becoming the next successor. Now we learned that Iri belongs to the Chapman family, which is one of the oldest Druid families in Nokin, which is also one of the biggest shareholders of Ash Market and how their most supported successor is Irie, who is a daughter of a human druid and a dark elf, and usually mixed breeds can't become rulers, but Irie is one, and it's unfamiliar to everyone how did she achieve this position as a mixed breed in such a short amount of time, like 3 years. Some people think that she possesses the ability of soul controlling speech, and that's why they fear her, and call her the Chapman Switch. Now we see Bella remembering how all of this started 3 years ago, exactly after Irie met with Mr. Lin, as she remembers how Irie was so happy after meeting with him, but how he definitely left a terrifying impression on Bella, because she never expected an ordinary human to possess such knowledge and power. Irie then comments how Mr. Lin has taught her that if she is cautious, she'll always have a better future, as she comments yet again, saying that they need to fulfill Mr. Lin's request perfectly. 
She tells Bella how it's been three long years that she waited to receive this call from Mr. Lin, as Bella thinks how impressive Mr. Lin has to be to be able to cause these kinds of reactions from Irie, who usually has no care in the world, as she also wonders what is Mr. Lin working on right now and how it must be of some great importance, as we go back to Mr. Lin swinging his chainsaw and finally getting the job done where he tried making a bed for himself, thinking how this bed is amazing when his lack of sleep and the time of the day is taken into a consideration and how even though it doesn't look nice, it will serve its functionality that is for Mr. Lin to sleep on it. And bros, I need this man's confidence right now, as he's getting a bit dissatisfied with the mess he left behind because he needs to clear all of it now. We see that Moon woke up as she approached him and asked if she could help somehow. Now, after Moon approached Mr. Lin and offered her help, he got a bit surprised because earlier this night when he found her, she was almost dead how badly injured she was, so he feels a bit bad now to ask her to do any labor work around the shop because of it. But after Moon realizes this, she flexes her muscles, showing she actually has no muscles. Mr. Lin smiles, thinking if this is supposed to mean that she's feeling better now and thinks so she is so skinny, plus injured, so there's no way she could help him now. But in order to not let her down, he decides to accept her help, but give her an easy task to help him with. He takes her by her hand and tells her to help him with cleaning the dirt left on the floor after him and tells her to try to clean it all carefully and thoroughly as she keeps looking at him completely mesmerized saying that she understands her tasks. He gets a bit worried now saying how she needs to be careful and mindful of her wounds so she doesn't get hurt even more now saying that there is countless of brooms to spare if she was to break one, but how there is only one of her. Now she gets a bit depressed, remembering her life in the lab, thinking how this is not true, that there is only one of her, and how there are many others like her that researchers made and produced, but then thinks how maybe she herself is different to Mr. Lin from those other androids, as she grabs her heart because she feels an emotion she can't describe now and thinks of it as human's warmth. Ah, oh, this poor girl bros, let's sign a petition for Inky to turn her into a normal human with normal emotions. As Mr. Lin is trying to lift up the bed, he tells her to clean this room for now while he's placing the bed upstairs, as she offers to help him carry the bed, but Mr. Lin of course refuses. While he's carrying it, Moon is looking at him, thinking how that doesn't look anything like a bed frame and then thinks how Mr. Lin is such a strange individual because one moment he has a horrifically powerful aura around him and the next moment he seems just like a normal man as she gets scared because she just remembered something and when she takes a peek back at the bookstore she thinks how she needs to go back here and clean but how there's so many of these terrifying monsters just existing here as well. As she's trying to muster up the courage and beat the uncomfortable feeling of being surrounded by these monsters, Mr. Lin calls for her, saying that since she's the assistant of this bookstore now, she can call him boss or manager, as she agrees and calls him boss. He then compliments her, telling her she's a good girl and his best employee right now and how he'll take good care of her and he did this to fulfill some kind of a fantasy he has, leaving her completely scared because she senses the terrifying aura all around. While we see Mr. Lin get worried now, thinking that he would have to pay her because she's working for him now. She finally musters up the courage and starts feeling good as she picks up the broom and the dustpan and starts cleaning. Now we see Mr. Lin upstairs checking the bedroom where Moon slept and seeing the bed completely perfectly made, thinking how she's definitely a good girl and thinking how they'll definitely have a good time together in the future. Now we see him helping her clean around the bookstore, two of them sorting out the books together, Mr. Lin taking a bath and I didn't know I need to see the scene of Mr. Lin taking a bath bros, but my boy is ripped. 
Reading books makes you jacked as well in this world, I guess. We also see him sewing a dress for Moon and the dress looks completely lovely as we can see on her face as well. After finishing all the chores around the bookstore, he opens it up ready to start working as he tells her it's time for them to receive some customers now, as we can see her being excited about it as well. Sometime in the day passes as they are sitting and drinking tea while Mr. Lin comments how it seems there's not gonna be any new customers today but how that's quite normal too as he remembers something. He reaches for the drawer and takes out a logbook telling her that in here they keep the track of all their customers and the books they lend, instructing her to do so as well from now on and telling her how to do it too. He gives it to her, telling her to go through it, so she gets the idea of their customers, and as she takes it we see her feeling mega uncomfortable now, and Mr. Lin asks if something is wrong, telling her to always ask him if she has any questions. And now we get an epic Jojo ending scene, saying that Mr. Lin didn't realize the problem he just got himself into by offering this girl a logbook to read. We see him completely disappointed, thinking how he never could have expected something like this to happen, as we learn that Moon almost can't read at all, and since she grew up in a lab, her knowledge of things is also very limited, because she only knows things she saw or heard from scientists when they were talking. Mr. Lin wonders what kind of an environment she grew up in, because she is having so much difficulty reading, but can understand philosophy and math easily. As she's looking at Mr. Lin all worried up, he's wondering where to start with her education, as she utters some words saying, boss I can learn. Aw oh, come on, why is this so cute? Mr. Lin realizes that maybe she's feeling a little bit embarrassed now because of all of this and how he, as her educator, needs to pay attention to her feelings so he needs to motivate her with some positive words as he tells her that she's really smart so learning things will be quick and easy work for her. He stands up saying how there's no rush with her helping him around the bookstore and how she needs to focus on learning more things and healing her wounds as he reaches out for two books and bros we're finally getting some Mr. Lin giving books to people action and as he takes out these books saying how it will definitely be really useful in increasing her knowledge and we see the books are the kids encyclopedia and kids dictionary. He tells her to ask him any questions she might have while reading these books and we can see Moon completely scared now because as she looks at these books of course she does doesn't see what Mr. Lin is giving her, but instead sees some kind of demonic books. She gets transported to another dimension and stands in front of the gigantic monstrous door. As Mr. Lin sees her face and thinks that maybe she is a bit discouraged now because the books he offered her contain kids in their names, so maybe he hurt her pride with them a little bit. He figures out he needs to be kind to her, but also tell her that learning is an endless process, as he tells her that there's no shortcuts in learning, and how even though these books are for kids, she needs to go through them thoroughly and learn all their contents, as we see Moon shaking in fear, as Mr. Lin continues saying how this is just the beginning and there is so much more knowledge she has to learn. As she continues to shake in fear while looking at the books Mr. Lin is offering her, we see her thinking that she doesn't feel any terrifying aura from Mr. Lin as she would feel from the monsters back in the bookstore, but how she definitely feels something weird now, she feels as if she's being pulled in and how she has no choice but to take these books and read them and because of this she feels scared right now as she realizes that these two books have the ability to change one's mind and consciousness just by looking at them. And bros, this girl is a genius because she's the first one ever to realize this. As she starts walking towards Mr. Lin, she wonders if these really are regular kids books that teach kids some knowledge. And Mr. Lin looks at her seriously now, repeating that when it comes to learning there are no shortcuts, telling her to not look down on these books and that these are the best 
basics and she needs to go through them and how there's so much more she needs to learn and she gets scared again thinking that these books are considered basics and her gut feeling is completely scared of them right now. So what would the advanced books be then? As she also fears that whatever she learned in the lab is going to change after she goes through these books as her voice shivers and she says that she's not looking down on these books. She looks at Mr. Lin again thinking he really looks serious so she needs to go through these books because they probably are just basics and she extends her short little arms to take these books she's given her but as soon as she touches them she starts feeling an overwhelming sensation flowing through her body as Mr. Lin tells her that she is a good girl again and tells her that learning is a painful process but she needs to learn to love it because it's the path to self-improvement and how this path is endless as he puts his hand on her head saying that if a house only has a roof then it's useless and in order for it to be useful it needs strong foundation and bricks that are built layer by layer and how only then the house will be useful as he reaches for his tea and says that gaining knowledge is like reinforcing a house and tells her how like the bricks make the house stronger learning and gaining knowledge will be her biggest shield and how only the wisdom she has will give her the power to pull through even the most uncomfortable and difficult situations as he continues speaking saying that all the hard work she puts into learning now will definitely prove valuable later in her life and we can see Moon still being petrified of Mr. Lin as he's saying all of this. Now he thinks how the words he just told her are actually learned from his own experience in life, thinking how all the struggles he had to go through are quite inhumane and we see those struggles being building a bed, fixing some broken walls and some other truly hellish like experiences. But Mr. Lin thinks how he managed to overcome all of these struggles in order for him to get this bookstore working and running and how he did all of this with the hard work he put in. Now we see Moon's face again, still terrified, but she gathers up her courage and says that she will do her best and study hard. Mr. Lin compliments her again, saying how her attitude is definitely amazing, saying she doesn't have to worry even if she doesn't understand all the knowledge at first, as he mentions Joseph's daughter, saying that the last girl that was her age didn't like learning at all, but after going through some of the books Mr. Lin gave her, she couldn't stop reading, and he doesn't understand how quite literally he's right right now. As he's saying all of this, Moon is just listening carefully and we see Melissa right now who is still recovering from her reading spree. Mr. Lin hugs Moon now and tells her that she's so lucky because she'll be able to read all of these books for free because she's working for him now as he tells her that people dream to be in the position she's in right now and tells her that she's gonna love it while we can see her just falling deeper and deeper into fear hearing all these words. He asks her if she understands what he means as she answers saying how she definitely does and will go to study as soon as possible so she can come back and help Mr. Lin. As he goes for a sip of tea, telling her that it's time for her to start reading, he tells her how she should only focus on learning now and how he will check on her every once in a while. And she pulls a chair with her short little arms close to him, we can see her beginning to study and read while Mr. Lin is enjoying his tea. As she opens the book and starts reading it, she gets completely consumed by it as we can see days and days pass while she's unlocking some forbidden knowledge. We can see inside of her mind now as she opens up her memory palace and memory palaces are usually methods people use to memorize a lot of things quite easily bros. Now as she's floating through her memory palace and thinking how this method of learning is definitely better than other ones and how all the things she learned she can categorize and access easily when needed this way. As she thinks how her boss, Mr. Lin, was definitely right about the knowledge, but how this basic knowledge she got from those two books is a bit too general because it covers all the basic knowledge that humans, animals, plants and supernatural things can obtain. She then realizes that because she's an android and her mind was almost completely blank, it's okay now, but how if she was a normal human, the amount of the knowledge these books have provided would definitely overload her brain 
scene and change her consciousness and mind into something else. And bros, did we just finally learn how these books actually work? Are they really trying to change the minds and personalities of all the people who read them? Ooh. Moon also thinks how she gained all the knowledge all the white mages possess, as she also explains that white mages use runes to cast spells, while black mages use chants, but how to cast spells that white mages cast, you can't only use one rune, and you need to mix and use many different runes. Now we can see Moon having a lesson with Mr. Lin as her teacher, as he's writing white mages rune on the blackboard and asking her to tell him the meaning of them. She tells him that this rune means the burning light and flame, and he gets confused now thinking how she's learning so fast, basically jumping from a grade school student to a high school sophomore in just 3 days, as he thinks of something's definitely odd with her, but he can't figure out what exactly. As he continues writing runes, we see that he's actually writing Chinese letters, but Moon is seeing runes, as she keeps answering correctly, surprising him more and more. We see him leaving his teacher's hat down and feeling proud of Noon, congratulating her, saying how she's been an incredible student and she managed to learn all the contents of these books so fast, and tells her that she can finally start working as the bookstore assistant. As we see Moon being proud now for hearing these words and thinking how Mr. Lin must have known that she felt fear after seeing these books for the first time, but how he motivated her to study them and learn their contents in order for her to be his assistant and to help with the customers as well. She continues admiring and praising him, thinking how he's truly an amazing person because he wanted to help her improve herself. We see a university building and Mr. Lin working as a professor there as he's holding a lecture in front of a huge class of students. Now we go a bit closer and see two girls talking about him and the blonde girl is commenting how Mr. Lin is a perfect man and a perfect teacher. She describes him as a warm person who can get serious quickly when needed and the blue haired girl agrees with the blonde one. She comments how Mr. Lin is still so young, being 21 year old but has already accomplished so many things, like publishing multiple books and articles, he's also working as a teacher while studying for his PhD, and as she continues saying some other words of praise for Mr. Lin as well, she concludes that Mr. Lin is definitely an amazing role model for younger generations, so much so that he might even be a prodigy. Then they see an article in the daily news about Mr. Lin, where he he gets interviewed to talk about prodigies and other highly intellectual people as the blonde girl comments how she definitely needs to change her approach to life and become a highly intellectual person herself so that Mr. Lin might grow some liking into her. Now we learn more about this interview as Mr. Lin says that he himself isn't a prodigy compared to actual ones who have achieved far greater accomplishments than him. He comments how he's not even specially smart, just saying that his memory is probably a bit better than of an average human, plus he's read so many books which increased his knowledge by a substantial amount. And last but not least, Mr. Lin mentions he has an amazing mentor too. Bros, I think we all know who he's talking about now. Now, as he's trying to stay humble and says that these small results he achieved by this early age are all thanks to these mentioned factors. As the interviewer trembles and asks Mr. Lin if he's not a prodigy, then what kind of a person would be a prodigy then? Mr. Lin gets all serious now, as we can see Inky's ominous smile in his cup of tea, and he starts giving an answer to this question, saying that the prodigies are... And then, we see Mr. Lin slowly waking up in his bed in knocking, while he's seeing that the dream catcher is glowing above him. Moon walks in, calling him to eat some breakfast with her, as he finally wakes up, 
thanking her and saying he'll come over right now and then thinks to himself how he's dreaming about his past and how he can't remember how he finished the answer he was just about to give about what prodigies are. He looks up and sees Moon and thinks that maybe after he was her teacher, that's what woke up these memories in him. And he thinks that Moon is definitely a prodigy since she managed to learn the contents of those two books in just three days. Now we see two of them having a breakfast as she comments how she's changed the recipe from the cookbook a little bit, asking Mr. Lin if he likes the food this way. And as he takes a bite, he thinks how her cooking definitely reminds him of his mom's cooking, which was so delicious that he started crying and tells her that the food is very tasty. He then ponders about Moon again, thinking how she is so smart and highly functional now, not because he was her teacher, but just because she is naturally really talented as he remembers how just a couple of days ago she was almost illiterate, but how in these last couple of days she managed to master both Chinese and English perfectly and how she even studied his research about the R's people and on the second day she took the bed frame Mr. Lin has built and just in a couple of hours of work time managed to make a perfect bed frame which was a work of art. She even sewed herself this beautiful dress out of the clothes that Mr. Lin gave her that were his clothes originally. And how she cleaned the bookstore so much that it looks like it was renovated now. And on top of all of that, she became a master chef in those three days too. And thinks how she's learning amazingly fast and she's absorbing knowledge like when a sponge absorbs water. He then thinks how Moon is the pillar of this family now and feels as if he should be the one taking care of her and not the other way around. He feels a little bit uncomfortable by her amazing skills because he thinks that he can't be a boss to a person who's more capable than he is as he's trying to figure out what he could do to impress her as we see her watering the plant Doris gave Mr. Lin while she's completely terrified of it because she realizes that this plant can suck out the soul of other people. Lin figures out that something's wrong with her while trying to water the plant and asks her what's the matter as she answers in a shaky and scared voice how she's not good at taking care of plants. Mr. Lin suddenly regains back some of his hurt pride and confidence thinking how even someone as smart and as efficient as Moon needs to have some weaknesses as he thinks that there is finally something that he can do better than her to impress her. He approaches the flower and lifts it up, bragging how he solely cultivated this rose as he starts describing its leaves, flowers and color. We see this flower from Moon's perspective and it looks absolutely terrifying. Mr. Lin continues saying how this rose is the best flower he ever raised and it sets the standard for beauty and elegance as he asks her if she thinks this rose is beautiful and we see Moon completely scared looking at this monstrous rose. She tries to compliment it but is left frozen in fear as Mr. Lin says that he understands her, that her admiration for this rose is so huge that it left her speechless. He tells her that even though she's not good at taking care of plants, she'll be able to learn it while being with him, as he's finally feeling calm again because he can teach her something and raise her up to be a good adult. We see Moon still quivering in fear, thinking how Mr. Lin is really nice to her and is always ready to help her learn new things. He looks at her again thinking that maybe it's not a bad thing that she is such a genius because it's definitely useful having someone of her skills working with him in the bookstore. Now two days pass and we can see the flower Doris gave Mr. Lin starting to wither. Oh no bros what's he gonna do now? And Mr. Lin starts sweating bullets again because the only thing he was better at than Moon was taking care of this flower and now he doesn't even have this. 
he remembers how every flower he had also died, but he doesn't understand what's wrong with this one because literally two days ago it was fine. He also remembers how this is a gift from Doris and if she was to come back to the bookstore and see that Mr. Lin didn't take good care of her gift, she would probably get disappointed and as he's thinking all of this, he's gathering books about cultivating flowers to learn what he can do right now to bring this flower back to life. He gets scared thinking how it would be truly terrible if the flower died as Moon interrupts his thoughts saying that something's happening outside of the bookstore. Mr. Lin looks out and realizes that the central government has sent their agents to investigate the fire that occurred recently in the factory that exploded out of which Moon escaped. Mr. Lin thinks about how he found out two reasons for the explosion, one being something wrong with the sewage that's far away from the factory and the other one being that somebody must have caused an explosion from within. Moon asks Mr. Lin about what's going on and he just pets her head telling her not to worry and how this is probably just the central government trying to figure out what's the reason for the factory's explosion. He asks Moon if she learned about the central government and high police as well from those books she read as she gets a little bit scared and confused commenting that they didn't come here looking for her. Now Mr. Lin thinks about how she finally told him something about her past thinking that there might be a slight chance they are actually looking for her because she just got afraid just thinking about it. He asks Moon if she still doesn't want to be taken away and would like to stay with him in the bookstore as she answers in a worried manner how she wants to stay with Mr. Lin as she thinks that maybe the Truth Society has found out about her escape from their laboratory and are now trying to find her and bring her back in. She thinks that even if the Truth Society were to come to this bookstore to investigate the recent events regarding the explosion of the laboratory, they probably wouldn't be looking for her because three more valuable androids were stolen after the explosion as well. And just then, the bell rings as the bookstore doors open and we see three figures walking in. As we go closer to see who they are, a man introduces them as the highest police, asking Mr. Lin and Moon if they've seen any suspicious individuals recently. And bros, before you ask me how I know this guy is a man, I've come to realize after the Claude misconception that the author of this manhua usually draws women with huge cakes. So that's how I know. And we see the high police walking down the street where the factory exploded as they are investigating and trying to figure out the reason that caused the explosion. We learn that the leader of this group is called Sender Ryan and he comments how this neighborhood is incredibly dirty even besides the damages caused by the explosion. He lights up his cigarette and asks for how long has the situation been like this and one of his subordinates comments how this place has been like this for over half a month now and how every time city tried to reconstruct and rebuild the old buildings in this neighborhood some random reasons would always occur delaying or even completely stopping the reconstructions and he comments how recently Roel Resources took over the project to reconstruct this neighborhood and how only recently the rebuilding has resumed. Ryan mocks this place saying it's still pathetic even after half a month of rebuilding has passed saying that the upper district of Nokin is definitely inefficient and this place is the upper district of Nokin. His subordinate it comments how upper district works slowly because of the central district and their requirements from the upper district. As the other police officer comments how higher police has only ever served under the highest authorities of Nokin and that they don't understand the regular folk and that's why they always look down on them as he instructs his colleague to hold it in or else he'd probably lose his current job. Ryan interrupts them 
telling them they have to go investigate the row of the shops at the end of this street, thinking that this job is going to be way easier than he originally expected. And bros, I have a feeling that he's gonna be completely wrong on this one. As he continues walking, he accidentally steps into some black slime and starts getting angry while his subordinate urges him to stay calm, saying he'll clean his boots. Ryan is regretting coming to do this mission already because he had other plans for tonight, way more productive plans as we can see, but now he thinks how he's stuck in this dirt hole right now and how the main reason he's here is not to solve this case, but so the people of the upper district would feel more safe after seeing high police working with them to help them which means he's here just for the shows. And as we can see him complaining and whining, thinking how he'll never step foot in this part of knocking again after he gets promoted. We see them continue the investigation, talking to regular citizens, and after almost completely finishing the entire investigation, they are now standing in front of the last two shops they need to go through, and as one of the police officers knocks on the doors of the first shop, we see Mr. Lin's neighbor running out screaming and scared, asking for help and saying he can't take it anymore. He's crying his eyes out as he continues begging the police officers to help him as he gets on his knees, still crying, and tells the police officers that the boss of the bookstore here is an evil spirit. All three of them are left speechless and in disbelief as Lin's neighbor keeps sobbing and saying that even the man working in the bookstore has probably been possessed by this spirit, as this man explains that this spirit can do what regular spirits can, fly through walls, move things with his consciousness, which is called telekinesis by the way. Neighbor then explains how a couple of days ago he heard a chainsaw sound coming from the bookstore saying that the owner was probably cutting up bones of some humans in there as he says that the chainsaw sounds left him petrified and what's even more scary is that Mr. Lin could kill him any time he feels like doing so. The neighbor continues crying and sobbing, begging for help, and one of the high police officers suddenly makes a <laughs> sound as he gets serious quickly, apologizing and saying he just remembered something funny. My man is so professional. This police officer now asks Mr. Lin's neighbor why he didn't ask a priest from some of the churches for help, as the neighbor answers how he did, and the priest is on his way here right now. The other high police officer tries to calm him down and Ryan interrupts him then, looking at Mr. Lin's neighbor dead in the eyes and asking if he has any evidence for the claims he's been making. <laughs> As the man breaks down even more, crying and saying what kind of an evidence you can have when talking about an evil spirit, because they don't have physical bodies. He continues crying more and more and the high police officers just give him a cold shoulder because they don't believe what he's saying is true. The other police officer that already laughed once starts laughing again trying to hold it in but he's not succeeding. As the neighbor calls him out for it saying that he's laughing at him because he thinks he's crazy. As this police officer refutes what the neighbor is saying and tells him that he's not laughing at all. Now we see Ryan getting nervous because of all of this, but he's also trying to figure out what's going on. As he decides to turn around and leave and tells the neighbor to wait for the priest to come and help him then. As they are leaving, the neighbor warns them that going to that bookstore alone is dangerous and they need more people with them, and as he closes the doors, two of the police officers just burst into laughing, as Ryan is visibly nervous now, saying that they couldn't expect anything more from people who live in this part of Nokin. They walk towards Mr. Lin's bookstore now, and as they are standing in front of it, Ryan is thinking how it looks like a completely normal bookstore. But we see Ryan is actually a little bit scared as well, thinking that he feels an indescribable level aura coming from the bookstore, but thinks it's because of the rambling from the guy they just encountered. 
as they enter the bookstore, we go back to present, where Mr. Lin and Moon are left surprised after seeing high police officers, and we see Ryan inspecting the bookstore, thinking how it's really really clean, and that's because of the Moon and her cleaning in the last chapter, but after he looks at Moon, he realizes she's not registered in the system of knocking, and he also spots bandages all over her body. As Mr. Lin interrupts his thoughts by greeting him and introducing himself, saying that he will cooperate with police officers fully and will answer all of their questions. Ryan comments about Moon, saying she's not registered and Mr. Lin answers how she's a new employee who he recently recruited and Ryan asks to see her ID card or any other proof of her identity. Now Moon gets scared knowing she doesn't have any of these as Mr. Lin hugs her and tells Ryan how Moon is a daughter of his relative that lives in the central district and how she just recently moved here telling Ryan that it's difficult for fallen nobles to convert to regular citizens, and that's why she's missing these documents right now. Mr. Lin continues explaining this situation as we see the plant he has waking up, as Ryan tells him that even if that was the case, why does she have so many wounds and bandages over her body? Mr. Lin starts making up lies about Moon and her family as both of them get uncomfortable with his bad lying while she is confirming that what he is saying is true. As he's spewing all these lies, the plant starts radiating an ominous aura now and the two police officers notice something strange. Ryan then comments how they've gotten complaints about Mr. Lin from his first door neighbor who said that Mr. Lin is an evil spirit and just then notices blood on the chair left by Moon while Mr. Lin was operating on her wounds. Mr. Lin comments how calling him an evil spirit is a bad joke, saying how in the past he even helped his neighbor once and never expected him to have this kind of an opinion about Mr. Lin. We can see the plant and the wicked aura around it now, while Moon is frozen in fear yet again and Ryan suddenly notices something. And as he turns around, he sees his two police officers frozen in place as well, while the plant is sucking out their souls. He looks over to the plant as it has its huge mouth wide open now, ready to consume all of them. And as it's diving deeper into Ryan's soul, he can hear Mr. Lin's faint voice saying that how could he ever be an evil spirit. The ominous aura now covers the entire bookstore as all three police officers are scared now and Mr. Lin casually laughs and comments saying how he can't be an evil spirit because he's an actual living Man. Now we see Mr. Lin's neighbor drinking the holy water mixture prescribed by the priest that would help him with the evil spirit possessing his home. He's drinking and spitting all over the place as he's reciting some cantation to repel the evil spirits as well before each spit. And bros, after looking at a room covered in my spit, I think I'd rather take an evil spirit any time over this. We see the neighbor thinking that this holy water recipe is actually working and he thinks how he feels a bit more relaxed after doing this procedure, but he also thinks how it's a bit pricey as well. He also remembers people from the high police as he wonders if they actually went over to the bookstore without any backup and as he's looking through his folds, he thinks how even though they are pretentious snobs who deserve to be taken care of, he still hopes they would be able to deal with this evil spirit, even though Mr. Lin's neighbor doesn't like them at all. He thinks so maybe they will be powerful enough to deal with the evil spirit, as we go back to the bookstore and these high police officers, and we see Mr. Lin just casually sitting with a smile, trying to tell them that he's just an ordinary person, while we see the dark aura completely covering the bookstore. 
through the chief police officer's perspective, even though Mr. Lin is saying all of this, he still looks at him as a terrifying monster and is left completely frozen in fear because of it. And as we actually get to see what he sees with his own eyes, I think everybody would be left frozen in fear in this situation. From his point of view, everything in the bookstore is gradually becoming darker until it completely shuts off like a TV screen and there's only him and his two comrades left in the complete dark. Suddenly, a huge red eye opens up and starts staring at them as endless smaller eyes start emerging from the ground, flying upwards with gaze piercing into their souls. The chief high police officer is starting to literally go insane and lose his mind thinking how nothing about Mr. Lin seems human, as he feels like his entire body is melting and as if he's been thrown in the pits of hell, but not just him, but all three of them, and it feels as if their minds are melting together in a concoction of fear, anguish, despair, hysteria and plethora of other negative emotions a human can feel. We can see he's going through literal hell as he's left lying on the floor in a pool of blood and thinking how there is no escape and this is how his life ends now. Also thinking that he's feeling uncomfortable emotions that he never would have expected for a human to be capable to feel before, as he describes it by saying that he feels as if his consciousness is being devoured and digested by some powerful, monstrous entity, literally sucking up all the positive emotions and desires he ever had in his life ever since he was a young child up until now. We see the evil eye above just observing his rotting corpse as it suddenly starts crawling back and it closes itself in, shattering this illusion of hell as we see the high police officer back in the bookstore again. Still frozen in fear, the blondie boy lets out an agonizing scream while the sweat drips from his face as if he just emerged from underwater. He manages to gather his thoughts as he realizes that he's still alive and he thinks how the illusions he just experienced were not actually just illusions but the power of that flower which almost devoured him and his comrades completely. He feels a burning sensation on his chest and as he reaches to see what it is, it's his necklace which is searing hot right now with inscribed holy words to stop the evil spirits and the necklace is cracked from trying to exorcise these demons and it feels so hot like it's literally on fire right now. He thinks so this necklace has definitely just saved him from being completely devoured by this hellish flower as he also remembers Mr. Lin's neighbor and his words warning them about all of this. But but Ryan thinks how the situation is a hundred times worse than what the neighbor described anyways, thinking that just this flower alone possesses more power than most humans alive in the world. Ryan thinks how he can definitely feel something about his soul that has been devoured by this plant. He doesn't know what and can't describe it better but he feels as if this will dramatically change his life in the future. Suddenly he hears knees hitting the floor and as he turns around, he sees his comrades still going through this hell as they look completely insane and just start running away while they look like literal zombies with melting faces. At that moment, the bookstore doors slam open as we see another individual entering the bookstore. As he gets serious and charges in, we can see him hitting these two high police officers and leaving them immobilized after only 3 seconds of him entering the bookstore. The chief police officer gets surprised by this, realizing that this man just stopped his comrades from completely falling into madness and has somehow managed to stop the evil powers of that flower. Bros, I didn't want to say it at first but powers of the flower, yo 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 let's go, rhyming like it's nothing bros. Eminem recaps incoming. Ryan starts feeling peace in his mind 
as he's looking at this man and sees a familiar face. He gets a memory of him being a child, watching TV and watching his favorite superhero Nokinian save citizens all might style. By the way bros, I wanna quickly stop you to point out the pose this lady is in while being saved. Hmm, definitely a dangerous situation to be in. He continues watching this on TV as we learn that this is a movie scene where Nokinian is saving his girlfriend as she is thanking him and calling him her superhero while he's reassuring her that she'll always be safe because he'll always be by her side. In the next scene, Nokinian tells his girlfriend how she needs to wait for him a bit as he goes to defeat the evil and powerful demon king and we slowly return back to reality as we see Ryan, who is the chief high police officer, looking at this man who just barged in the bookstore, saving him and his co-workers and he thinks of him as a superhero from the movies. Ryan also realizes that this man is giving out superhero auras as we see this man taking care of his co-workers as Ryan also realizes why this man looks familiar. He is the young first grade inspector who recently got promoted to and Ryan remembers that this guy's name is Claude and bros, for those of you who don't remember, Claude is one of the two students of Radiant Knight Joseph, the other one being Claude, and he looks awfully familiar to Edward Elric from Full Metal Alchemist. Ryan starts crying now, thinking he is saved, because Claude, even though he was a common man, he managed to climb the ranks and reach this high position, because he is really skillful and powerful, as Ryan thinks that the heads of the central district have probably sent Claude to save Ryan. He figures out how he needs to build some rapport with Claude, and as Ryan approaches him, Claude just ignores him and walks past him, leaving Ryan in shock. He exhales as he comes closer to Mr. Lin, bowing down and introducing himself as Harry Claude, who is the first grade inspector from the central district, saying how he is also Joseph's student and also wants to greet Mr. Lin on Joseph's behalf, and Ryan just faints after hearing all of this and realizing Claude is showing respect to this monster. He literally starts drooling and crying, thinking how there is no way this is actually happening right now. Mr. Lin, a bit confused, greets Claude back and asks about high police officers and whether they are okay, as we see all three of them lying on the floor in the back, as Mr. Lin thinks to himself that they must be cowards through and through because they fainted after seeing their superior who is Claude and of course. Mr. Lin misunderstood this entire situation, thinking Claude is the reason why they all fainted. Claude is left speechless by Mr. Lin's ignorance as well, thinking how this reminds him of Joseph, as he thinks that maybe all destructive level people have some kind of ignorance within them. He thinks how he's used to this kind of behavior from his teacher already, so he can handle the situation easily, as he answers that they have all fainted because of overwork working and how they'll need a couple of months to rest to come back to their full senses, saying he'll send them on a long holiday and how Mr. Lin doesn't have to worry about this. Oh yes, some prime misunderstanding action happening. Cloud is thinking how these three high police officers are definitely not overworked and three months of a vacation is nothing for the petrified state they are currently in, as Cloud realizes that they will probably remain frozen in this fear for the rest of their lives. And Cloud thinks how him arriving here saved them from not becoming walking corpses, because if he had arrived even a moment later, that's what would have been left of them. Bros, I don't know if you can hear it, today in the background we have some real life birds chirping in my backyard. Back to the story, Cloud thinks how if it wasn't for Carolyn, and bros, they changed her name again and I really don't remember it, even though she is one of my favorite characters. So if you remember her name, please, please, please tell me down in the comments. Anyway, Cloud thinks how thanks to her research, he learned that these three high police officers are coming to this bookstore, so that's why he headed here as well, to be like their backup. 
but he also figures out that he would have ended up same like them if not for Knight Joseph's instructions on how to behave after entering the bookstore. But Cloud feels disappointed because even though he rushed here to save them, he didn't arrive in time, so they still suffered, and Cloud figures out that the person, or better, the thing that caused these high police officers to become living vegetables was a plant itself. We now learn more about this plant, as Cloud explains that this plant is known as the seed of desires. We learn that this plant is an ancient being, not known by many today, and that it's a very rare, supernatural being, which was cultivated by ancient elves, and we also learn that it doesn't always have the same shape, but it changes the shape according to the person person who cultivates it and according to that person's desires to be more precise. As we see Bulbasaur looking one existing as well. Cloud also explains that this being has some kind of intelligence but not a high intelligence level similar to a pet. But how its true nature is that it's a being that feeds on the desires of its victims. Each time it consumes desires from its prey, its power also grows and we learn that it's extremely greedy when it comes to this. And the power of these beings usually usually depends on many factors, like its bloodline, cultivation process, etc., as Cloud realizes that this plant here is extremely powerful due to a very high cultivation level, way higher than usual seeds of desire. But Cloud figures out that you can't expect less from the all-powerful bookstore owner, but to turn this seed into its most powerful possible version. But Cloud doesn't understand why does the plant look like it's withering as he's trying to figure out why is Mr. Lin doing this to it. As he figures out that he can't understand it, his eyes shift towards Mr. Lin and he thinks of the reason how did high police officers manage to make Mr. Lin nervous. But Cloud thinks how they are lucky that he himself didn't punish them directly but just let his flower do it instead. Cloud also gets a bit scared now, thinking he needs to be very careful when interacting with this bookstore owner, because even though he was friendly so far, he's not a normal human, and his power level is that of an immortal level, so you never know if and what can change his mood. Cloud also thinks how Mr. Lin just joked about giving them a scare, and this joke alone almost sucked their souls dry out of their bodies, and what would have happened if he actually wanted to punish them. He figures out that he's exposing himself to a dangerous situation now too, but as a knight working for the secret instrument tower, that's his duty and he has to abide it and do his best to attain any information, no matter how small it may seem. As he starts speaking again and apologizing to Mr. Lin in the name of these high police officers, as Mr. Lin responds how it's not a big deal at all, saying he understands that they're doing their jobs, but even after they learned that Mr. Lin's assistant's ID is still not completed, they kept asking some unnecessary questions, and Cloud bows down saying he understands the situation, as he thinks that Mr. Lin didn't have an assistant before, and he looks at Moon and thinks how Mr. Lin seems to really like her, and regarding more information about her, it's obvious Mr. Lin wants them not to investigate it, and that was the mistake of the high police officers. Cloud thinks that their curiosity made Mr. Lin mad, which resulted in him punishing them, and as we look at Mr. Lin, we learn that he's literally not mad at all, because he never is, as he's thinking how Joseph Disciple has the potential to be his new regular customer. But Mr. Lin wonders how high of a rank did Joseph had in the military while he was active, because Cloud is his disciple and is the first grade inspector of the high police. So Joseph himself must have been a very important individual in the army. Mr. Lin decides to try and swindle Cloud into becoming his regular customer, as he comments how Cloud looks tired and he should just relax and have a chat with Mr. Lin while drinking some nice tea. Cloud tries to say that that's not the case, him being tired, but is so scared of Mr. Lin that he just goes with the situation, saying how yeah, he definitely is quite tired. As he goes to sit down, Moon offers him some nice tea, hot tea, leaving him a bit surprised after hearing her voice as he thanks her for the tea. Now we see Mr. Lin's thoughts as he feels proud of Moon, 
thinking this is her first time interacting with the customer and she's doing such a good job as he thinks that from now on he can relax more while she does most of the work and thinks how he can finally feel like a real boss now. He takes a sip of the tea and asks Cloud about the reason he has come here as he asks about Joseph and mentions how Joseph seems way more relaxed now after giving the candela sword to Mr. Lin. Now we see Mr. Lin who's thinking that Joseph forced Cloud here and forced him to be so nice and polite to Mr. Lin. Cloud comments how Joseph hasn't been as good as he is now in a long time as he also thinks how the tea is really really delicious. Cloud also comments how there is a breakthrough happening with Joseph as Mr. Lin responds how that's quite an achievement for him to be able to break through at such an old age as we see Mr. Lin thinking how Joseph is definitely getting better quickly and figures it's all because of letting go of that sword which was a symbol to Joseph that represented his military days. At least this is what Mr. Lin thinks. This is not the case at all. Now Cloud thanks Lin again, saying that the overall safety in knocking is much improved and it's all thanks to him as he remembers how Mr. Lin stopped the Dream Beast Cthulhu but didn't reveal himself publicly, meaning he probably doesn't want people to know about it, as we see Mr. Lin left completely confused, thinking what the hell the safety of knocking has to do with him, as it hits him and he finally understands the situation. He thinks Joseph is probably back at work again, thanks to having a couple of talks with Mr. Lin, and this way he's fighting crimes again and that's why knocking is safer now and of course he is right as always bros. He also remembers how big Joseph's fists were and he thinks how he definitely has the physique of a superhero even at his old age. Mr. Lin then responds back to Cloud saying how there is no need to thank him because Joseph is the one that is actually doing the work and Mr. Lin just gave him a little bit of guidance. And now this makes Cloud realize that this confirms the suspicions the secret instrument tower had. Uh, the suspicions being that Mr. Lin is the one who stopped Cthulhu and Cloud thinks how Lin used the cursed sword Candela as a casting medium to summon and revive the ancient elven king, King Candela, and used Candela to stop Cthulhu and all of this is because Joseph gave him the sword so that's why Mr. Lin said it was Joseph who did it and not him. Ah sensational. I missed these misunderstandings bros. Cloud continues thinking that if Mr. Lin didn't stop Cthulhu, the dream beasts would have destroyed the entire city and is acting so casually about it now, almost as if he didn't actually stop the beasts. And you know what's even more funny bros, even though Mr. Lin thinks he didn't stop the beasts, he actually did stop the beast in this case. Now Cloud starts admiring Mr. Lin for being so humble about all of this, so he thanks Mr. Lin again, saying that both him and Joseph are grateful for his assistance, and as a token of gratitude, Cloud says that Joseph has sent Mr. Lin all the information they have about the ancient elven language, which Mr. Lin actually asked of Joseph in some of the earlier chapters, bros. Cloud explains, so there is not a lot of information about this language since it's really old and how most of the information they have here is gathered from some ancient ruins. And we see Cloud thinking how Joseph is not the one who actually did the work to obtain this information, but it was Cloud. Claudie and Carol who Joseph may do this work. Now we see Mr. Lin get completely consumed by satisfaction for managing to obtain more information about this ancient elven language as he remembers that after Joseph gifted him that sword, Mr. Lin took an interest in this language. He starts drooling as he can't wait to start doing more research on this ancient language and if you don't remember bros, Mr. Lin's previous occupation was of the folklore researcher, so that's why these things excite him so much. Mr. Lin thinks how Joseph is so reliable and doesn't understand how a reliable man like him can raise such a barbaric daughter as Melissa. Mr. Lin thanks Cloud for these papers as he picks them up 
and figures out that most of these papers just contain sentences written in the ancient language found on those ruins, and how the papers on the actual research are scarce, as he also realizes that these documents are all just speculations. He figures out that the people who've done this research must have not been real scholars, but probably just archaeologists who dug up these ancient ruins. He thinks so he can't waste time on analyzing this research more now, if it's not originally done by scholars, and the only way he could continue the research is if something was about to happen right now. He thinks that it's still better to have it at all than not to have it, as he exhales while being a little bit dissatisfied but still thanks Claude for providing him with these papers. And as Claude gets a bit scared realizing this, Mr. Lin puts on his business grin and he tells Claude, since we are resting, are you interested in reading some books? He gets up and says that he has many books in the bookstore and Cloud could definitely find something interesting for him. As we see Cloud thinking how he expected Mr. Lin to offer him some of his legendary books and even though he expected it, he still feels fear as he answers by thanking Mr. Lin but declining his offer, saying that he has to take care of these three high police officers right now so he doesn't have time to do some reading right now. We get a flashback of Cloud's bakery, I mean <laughs> interaction with Joseph bros, where we learn that Melissa is still trying to recover from reading all these books that she got inspired to read by Mr. Lin. Joseph, wearing his Radiant Knight pajamas, is explaining what exactly happened to Melissa to his student Cloud, saying that she's in this state because she couldn't handle the amount of knowledge and power Mr. Lin has offered her. Joseph explains that if he didn't stop her from reading so much, even worse fate might have happened to her as he gets completely serious and looks at Cloud, telling him that he needs to be well prepared and well thought when interacting with the bookstore owner or else he'd end up like Melissa too after not being able to handle the power offered by Mr. Lin. Joseph also instructs Cloud to not read any books offered by Mr. Lin right now, as they are the keys to unlocking these forbidden powers, as he explains that Cloud still isn't strong enough to handle their effect. So if it actually happens to be that Mr. Lin is offering him a book to read, he needs to find a way out of that situation and not read them at all costs. If there's no other way to avoid reading them, then at least open them in the presence of Mr. Lin or try to bring them back to Joseph so he can inspect them first. And we go back to the present where Mr. Lin did actually offer Cloud the book to read and Cloud is trying to refuse it, making up reasons and saying that he doesn't have time to read it now because he needs to take care of the high police officers lying unconscious in the back of the bookstore. Mr. Lin understands the situation as he knows that Cloud is here for work, so he figures he can't push him into reading the books quickly and right now, and Mr. Lin answers Cloud, saying how that's a shame and how he hopes Cloud will be back to read more books, as Mr. Lin gets dead serious, looking Cloud in the eye as he comments and starts complaining about this batch of high police officers, saying they are really bad at their job and how sensitive Central Police really needs to raise their standards for hiring so they don't hire unqualified people like them anymore. And of course bros, Mr. Lin is doing this to try to sell some books to Cloud or at least make him read some books, but Cloud, these words surprise him as he focuses on one word in particular, the word being batch because this means that Mr. Lin interacted with other groups of high police officers before as well, as he starts fearing and admiring Mr. Lin at the same time, thinking how he really is unpredictable and every word he says is cryptic with deeper meaning behind it. He then remembers Joseph's words when Joseph instructed him to keep his mind sharp when interacting with Mr. Lin. He decides to write down Mr. Lin's words 
so he can study them later and report them back to the secret instrument tower. He then lets Mr. Lee know how he'll report his dissatisfaction with these high police officers to their higher ups as he also gives Mr. Lin his contact, telling him to feel free to contact him whenever he needs. Mr. Lin writes down his phone number, I mean, not phone, his communicator device number, as he thinks this is great, because now he can use this number to sell him some books in the future. As Mr. Lin takes out his communicator device to write down the number, Cloud notices the logo on it and realizes this is the Ash Market logo, as he remembers that the bookstore was financed by the Ash Market three years ago when it was opened, and that's exactly when the infamous switch of the Chapman family, which is the druid family of the Ash Market, and this crossbreed dark elf which became their leader. Cloud realizes that the reason how a crossbreed could become a leader was never clear to the secret instrument tower before, but now figures out it has to be due to the help received from Mr. Lin. He then also remembers how Mr. Lin came to the knocking scene three years ago and probably started playing his game and recruiting pawns that would move and operate as he wants them to. Cloud thinks that besides Joseph and Old Wild, not many people know about this bookstore owner, thinking this is good and thinking that even the Truth Society doesn't have a lot of information on him. Cloud thinks that if the Truth Society would find out about the power Mr. Lin offers to his customers, they would definitely fall apart because even now they have many internal conflicts already happening inside of their organization. Just then, he hears Mr. Lin saying something and gets utterly petrified, apologizing and asking what he can do for Mr. Lin right now. Mr. Lin finds the respect received from Cloud a bit weird, thinking they are the same age, but Cloud is talking to Mr. Lin as if he is some wise old sage or demon or something, but then Mr. Lin realizes that maybe Cloud acts like this because his mentor Joseph and Mr. Lin are close friends. Mr. Lin remembers his amazing humor and jokes and decides to lighten up the mood with one of his jokes and he says that Cloud looks so scared as if he thinks Mr. Lin would eat him. I mean, this is like the fourth time he's using this joke, bros, and it's not even particularly funny. So his sense of humor is pretty dry, but what's funny about this joke is that everyone takes it literally always, as we can also see poor Cloud completely shaking in fear and freezing in place. Mr. Lin then mentions Melissa as well, saying how she also visited him recently and how Mr. Lin gave her some books to read, as he comments now that these books are probably too difficult for her to understand and asks how she is doing right now and if those books helped her at all. Cloud remembers Melissa being bedridden for weeks now as he tells Mr. Lin how she's been studying a lot recently which is good but that she's feeling a bit under the weather too as we can see Cloud thinking to himself how just now when Mr. Lin mentioned eating people he thinks something similar must have happened to these high police officers too. Mr. Lin continues talking about Melissa, telling Cloud to let her know to pay a lot of attention to the books she's reading and studying, saying that she should start with easy topics first and after mastering them move on to more difficult ones. As we see Mr. Lin thinking how it's great that Melissa is studying so much because she'll need more books to study from and this is where Mr. Lin comes in by selling her those books as we also see how he remembers Melissa in a completely normal studying pose bros, right? This is the pose you also assume when studying, right? Anyway, Mr. Lin lets Cloud know this, saying that if Melissa needs more books, she should definitely visit him to get some. Cloud stands up as he lets Mr. Lin know that he will convey these words to Melissa and saying he really needs to leave now as the author is again testing me with these bakeries he's drawing onto these male characters in his mawas. As Cloud is leaving, we can see him dragging three unconscious high police officers with him and we see Mr. Lin thinking how he managed to dodge these inspectors, finding out more about the moon and her fake identity, thinking that the Ash Marcus should help him with the fake ID soon as well. 
Now Mr. Lin focuses on the ancient elven language papers he got from Cloud, thinking he didn't research ancient civilizations in so long. He thinks how life has been pretty boring recently, so this will definitely help him fill out the time with some interesting activities. He also thinks how his networking with his customers has come really in handy as he admires himself and his people skills, thinking how he managed to swindle all of his customers to like him and to buy and rent and read many of his books. Now we see Moon curiously looking at these papers as Mr. Lin interrupts her, telling her a bit about it and how this language is also the language of the words on that special sword he has and instructing her not to touch these papers since they are really rare and valuable and she wouldn't understand them anyways. He thinks how it's a good thing Moon is so interested in learning and obtaining more and more knowledge but how these papers would be too difficult for her to understand as he lets her know that this material is too difficult for her and if she tries to understand it she'll just get dizzy and faint just like those three high police officers did. Moon disappointedly says that she understands as she remembers her first learning process with Mr. Lin and her mind getting reconstructed completely while she was absorbing all the knowledge from the books he gave her. But then the sentence that this language is the language of the words on the sword echoes in her mind as she thinks how these words somehow might be connected to her soul as she understands that this ancient language belongs to a ghost that has destroyed entire civilization many millenniums ago. As she finds herself in a vision of King Candela kneeling before the primordial witch as he was waiting to receive the witch's blessing. But the witch suddenly looks towards Moon and starts talking to her, saying how she can't be looking into memories of this era now, how it's too early for her to do that. As this leaves both Moon and me honestly completely surprised and scared because this should be a vision from the past but the primordial witch is so powerful that it can transcend time apparently. Moon snaps back to reality as she hears Mr. Lin words asking her if she's okay as she thinks how Mr. Lin was definitely right about this knowledge how a simple glance at it caused her to have these terrifying visions so who knows what might happen to her if she tries to learn more about it. She suddenly rushes out of the room saying she'll go and wash the teacups. Mr. Lin doesn't understand why she's so scared but figures it must be because she's still kinda young so studying is scary for younger people. Now we go back to Cloud walking down the street as we see Mr. Lin's neighbor peeking from behind the curtains at him while shivering in fear. He sees three high police officers unconscious as he thinks of these high police officers were so reckless even though he warned them but he also figures out that Cloud seems perfectly fine, what's more he even seems as someone who respects that wicked bookstore owner. He falls back in fear thinking that Cloud must be mind controlled by an evil spirit as he starts praying and asking for Father Vincent wondering when he will come to help him. Now we transition to a different scene and get introduced to a new character this time being this Father Vincent guy. We see Father Vincent and some kids picking fruits as the elder priest is slowly approaching them and one of the kids is greeting the elder. The atmosphere is friendly and relaxed as these kids continue chatting and talking and as the elder priest approaches them and gets close, we learn some things about Father Vincent. We learn that he's a new follower who just recently went through the process of baptizing and is a very busy person because of that so elder priest instructs kids to let father Vincent rest and go to Aunt Susan and carry the fruit they've plucked so she can use it in a pie she's making. The elder priest starts talking with father Vincent saying how kids always have good words about him and saying how after looking into his eyes they say they feel happy and relaxed. This makes Vincent blush as he comments how he was saying the same things about this elder priest when he was a young boy as we learn that at this location, besides the elder priest, there are only two more priests working and living here. We also get to learn that they follow the church of the moon and that the duties of priests here 
is to find kids with great potential and help raise them into powerful priests and sisters. But the kids who don't have the special potential still need to be taken care of. So they stay at this church for as long as they don't grow up. Which is good because this means they are good guys. We get to know that this church is called Church of Benevolence and how at this very place is where Vincent received his baptism as well and became a priest. By the way, bros, if you don't know, benevolence, according to Google Sensei, is the quality of being kind. So if you didn't know this word before, like I didn't know it, say Arigato Google Sensei. <laughs> anyway, back to the story and the conversation Father Vincent and Elder Priest are having, we also get to know that many people, after growing up, decide to leave this church as the life that is lived at this place is rather poor, but Vincent wasn't one of those people as he was staying for the longest out of all the kids at this church and how the only reason he ever left is because the elder priest forced him to pursue a better life, especially because he is one of the most beloved and renowned priests in this area, so in order to live up to his full potential, he can't stay in this small village forever. Vincent comments how he's not that strong and that he can only help with troubles people have when it comes to low-level evil spirits and dream beasts. We also get to know that why people are so satisfied with Vincent is not because he is dealing with their evil spirits problems with sheer force and power, but he also employs the use of some tricks, like recommending them to use holy water, which is useful with vanquishing low level spirits, but what's more used for is for having good sleep, and after people start having good sleep again, they start thinking that the evil spirits are gone, and that's why they get satisfied with services Father Vincent offers. Vincent also explains how he changed the recipe to make standard holy water and he managed to find cheaper ingredients for making it after doing an extensive research about it. And it's so cheap now to make that people usually doubt if it will be effective being this cheap. So later on, Vincent had to add some expensive ingredients to the recipe so that people wouldn't doubt it. But if some think these expensive ingredients are too pricey, Vincent would just tell them to remove them and that the holy water should just be slightly less effective without them, even though these expensive ingredients are completely irrelevant in this mixture. He also explains how even if the cheaper holy water recipe is too expensive for some people, he would personally cover the cost for those people who are too poor to afford it, and with these simple tricks, he managed to gain love respect and renown from people. And because they are so happy with his services, whenever they have some evil spirit problems, they'll first go to Father Vincent for help. And even though these tricks helped propel Vincent into being the most beloved priest in this area, there have been some problems as well, as we learned that other priests don't like these tricks as they think it's cheating people. Plus, if the evil spirit would really be a powerful one, these methods wouldn't work on it, so Vincent would need actual help from actually strong priests. My bro is not even aware what kind of an evil spirit is awaiting him in Nokin. Now after hearing all this talk, the elder priest then explains how everything in the world has a bright side and a dark side. So Vincent shouldn't worry about it because even their church's motto is that the moon has a bright side and a dark side. Elder priest continues explaining, saying that after hearing Vincent's talks and complaints right now, what he can deduce from them is that Vincent lost the peace he had in his heart and is looking for an approval of his methods right now. This surprises Vincent as the elder priest read him like an open book and Vincent confirms this saying that the elder priest is right as usual. We also see uncertainties that Vincent feels as he comments how he thinks that he might not even be worthy to be a priest and a follower of the moon but as soon as he said that the elder priest put his hand on Vincent's head as he comforts him saying how they will worship and follow the moon their entire lives and telling him to calm down and not question the ways of the moon. 
that he just needs to have faith in these ways and that this will bring him peace of heart and peace of mind. He also tells Vincent to take a couple of days off and rest at this place, saying how the doors of the Church of Benevolence will always be open to all the followers of the moon. Vincent is now a bit ashamed by his words, saying how he is still not strong enough, but that he does feel better after listening to the elder priest and coming back to this place as well. He comments how he will take a couple of days off after resolving this one active request he has and bros, if this request is the one I think it is, oh, it would be better for him to take these days off immediately. Vincent, now confident again, continues speaking, saying how his teacher is right and how he will completely devote himself to following Moon even more than before as he comments how his goal is to make the elder priest proud, to which the elder priest responds how Vincent already did that. Suddenly, they hear a villager yelling how his kid got hurt and the villager is asking for help from the elder priest and as the elder priest starts walking to the kid to help him, Vincent offers his help as well, to which elder priest responds how Vincent should just rest and how he can handle this situation on his own. Vincent bows down in respect, letting the elder priest know that he understands and agrees with his order. Vincent then decides to leave to fulfill this one active request he has and as he's saying goodbyes to the elder priest, he lets him know that the trip there will last a couple of days, but after he's done with this request, he'll be back soon. As Elder Priest is waving goodbye to Vincent, he remembers Vincent as a young boy, thinking how time really flies, and he then starts praying to the moon, asking it to protect Vincent and to guide other people as well to follow the moon, as he finishes the prayer with hopes that the kind people of this world will always get rewarded properly. Now, three days pass and we see Vincent arriving at the 23rd street in Nokin, uh, the street where Mr. Lin has his bookstore and where his neighbor lives as well, obviously. Now, the contrast between the green grasses of the village where his church is and the suburban area with buildings and street lights feels very different for Vincent as he also realizes that he arrived here in the dusk which means that the demons are more powerful and more active than they would be if it was morning or daytime currently. This makes Vincent a bit uneasy as he also remembers the stories he heard about recent events that took place in Nokin, and uh, one of them being the battle between Murphy, the Crimson Cult leader, and the Elven Sage Doris, which completely destroyed this street and the other event being even more catastrophic, which was the summoning of one of the most powerful dream beasts in the existence, which almost completely obliterated City of Nokin in its wake. Vincent also figures how the general public is mostly not aware of these things, as the Truth Society and the Secret Instrument Tower covered it up as much as possible because the only people who are allowed to use magic in public are low-level priests like Vincent. And these cover-ups always result in people being oblivious to more powerful individuals living among them among us, which also leads up to them considering low-level priests to be really powerful as they don't know that even more powerful people actually do exist. Vincent decides to focus up on the job at hand and leave this city as soon as possible as he gets intrusive thoughts and starts thinking how if he came here for nothing more than a lack of sleep this individual is facing that called him, he'll have to punish him somehow but then he recollects his thoughts, remembering he's a priest and he can't think like that. We then learn that these intrusive thoughts have been a recurring thing in Vincent's mind lately and how he hoped talking to the elder priest will help him deal with it, but it seems that he still is getting them, which makes it easier for him to get angry and mad than he usually would. 
He thinks that maybe he's just tired from overworking himself, so that's why this is happening to him right now, as he figures that he can go back to church and rest after finishing this request. He takes his uh, communicator device as he's trying to find the location of this person that called for help, and after reaching his home and knocking on his door, Vincent wonders why did this person tell him to come in through the back door door. After the neighbor slowly opens the doors and sees Vincent, he breaks down as if he wasn't already broken and he starts yelling in happiness saying, oh Vincent, you came, thank you so much, and he runs towards Vincent asking for help, but this sudden reaction scares Vincent as he pushes the neighbor back and almost uses his holy spells on him to kill him and then realizes how he can't behave this way and needs to show compassion and understanding to all the people no matter how weird they are. He then apologizes and says that they should be quiet so they don't disturb the evil spirit and the neighbor looking at Vincent in fanaticism comments how he's definitely right. The neighbor is crying and saying how his nightmare is finally over now that Vincent is here as we see Vincent being absolutely disgusted by this guy and the way he's acting right now. After the neighbor explains the entire situation, from what he thought happened, not what actually happened, with the high police officers being unconscious and dragged out of the bookstore by Mr. Lin's accomplice, Vincent comments how he finds it weird that holy water didn't work at all and stop the evil spirits. Vincent comments how he'll need some time to prepare and while he's preparing he'll need to stay at this place for the night as the neighbor welcomes him saying how he can stay in his storeroom and if it's dirty Vincent could quickly clean it up leaving Vincent surprised at how rude this guy is. As Vincent is going to the storage room the neighbor comments how he's at Vincent's service to which father Vincent responds by saying how it would be for the best for the neighbor to just stay put and do nothing at all. After entering the storage room, we see Vincent being really really tired, stressed out and drained because of all the events that happened recently and we see him taking out some smokes to relax himself and bros don't ever use this as this will only cause more health issues than any good it would ever provide for you. So don't, just don't use them. Anyways, after Vincent leans back against the wall, trying to relax a bit, we can see his face really really tired, with bags under his eyes, and his eyes looking really tense. The atmosphere in the air is really sorrowful, as we see Father Vincent not feeling any better as well. He kneels down on the floor to begin his prayer, since this is the first step in the exorcism process. As we see his face in prayer, we can see visible signs of exhaustion on it as Vincent is trying to focus, sweat dripping from his face. The exorcism circle did start appearing beneath him, but it couldn't fully form as Vincent starts wondering what might be the reason for this. He's thinking that the moonstones and the medallion he's using maybe aren't as effective in this location, but what might be the actual reason, as he realizes, is that he lacks focus in this place, thus he can't meditate peacefully and can't achieve the needed mental state for the exorcism to start. He also comments how he can hear some weird noises as well and is getting weird pictures in his mind but he doesn't understand why as he gets angry remembering that it might be his intrusive thoughts acting up again. He's really feeling down and angry right now as he realizes that with every passing moment the anger he feels just keeps increasing. He reaches for what I thought is a holy book bros but is actually a pack of cigarettes as he lights up another one thinking that the only thing that can relax him right now is this as we see him looking like a fiend more and more losing his mind and not understanding what's making him so angry and depressed and giving into this foul smoke 
smoke, thinking that that's gonna help him somehow. As he exhales the smoke, he gets a flashback of him being a young boy in the lake with his teacher priest standing in front of him as we learn that this is the process of the first baptism in this world. His teacher comforts him, telling him to relax and submerge his head into the water while following his words and orders and young Vincent does that, pushing his head down in the water while hearing his teacher say how they will forever be devout followers of the moon. As young Vincent almost loses consciousness and starts hallucinating himself, falling deeper and deeper into this lake, while still hearing his teacher say the religious words, praising the moon and swearing their complete faith and loyalty into it, saying how the light side of the moon symbolizes life and the dark side is the opposite, meaning death. As young Vincent suddenly opens his eyes while being underwater after hearing the words, the dead will be reborn. And after opening the eyes while still falling deeper and deeper in this lake, what he sees at the bottom isn't the usual consuming darkness, but the entire moon dwelling on the bottom as the words his teacher keeps uttering still follow him even in these depths as he hears how after they die they will be reborn in the sky close to the moon. Vincent from the present, while still remembering this, both terrifying but in a way peaceful memory, realizes that the moon he saw underwater wasn't the real moon, but the reflection of the real moon from above, as he realizes that this was his last time until this day today seeing the true moon. Now we go back to the present, seeing Vincent even more disturbed than he was earlier after coming to this realization, as even his faith got shaken up a bit after coming to this conclusion. This disappoints him as he keeps smoking those stinky cigarettes, but suddenly his eyes open wide as he realizes something else now as well. As he drops the cigarette because his hand started shaking, he comments how he just saw the true moon in his memory and how something like this shouldn't be possible because after young boys go through the baptism to become priests, that's the last time they see the true moon, so much so that even the previous moon sightings get erased from their memories completely, as Vincent continues shaking, wondering what this means that he just saw the true moon in his memories. He tries to calm down, thinking how even that wasn't the true moon, but it's just reflection, as we learn that all the devout followers of the moon have the true image of it completely removed from their minds and souls and are not capable seeing it for the rest of their days no matter how much they admire it and desire to see it again. Then Vincent starts getting worried again as he thinks about the image of the moon he just saw, thinking that maybe he isn't the true follower of the moon since he can still see its true form. He starts crying as he falls down on the floor, thinking that his faith in the moon might be dwindling or maybe this is a punishment from the moon itself as we see him trembling in fear as he figures that this really might be a punishment directly from the true moon. Also, as he's sitting down on the floor, there's a mirror next to him which isn't showing his true reflection because we can see his face visibly scared but on the mirror we can see an evil grin. He starts sweating profusely as his eyes are slowly getting swallowed in madness and confusion. He takes out another cigarette and just as he was about to light it up, he throws the packet on the ground and starts stomping it and cursing, completely breaking apart as he starts yelling louder and louder, but then hears a knock on the door. It's Mr. Lin's neighbor, who after hearing some commotion happening in this luxurious room he gave Vincent, wanted to check on him to see what's going on. Now we see the neighbor yelling in fear, thinking that maybe Vincent is struggling with the exorcism, as he yells how he prepared all the things Vincent asked for and asks him what the next step for him to do is. Father Vincent comes back to his senses a little bit as he fixes his attire and comments how he's fine and will be out in a moment. As he opens the door, we see the Giga Chat pillow around the neighbor's neck. The neighbor comments how he's glad Vincent is okay as he thought something bad might have happened to him, that's why he started yelling and screaming. The neighbor then comments how he's really grateful for having Father Vincent here as he couldn't sleep at all for the last couple of days and now after 
Vincent helps him, his life will go back to normal again, as we see Vincent exhaling in relief, thinking how the phase he just went through was due to the irritation he felt after hearing this person talk and act, so everything that he just got scared of must be because of the neighbor making him nervous. Vincent then takes a couple of steps as he starts chanting the incantation to expel the evil spirit as we see him light up with the moon's light as he commands this evil spirit to leave this house in the name of the moon or face the consequences. He then lets the neighbor know how the chanting is completed as you see a bluish circle forming on the wall and Vincent comments how this circle means the exorcism is completed. He then figures out how he didn't actually sense any evil spirits, neither in this apartment nor in the one next to it, which is Mr. Lin's bookstore, as he decides to go to the bookstore personally to see if there really are evil spirits in there. Ooh, bros, let's go! Are we finally getting some Vincent Mr. Lin action? Now back to the story, the neighbor comments again how he feels grateful for Father Vincent being here, as he comments how he was worried for Vincent as he was wasn't responding to the neighbor's yells for an entire minute and then Vincent gets scared again realizing he didn't hear this yelling almost at all let alone for the entire minute that it was happening as he asks the neighbor if he actually did it for the minute straight and the neighbor gets taken aback a bit by this but confirms it saying how this is the truth. He says that after yelling for some time and after getting no response he started knocking on the doors as Vincent starts getting worried again because he realized that he got so deep into that hallucination that he didn't even hear the screams from the neighbor as he figures that he first has to help Colin uh, that's the neighbor's name and after that he will have to focus on his own problems and deal with them as well so before going to the bookstore Vincent decides to prepare and do a research on the bookstore owner as thoroughly as possible because if the bookstore owner is really an evil spirit or maybe is influenced by an evil spirit, at first he should act completely normally so he doesn't draw any unnecessary suspicion onto himself. He remembers some previous exorcisms cases he had where after a person who was affected by an evil spirit would commit seppuku, their bodies would get cursed and they would keep repeating the same actions over and over again, even though they have long passed away and how sometimes the evil spirits would even control the bodies of their victims into doing what they want them to do and he also remembers how some spirits aren't strong enough to possess humans so they prepare other sorts of traps for them and he's thinking all of this in order to prepare for the evil spirit that might await him in the bookstore. Vincent also realizes how this might not be an evil spirit after all but maybe a dream beast which would cause even more problems since dream beasts are extremely powerful beings but it shouldn't also be a dream beast because there was no sign of dream beast activity until just a month ago after Colin asked Mr. Lin to fix the broken circuit out in the back. We then see Colin's amazing suggestion for Vincent to use Colin's silver spoon that he inherited from his grandma which makes Vincent just facepalm in desperation as he figures what kind of people he needs to waste his time on saving. He figures that based on Colin's intelligence he can't fully trust what he says as well because his perception is very limited since his IQ is about the same size as his true size. Vincent tries to come up with possible explanations if it's actually the dream beast and the most plausible one being that after that Cthulhu dream beast appeared in Nokin, dream cracks appeared all throughout the city as well causing small level dream beasts to come into this reality too. Vincent also thinks that if there's really actually a dream beast in this bookstore, it must be using its powers to hide its aura from the secret instrument tower and the truth society since Vincent can sense any aura even after being so close to the bookstore. 
We see him tying a bandana around his head and as we get the front shot of him, we see him wearing it like Illidan is his daddy and as if he sacrificed everything and what have you given. Anyways, back to the story. He activates moon vision and we see energy starting to radiate from him and from his point of view, he sees aura and mana floating in the area around him as we learn that moon vision grants the followers and priests of the moon to keep their true vision while their eyes are covered up but also allowing them to see the physical conditions of others around them as well. He leaves Colin's apartment with slow steps as Colin follows him to the doors, letting Vincent know that after he finishes the exorcism, he doesn't need to come back to Colin's place since he might have some dirt or evil spirit aura remaining on him and Colin slams the door, leaving Vincent speechless by how much of a gentleman and a caring individual Colin is. Right bros? Of course not, as we see Vincent getting really really angry to the point of wanting to quit this mission but decides to go through with it because it might be of use to other people living in this area as well. He turns around towards the bookstore, confidence all high, as he exclaims how he can't wait to see what type of an evil spirit awaits him in this bookstore. Now finally, after forever it seems, we go back to the bookstore where Mr. Lin and his assistant Moon are looking at the flower he got from Doris and the flower looks all dried up because it feasts on the souls of people and it didn't eat any souls in so long but of course Mr. Lin doesn't know this as Mr. Lin starts making up stuff to justify his gardening skills as if you can remember from earlier chapters bros his gardening skills are the only skills he has that are better than moon so he gotta make some stuff up so he doesn't seem the flower is dying because of him as he comments how this is what happens in nature everything has to meet its end eventually and there was nothing he can do about it. Moon, however, knows that this flower feasts on souls, so she doesn't understand why is Mr. Lin saying this when it's obviously not the reason, as she figures out that it must be that Mr. Lin is waiting for the flower to completely wither so that he can use its ashes for something else. As she asks Mr. Lin, when will he kill it off completely, shocking him to the point that he started drinking his coffee backward, bro. He realizes how it's getting harder and harder for him to lie to Moon as he comments how this flower still might be saved, making Moon even more confused now, but their talk suddenly gets interrupted by the bookstore door opening as they turn around and see Father Vincent standing on the other side of the bookstore. Mr. Lin's business mode suddenly activates as he gets really happy and starts giving his opening speech on selling books but after seeing Vincent a bit better, he sees the blindfold and the priest robes he's wearing as Mr. Lin figures how Vincent is a blind father and bros, these misunderstandings are like drugs to me now. They make me so satisfied when they happen. So Mr. Lin figures out how he usually gives guidance to people with his words, but now his guidance is required from a person whose actual job is to give guidance to other people. As Moon realizes that Mr. Lin isn't saying anything for a while because he got consumed in his thoughts and she comments, offering her help to Vincent. However, Mr. Lin hushes her and turns around to Vincent asking him if he's the father from the dome church. This surprises Vincent now as we see that he realizes how Mr. Lin's thoughts are pure and clear, meaning he's not affected by any evil spirits, plus he's an observant individual because he immediately figured out Vincent belongs church of dome. However, even though Mr. Lin's aura is pure, Vincent does feel leftover residue of evil spirits in the bookstore, meaning that this place definitely was under some kind of supernatural influence. He also realizes that the gargoyle Mr. Lin got from Old Wild is giving off the biggest amount of supernatural aura as Vincent feels its cold and imposing presence clearly. So he figures out that this gargoyle must be the reason why Colin called him here as he slowly approaches the gargoyle 
and figures out how Colin over exaggerated way too much because there's no evil spirit in this bookstore besides this regular old gargoyle and we see the bookstore from the outside and Inky ominously covering the complete sky above it as well. Vincent also realizes that Mr. Lin himself might be the victim of this evil spirit gargoyle but Vincent also figures how the first thing Mr. Lin told him is whether he's the father from the Church of Dome, which might be a warning message from the evil spirit who somehow possessed Mr. Lin even though Vincent can't detect it now, so he decides to stay cautious and try to have a normal conversation with Mr. Lin as he sits on the chair and confirms how he is working for the Church of Dome in this area right now. He scans Mr. Lin again with his moon vision, but sees no evil spirits still, which probably indicates that Mr. Lin is a normal person after all, as we see Mr. Lin thinking how this father looks like he's doing his job really well, but the way he said this last sentence gives off Mr. Lin vibes how there's something else Vincent wants to say, but can't say directly, as Mr. Lin tries to figure out what could he mean, and thinks how if he came here for work and he's working as a father for a church, what might his work be in this bookstore then? As he figures how usual duties of fathers are to spread the religion, to religious marriages, helping the ones in need by praying for them and lastly exorcism. As we see Mr. Lin's face completely serious now as he figures out how if this father is not here to spread the religion and other mentioned duties probably aren't possible at all, he must be here for exorcism. As it suddenly hits him, he comments asking Vincent if Colin is the one who hired him because Colin accused Mr. Lin of being an evil spirit before, so Vincent must be here to exorcise him as Vincent sees a huge, ominous and devilish aura emerging behind Mr. Lin. Vincent is left startled as he didn't expect for Mr. Lin to realize so quickly what the reason he came to his library is. We see Mr. Lin thinking to himself now how it's unfortunate that Colin, which is his neighbor, actually thinks that he is an evil spirit and Mr. Lin is both sad to learn this but also kinda angry that he actually called a father on him and as he's thinking all of this, we see Vincent just silently sitting in a shock for now, thinking how is it possible that Mr. Lin figured it out, as he thinks that maybe Colin told him that he'll call a father on him, but that also doesn't make any sense because you're not gonna threaten an evil spirit like that. So he wonders if he was maybe baited into some kind of a trap, and as we go back to Mr. Lin, we see him thinking how Vincent also looks uncomfortable, just like Mr. Lin does, and Mr. Lin being a good guy that he is bros, and a guy who perfectly reads the room with no misunderstandings, decides to not expose Vincent for coming here basically for no reason, as he thinks how Colin's actions were outrageous, and as he thinks that, Colin feels shivers going down his spine. Mr. Lin then tells Moon to go and make them some tea, as he tells Vincent how all of this has just been one huge misunderstanding, and with a smile on his face, comments how he has no idea why would Colin call a father on him, because obviously he's just a normal bookstore owner, saying how he's just made of flesh and blood and likes to help people, and how he even helped Colin once. Mr. Lin says how a couple of high police officers came recently to to inspect the bookstore and how they can testify for Mr. Lin as well that he is indeed a normal person. Vincent now gets even more scared as he knows that those three high police officers were dragged out of the bookstore unconscious as he thinks how maybe Mr. Lin is threatening him right now by telling him this. Mr. Lin then stands up as he figures out how Vincent still isn't convinced and decides to pick up the gargoyle he got from the old wild as he shows this gargoyle to Vincent and he says how this is also a proof he's a normal bookstore owner who helps people because he got 
got this gargoyle as a gift from an old customer who Mr. Lin helped a couple of times and how the use of this statue is to ward off evil spirits so he himself can't be an evil spirit then, right? And as he says that he himself couldn't be an evil spirit then, the gargoyle's eyes light up red as it stares directly into Vincent's soul but of course Mr. Lin doesn't realize this and Vincent is left petrified seeing a vision of himself standing on a field of bones with the gargoyle towering above him as he sees Mr. Lin now reaching his hand out to pull out Vincent's soul but at the very next moment Mr. Lin grabs Vincent's hand quickly saying how the stone this gargoyle is made of is quite fascinating as he pulls his hand towards it to touch it and feel it himself since Vincent is blind and he can't see him is what Mr. Lin thinks and as he puts Vincent's hand on the gargoyle the gargoyle activated as he pulled Vincent into his realm now and Vincent screamed in fear seeing that countless souls are swimming in the sea of blood in this realm crying for help and screaming in pain reaching their claws out towards Vincent to pull him in as well. Now we're back to reality as we learned that this all was an illusion Vincent saw as Mr. Lin lays the gargoyle back on the table asking Vincent if this is enough proof for him that Mr. Lin is a good person after all and not an evil spirit. Mr. Lin decides to flex with the rose as well saying how it's also a gift from a different customer as you see the rose is completely withered bros and Mr. Lin thinking it's lucky Vincent Vincent is blind so he can't see that the rose is almost dead so he can just lie and say it's well nourished and blooming. So he takes Vincent's hand again to touch the flower as he comments how this flower is alive meaning Mr. Lin is a person who cherishes life of every living thing and as soon as Vincent touched the flower's petals Vincent's already fragile mind was consumed by a terror greater than any he ever experienced before with the flower completely surrounding him just waiting to suck his soul out. Vincent thinks how the flower's petals feel as if they are made from flesh too because he can feel the veins on the petals full of blood but there's something else, some other sensation he feels as if a thousand eyes are staring directly at him now. Luckily he's wearing a blindfold and he doesn't actually see what's going on bros but the sensation he feels from these stares is more than enough for him to feel immense fear as he yells out how that's enough pulling his hand out of Mr. Lin's grip as his protective medallion falls to the ground and you see Vincent's face consumed by fear inflicted upon him by the flower and the gargoyle. He keeps staring at Mr. Lin with overwhelming fear as he thinks so he was definitely wrong the first time he made a conclusion about the bookstore owner being completely normal because right now he feels evil and ominous aura radiating from Mr. Lin and we get a close up of Mr. Lin and we see the demonic force appearing behind him which is what Vincent is seeing and feeling and of course Mr. Lin is completely oblivious to this. Mr. Lin smirks and comments how he understands if it's enough and asks Vincent to use all these statements he has just given him and tell Colin he's not an evil spirit after all because what Mr. Lin is thinking Vincent has had enough of the arguments from Mr. Lin why he is a normal person and not an evil spirit. Mr. Lin then picks up Vincent's medallion and tries giving it to him extending his arm towards Vincent as we see Vincent gulping while even more fear starts covering his entire body making him shiver now as he thinks if this is another trap and is trying to decide whether he should take his medallion back from Mr. Lin's hand or not. As you see Mr. Lin with his usual dull smile a bit confused as he doesn't understand what's going on and why isn't Vincent taking the medallion back so he asks Vincent why he isn't taking taking it back and then it suddenly hits Mr. Lin, he figures out how he was so busy trying to justify himself not being an evil spirit that he completely forgot Vincent is blind and couldn't see him extending his hand towards him like that so he decides to try to fix the situation leaving the medallion on the table close to the gargoyle and letting Vincent know about it verbally. As he goes back to sit in his chair he asks Vincent if everything is okay since he looks kinda pale and this surprises Vincent a bit now as he answers saying how he's fine, how he's just lacking a bit of sleep so that's why he might look weak, saying how he rushed to knock in quickly so that's why he didn't sleep well. 
as we see Vincent thinking now how the only thing that was protecting him was this medallion and now he doesn't even have that anymore as he figures out how Mr. Lin is probably taunting him by telling him to take it back but Vincent is too afraid to do it because he's not used to combating evil spirits in that way anyways without a medallion that is. So as his already distraught mind is trying to figure out what's going on. He feels as if Mr. Lin is a mysterious and evil high level being as we see an epic image of a giant Mr. Lin sitting on a throne of bones with tiny Vincent standing in front of it. We know that Vincent is going through the usual treatment of overwhelming fear that all the people who meet Mr. Lin for the first time go through and he's trying to figure out the intentions of Mr. Lin as we see Vincent trembling in fear. He thinks how something of this demonic power is rare even in church's records as he realizes that the stone gargoyle has at least a hundred souls of powerful humans trapped in it and torturing them by combining their souls into one and causing immense measurable agony on them that way as he then envisions himself getting caught by this gargoyle as he thinks how if the gargoyle managed to devour so many powerful people if he decides to go after Vincent too it will easily capture him as well because Vincent isn't strong in any regard quite the contrary he's rather weak. Vincent figures out that only a destruction level dark wizard could create a statue of this power and not only that, this dark wizard must be extremely cold blooded and cruel to create a stone statue that would basically cause hell for the souls it traps. As he then looks back at Mr. Lin who's just patiently waiting for Vincent to pick his medallion back up and figures how even Mr. Lin having this stone statue must be way stronger than it himself meaning he's at least a destruction level human too. Cold sweat covers Vincent as he remembers the flower as well and realizes that it's not an ordinary flower too and it's giving him the fear of the abyss as he realizes how this flower is even more powerful than the stone gargoyle and thinks how it has a power of consuming someone's soul to the point of no return with its fangs and creepy eyes completely overpowering its victims. He then starts trembling even more thinking how Colin didn't call him here to exercise an evil spirit but to actually come and become a sacrifice of an evil demon lord as he thinks of Colin must be a lackey of this demon lord. Mr. Lin interrupts what seems to be the silence from his point of view as he comments how Colin really did him dirty this time saying how Colin's misunderstanding definitely caused so much trouble both for Mr. Lin and Father Vincent now. Mr. Lin then explains how he presented enough evidence of him being a normal human and asks Vincent to tell this to Colin too saying how he hopes they can clarify this situation as quickly as possible. He then laughs saying how Vincent seems like a smart man and how he should have also probably quickly realized how there's no way that Mr. Lin is an evil spirit as this surprise has already scared Vincent even more now. As we see him getting completely mad in his thoughts thinking how Mr. Lin is definitely not an evil spirit but a being way more terrifying than an ordinary evil spirit would ever be as he thinks how he'd like to go back to his church and his simple life and figures out how he's breathing really hard now and remembers his anxiety that he has been struggling with for a while now that feeling that made him impatient for months as he repeats this same exact thought a couple of times in his mind meaning he's really starting to lose it now as we see cold sweat completely covering his face now as he figures out how he's been struggling with this unknown creeping terror for a while now and how maybe all of this is just a misunderstanding on his part caused by this fear he's been feeling for a while now as he thinks how maybe all of these visions that he saw are just caused by his anxiety and how everything might be normal. He feels his muscles are starting to spasm, his breaths are getting too frequent, his lungs are twitching and his heart seems to be only increasing its beating rate and it's beating faster and faster with every passing moment. He feels as if there are million ants crawling all over his body and how all of this is impairing his thought process right now as he keeps on shaking more and more and thinking of what he could possibly do right now to relax as he reaches into his inner pocket his mouth drooling now as he takes out a pack of smokes 
thinking how this will definitely help him out and relax him. And bros, I think I finally understand what's the reason he feels all this anxiety. It's probably because he's addicted to smoking and whenever a bit more time passes with him not smoking, he starts getting these withdrawal symptoms and has to go for another smoke. So lesson here is, never even try smoking a single cigarette once, broskies. Don't be a beta like Vincent, be a giga chat like Mr. Lin. Now back to the story, as he saw a smoke, he pulled out of the pack, his hand immediately started shaking less as he tells Mr. Lin how he'll definitely let Colin know he's not an evil spirit and we see Giga Chad Mr. Lin noticing Vincent taking out a cigarette as we see Vincent looking like a fiend taking out his lighter and trying to light it up as he figures out how just seeing the smokes made him feel more relaxed so actually smoking it will relax him even more then. He looks at Mr. Lin who stood up again and thinks so maybe Mr. Lin wants to hide his true identity from Colin and Vincent's only way out alive from this bookstore is to agree to follow along and keep his identity hidden as well. But he gets scared again thinking how could the secret instrument tower and the truth society allow someone this powerful to exist and do what he likes and as he thinks how maybe he needs to report this back to the church we see Mr. Lin's hand coming from behind Vincent's back as he with a completely serious voice now calls Vincent and says how smoking is prohibited in this bookstore, laying his hand on Vincent's shoulder, scaring him even more, as Vincent quickly turns around apologizing, seeing Mr. Lin with Yelena's face. It's pretty obvious, so I'm not gonna explain the reference, but if you get it bros, let me know down in the comments below. By the way, this is my favorite anime ever. Now, Vincent screams in fear, finally breaking down, apologizing and saying how he didn't know and he won't ever do it again as he jumps back from Mr. Lin while we see Mr. Lin's face still completely serious as he asks Vincent if he just couldn't control himself. He asks Vincent if he feels uneasy recently, asking if he sweats while sleeping, gets random fluctuations in his emotions and after shivering uncontrollably and he keeps describing all the symptoms Vincent Vincent actually has and Mr. Lin ends his sentence by saying and the only thing you feel like could help you in this situation is a smoke. This surprises Vincent as he looks at his pack of smokes again and Mr. Lin figures out how Vincent was definitely acting weird and mental from the get go but Mr. Lin thought it's actually due to the lack of sleep as Vincent said but after learning more about him Mr. Lin realizes it must be because he is experiencing withdrawal symptoms from smoking, as he realizes how Father Vincent is an addict. Mr. Lin also realizes how Vincent is not aware of this, meaning that somebody probably caused him to be like this, which will cause a bigger problem for him to stop smoking then. He asks Vincent where did he get these smokes, and Vincent gets scared yet again as he gets up and with a raised voice says how there is nothing wrong with these smokes, explaining how because of them he is able to, as we see Mr. Lin is not paying any attention to what he's saying anymore and thinking how someone Vincent trusts completely must have given him these smokes and that's why Vincent doesn't even realize how bad they are for him as he looks at Vincent and figures out how no matter what the source is it's beyond cruel to let him suffer from this addiction further as he goes into his usual advice giving mode and tells Vincent how he shouldn't blindly trust anyone because you can never be certain what other people are thinking as he explains how nothing is impossible in this world and asks Vincent if he'd be willing to answer some questions Mr. Lin has for him. Vincent thinking he has no choice answers with a shaky voice how he'll answer all his questions as Mr. Lin asks him once again where did he get these smokes and Vincent still in fear thinking how it's prohibited that the trading of supernatural items is talked about to the general public, he figures how Mr. Lin is at least destructive tier human so he shouldn't be general public and it shouldn't be a problem to tell him more details about it. He rips the packet open, showing the logo of the ash market and telling it to Mr. Lin as well, saying how he bought it on the ash market and how they only started selling recently and were given exclusive 
exclusively to a couple of church members as a test product. And this leaves Mr. Lin completely shocked. We get to learn more about Church of Dome receiving the cigarettes from the ash market and we see them in one of their biggest churches and a high priestess Vanessa explaining the benefits of smoking, saying that it helps increase focus and meditation which will allow for better communication between the followers and the moon. She also points out how only a select few will be getting this special gift for now and special gift being lung cancer I guess. But we also learn that Vanessa is a Dark Moon follower, implying she's probably not the goodest person around. We see the priests passing the packs along and among them we also see Vincent, a bit confused but following the orders of his superior as he holds the pack of cigarettes in his hands and thinks how this item is considered to be supernatural and was given to him by the seventh apostle and its origin is also quite reliable so it must actually be of great benefit for them. As we go back to present we see him holding the pack of cigarettes now covered in sweat and his whole body twitching as he figures out how after starting to smoke his meditation not only didn't improve it started rapidly decreasing but he never thought it was because of the smoking since he had utmost faith in his superior but now thanks to Mr. Lin pointing it out, Vincent finally figures out that the cigarettes might be the root of all of his problems. He then thinks how to a follower like him, loyalty to the apostles is a must, since they are in charge of fathers and are the third rank in the hierarchy system of the Church of Dome, and how from the followers point of view, they are considered to be the absolute existence since they represent a small part of the moon's will. He then questions how maybe his utmost faith was the reason for him to start degrading, wondering if Mr. Lin is actually right, but then he starts shaking his head in disbelief, thinking something like this is impossible. He then tells Mr. Lin how this product was approved by the Ash Market and the Apostles and how all the other fathers using this item have reported an actual increase in their meditation thanks to it, saying that he is the only one that's showing this negative symptom and as he continues his speech, we see Mr. Lin left absolutely speechless by the ranting of this cigarette fiend from Mr. Lin's perspective. Mr. Lin then thinks how it was so unexpected for him to hear Ash Market named from this father as he starts remembering the Ash Market leader girl whose name I of course forgot because these chapters release like one in every two years. Anyways, it's the half elf girl that helped Mr. Lin with a fake identity after he came to Nokin. Mr. Lin figures out that if they are able to provide fake identity identities like this, they have so much power that they could even fake it out and say that the cigarettes are healthy and good for meditation as they already basically did. He then compares Ash Market's power to Lore's resources, uh, which is the company ran by Miss G's father, and Mr. Lin figures how Ash Market's power isn't anywhere close to the Lore's resources, but they are still a huge tycoon with great power. He then explains how Lore Resources is a huge company which is able to manufacture different items for all kinds of different fields, while Ash Market would be something like Amazon, a place where you can find, order and buy those items, but they themselves are not the manufacturers. He also thinks how it shouldn't come as a surprise that church has special items produced just for them exclusively. So he realizes that it's reasonable why Father Vincent trusts the product so much. If the product is sold on the ash market, because they would never sell anything that's not of the highest quality. Mr. Lin figures that even though the ash market provided him with a fake identity easily, on a country scale, they're still a reliable and a really famous shopping platform, plus on top of that, from Vincent's POV, the product was bought on the ash market but also endorsed by his superior, this time being Apostle Vanessa and it was also reported by other fathers that the product is working. So Vincent doesn't realizing cigarettes are bad makes sense to Mr. Lee now. But he looks at Vincent in concern, realizing the symptoms he is experiencing are real and are caused by smoking, which means that this situation is really serious 
but not easy to tangle with. So Mr. Lin figures out that he needs to put a lot of effort into helping Father Vincent now, and with his finger nervously tapping the chair, Mr. Lin comments, telling Father Vincent how nothing is impossible and he shouldn't blindly believe into that, as he also states that he will investigate further and directly talk with the Ash Market's leader about this, but how that's not the problem at hand. The product at hand lies in Father Vincent's trust rather in who he trusts, as Mr. Lin asks him this with an ominous expression on his face. This completely scares Father Vincent as he gets chills throughout his body. He thinks how the only meaning behind this question is if he trusts the Church of Dome or does he trust the bookstore owner as we see Mr. Lin from Vincent's POV now radiating with evil energy all around him. Father Vincent starts sweating even more now since he doesn't know what he should do in this situation and as he starts praying to the moon for guidance he spots his medallion on the table nearby and remembers how he would never let go of it and would always keep it close to him even wearing it while sleeping as he now begs for any kind of guidance from the moon but he can't shake off the feeling of betrayal that's burning deep in his heart right now. His body starts shaking and he figures that the only way to help him calm down right now is for him to smoke another cigarette and as he reaches to take one out, he sees his reflection in the pack of cigarettes because the packs are made from mirrors I guess? <laughs> so you can see how stupid you look while smoking. Anyways, he sees his reflection on it and he realizes how something is definitely wrong with him right now because he looks like a madman who's completely falling apart both mentally and physically with his body twitching and shaking and sweating profusely. He realizes how the feeling he feels when he sees the cigarettes is definitely a negative one as if the ants are crawling over his entire body and it feels as if his skin is going numb and even his internal organs are itching. He realizes how he also didn't have any problems with meditation before and didn't have any disruptions in his thoughts, as he does have right now, as he thinks how this feeling is absolutely terrifying, but he realizes that he can't doubt in the church and its heads because the one thing that he was taught his entire life is the absolute discipline and servitude towards it and it doesn't allow him to have any suspicions in the church at all. He accidentally drops the pack on the ground in all this mental struggle he's going through as he starts trying to figure out what's the best thing for him to do right now and with his face in his hands he barely utters telling Mr. Lin actually asking him for guidance. We also see a symbolic image here of his medallion but it's covered with Mr. Lin's shadow meaning that Mr. Lin's influence or maybe better even Inky's dark influence has overpowered Vincent's faith. I like this small detail bros. Mr. Lin exhales in concern as he remembers old wild and the issues he was facing a couple of years ago when he came to Mr. Lin for the first time and the problems Vincent is going through are reminding Mr. Lin of old wild as well. He remembers how old wild was on the verge of ending his own life because of the difficulties he was going through and because his faith collapsed at a time but Mr. Lin figures how old wild was lucky enough to stumble onto him a helpful person with a kind heart. What a humble opinion he has about himself. Mr. Lin figures out how Old Wild is definitely showing signs of energy recently and how his life is back on track, so much so that Mr. Lin hopes that Old Wild will make up with his old friend Joseph again and will continue their friendship. I can't wait to see this interaction happen. Now Mr. Lin looks back at Vincent again and realizes how Vincent right now might be in a worse state than Old Wild was in when Mr. Lin first met him because Vincent is on a brink of collapse right now, especially since the position he is in is a really difficult one. He is a follower of a church and the orders he has been receiving from it have continuously made his life worse, but for a father of the church it's unimaginable to doubt his superiors, even though everything points to the fact that he has been progressively getting worse because of their orders. Mr. Lin thinks how there might be something wrong in the inner part of the dome of the church to subject their fathers to something like this. Mr. Lin 
places his hand on Vincent's shoulder as he thinks how it would definitely be cruel to let Vincent continue to suffer like this since he does seem like a good man who rushes in to help other people and save their lives when he is asked to do it. He gets close to Father Vincent and whispers how he needs to relax right now since his physical and mental conditions are what's important right now and how the rest they will investigate a bit later on. He tells Vincent how because he's not smoking more, he's experiencing these withdrawal symptoms and the reason why his colleagues aren't complaining is because they smoke way more than him which allows them to keep their mind sane under the influence of the cigarettes but they don't realize that it's all just withdrawal symptoms. He calmly asks Father Vincent how does he feel right now as Vincent gets absolutely surprised saying how he saw the moon in his hallucinations and how something like this for a father should be impossible because as we mentioned in the previous parts in order to become a father they have the image of the moon magically removed from their minds and they are also not allowed to ever look at the moon for the rest of their lives. But of course Mr. Lin doesn't know this and he thinks of something like this indeed is impossible because a blind man cannot see. So that's why Vincent couldn't see an image of the moon. How perspective of Mr. Lin. So he comments telling Vincent to stop using the holy moon's brain since this is what's probably causing him to have these abnormal behaviors and how he should try to find something else to distract himself with for now. By the way holy moon brain is what father Vincent refers to as cigarettes. As Mr. Lin walks off, he comments how a good distraction for now would be if Father Vincent would read some books, as he reaches out for a book and pulls it out of the shelf, saying how this book in particular might be useful for him and help him see something different from within him. I mean my bro is blind and Mr. Lin is still trying to sell him books. This is some next level salesmanship right here. And as Mr. Lin pulls out a book, Father Vincent is left in a complete state of shock as his moon vision ability, the one that he uses to detect supernatural things, starts going crazy as he sees an immense and extraordinary yet terrifying power emanating from the book. Vincent felt as if the sun itself was coming out of the book and the more terrifying fact about it is that this bookstore owner is just casually holding this book with ease even though the aura it is emanating is so heavy. Vincent started thinking that Mr. Lin might be some sort of a divine being for being able to withstand this immense power without flinching. One other feeling that struck Vincent as he was standing completely in awe in front of Mr. Lin is familiarity because the feeling he gets from seeing this aura with his moon vision is the same feeling that he feels when using his supernatural powers contained in his body, which he felt countless times in his life so far in many different instances. Like when he would pray to the moon alone at night, so much that his mind would get completely consumed by prayer, sinking into the moon's realm or when he would use his holy skills to cure patients by begging for moon's blessing, or even when exercising demons and evil and using moon's holy power as a shield. And this supernatural power is possessed by all the devout followers of the moon and is given to them from the moon as a blessing because they are so faithful. And even though the aura radiating from the book is strikingly similar to the moon's powers, there is one huge and important difference between the two. The aura that's coming out of this book is far more powerful and intense than moon's power. And not only that, Vincent can feel its invasiveness as if it's trying to consume his mind. His first explanation is that someone trapped a huge amount of moon's power and put it in a book somehow and when the book is opened the power gets released. But next he thinks how maybe these are two different powers, the power from the book and the moon's power and how they probably come from the same source but one originates from another. And he's not sure which power is the one that came before, book's power or moon's power. Basically what he means by this is that one of these two powers gave birth to the other one in a way. All this thinking and exposure to this strong aura is making Vincent tired and as he decides to rest he notices Mr. Lin slowly starting to walk towards him and the next unexpected thing that happens is that his emblem or medallion starts glowing so bright 
it actually catches on fire and the flames coming out of it grow bigger and spread higher each passing moment. He understands that his medallion is somehow calling for the power and divinity from that book and this makes him wonder who might be the actual owner of his medallion since he always thought it's him. But whenever Vincent would pray in the past, Medallion would glow and emit this same energy, but not even close to intensity as it's doing right now, making Vincent think that the Medallion urges to return to its real owner, who's apparently not Vincent. However, in the next moment, the light coming out of the Medallion starts slowly approaching Vincent, and as he notices this happening, it starts entering his body, surprising him as at first he doesn't understand what's going on, but then he figures out that the medallion is connected to his soul and how this energy that's coming into him right now is the energy released from the book and it feels as if the book is using the medallion as a mediator to enter Vincent's soul. His whole body starts shaking as the power is forcing itself in and even though Vincent can't block it out, he thinks that this power is too strong for him to fight it back, but that's not a problem because this feeling of this huge power entering his body is pure bliss. He feels like entering a hot bath after a long and cold day at work as every muscle in his body starts relaxing and the nervousness he felt the last couple of months completely vanishes. He realizes he didn't feel this calm in so long as he feels at home right now, with no unpleasant feelings. This whole process feels so natural and smooth and as he keeps relaxing more and more, his blindfold lifts up and he gets surprised seeing a bright silhouette made of light standing in front of him as a sudden realization hits him how this might be the one true lord of everything. However, as he keeps on levitating in this heavenly bliss, he senses a demonic presence creeping around it as if all of this was just an illusion to lure him in and then suddenly, in the very next moment, he hears a voice whispering, What's more important is you, father, who are you willing to trust? This surprises Vincent as the feeling of bliss quickly disappears and gets replaced by the familiar terrors and fears he felt, but now way more intense than ever before, as he feels like he's falling into the jaws of a demonic entity, he gets a sudden realization how his complete understanding of the world and everything around him was completely wrong, as he starts feeling as if he is suffocating in the dark blue waters. He figures out how the mysterious mysterious bookstore owner never really directly talked about Moon's brain, which is what he calls cigarettes, and how Vincent's understanding that if Mr. Lin asked him who he trusts more, the church or him, was also a misunderstanding on Vincent's part. Ah yes, even though it wasn't a misunderstanding and he actually understood what Mr. Lin meant clearly, of course now he's figuring it out completely differently. <sighs> sensational. Vincent's new realization and understanding of the fundamental truths of the world is that Mr. Lin meant if Vincent was to face a different situation to any other he has been exposed to so far in his life, like this one right now, where his complete knowledge of the world around him is getting overwritten basically, what would he do and who would he trust in this kind of a situation. But being a devout follower of the moon, the next thought that crosses his mind is that all of this is just a punishment from the moon because he was acting blasphemous recently, both with his deeds and thoughts and as he starts falling deeper and deeper now into darkness, he thinks so his mind must have been bewitched for him to even have such blasphemous thoughts in the first place. He thinks of the power he felt coming out of the book is the true power of the moon and that the book is the actual source of its power. And then, as his mind almost completely drifts away into the darkness, he hears a crack and all the darkness around him shatters as from the other side of it, there's a hand pulling him to safety, to light. A hand of a female figure, but after gazing upon her face, all he sees is a blur. And then he hears familiar, 
he had distorted voice saying, And in the dark nights, throughout my entire life, life. the books that I have read mm. and those that others but have read for me, read has already turned into a glorious light tower, showing me the railway of humans deepest heart. As the mysterious lady keeps pulling him upwards and upwards, closer to the light tower, he snaps back to reality, finding himself standing in front of Mr. Lin, with Father Vincent now on his knees and looking at Mr. Lin's face, now covered in complete shadow, as the light source from behind him keeps getting brighter and brighter, Mr. Lin continues saying how people who are blind to certain things in life need to make sure to keep their hearts pure and the best way of preserving the pureness of the heart is through reading books. Ooh, what a speech. Makes me want to buy a book from him even though I don't even know how to read. Mr. Lin continues speaking in a calming manner, explaining to Vincent how books are like stairs towards evolution of individuals, meaning they provide education and necessary knowledge for humans to calm their mind and gain more experience. As Mr. Lin places the book on Father Vincent's shoulder, he explains how the book he's recommending to Vincent right now was written by Helen Keller and it's actually her autobiography, a book filled with countless stories from her life. Bros, a quick info, she actually did exist in real life and is an actual writer and sometimes early in her life she got really really sick, leaving her completely blind and deaf afterwards. Mr. Lin also explains this in the manhua, but a bit inaccurately, but hey, he's knocking Mr. Lin and I'm real world Mr. Lin, your bro got you covered. Now let's go back to the story. Mr. Lin tells Vincent how a woman who had no sight or no hearing was able to live a more fulfilling life than most people by keeping a positive mind and attitude about all the challenges she has faced. Mr. Lin thinks this is definitely a perfect book to give to a blind person and I couldn't agree more besides one small fact. Father Vincent is not actually blind. As Mr. Lin extends his arm, giving Father Vincent this book, he tells him how the only person he needs to trust is himself, explaining how after reading this book, he'll be able to make his own decisions and this book will definitely be his guidance out of the loneliness and darkness he's currently facing because it will allow him to find his true self. Father Vincent listening to all this is still a bit scared and skeptical but Mr. Lin continues saying how he needs to look with his heart and embrace the light that's been offered to him. Of course, Mr. Lin meaning the book is the light metaphorically, but Father Vincent actually senses an immense aura of light coming out of the book, so he misunderstands the situation and thinks Mr. Lin is talking about this light. So he reaches out for the book and takes it, seeing a different title, of course, and the title he sees is The Son's Holy Bible. But there's something strange about this book that Father Vincent notices. He sees that the sentences in this book are written with shapes and dots and other symbols and not actual letters as he thinks how this has to be some ancient language and as I think and figure out how dumb I am for completely forgetting there are books for blind people which are made like this in real world. But what's good about it is that Mr. Lin gave him an actual book for blind people with these shapes instead of letters but Father Vincent misunderstood it for an ancient language. Vincent thinks how he can't read this book since he doesn't know this language at all, but what's more impressive about it is the fact that even though he can't read it, after touching the book, he feels as if he can understand all its deepest teachings, as if they are etching themselves directly onto his heart. As the demonic red aura is completely surrounding him right now, which he doesn't notice because of the small light aura in front of him diverting his attention, he realizes how the light that the moon produces comes from the sun originally, meaning that the source of the moon's holy power must be in the sun's holy bible as well. However, he thinks how no one has ever followed and believed into the sun, because ever since after the first era, the sun, light and fire have completely vanished from the dream world, and after the dream world entered the second era, it continued existing without these three, without the sun, 
the fire and the light. Thus, no one has believed in the Son since then, and no one has even mentioned it for an eternity almost. We see Vincent's blindfold completely off, as we see him standing and looking directly at a light source, a bit worried and uneasy. And I love the symbolism in recent chapters, bros. The blindfold was symbolizing his blind following to the moon, and now when it's completely off, He's no longer following the moon blindly, but this is all new to him, so he is a bit worried and uneasy, and we see him standing in front of a huge stairway to a bright light realm, possibly heaven, as he wonders if the sun is the actual true lord of the universe. What is the moon that he follows? Bros, that's all for this mega video special. If you watch it completely from start to finish, you're a Giga Chat certified. Thank you so much for watching it. Please check out other Mahou recaps I do on my channel. It would mean a world to me. Stay awesome, bros, and peace.